You know you spiked my plans for a fishing trip just a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah. All right. What's on your mind? Big fish. Real big fish. You ever hear of Douglas R. Lanfear? Uh, millionaire playboy, sportsman, yachtsman? That's the one. Well, didn't I read somewhere that yeah, he Yeah, you was... sure did, Johnny. At the bottom of the deep blue sea. And a $400,000 claim has been filed. You interested? An expense account based on that will be a pleasure. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut... Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Sea Legs matter. Expense account item one, 90 cents. Taxi from my apartment to the offices of Universal Adjustment, where Pat McCracken was waiting for me with a handful and a head full of information. Two claims, Johnny, both filed by Constance Lansphere, the wife. Here are copies of them. How come two, Pat? Now, number one is against Douglas Lansphere's life policy with Greater Southwest Life and Casualty Insurance Company, $250,000. Uh huh. What's the other? $150,000 International Maritime Organization for the loss of the Lansphere yacht. 400000 claim. That's right. Okay, what's the story? Well, Landfair was making a trip along the coast of Central America in his yacht, the Sea Legs. He ran onto a rock or something, the boat sank, and he and his crew of one went down with her. Well, do you have any reason to question the uh, validity of the claim by Mrs. Landfair? Two and a half years ago, Landfair himself filed a claim with International Maritime. It seems he lost a power cruiser in exactly the same place, near the Boldaro Islands off the coast of Nicaragua. $85,000. Total loss? Happened in a spot where not one bit of the wreck could be salvaged. Oh? Uh-huh. Where'd you learn that? Local authorities in this small Nicaraguan seaport, and Mrs. Lanfear, she was with him on that trip. But she wasn't with him on this one, aboard the Sea Legs. No, or presumably she wouldn't be around to file the claim. Uh-huh. Where's Constant Lanfear now, Pat? Home, as far as I know, lives on their small estate on Long Island, out near the town of Kachog. You want to call her, talk to her? No. I think I'll go down there. Item two, 2120, fare and miscellaneous to Kutchong, Long Island. Item three, a buck even for a taxi from the little station to the Lanfear Estate. Estate, did you call it, mister? Well, isn't it? Well, it used to be, before the Lanfear sold off a lot of it. Oh, that's so? Yeah, I guess there wasn't nothing else they could do to keep up with that high way of living. Keep talking, fella. Well, the old man, Lanfear's father-in-law, well, he had plenty, I guess. But after he died, all the kids seemed to do was spend it. Uh, you know what I mean? Fancy yachts, lots of polo playing, Florida in the winter, Maine in the summer, all that sort of thing. Oh, there's a place now, right up ahead there on the right. I looked, and what I saw apparently bore out what the taxi driver had said. A big stone wall surrounded what had evidently been the original, rather vast property belonging to the estate. Square in the middle of it sat what was probably once called a mansion... But small, new, modern homes were crowding in on the old house. Uh, 
Hello. Mrs. Lanfear? That's right. I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm representing the Universal Adjustment Bureau in Hartford. Oh, yes, of course. In connection with the insurance. Yes, ma'am. Well, won't you come in, please? Right in here, Mr. Dollar. And do pardon the looks of the place. I'm afraid I've neglected things somewhat since... Well, s- sit down, please. Thank you. I, uh... I hope you don't mind answering a few questions, Mrs. Lanfear. But since you've already filed claims on the insurance policies... Well, I'll try to be as brief as possible. I don't want to seem cold-blooded about it, Mr. Dollar, but the initial shock of losing Doug and the loss of the yacht is past. And there's nothing to be gained in just sitting around feeling sorry for myself, particularly in view of the day-to-day problems I have to face. What uh, problems, Mrs. Lanfear? To be perfectly blunt about it, financial, mostly. Well, I, I must say your attitude is very commendable. It's a necessary attitude under the circumstances. Now, what may I tell you? If you're sure you don't mind talking about it. I'd like to know all I can about the circumstances surrounding the sinking of the yacht. Well, I don't quite know how to start. We were on a... Well, just a pleasure cruise. You were along on this trip? Yes. That is, up until... Until the day it happened. Oh, why did Doug ever have to... I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. Well... We were just taking our time, cruising south along the east coast of Central America, doing a little fishing. We'd often taken the sea legs down there. That's the yacht? Yes, a motor sailor. Here, on the wall. This is a picture of her. That's Doug on deck. Oh. Isn't she beautiful? Sixty-eight feet overall, twenty-foot beam, solid teak decking, everything. Yes, that is a good-looking boat. It's terrible to lose something as nice as that, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes. Anyhow, along the coast of Nicaragua, Doug decided to put in at San Juan del Perro. That's uh, where the sea legs had originally been built. But the sandbar formations have almost ruined San Juan as a port, so we went on up to Bluefields. Oh, yes, I understand that's now the best seaport on the Caribbean side of Nicaragua. You know that country down there? Only from what I've read. Oh. Uh, But go on, please. Well, while we were there, he had some work done on our radio equipment. We'd had trouble with it on the way down. Uh Uh-huh. When the work was finished, of course, he wanted to try it out. He'd found a radio amateur in Puerto Gardo, so he asked me to stay on shore while he and the skipper went out to sea. We kept in contact every few minutes while he headed her out toward... The Boldero Islands. The Boldero Islands. Isn't that where you lost a power cruiser a couple of years ago? Yes, the Connie O, named after me, and I begged him not to go out there again. Why, Mrs. Lanfear? Because of the treacherous currents between the two little islands, the great deep that lies between them, a terribly dangerous spot with pinnacles of rock that reach up almost to the surface. Well, why did he go out there again? To prove a point. That's all, to prove a point. Look, I'm afraid I don't follow you. Doug had blamed the loss of the Connie O two years before on poor seamanship by the man at the wheel. He wanted to prove that he could take a boat through there safely. Oh, Kind of looks like he was wrong, doesn't it? His last words over the radio were that a rock had torn the bottom out of the sea lakes. Oh, Mr. Dollar, before the signal stopped, I could hear the crunching of the hull and the sound of the water as it swept in and over. And it was terrible. You sent someone out there right away, of course. Oh, yes, but it was no use. The sea legs was gone. And with it went my husband. And the man with him. And the, uh, the bodies were never no. recovered. Before, when we lost the Connie O, we had time to put on life preservers, launch the small boat. I must admit, I wondered how it was. But when the sea legs went down, there wasn't time, and I could hear it over the radio, and it was terrible. It was terrible. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm all right, Johnny. Mr. Dollar? I, uh, I may have to go down there, Mrs. Lanfear, and go through the motions of an investigation, you know. But then you'll... Uh, your companies will pay the claims. I sort of see no reason now. Why not? It's terrible to have to be so frank about it. But I do need the money, Johnny. I was telling the truth. I didn't see any reason why the claims shouldn't be paid. Perhaps Connie Lanfear's explanation of why she wasn't grieving over the loss of her husband was true. But more than once I wondered if she weren't far more concerned over the loss of the yacht... Or about how soon she could collect on the policies. 
Then that deliberate slip in starting to call me by my first name. Just what are your plans, Mrs. Lanfear? Plans, Johnny? I I don't quite know what you mean. Well, suppose the companies make prompt payment on these claims. That'll mean $400,000. Well, really, Mr. Dollar, aren't you overstepping bounds a little bit? Maybe. But if it'll make you feel any better, or if it'll help to hasten a settlement, I'll tell you. I'll sell what is left of this property and leave the country. Leave for where? Somewhere in Europe on the continent. Alone? I beg you. Of course, alone. Sorry, I just wondered. Doug and I were too close to even think of my having boyfriends or whatever you want to call it. The more I think about it, the more I resent that question. No particular implication meant, Mrs. Lanford. Next thing, you'll start implying that the sea legs wasn't wrecked at all, that Doug is still alive somewhere, and that if you can't dig them up out of the sea, your precious companies can somehow contrive to keep the money that is rightfully mine, can get out of paying off on what I thought was a legitimate... The more she talked, the more I became convinced that something was very wrong about this case. I let her vent her fury on me. It was simulated fury, I thought. Then I called the taxi again and left. Oh, no, sir, mister. You're all wrong. Them land fears, they were thick as two peas in a pod. Say, tell me, did you ever notice any particular friends either of them may have had? Well, there was always throwing them big parties. That's what you mean. Big society-type brawls. No, no, I was thinking of girlfriends for him or boyfriends for her. Oh, no, sir. No, sir. He was her, she was his, and no playing around. Not like most people in that set. And I know. <laughs> I know everything goes on in cut chalk. Back in New York, I found that the best immediate routing to Nicaragua was by plane to Dallas, then to Mexico City, and finally to Managua on the West Coast. I made a reservation on the Dallas plane immediately, that's item four, and then spent a dollar forty, that's item five, on a phone call to Pat McCracken back in Hartford. Well, sure, Johnny, if you think it's important enough, you have my full permission. Yeah, I've already made my reservation for the first leg of the trip. Well, now, don't go overboard on the expense account. Pat, how you talk. But you really smell a rat, huh? Well, look, according to report, the land fears were real buddy-buddy. She loved him, he loved her. Yet only a couple of weeks after his death, she's a lot more concerned over the loss of their boat than she is over him. Oh? You think perhaps... Uh, I don't know what to think. Meantime, if you can afford it, why don't you have somebody keep a check on her? Well, sure, Johnny, but with what specifically in mind? I don't know. After all, I didn't have any real concrete reason for feeling that this case was fishy. It was more a hunch than anything else, but a real strong one. And I felt that after my visit to her, Connie Lanfear would do something, just what I hadn't the least idea. But whatever it was, I wanted to know about it. It was a couple of hours later that I started to pick up the telephone to order a cab to the airport. Johnny Dollar. This is Pat again, Johnny. Oh, hi. I ordered a man to keep tabs on Connie Lanfear. Good. It's your old friend, Detective Randy Singer. Fine. Hey, but you know what? What? She seems to have left town in a hurry. No trace. Uh Uh-oh. You still going to Nicaragua? Yeah, but keep looking for her. Right. Expense account item 6, 475. Taxi and tip to LaGuardia Field, where my ticket and seat reservation were waiting for me. Within a few minutes, I was comfortably ensconced in my seat by the window. The passenger door was closed, and the big plane's engines were warming up for the trip to Dallas. Then suddenly, the cabin door opened again. A feminine figure skipped lightly in and plunked herself down on the seat next to mine. Well, how nice. Mrs. Lanfear. Surprise, Johnny? Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the seeds of suspicion really begin to sprout with the help of one of the wildest characters I ever met. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Here's your call to Hartford, Mr. Dollar. Go ahead, please. Hello? Pat McCracken. What'd you get me out of bed for this time? I'm calling from the airport in Dallas. Does that mean you're going on to Nicaragua? Yep. All right, then I know why you're calling. The answer is no, we still haven't found any trace of Constance Lanfear. So why don't you come on back here and start from scratch? Because I have found some trace of Connie Lanfear. Oh, it's Connie now, huh? It sure is, brother. And what's that supposed to mean? Pat, she just happened to occupy a seat aboard the plane right next to mine. Look, Johnny, why don't you work on the facts of the case for a change instead of on the woman involved? Patrick, ever hear of killing two birds with one stone? <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Bluefields, Nicaragua to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Sea Legs matter. Expense account item 8, 525. Late supper at the Dallas airport for Connie and myself during the wait for our midnight plane to Mexico City, which we finally boarded and which finally took off. And on this trip, I learned no more, no less from Connie than I had on the flight from New York to Dallas. For instance... Doug and I were so close in everything. Same friends, the same interests. That's why we always took the long yachting trips together. Did everything together. As a matter of fact, I felt that her somewhat overdone assurances of how much she loved her late husband could have been to throw off any suspicion I might have that she'd done him in. Another, for instance... I still can't get over the coincidence of our both deciding to go to Nicaragua at the same time. But believe me, Johnny, Mr. Dollar, I'm... Just as anxious to clear up this whole thing as you are. The more I thought about it, the more certain I was that it was not just coincidence that had put her on the same plane with me, and the more leery I felt. I know the country so well, too. I think I told you the Sea Legs was built in a small shipyard in San Juan del Paro. That's south of Bluefields. Yeah, that's at the lower end of the East Coast, isn't it? You do know something about Nicaragua, don't you? Oh, uh, only what I've seen on the maps. Oh, now, let's see. We can get a plane from Managua to the East Coast? Oh, yes. Nicaragua boasts two or three commercial airlines. I'm sure at least one of them makes a direct flight to Bluefields. Uh, that's where we put in with the sea legs, you know, before... Before she was... Before the beautiful thing went down between those awful Boldero Islands. And took your husband with her. Oh. Yes. Poor Doug. There it was again. More apparent concern over the loss of the sea legs than over the husband she claimed to have loved so much. And still no explanation of why she decided to go back to Nicaragua. Her decision must have been sudden, too, right after I'd seen her at her home on Long Island. From Mexico City, we took a deluxe four-engine plane to Managua. But the last leg to the city of Bluefields was in a two-engine something that looked like war surplus tied together with bailing wire. At midnight, we signed in at the Providencia Hotel and after a hearty meal, retired to our respective rooms to make up for lost sleep. I had not planned to wake up at 6 a.m., but fate decreed otherwise. Huh? Huh, what? Ha-ha! You're stealing bat. Yeah, sure. Just a minute, I'll get up and open the door. Uh, No, 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 do not disturb yourself, dear sir. Huh? There, you see, there was no need to disturb yourself. Well, now, just a minute. Who are you? Oscar Patrick Vladimir Poschiaro. At your service. Oscar Patrick, what? Hey, you, my dear Mr. Dollar, may just call me Oscar, now that we are working together. Working together? Whatever you... Welcome to Nicaragua. And no matter what your needs, I, Oscar Patrick Vladimir Poschiaro, will provide them for you. Uh, For a small financial pittance, of course. (laughs) Here, let me straighten your pillow. Hey, look, wait. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Where did you get the key you just used to open this door? (laughs) As you can see, Mr. Dollar, I am prepared for everything. That is why I can be of such unestimable service to you. Oh, now, who the devil is that? The breakfast I ordered for you, of course. 
Ah, here, my good man. I will take the tray. <laughs> you may collect the tips some other time. Get lost. Is this a gag of some kind? Mr. Dollar, how can you say such a thing? After I just saved you paying that menial servant a big tip. Uh, here now. Uh, tomato juice, orange juice, cream, chippy fun, toast, oh, eggs, oh. Benedict, lamb chops, scrambled eggs, little sausages, toast, honey, jam, and coffee. You expect me to eat all of that? If I am to be of help to you in this important campaign, I must keep my strength up. Oh, I beg your pardon. And at my expense, of course. Of course. After all, nowhere else in Central America can you get such invaluable help as I can give you. Yeah, well, just what gives you the idea I may need your help? Aha, uh-huh. a good question. Oh, here, let me prop you up on your pillow so that you can enjoy this delectable food. I see. There you are. Oh, now, the cheap beef and toast. It doesn't look so good this morning, so I shall take that. And the lamb chops. Oscar, will you please... Uh, now, no, to business. While you enjoy your breakfast, that is. No, 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 please don't wait for me, Mr. Dollar. Look, to begin with, how did you know my name? Ah! easy. You signed the hotel register. Okay, but then how did you and know? who has not heard of the famous freelancing insurance instigator with such a lovely, big, fat expense account, huh? Lucky man. Ah, so that's what appealed to you. Yeah, of course. And who am I, Oscar Patrick Vladimir Pascara? Yeah. Exactly. Who am I that I shouldn't learn a couple of tricks or two from such a great man? Oh, brother, <laughs> seems to me you've learned plenty already. Thank you. And that is why I should be of such magnitudinous assistance to you in the ceilings matter. For a pittance, you understand. Yeah. <laughs> Say, a uh, hundred dollars a day. <laughs> How about ten? Ninety. Twenty, then. Uh, Seventy. Forty? Uh, Thirty. Uh, Fifty? Uh, Twenty a day and not one penny more. <laughs> Sorry, Oscar, but you are not hired. Oh, Mr. Dollar, you bleed me to the quick. How else could you solve this case without me? Do you really know something about the sea legs? And how did you know I came here to investigate it? In the second place, what else would such a distinguished instigator be doing than the case of the American boat lost in the Bulldara Islands, especially coming here with Mrs. Lanthier? All right, go on. And in the first place, because I know all about it. All right, all right, Oscar, tell me this. Do you think there's anything phony about the loss of the sea legs? I am sure of it. It was a crime of the first and second water. Why? Because you are here. Oh, you can do better than that. All right. Because I am always sure there is something crooked going on until the guilty ones are proved otherwise or until the innocent ones are proved whatever is left, which is besides the point because I was sure of it in the first place. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, the first thing for you to do is make a trip to Portogado. The last point of contact with the sea legs before she was wrecked. Exactly. I have a plane ready and waiting for your own personal use. A plane? Yeah. How else? 150 miles by ox cart? Or, or, or both? Well, no, no, no. First, however, I'd like to contact the authorities here in Bluefield. Whee, what do the authorities know about crime? Me, I know all about it. Yeah, I'm beginning to think you do, Oscar. Too much, probably. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. I respect your high opinion of myself. All right. I don't know yet what your racket is, but... <laughs> that I can make plain to you in two words. Money. Okay, look. If you can get me a small plane... Here, good, sir, is the address to give to the taxi driver when you are ready to go to the airfield, where I shall be waiting for you. Oh? Not the big airport? No, 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 no. That is where the lady, Mrs. Lanther, would expect you to look for transportation. Asker, you are the craziest. Thank you. I, I, I knew you wouldn't want her coming along, and if she ever gets in your way during your campaign... You'll keep her out of my way. Yes. At my expense. What else? I'll tell you something, Oscar. If there is a wrong angle to this case, I can't help wondering if she isn't a part of it. You read my mind. You see, we are like brothers under the chin. You say you have a plane all ready to go, A huh? charter plane. Then we can be on our way before Mrs. Lamphy knows we've left. Hey, you want to set the tray over there so I can get up? Oh, yes, of course. I'll set it right over here on the... Hmm? Hey, wait a minute. What are you going through my pockets for? Oh, just accepting a small tip for bringing up your breakfast. <laughs> Thank you. If only half of what Oscar said was true, it was conceivable that he could be of help to me. I checked with the hotel manager and the local police. They knew Oscar well and told me that he pretty much lived on the occasional American tourist who showed up. That he acted as guide, chauffeur, pilot, anything for a price. That he could be trusted implicitly by whoever happened to be paying him at the moment. And, which was important to me, he knew the country and its people inside out was a font of information about anything and anybody. So I decided to let him tag along for a while. 
The Federal Maritime, uh, well, the equivalent of our Coast Guard, had headquarters in the harbor area, and I found a captain there who spoke fair English. I'm sorry, said your dollar, but you know as much as we do. We sent a boat, of course, but we find no sign of the sea legs or the poor people who go down with her. Nothing. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking of going up to Porto Gardo, where she took off on her last trip, you know. Excellent idea. From there, you can uh, fly out to the Boldaro Islands where the wreck did occur. Now, that's what I was thinking of. But in addition to an airplane, you must uh, also need a pilot and a guide. You have someone to suggest? I see. There is but one. Senor Oscar Patrick Vladimir Pascaro. Precisely. Item nine, 20 cents American for a three-mile ride and an old Model T Ford to the little private airstrip where, true to his word, Oscar had rented an almost brand-new two-place plane for us. He had it warmed up and ready to go. So fasten your belt, Mr. Dollar, relax, and enjoy it that little takeoff. You sure you can fly this thing, Oscar? Ha! Ah, I am the finest pilot in Nicaragua, maybe in the whole world. I'm even a co-pilot. Yeah. Just how much is the use of this plane costing me, Oscar? For me, a special rate, so don't worry about it. Here we go, into the... How mile. much? Well, the usual price is $35 a day, American. But me, I always have a deal. And that's on account of I give the field so much business. So now that that is said... Oscar, how much? $45 a day. Hey, do you see what a beautiful view we have from... 45 Look! The bay and the Caribbean on one side, and the flat, empty marshes and plains on the now, other. Now, wait a minute, and look. There, if $35 down. a day is a regular rate, what's so special about 45 for me? Oh, no, Mr. Dollar. For me. Surely you wouldn't expect the finest pilot in the whole entire world to work for nothing. Why, you... Okay, okay. But what took you so long getting to the airfield, Mr. Dollar? Oh, a couple of calls I wanted to make us all. Why? Why, you have disappointed me. And all the time, I thought you had the uttermost confidence in me. Now, what's that supposed to mean? First, you tell me you do not want the lady to know you're awake and up and going. Mrs. Lanfear? Yes. And then what happens? You tell her all about it. What makes you think that? Why else would she come tearing out to the airfield while I was waiting for you? Wait a minute. To rent herself a plane and take off in it. What? She took off just a couple of minutes before we did. <laughs> Honey Lanfear, chartering a plane. Why? And to go where? And after her offer to stick by me and help me, why would she do it without letting me know? There were a lot of questions to be answered in this case, and most of them to be answered by Connie Lanfear. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the sea, the rocks, and dear old Mother Nature bring some pretty startling facts to light. And the case takes a sudden twist. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
of Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. You hear me? Johnny Dollar calling. This is Pat McCracken of the Universal Adjustment Bureau. What in the... Hi, so- Patsy. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, what kind of a noisy hookup is this anyway? Pat, this call is being relayed to you from an amateur radio station. Well, next time, try the telephone. From Puerto Garda, Nicaragua? Oh, now you're coming in quite clearly. A port of what? It's a little spot on the Caribbean coast, the last port of call for the sea legs before she was wrecked. Mrs. Douglas Landfair still with you? No, and I don't know where she's gone, which is why I called. So? She acted just as surprised as I was that we both took the same plane down here. And Pat, I still don't know why she decided to come here at all. Maybe she doesn't like the idea of your going down there to investigate the case. She wouldn't admit it, of course, but that's what I think. You think she may try to obstruct your investigation? Right now, I don't know. Because she suddenly chartered a small plane and disappeared. To work her way back here to the States? Ah, uh, your guess is as good as mine. Look, why don't you hire a watch on her place on Long Island? And if she shows there, call me at the Hotel Providencia. It's in the city of Bluefield. Nicaragua. Right. In any event, you think her claims for insurance on the sea legs and on Douglas Landfair are fraudulent. Pat, at this point, I don't know what to think. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location San Juan del Perro, Nicaragua to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenditures and report of activities during my investigation of the sea legs matter. Pat, I lied to you during that radio contact a few minutes ago. I do think Connie Lanfear's claims for $400,000 insurance are fraudulent. Fraudulent as the very devil. But just why I think so is beyond me. At any rate, the assistant who's foisted himself on me down here is a real weirdy whose name, believe it or not, is Oscar Patrick Vladimir Pasquero. He rented a plane and has flown me here to Puerto Gardo, a half-baked little town on Nicaragua's east coast. Here is where a radio amateur made the last contact with the sea legs before it smashed up and sank off the Baldero Islands. And who is the operator of this ham station? Oscar Patrick Vladimir Pasquero. You such a long talker, Mr. Dollar. I, I'm cranking this generator until my arm is nearly dropping off. Well, I'm sorry, Oscar, but that contact with the States was important. Even my back is tired. Ah, I know. I'll make an expense account to you. Uh, say, uh, $10? You try that, and I'll fly back to Bluefields without you. Oh, please, Mr. Dollar, no joking, please. Who's joking? But without me, you would be a lost soul in this vile country. Hey, tell me something. Why did you ever set up a transmitter in this isolated fishing village? I should set it up in Bluefields? Ha! Ah, they even wanted me to have some kind of license up there. Disgusting. And a waste of money, too. Now, that reminds me. Do you have a pilot's license? Who needs a pilot's license when those little planes practically fly themselves? Besides, a pilot's license costs money, too. Well, I have one. So from here on in, I stay at the controls. No confidence in me. No confidence in you. What a smirch on the good name of Oscar. Okay, okay. Now, let's get out to that flat where you parked the plane. I want to fly over the spot where the sea legs went down. <laughs> you see how invaluable I am? Huh? Without me, you wouldn't even know where to look for the Boldaro Islands. You know darn well. All I have to do is look at the charts in the cockpit of the plane. But, Mr. Dollar, that wouldn't be fair. The Balderos turned out to be only six or eight miles offshore. Two narrow little rocky islands that poked up out of the sea to keep each other company in the vast, quiet blue expanse. One of them was perhaps a mile long, and the other, just a couple of hundred yards away and stretching parallel to it, was even smaller. Sure, to a man at the wheel who was unfamiliar with these waters and without charts, the Balderos could conceivably be a menace to navigation. In the dark of the night, that is. Oscar. Yes, sir? Do you remember what time of day it was when the sea legs went down? Of course, I remember anything. Names, dates, places. Well, how about the sea legs? Of course, I was talking to her by radio. Well? Such a lovely day, too, just like today. And you know Mr. Lanter even promised to take me fishing after we finished the radio contact testing? What time? He even promised we would... Oh, 
Uh, it was exactly 10.21 a.m. when the radio signal from the yacht suddenly cut off. You're sure of that? Yes, sir. We were talking away back and forth and then... Pip! Nothing. 10.21. One question, a couple of real good answers. A day like today meant it was clear and calm. And 10.21 a.m. and full daylight. The Balderos must have stuck out like a sore thumb. Hang on, Oscar. I'm going to make a tight circle over those islands for a closer look. You sure you wouldn't like for me to steer, Mr. Dollar? I'm sure. But if you do all the work, how am I ever going to earn the handsome restrainer you're going to pay me? Wait a minute. Yes, sir? That channel between the islands is as smooth as a mill pond. Sure, it always is, except during a storm. And so clear you can see way down into it. Oscar, I thought there were a lot of pinnacles of rock sticking up in that channel. Oh, maybe at low tide, one or two on the east side, very shallow, uh, otherwise, like you see it now. And what's supposed to make the channel so dangerous? The current that runs through it when the tide is changing, Mr. Dollar, it's how you say, uh, uh, ideally, li- like now, when the tide is coming in. Enough to wreck a boat like the sea legs? If the skipper wasn't watching the road, you should see how the current wobbles and squirms. Hey, look! There's a packing case down there floating around. You you see? First one direction, then the other. Shifting around like a crazy. Yeah. Oscar, I think that packing case is going to be a big help to us. Yeah, maybe there's something in it that might be worth money or something. Oh, stop thinking of money. Then how? We're going to see just where the current delivers that packing case. You want to know where that packing case will be ending up? That's what I said. Then steer back to Porta Gardo, to the beach in front of my superlative radio station. Huh? Sure. How else do you think I got all the lumber and furniture and stuff from my radio shack? He was right. From the air, we could see that every bit of flotsam passing through the Baldero Island Channel on a rising tide wound up in the tiny cove on the shallow sandbar directly in front of Oscar's radio shack. Even now, it was piled high with crates, bits of ship's rigging, odd pieces of furniture. That junk stay down there forever, Oscar? Ah, no, Mr. Dollar. Once a month, a real big high tide comes along and presto. I have a clean front yard again. Uh, but I always make a trip up here before then. What do you mean? Sure, that's why I'm Nicaragua's A number one beach brusher. Oh, stop being corny. What do you mean, beachcomber? So I have to brush the sand off everything I pick up down there. So you didn't laugh. What do I care? Anyhow, you should see some of the valuable things I pick up to sell to the natives. Well, tell me, two years ago, when the Landfair's other boat went down. Ha, ha, you should have seen it. Everything that could float ended right up in my front yard. It was beautiful. How about when the sea legs was wrecked? You know, that's very funny, Mr. Dollar. There was nothing. Nothing at all. I, I don't understand it. Well, I think I do. I think I'm beginning to understand a lot of things about this case. Hang on, Oscar. We're flying back to Bluefield. Expense account item 12, 30 cents American. Taxi from the private airport where we'd rented the plane to the headquarters of the Federal Maritime. I never will get that straight. Call it the Coast Guard and Captain Ramirez. Si, senor. On uh, July, the... Uh, ah, here it is. Uh, the date... And at 10.21, Captain. Huh? See, the tide at 10.21 was just after what you call uh, neap. So it was neat. It was pretty. What does that mean? Oh, shut up, Oscar. Yeah, I see, Captain. Neap tide at 9.40. So it was coming in, rising, huh? Yes, yes, senor dollar. Uh, rising right. up. <laughs> Good. Thanks, Captain. Here, buy yourself a cigar. Buy yourself a whole box. Uh, gracias, senor. Gracias. Come on, Oscar. Sure, Mr. Dollar. Nothing for me? Later. Come on, we're going back to the airfield. And from there, we're going to fly down the coast again. Yeah, but, Mr. Dollar... And I feel so good, I may even let you fly that plane this time. Yeah, for a small pittance, even? For a small pittance, even. Now, drag out your best dialect and call that taxi over here. Mm-hmm. Item 13, six bucks for the Capitan. Item 14, 50 cents taxi back to the airfield. Mm-hmm. For some reason, the fare in the old Model T went up every time I used it. Or did Oscar wink some kind of a deal with a driver that he could cut in on later? Item 15 and another 45 bucks for rental of the plane, and I'm sure it all went into Oscar's pocket, that his knowledge of the language enabled him to persuade the owner we shouldn't pay two rentals in one day. We headed south and made good time. But where are we going? Another few minutes and you'll be down to Costa Rica. What's that little seaport straight ahead? San Juan del Perro. 
And according to this map, it has a more than adequate landing field. Look, do you see what I see down there on it? Yeah, exactly what I hope to see. The twin of this plane. The plane in which Mrs. Landfair disappeared this morning. Now land right beside it. No sooner said than my name is Oscar Patrick Vladimir Pascaro. Don't these little fields have any personnel? Ha! If they get two planes a month, they think it's a crowd. Yeah, but there must be somebody. There's a car back of the hangar. Good. Then we'll have transportation into town. You still haven't told me why you decided to come here. Was it because Mrs. Lanter did? That was something I didn't know until I saw that plane down there. All right, easy now. Don't land too close to it. I am in perfect control. Here we go. No, Oscar, it was a hunch. Based on the fact I remembered that the Sea Lakes was built in this town. Hey, nice landing. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. Uh, maybe a little extra bonus for such a good if job. If you don't stop landing. talking about money, you're going to have to find yourself a... Seem like crazy. Is, isn't there someone in the cabin on that other plane? Hey, the car, it's coming over to meet us. Hey, watch it, Oscar. That darn fool is heading right across that landing plane. Huh? Come the engine. He is. He crazy. Can't he see us? Hey, swing high, but don't flip us. Come on, more throttle. He is already there. Let's straighten out. Take off. I can't. What do I do? What do I do? Let me hit those controls and hang on. Here he comes. He'll hit our gear. Hang on. Oh, hang on. For a long moment, there was nothing but a vague blackness all about me, and the sound of our crack-up seemed to roll and echo almost dreamily back and forth in the deep recesses of my mind. Then, slowly, hazily, I hear... I seem to hear some of the sound. Yeah, like an engine, far off. An engine of a plane starting up and lazily moving away. Sure, yeah, of course I did hear it. It was the other plane, the one that had been parked on the landing strip. Then as my mind began to clear, I realized I'd seen something, someone else. I'd caught a glimpse before the car struck our landing gear of the man behind the wheel of it. A man whose picture I'd seen briefly at the home of Constant Landfair. But it couldn't be. Oh, Mr. Dollar... Am I still alive? Yeah, Oscar. I'm afraid you are. Uh, thank you. But did you... Oh! Uh, did you see who was driving that car? Yeah. Oh. You recognize him? Look, maybe they're both dead, like he is. And that's why we saw him. Douglas Lanfear? Yes, sir. Mr. Douglas Lanfear. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the dark back streets of San Juan del Perro yield some valuable information and a threat of sudden death. And believe me, it isn't an idle threat. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Alguien le llama de los Estados Unidos. Ah. Johnny? Yes. Pat McCracken, Universal Adjustment in Hartford. Oh, hi, Pat. Now listen, as you requested, I had a man sent out to Mrs. Lanfear's Long Island home to see if she'd returned. I suspicion wrong, Pat. She's still here, very much so. Will you listen? Shoot. The man was a little overambitious. Let himself into the house through a basement window. So? While he was there, the telephone rang. He wasn't crazy enough to answer it. Crazy like a fox. It was long distance from right where you are now, San Juan del Perro. And Johnny, I suspect it was from the man on whose policy she's made a claim for a quarter million dollars. Her dear departed husband, Douglas Lanford. Right. And if so, her claim on him, at least, is fraudulent. So see if you can dig up some proof. Brother, I have it. The man is anything but dead. Huh? It was Douglas Lanfear who wrecked our plane when we tried to land here a few hours ago. And Johnny, get him. Sure. If he doesn't get me first. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location San Juan del Perro, Nicaragua, to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Sea Legs matter. $250,000 insurance claimed by Mrs. Constant Lanfear for the death of Douglas Lanfear. An additional $150,000 for the loss of the yacht, the Sea Legs. Claim number one now proved to be fraudulent. As for number two, the claim on the yacht? Expense account item 14, two dollars American. To the banana plantation worker who pulled us out of the small plane that Douglas Landfair wrecked as we tried to land. And another dollar to said plantation worker for a ride into town in his ancient truck. I must admit that this is one time that my ubiquitous assistant, Oscar Patrick Vladimir Pasquero, came in handy through his knowledge of the Spanish-Indian dialects spoken in these parts. Apparently, San Juan del Perro had once been a fairly busy little seaport. But over a period of years, the sea had slowly, inexorably washed in shallow sandbars, and only a handful of small cargo and fishing boats now negotiated the narrow channels that led out to the Blue Caribbean. The town itself was scattered around a small marketplace near the docks. There were a few stone and brick buildings, including the San Andrea Hotel, but most of them were weather-beaten frame structures. An occasional aged American car kicked up the dust, but most of the street traffic was ox carts. Item 15, $2 American, to a doctor with an unpronounceable name who came to our room at the San Andre and patched us up. And about 7 p.m. he left after instructing us to spend the rest of the night in bed. Item 16, another $2 for a sumptuous dinner brought to our room. American dollars, I learned, go far in this place. Unless, of course, Oscar gets his hands on them. You should let me handle all the bills for you while you're here in Nicaragua, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, sure, and let you take a 50% commission on all of them, huh? No, thanks. Oh, but, Mr. Dollar, I'm... When the poor fellow who rented us that plane to get down here starts patching it up, my expense account is going to take a big enough beating. Have no fear. I will supervise the repairs on the plane myself. Yeah, for a small pittance. Yeah, of course. Ah. Uh, uh, what a wonderful dinner. Now, to sleep it off. Well, you sleep all you want to. I got work to do. Work? Yeah. Hey, besides, you still haven't told me why we flew down here in the first place. I still don't understand. Listen, Oscar, a couple of years ago, Landfair lost a power cruiser off the Baldero Islands. I know. I told you I helped him and his wife and his captain get to shore. He collected $85,000 for that boat from his insurance company. I saw the boat. It was worth the 85000 So he should have insured it for more. Maybe 100000 Made himself a profit. Yeah, a very poor businessman. Would you listen? The ease of collecting on that loss must have given him ideas. What's more he could do with some money? The parental estate was running low. Anyhow, a few weeks ago, he brings a yacht, a motor sailor down here. The sea lakes. Right. This one's insured for 150000 And his own life is insured for a quarter million. Uh-huh. Maybe he's not such a bad businessman after all. He takes the sea lakes out to the very same place where he lost the first boat. This time, he leaves his wife ashore. 
He and the skipper go out alone, presumably to check on some new radio equipment he's installed. Sure, we made the radio contact from my own personal sender on shore at Porto Gardo. But the contact was suddenly cut off. I heard it. And the next thing we know, Mrs. L is back at her home on Long Island claiming a total of 400000 Well, why not if she thought he went down with the boat? Because I don't think she did. What's more, I'm uh, going to prove... Uh, of course I knew it all the time. Because if he drowned off the Boldara Islands, what was he doing here today, driving the car that wrecked our plane? Unless he was dead. And do you know something, Mr. Dollar? I don't believe it. Oscar, there was somebody in the cabin of that other plane waiting to take off with him after he smashed our landing gear. You didn't see who? No, but I'll give you odds it was constant land fear. Another thing, she said that when the sea legs went down, she heard it go over the radio. You said that the signal just suddenly cut off. Mr. Dollar... You don't think the yacht was wrecked at all? Not any more than I think Landfair went down with it. Then where is it? Well, I have a hunch it's right here in San Juan del Perro. Yes, but wouldn't everybody know the boat? Oh, Oscar, one of the oldest insurance rackets in the world is to fake a shipwreck, take the hull to some obscure foreign port, dress it up a new paint and rigging, then put it to sea again. Now, why didn't I think of such a good Now, if I remember story? rightly, I spotted a couple of old shipyards down here when we circled the land. Uh, yeah, sure, but there's only one that does any work. Do you know where it is? Of course I do. <laughs> You see how invaluable I am to you? Then that's where we're going right now. Uh, but, Mr. Dollar, what if you do find the boat? What do you mean? If Mr. Landfield has already flew the goose. He, he took off in that other plane after we cracked up. Look, we'll take things as they come along. Right now, while we're here, I want to look for that yacht. I saw an excellent picture of it, and I'm sure if I find it, I can identify it. And if we do find it? We will have twice the case against the Landfairs. Mr. Dollar... Mr. Dollar, I am fortunate to be working for such a sterling, silver, 14 carat genius for the most outstanding, intelligent... Get your hands out of my pockets. There's one other thing I'd like to find. One person, unless Landfair murdered him. Who? His one-man crew. Oh, Raymond Gonzalez. The, the same man as on the first trip. Well, if he was allowed to live through the first wreck, he was probably in cahoots with Landfair and therefore is still around. Would you recognize him if you saw him? Maybe so, maybe not. The, the first trip, he was big and fat. Uh, the second trip, he was skinnier. He, he wore a beard on his face. If he's changed again, yeah. Oh, you're a lot of help. I thought you never forgot a name or a face. But, Mr. Dollar, him I never made any money off of. <sighs> well, come on, get into your clothes and let's prowl around the shipyard. <laughs> It was only a few minutes after eight, but the town was practically asleep, except for an old saloon down near the docks. Quietly, so not to disturb the snoozing night clerk, we let ourselves out of the hotel and headed for the waterfront. The night was clear and moonlit, so we had no trouble finding the way. I glanced hopefully into the open door of the dockside saloon as we passed it, and I chuckled at the incongruity of the music blurring away. But of course, saw no one that... Wait a minute, Oscar. Yes, sir? At that table in there, drinking beer. Hey, can one of them be the Raymond Gonzalez you mentioned? So who can tell from here? In San Juan del Perro, there must be a hundred who are skinny and wear a dirty little beard on their face. Could you tell from close up? Sure. What, he recognize you? So what? Well, it might not be very healthy for you. Ah, Mr. Dollar, working on an important campaign for you, my dearest friend, I would gladly lay down my life for you. For a small pittance, of course. Of course. Anyhow, how would he know I am working for you? Okay, okay then. Saunter in and take a look. Okay. I'll wait right here. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh... <laughs> it's a, a, a nice uh, weather we're having, huh? <laughs> es buen día, no? no? <clears throat> well, 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 if it isn't my old pal, Ramon Gonzalez. <laughs> uh, how are you, Ramon? Yes, Rafael. Me, a stranger? Why, I am one of your oldest and dearest friends. El mi amigo, remember? Salgate, extranjero. Get out. But I am Oscar Patrick Vladimir Pesquero. You know, just a fine old Spanish name. Who helped you ashore that time when you... you... No, 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 no. Uh, put on that bottle. Salga, lárgate de aquí, o si no te mato. No, no, no. Te mato. Uh, 
Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I don't think they'd like you to interrupt their little beer party. He threatened me that I might. He said he would kill me. Is he Ramon Gonzalez? Who? Yeah, oh, yes, yes, I'm sure of it. You see, Mr. Dollar, he did not go down with the ship. You're telling me. Well, aren't you going to do something about him? Later, if I locate the sea lakes. Cautiously, quietly, looking back over my shoulder now, we prowl through the old shipyard. And finally, led by the smell of fresh paint, I found it. The once clean white hull was painted a gaudy red and blue. And given the appearance of age, the mahogany rail and taffrail had been replaced with iron pipe. The beautiful teakwood deck painted a dirty gray. The wheelhouse had been moved, the cabin altered, even the mast, bowsprit, and general rigging changed. Stanchions, cleats, all the hardware that had once been polished bronze was now corroded or painted over. All in all, a quick, very thorough job of disguise, of change, from a graceful, expensive yacht to a rather weary-looking fishing schooner. But it was the sea legs, all right. I would never believe it, Mr. Dollar. I, I, I never would have recognized it. Are you sure? Wind your hand over the transom here. Hmm? You can feel where the lettering has been painted over. Hey, don't strike it much, so I can see. Better not. Somebody... That's too late now. But do you see where the outline of the lettering is underneath this last coat of paint? Sea lakes. But it was such a beautiful boat. And now it looks like... Like a dirty old tramp. <sighs> well, what do we do now? Go back to that saloon and latch on to Ramon Gonzalez. Make him talk. Sure. Only, uh, I... <laughs> I'll wait for you. Huh? Well, he's so big and strong, Mr. Dollar, and, and that knife in his belt. Why, I thought you said you'd lay down your life. Uh, sure, sure, I... But what could he tell you that you don't already know now? Where the land first headed when they took off in that plane. Come on. But I... Okay, you lead. Alto, senor. Uh -huh. Mr. Dollar, it's him. If you like the man, so show me the way. Gracias. I was afraid of that. Look, the knife in his hand. Oscar, if he makes one move to throw it, pull the trigger. Trigger? What Yo, trigger? Have I, I good? No, 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 I swear I... But I have a couple of fists. Uh -huh. Well, let's bring him in. Bring him to so I can question him. No, 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 no. Let, 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 let's get out of here. Please, Mr. Dollar. He, he may have a friend around. Quite right, Oscar. He has. And this one carries a gun aimed straight at Mr. Dollar's back. Well, well. Mrs. Lamphere. Surprised, Johnny? Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, sometimes when you wind up a case, things take a turn, a sudden switch that makes you wish you hadn't won. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Captain Ramirez in Brookfield. Hello, Captain. Thanks for returning my call. Oh, you are now in San Juan del Perro? Yeah. Oh, soon you will know Nicaragua as well. Yeah, listen, Captain, I need your help. Can you get a plane down here for me? The one we bought has been wrecked. Oh, see, si, Senor Dollar. And if I were you, I'd come along with it. I, But I... A nice chance to add to your laurels, Captain, by making a couple of arrests. Criminal? Yeah. One of them a killer. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action tactic sense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location San Juan del Perro, Nicaragua, the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is the final accounting of expenses and report on my investigation of the Sea Legs matter. <laughs> Expense account item 18, one dollar American. Phone call to Captain Jose Ramirez to the Federal Maritime. Uh, I still can't spell it. Call it the Coast Guard. But a lot of things happened before I could make that call. Like the fast plane trip that we made to San Juan del Perro in the hope of finding the yacht, the Sea Lake, despite a big insurance claim based on its alleged loss at sea. Like the fact that our plane was wrecked for us by one Douglas Lanfair, despite a big claim based on his alleged death at sea. Like our discovery of the yacht, carefully altered and repainted in an old shipyard. Our discovery of Ramon Gonzalez, a member of the crew who was supposed to have gone down with it. Mr. Dollar, let's get out of here. Oh, no, Oscar. Not until I revive this Gonzalez character and make him talk. You must even have a friend around. Quite right, Oscar. Yeah. Huh? Right. And with a gun and save Mr. Dollar's back. Well, well. Connie Lancer. Fine. Done. Not particularly. Done, sir. I won't hesitate to pull this trigger. No. No, I guess you wouldn't. So you found the sea leg. Did you ask to help you? Oh, then you're familiar with Oscar Patrick's Vladimir Pascal. Ask him, the chiseling money grabber. Please, please, how can you say such a thing about such a Oh, shut up, Oscar. Thank you. Nice job you did at disguising the sea legs, Mrs. Lansfield. If Oscar hadn't shown me where to find it, my husband and I would have it out to sea again. A new pose under a new Oh, yeah, and... sure, one of the oldest games in the business. And in the meantime, you would have collected $150,000 on a supposed loss. In addition to a quarter million on your husband, Douglas. Why did you have to come along, Jim? I'm afraid you asked for it when you filed your claim. Four hundred thousand dollars. We've had to. We were in trouble. Oh, sure, because you spent every nickel you could get your hands on. No. You inherited the estate. I told Douglas. Oh, yeah, sure. All his fault. It's true. Well, that ain't the way I heard it. And I don't intend to believe it any more than I believe a couple of things you told me on the plane down here. You don't understand. Nobody has to lie. But remember how you sobbed as you told about the last radio contact with your husband when, as you put it, you could hear the rocks grinding away at the hull and the water pouring in overside as he desperately fought for his life. Johnny, please. Well, I heard it a little different from Oscar here. The radio signal was suddenly cut off. That's all. No fancy sound effects, nothing. Oscar told you that. And what rocks, by the way, that smashed the sea legs? I flew out to the Baldero Islands and tried to find them. They were as non-existent as the wreckage that should have washed ashore in the Valdero current. I'm beginning to see some things, Johnny. The mate or skipper or whatever you want to call him, who was supposed to have been with your husband, has been lost with a boat, Ramon Gonzalez. Well, as you can see, he wasn't quick enough when he attacked us here a minute ago, and I had to get a little rough with him. Johnny! If you're having a gun pointing at my back, stop kidding, Connie. You know more Johnny, about... Johnny, look out! Right. 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 <laughs> you were too good for him. Well, a lot of help you were. That is nice. Huh? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I think I'd better have it, Oscar, because... Well, I see Connie Lanzer made a hasty exit from the scene. She did? Well, what do you know about that? You didn't see her leave? Well, it's so dark in this old shipyard, and I was so worried about you, dear Mrs. Oliver. Why don't you you should be. Plenty worried. Huh? Look, why don't we get out of this? I needed only two things when I came down here, Oscar. Proof, both of them. Why don't we get out of this dreary place, Mr. Dollar? Let's talk someplace else. Somewhere there's lies. Oh, shut up and listen. Thank you. I found them both now. 
Proof that Douglas Lansley never died in a wreck of the sea legs, and proof that the sea legs was never wrecked at all. Except for a couple of details, the case is closed. One of those details is you. Me? Oh, you mean paying me for all the unvaluable help I've been... Oh, how nice. I think it intended to be... Oscar, I'm going to lay the cards right on the table. And the money? I'll find it cleaned Now, listen to me. Connie Lansley slipped away during our little ruckus here. But you could have stopped her as easily as you could have stopped this Gonzalez character from jumping with you. She, she, she said she had a gun. A bluff. She didn't. But you did. Me? Oh, Mr. Dollar, I was... I spotted scared. that bulge under your left arm the minute you appeared in my hotel room that first morning. Well, don't reach for it because I'm carrying one, too. Mr. Dollar, dear, I don't understand... Well, I do, now. I've wondered from the beginning just why you insisted on sticking so close to me from the minute I arrived here in Nicaragua. All right. I will tell you the truth. The whole truth. Even if it costs me a small, slight percentage of an election piece, you're going to pay me for the unestimable assistance I've been giving you. Ask him. You just won't give up, with you? The money. It's not what it is. The money. Like I get from all the Americans who come here to Nicaragua. Only from you it was not for sightseeing, guiding, but for all the help. Like, for instance, the money you've been getting from the Lancers. I cannot tell a lie, Mr. Dollar. I did get some money from Mr. and Mrs. Lancer, you know, for various and sundry services when first they came here. But by now, including the use of my radio center, you see, if I hadn't known they would pay me well for the using of my radio... Your unlicensed My radio. unlicensed radio, because the license cost too much. I, I would never have been able to know about the wreck that didn't happen and so skillfully lead you to the Bogara Islands and all the clues that, that I... Yeah, you know what I mean. What you really mean, Oscar, is that you expected a lot more from them if their crazy plan to collect on the insurance policies worked out. You sure? Because no, no, Mr. Dollar. No, I was only trying to help you. Think, Mr. Dollar, about all the things I've told you about. You were careful not to tell me a single thing that I wouldn't have learned anyway. Oh, Mr. Dollar. You Why did you insist you... right off the bat that we fly to Puerto Gardo, for instance? Why, I... Apparently, they helped me for a small pittance, of course. <laughs> but actually, it was to keep me out of the way while Constant Lansfield made contact with her husband here in San Juan del Perro. Oh, please, I, no doubt you I, worked that all out with her I, before you busted in on me that first morning. Then, when we did get to Porto Gardo, trying to prevent me from spotting the current would have taken any wreckage from the island to wash to the shore on the sandbar at Porto Gardo, if the sea legs had gone down. That, that, that isn't... No, no, no. I, I told you about that strong current of very dense. Sure you did. But only because you realized at that point that I couldn't help finding out about it anyway. Mr. Bauer, you're making a crook out of Making me. a crook of you? Well, I have this little item, aren't you? When we started to land our plane and Douglas Lanford came at us with his car, you know as well as I do that you could have avoided it. Kept us from snapping off our landing gear and crashing. Oh, oh it was nicely done, too so that you wouldn't get badly hurt, but still be up and around to collect from land here for it. Oh, 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 Mr. Dollar, how can you even implicate such a horrible thing? You, my dear, my undying Because friend. of your little suggestion along the way that I unfastened my seatbelt and relaxed while you, I noticed, kept yours tight, oh. one thing after another. Oh. And finally, of course, armed as you are, you not only let Gonzalez attack me, but you let Connie Lancer escape as well. And all for money. Money. That's all you've talked about. How did you figure to collect for all this? Oh, it's true. It's true. All my life in every country in the world, I've been... Whatever I have done has been because I love money. But I, I swear, Mr. Dollar, I would have never let them kill you. Because I do like you, Mr. Dollar. I, I almost... Mm -hmm. Even with all the money I could get from them, I almost gave it up. Yeah. For well, whatever you could get from me. Yes. And because you're such a nice man, I... I guess I'm not used to being around nice... Mr. Dollar. Well? Um, Mrs. Blanchard. What about her? Don't be too hard on her. The book of his dreams. She had such a strong hold over her. But if he treated her, sometimes I almost thought she 
wish to have gone down more rest of the boat. What are you talking about? She's still in it. Because by now she's so far in, she has just to give him, don't you see? Oh, yeah, I suppose that does make sense. All right, what else? That's all. I opened up my whole entire heart. Well, Mr. Dollar, for once in my life, I'm telling the truth. I thought maybe I could persuade you to pay me more than they could. Then I could be on your side, on the good side, just for one. But now, I, well, I guess I can only beg for your mercy. One thing you haven't told me, where Douglas Lanter is. You must know. Well, do you? Yes. Well, for maybe enough of a small pittance to get out of this country. Can't get over it, can you? Well, you haven't much of a choice this time. You will help me maybe just a little bit if, if I say. We'll see. I am leaving on um, hope, Mr. Dollar, so I will tell you. Mr. Lanthier. Mr. Lanthier is right here. Uh -huh. And well-armed officer, ready to blow your brains out for what you've just told us. You know the insurance investigator. Don't be careful, please. Mr. Dollar, he, he has a gun. Yeah, I see. So have you, Oscar. Yes. Yes, I have. Careful, Oscar. And if it is the last thing I do, the man who got me into this is going... Oh, no, you don't. Stop, stop, stop. No. 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 So, it was after that I called Captain Ramirez to the Federal Maritime. Yeah, it's Sunday, I'll that word. And let him take charge. Extradition proceedings for Connie are underway. The U.S. courts will have to take over with her. And Doug Lanthier's body is being shipped to the States. Oscar's body? Well, I left some money with Captain Ramirez for a decent burial. Expense account total? $841.95. Remarks? I wonder what kind of a deal Oscar Patrick Vladimir Foscaro was able to make at the pearly gates, or wherever he was headed. And you know something? I kind of hope it was a pretty... Well, at least I hope it wasn't too bad a deal. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Next week, the promise of romance in the arms of a lovely girl. And the threat of a knife in the back. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in our cast were Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dobkin, Virginia Gregg, Harley Bear, Don Diamond, and Russell Thorson. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Big Kelly, Johnny. Worldwide Mutual. How's your Spanish? CC, senior. Oh, mother told me there'd be days like this. One egg in your beer? I gotta be a linguist yet? You may have to be a lot more than that to unscramble this one. Tell me about it. Oh, uh, price is still the same, though. Get on over here, will you? Sure, but give me a little hint. I'd like to start worrying early. All right. Try this. William Billy Alder. The promoter? World's number one salesman? Up again, down again, Alder? The same. And at this point, he's up. Up to his ears in Venezuelan oil. We're carrying a quarter of a million life on him. Ooh, I'd settle for the premiums, Vic. How come you're worrying? You'd worry two carrying coverage that size. Especially with Alder behaving like he is. Like? Like changing his beneficiary five times in a month. What would you say that means? Means I'll be right over. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Alder matter. Expense account item one, $1.35. The price of being taxied to Vic Kelly's office at Worldwide Mutual. For a normally easygoing fella, Mr. K had a bad case of how did I ever get into this? $250,000. That's a big policy. Big. You look like the claim's already been filed. Smile a little, Dad. Yeah, sure. At least fill me in. How much do you know about Billy Alder? Oh, just surface stuff, what the headlines say. Promoter, wildcatter, super salesman. Fellow with a flair for selling anything. Why? Well, that's what's rough. I can't give you too much more than that. He's been in a dozen different businesses, headed up a half a dozen corporations, a couple of bankruptcies, even a nasty court case. He's been flat broke and six months later been a walking blue chip. Been up and down more times than a yo-yo. Oh, that's a nice life if you can take it. But, feast or famine, he does everything big. Like the quarter of a million policy, huh? Well, it didn't seem out of line three years ago. It still doesn't. Not with the kind of money he's dragging out of the ground in Venezuelan oil. Hey, uh, this changing of beneficiaries, when did it begin? A little over a month ago. In succession, it's been his wife, his daughter, a brother, back to the wife, and... Now it's his daughter again. <laughs> Sounds like a woman trying to make up her mind about a dress. Price tag's a little different. What does it sound like to you? Give me a chance to get down there and look, will you? Well, I mean off the top of your head. Oh, sounds like he's worried. Like he shouldn't buy any long-playing records. Look, Johnny, there's a clause in the policy that lets us investigate irregularities. Go take a look. Just don't expect him to cooperate. He's a big operator type fella. I don't know. I never met him, but I like him already. What? His style. Any man who uses a slogan like, we lose a little on each deal, but think of the volume. Well, he's for me. I got to keep him alive. (laughs) Expense account item two, $329.88. Airfare and incidentals to Caracas, Venezuela. It was about noon Sunday when the big plane lazed in over the Caribbean shoreline pointed its nose for the Magida Airport in Caracas. Below us spread what's laughingly called man's handiwork, his progress. A few short years ago, it had been nothing but lush green jungle. Then came men shouting the magic word oil, and the jungle was now disappearing as fast as they could throw up the derricks and sink the drills. Progress. A taxi to the Hotel Parayo and a good lunch adds up to item three, four bucks even. I was ready for business. Knocking around in this game, you learn a lot of ways to save steps. On another country deal, for instance, the local police chief is one person you can't ignore. He can save you more than steps, blood sometimes. He turned out to be 35-ish, bright, relaxed. They might have changed the jungle, but nothing was going to alter Jefe Velasquez's style. He took his time, even after I told him why I was here. I'm sorry about the ceiling fan, senor dollar. Oh, what's wrong with it? It's working. See, but it's old-fashioned, not like the, um, how you say, uh, air condition in Estados Unidos. No problem. I'm comfortable. With all the money from the oil, you think they may modern these offices? No. It's air conditioned in the home, in the car, but not in the office. At least this one. <laughs> A fan. Well, I'll get to it. Jefe, I get the feeling you're steering away from discussing Billy Alder. Of course. 
Then there must be a reason. See, because I do not want to give you the bum cow. Oh, bum steer. Uh, gracias. Uh, what I mean is there is uh, nothing to put the finger on. To look at them is a nice family with lots of money living in a big, expensive house. But you spend a couple of hours there. You know, it's not that way. It's nothing you can see, but... Uh... All uh, underneath. Mm. You ever see an oil well fire, Juanito? Uh -huh. All the, the burning and burning under the ground. Then, when it's enough force, whoosh, everything explodes to the sky. It's exactly what you expect when will happen to these people. Someday. It's, still, it's hard to figure exactly why. But that is all. Yeah. Well, thanks. I appreciate what you've given me. Now, what's the best way to get to the house? You go there, huh? That's where the job is. It's easy enough to get to, I tell you how. You mind if I ask a question, amigo? Shoot. In your own office, you got a fan or air condition? When I left him, he was even weighing the idea of spending his own money for an air condition. I went right on spending company money. For instance, item four, $39.55 deposit and first day's rental on a U-Drive automobile. A 20-minute drive over the autopista, that's a six-lane mountaintop freeway, less traffic jams, brought me to La Guiara, a clean, scrub-looking suburb on the edge of the Caribbean. The older house wasn't hard to find. Huge and impressive, it sat all by itself on a high promontory jutting out into the sea. I suddenly found that I'd become J. Dollar Intruder, because in the doorway of the house, a very luscious young lady was being enthusiastically and expertly kissed by a handsome young man. <coughs> My cough must have been pretty frightening because the boy took off around the house like a quarter horse. Not so the girl. She glared angrily as she came toward me. I hope you're satisfied. Well, embarrassed is a better word. I'm sorry about my time. I'll bet you are. Well, look, Miss, Happy I, uh... now that you've got something to tell my father? Well, go ahead and tell him. If you'd only slow then down a minute. while you're at it, tell him something else. Then he can hire as many detectives as he likes. It still won't keep me from seeing Paul. Well, looks like you'll need track shoes to see him now. Very funny. Assuming that was Paul. Look, I don't... Assuming... Oh, now look, lady, you never gave me a chance to explain. Not too hard to figure why, well, who you think I am, but I'm not. My name is Johnny Dollar, and you're right about only one thing. I do want to see your father, but not for the reason you think. Okay? But I... I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. Good. Are we friends now? I'm Peggy Alder. Yeah, I figured as much. Would you like to come in and wait, Mr. Dollar? Wait? My father isn't home at the moment. He shouldn't be over an hour, though. Fine. You won't say anything about what you saw? About Paul, I mean? Lady, the world is full of trouble. Why should I add to it? <laughs> Billy Alder's selling methods may have been wild, high-pressure stuff, but there was taste in his home. And uh, when Peggy Alder put a drink into my hand and led me out to a patio, I was ready to get a drill and go oil hunting myself. Patio. It was a small, exclusive, man-made mountaintop 600 feet down to the Caribbean on three sides. If you were going to have troubles, this was the place to ponder them. Peggy Alder still didn't trust me completely. Inexpertly, she tried to dig out my reason for being there. Gave up after a while, then excused herself when her father showed up an hour later. Glad you're here, Dollar. What's wrong? Oh, uh, just surprised. Guess I expected to be tossed out. Why? <laughs> kind of delicate asking a man why he changes beneficiaries like some men change suits. I've read the policy. Your company is allowed to ask. We appreciate your feeling that way. But it says nothing about my having to answer. No, no that's right. It doesn't. But it's hard not to draw conclusions. Such as? You're afraid somebody is, shall we say, gunning for you. But you don't know who. Am I right? Is that what your company thinks, too? Well, they don't think anything, but they'd like to know. Do you enjoy your trip down, Mr. Dollar? Uh -huh. Well, if I take it, I've worn out my welcome. Sorry. No, no, no. Sit down. I told you I was glad you're here. Then you shouldn't mind a couple of questions. I'll tell you nothing, Mr. Dollar. I admit nothing. Is that clear? Is it? Look here. Your company has a good deal to lose by my death. We just want to be sure nobody's thinking of it as a commercial venture. Then stay here, Mr. Dollar. Here, in this house. Keep me alive. Mm -hmm. 
Behind the calm, controlled demeanor, Billy Alder was loaded with fear. The worst kind of fear. The grinding, implacable kind of terror that for some reason has to be hidden. Two hours later, my bags had been sent for, and I was comfortably settled in the guest room only slightly larger than Pennsylvania Station. By dinner time that night, the only other people I'd seen in the house were the servants. Alder, his daughter, and I sat down to eat alone. I must apologize for Mrs. Alder's absence, Mr. Dollar. She went to the bullfights today. She's staying in town for dinner with the others. Uh, the others? We have several guests staying with us. Charming people, Mr. Dollar. Wait till you meet them. I think we can do without that kind of talk, Peggy. You defending them, Father? Guests. Don't you mean leeches, parasites? That'll do. At least they'd have the manners not to start a thing like this in front of Mr. Dollar. You may be excused any time you like. Gladly. Incidentally... Thank you for disobeying my orders to keep Paul Kincaid away from this house. You... you told him after you promised. Mr. Dollar told me nothing. You seem to forget that servants have eyes and ears. Sorry. Didn't mean to embarrass you, Mr. Dollar. That's all right. (laughs) Kids. Can't do anything with them these days. Headstrong, no sense of values. (laughs) Not Paul Kincaid. An oil field foreman. Can you see him fitting in as Peggy's husband in the Billy Alder Enterprises? Quite a step up, if he can make it. Believe me, he never will. After dinner, Alder and I headed for that fabulous patio. I hoped he would open up, but he kept the talk general. Charming, witty, but simply conversation. Truthfully, I wasn't too unhappy, because the setting was one of those once-in-a-lifetime things. I couldn't take my eyes away from the lights far below. The glittering shoreline stretching from Carinero all the way to Puerto Cabello. That's when it happened. (laughs) The bullet smashed into the wooden canopy support just inches from Alder's head. So close that the splinters flew, buried themselves in his cheek. Mr. Alder, you all right? I I think so. Stay here. I raced back through the house, headed for the front entrance as fast as I could. Outside, I tried to stare through the darkness into the only direction from which that shot could have come, the rolling jungle slope of the promontory. Sure, it looked deserted, but I knew it wasn't. Someone had to be out there, with five more bullets in his gun and murder in his heart. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, one man dances attendance, another dances death, and a woman calls the tune. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Caracas Police, senor. I have Jefe Velasquez returning your call. Momentito, por favor. Thanks. I have the senor Dollar, Jefe. Gracias. Uh, Good morning, amigo. It is, huh? Here it is. Here it ain't. Where is there? 
The Alder House in Lagiata. I'm staying here at Alder's request. Ah, you are, uh, how they call a, a fast mover, amigo. Felicidades. Sorry, but felicitations are a little out of place. Trouble? Someone came within inches of killing Alder last night. I've got the bullet. How's your ballistic setup? At your disposal. Just bring it in. Thanks, I will. Maybe it's got something to say. I hope you're right. But, amigo... Yeah? Don't you think is the next bullet you should be worrying about? Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Caracas, Venezuela, to the Home Office Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Alder Matter. Expense account continued. Expense account item five, five dollars even, tip, to one Nachos Gomez, servant in the big Alder house. For a good reason. He hadn't liked the idea of my prowling the slope alone last night looking for someone with a gun. He'd insisted on joining me. True, we hadn't found anything, but he'd been there. Five bucks isn't much to pay for a friend, and I had a feeling I could use one. I ate breakfast alone. Alder had already gone to his office, and the rest of the house was asleep. Nacho's breakfast tray rattled when he saw the money. For me, senor dollar, why? Oh, call it appreciation. You didn't have to follow me out there last night. Oh, you, you could have been hurt, senor. You don't know the slope is a long drop to the bottom. Yeah, and lumpy. I, I didn't expect money. I, I did not do it for that. I know that. Go ahead, take it. Mil gracias. Uh, something... Uh, I, I, I tell you something, senor. When you go running out there last night, I was sure you would find nobody. Oh, why? Would you suffer yourself? Too much, uh, how you call it, bushes, uh, too thick. They could be standing right next to you and you wouldn't know. Then why did you come streaking out after me? I told you. It's a long way down. One wrong step and pssst. <laughs> In the States, that's an old joke. The punchline is, watch that first step. It's a beaut. I got in the car I'd rented the previous day and headed toward Caracas. I passed the driving time pleasantly by counting oil wells. From that, I graduated to trying to figure how much money they made with each given stroke of the huge pumps. Nice kind of occupation? Sure. Specifically designed for a purpose. To keep me from worrying about the business at hand, namely why super salesman Billy Alder insured for a quarter of a million dollars should change his beneficiaries five times in a single month. Further... Who'd taken that pot shot at him last night? Answers? I went back to counting oil wells. In Caracas, I headed for police headquarters and the head man, Jefe Velasquez. He turned the bullet over to his lab, but they were short-handed. By lunchtime, I still had no report. So I took Velasquez to lunch. For a man who is living in a house like Billy Alder's, you do not look happy, amigo. That bullet traveled an inch more to the left. Billy Alder wouldn't need a house. It's a good point. You look too serious for a nice lunch. I fixed that. Hey, dame dos pisco sour, por favor. You, uh, you ever drink the pisco sour, amigo? No. Will it help? Well, they do not solve the case for you, but they make you happier about being worried. Well, maybe we'd better order doubles. It's confusing, the other house. What do you think? Keep him alive, Alder says. But that's the only word you can get out of him. You feel the thing I mentioned yesterday, the, the, the tension, the strangeness? The only ones I've met are Alder and his daughter. You haven't met uh, Mrs. Alder, any of the others? Why? Mm, they got home late. After the shooting? Way after. Interesting. Oh, sure. It could have been any of them out on that slope. I do not worry about you, amigo. You will do fine. Well, I... Well, here's something else interesting. Alder doesn't want me to question any of them about that shot. Oh? Huh? You noticed there was no complaint to your office about the murder trial. I noticed. Because Alder wanted it that way. Like I say, interesting. Ah, hey, gracias, waiter. You sip that, amigo. See if it does not help. It's good? Oh, very nice. It will be nicer. Just give it time. You uh, you still have the senior Billy Alder on your mind, eh? Yeah. 
Have another sip. Heffy. See? There's something else in my mind. You got to learn to relax, Johnny. You mentioned Mrs. Alder a few minutes ago. Seemed surprised I hadn't met her. What are you thinking of? Just that uh, you living at the house. No, Hefe, it was more than that. I mean, God, you are imagining. Come on, come on now, level with me. I'm far enough out in left field as it is. Write it off as professional courtesy, huh? You are a pretty nice looking fellow, amigo. Don't snow me. Just I am me... simply trying to answer your question, Johnny. Mrs. Alda, how shall we say it? Uh, it does not make her angry to be seen in the company of a handsome man. I see. What's Mr. Alder's reaction? The Alders must be people of breeding. If they have a quarrel, it is not in public. Thanks. But at the risk of seeming ungrateful, you could have mentioned that yesterday. It's a pretty good department, the Caracas police, amigo. You know why? Because I teach them always one thing at a time. Comprende? <laughs> Mucho, amigo. Come on. We eat, then we get back to the lab. If they have not finished, I fire everybody. <laughs> Expense account item six, fourteen dollars eighty-five cents. Valesquez drank enough pisco sours to float the Normandy. Back at the police lamp, I wished I'd kept pace with him, because all they could tell from the bullet was that it had come from a Luger. And Valesquez pointed out there must be a couple of thousand Lugers in Caracas. I headed back for the Alder House at La Guerra. Unless the members of that happy household slept all day, somebody should be alive and stirring. And they were people I wanted to meet badly. But I almost didn't make it. As I approached the main gate, I noticed another car parked along the side of the road about 50 feet from it. Suddenly, it roared into life, shot forward, screamed to a stop, and cut me off, almost piling me into the entrance pillars. You darn fool, what's the matter with you? Plenty. You know who I am, Dollar? I know this. If you ever try a stunt like that again, I'll ram those pearly teeth right down your throat. Tough guy, huh? There's an easy way of finding out. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. I ask you if you knew who I am. Sure I do. Paul Kincaid, the lad who was smooching with Billy Alder's daughter yesterday. You taking bows? You just couldn't wait to tell Alder about it, could you? Your girl's been telling you lies, Kincaid. I just happen to be there. If you don't want to be seen, don't neck in doorways. Now, just a minute, Dollar. And speaking of people in wrong places, I thought you were a foreman in the oil fields. I don't see any derricks on the Alder property. I took the day off so I could come over and see you. Well, you getting a good look? Yeah. And I still think Alder hired you to keep Peggy away from him. Now, you keep out of my head, Dollar. What are you staring for? Well, now, everybody's full of wild ideas today. I just had one that maybe isn't so wild. Like maybe you just ad-libbed a reason for being here. And the real one is to sneak out on the slope and see if you can't find an empty Luger shell. What? There has to be one out there, you know. You saying I took that shot at Alder? I don't know. How bad do you want to marry into the Alder money? <coughs> Saw the punch coming, slipped it and threw my own. It was a dilly while it lasted. It lasted too long. You get a set of arms working in an oil field. He had him all right. And those punches hurt. So I went to judo. Even then, it was tough. Oh, I guess I better get in shape or take up accounting. A look in the car mirror made one thing clear. I couldn't take a face like that through the front door. When I reached the house, I skirted it, managed to get to the service entrance without scaring the life out of anyone. Here, my little gift to Nacho Gomez, seat item five, began to pay off. He hustled me up to my room by the back stairs, and without waiting to be asked, he got busy with bandages and things. You, you win, senor? You, oh. Would you believe it if I said yes? Only through politeness, I think. Oh, oh, perdón, señor. That, that one was pretty deep. Oh, God, I... Yeah, what's the matter? I was just thinking, if you really win, I hate to see the loser. Thanks, but I can do it without seeing him again. That is about the best I can do, señor. Yeah, well, okay, thanks. Oh, no, it's nada. Con su permiso, señor. Sure, I... just tell me one thing, will you? Is anything going on downstairs? Well, how, how do you mean, senor? Well, that racket we hear coming up. Uh, racket? Oh, you mean El Mantante. Mantante? The bullfighter? The finest matador in the world, senor. Did you not know he's the guest of the house? He's staying here? Oh, si. The senor and senora Alder, they're big aficionados. They love the corrida. New style, isn't it? Finding bulls in the house? <laughs> no, senor. Mantante, he just give a, how you say, a, a demonstration of the passes... 
with the cape, you know? Uh-huh. Oh, it's beautiful. Why you not go down and watch, and you, you see, you will enjoy. It's lovely, the fine bullfight. Anybody ever asked a bull about that? After Nacho's gentle ministrations and a quick change of clothes, I must confess I look slightly more like a human being again. Uh, slightly. Anyhow, I wandered downstairs, headed for the huge living room. And it was like walking into another world, alive and pulsating to the music from a record player. Five or six people stood around, hypnotically beating time, their eyes glued to the great El Mantante, a handsome Spaniard who skillfully worked a bullfighter's cape in the center of the floor. Nacho hadn't exaggerated. Montante was beautiful to watch. But the feeling wasn't unanimous. Billy Alder and his daughter Peggy were the only people in the room I knew. And though they beat time with the others, they both shared the same expression on their faces. Intense dislike for the man with the cape. As I shifted my attention to them, a woman tore reluctant eyes away from the matador and moved quietly toward me. She wasn't really beautiful, but tremendously chic, for want of a better word. And that made her seem beautiful. I'm Constance Alder, Mr. Dollar. Welcome to our home. Well, thank you, Mrs. Alder. I'm afraid I've been negligent as a hostess. Oh, we've just missed connections, that's all. Charmingly put. Do you mind if I wait to introduce you to the others? When Montante's finished? No, of course not. Please go on back. Don't worry about me. I'm doing fine. Thank you. I watched her as she crossed the room, then realized that someone else was doing exactly the same thing, her husband, Billy Alder. Only the look on his face was the same glaring dislike with which he'd favored the cape wielding matador. Interesting. Then after a long moment, Constant Alder moved quietly out of the room, as though not wishing to disturb the others. The performance was still going strong, and after about five minutes, I moved out onto the patio, stood looking down at the La Guerra Harbor. Because it was on my mind, I stared down at the spot on the slope from which the Luger had been fired, and I saw that someone was there, awkwardly searching the ground. A moment later, they straightened up, moved a few feet to continue the search. Even in the late afternoon sun, there couldn't be any mistake in the search's identity. It was Constance Alder. Now here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, two sides of the same old yarn. And whichever side you choose, you've got to call it wrong. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Constance Alder, Mr. Dollar. Are you all right? Sure, Mrs. Alder. What made you think I might not be? Well, just your having left the living room. Being in your own room like this, I... Oh, nothing wrong, Mrs. Alder. I'm fine. I'm sorry, El Montante took so long with his cape handling demonstration. I hope you weren't bored. Not in the least. He's very good. But you did leave. That isn't necessarily a sign of boredom, is it, Mrs. Alder? You left before I did. (laughs) Yes, of course. The hostess has to keep busy, you know. Sure. And like I said, I wasn't bored. I only left because I wanted a little air. I went out on the patio for it. I'm 
Wonderful spot, Mrs. Alder. You can see everything. The harbor, the slope down from the house, even anyone who might be on it. I want to see you, Mr. Dollar. Talk to you. That figures. Where? Your car. Half an hour. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Caracas, Venezuela, to the Home Office Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Alder Matter. Expense account continued. Sometimes it takes only a few well-chosen words to start the mountain coming to Muhammad. And it looked like I'd picked the right ones with Constance Alder. Whatever she had to say, I wanted to hear it. Because it was a cinch nobody else in this rat race was giving away any information. Yeah, I wanted very much to hear what Mrs. Alder had to say. I headed downstairs right away because I have a fetish about being early. But my timing was bad. Hey, Dollar, you got a minute? Well, I can hardly say no to my host, Mr. Alder. Come on in the den. Anything the matter? There's cuts on your face. What happened? Your daughter's boyfriend. Paul Kincaid? Yeah, he's got the idea you hired me to bust up that little romance. He didn't like it. That idiot. Is that all you've got to say, Mr. Alder? What? Because if it is, let me tell you how I feel about it, where I stand. Look, Dollar... No, you look. I know you're the insured, but I just about had it with you. I don't have to take that kind of talk. I think you do. You asked me to keep you alive, but you won't lift a finger to help. Every time I ask you a question, you look the other way, do an imitation of a clam. What am I supposed to be, a mind reader? All I want you to do is protect me. Oh, come on, come on, Alder. You're smarter than that. Protect you from what? You've almost been tagged out once. You must have an idea who made that try and why. I have no idea. Just like that, huh? Mr. Dollar... Look, Mr. Alder... Don't you see that by not opening up, you're making a clay pigeon out of yourself? I, uh, I can tell you nothing. You know that I'd be justified in suggesting my company cancel the policy. Well, you'll have to suit yourself about that. Excuse me. Just a minute. What did you tell your family and guests about me? Who am I supposed to be? An old friend from up in the States. Uh-huh. You realize something, old friend? That's the first question I ever asked that you had an answer for. It's the first one I considered you had a right to ask. Mr. Alder. Yes? Whose side are you on? Yours? Or the person who's trying to kill you? Oil-rich Billy Alder, business mind par excellence, super salesman deluxe. The man who could sell or talk you into anything. Well, could he say one word that might keep another bullet from coming his way? It sure didn't look like it. I left the den, was just starting out to my car to meet Mrs. Alder. I must have been real anxious for our chat because I suddenly realized I'd forgotten my car keys. I hurried back upstairs and at the top almost bowled over a woman who was about to come down. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. My fault. That's all right. No, no, I should have looked where I was going. Here, uh, are you hurt, Mrs. It's Sarah? perfectly all right. Excuse me, please. Sure was a hard house to make acquaintances in, even when they were old and drab and stern-looking. Well, I went to my room, got my car keys and my wallet, which lay alongside them. The position of the wallet was interesting. I shut the door, headed once more for my car. The lady of the house was waiting, we took off. I know who you are, Mr. Dollar, while you're here. I'm sure you do. I was just back in my room. What? I'll give you a tip. Never search a pro's room. He always puts an article down in a certain position, then memorizes it automatically. A searcher can never replace it exactly the same way. With me, it's wallets. I did not go into your room. Oh? Then name a guess for me, will you? Fifty-ish kind of lady, kind of faded, severe looking? Why? I'm just curious. Doris Cole, a very old friend from the States. Mind telling me where her room is? Right next to yours. Why? 
Well, I just ran into her as she was coming downstairs. She looked a little, um, call it worried. That's ridiculous. She'd have no more reason to search your room than I would. Sure. Let's forget it. A little while ago, I saw you searching out on the slope. And you know I saw you. Now, what were you looking for? An empty cartridge? You think I fired that shot at my husband? Someone did. And there are easier places to go for a stroll than on that slope. I know what you're thinking. But you're wrong. I just wanted to see if I could find some trace of whoever had done it. A shell from a gun. Well, that's interesting, to say the least. I don't like your tone, Mr. Dollar. I don't blame you. Because you just made a boo-boo. Only an automatic ejects a shell. A revolver doesn't. In other words, you knew what kind of gun was used. Uncomfortable, Mrs. Alder? Why don't you go home? Like to live dangerously, Mrs. Alder? Slapping the driver of a moving car? Pretty foolish, isn't it? I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. All right, tell me something. How did you know what I was really here for? My husband. I made him tell me. Well, congratulations. I can't get him to tell me the time of day. And he knows whose side I'm on. We rode back to the house without exchanging another word, and one thing was obvious. The chic Mrs. Alder had apologized all right, but the anger I'd stirred up could have powered a fair-sized city for a week. When we reached the house, she simply got out, headed for it as though I were a process server she wanted to get away from. I went to my room, trying not to look like a process server, to figure what my next step would be. I was suddenly very grateful to whoever had chosen my room because of two things. The excellent view of the Alder patio and what was happening on it. Mrs. Alder and Doris Cole were having a discussion with Mrs. Alder doing all the talking. Even from this distance, I could see the anger on both their faces. Then, after a few minutes, both women went into the house. Five minutes later, I was still wishing I could have heard the words. Well, Miss Cole, won't you come in? Well, I uh, only stopped for a moment. Glad you did. I uh, just wanted to apologize for my behavior when we ran into each other on the stairs a little while ago. Oh, nonsense. It was my fault. No, no. I, I meant, well, I was so brusque and... Well, I just don't know what I could have been thinking of. Oh, you were nothing of the kind. Don't worry about it. You're, you're very nice about it. Very nice. Well, uh, excuse me now, won't you? Oh, sure thing, Miss Cole. Thanks for taking the trouble. Yes, yes. I watched her as she hurried down the hall. An awkward woman who left you with one strong impression that she had little feel for the social graces. The impression was emphasized about two minutes later by a second visitor. One who knew all about the social graces. Constance Alder. All smiles and charm. I'll bet you thought we ran out of food, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> I was kind of wondering. Blame El Mantante. Does he eat everything in the house? Oh, no, not quite. He just refuses to allow dinner to be served. Insists that tonight he's the host, that it's his evening. Oh, what does that mean? Dinner in town, the high lie matches, and night clubbing afterward. He simply won't be refused. Insists that everyone in the house be his guest. Sound attractive? Well, it would be pretty hard to say no to an offer like that. Good. Don't be long. Everyone's dressing like mad. It should be quite an evening. It was. Montante was acknowledged to be a great matador. He had just as much class outside the arena. He ordered a dinner, and it was gourmet time. He placed our bets at the highlight matches, nothing but winners. And at the nightclub, nothing but champagne. For a group of people living in a house loaded with tension, it was a ball. And a lot of it was because of the matador's quiet, easy manner. He was a man who knew how things should be done and did them. It was pretty tough not to like him. Constance Alder seemed to feel the same way, her eyes always on him. But the matador himself was never once out of line, never said or did anything that could possibly offend Billy Alder. And for a busy host, he was observant. I found that out while the others were dancing. Perhaps I can answer the question, Senor Dollar. I haven't asked one, Senor Montante. In words, no. But it's not difficult to interpret. You watch Mrs. Alder, then me. Then a question is in your eyes, no? You're a pretty sharp fellow, Senor Matador. And a gentleman, Senor. I do not pursue other men's wives. The question is answered? Partly. What happens when you're the pursuit? I see. Senor Dollar, women with money but without great beauty, they try to compensate, 
each in her own way. Hers is not unusual. Acquisition. The company and attendance of a man who is presentable, admired. I am not unknown in the arena. So for the moment it is my company. Tomorrow a better known companion if one should appear. As simple as that. It's sad, no, senor? And a little embarrassing. Thanks. And I'm the one who's embarrassed. I thought your eye was on the Alder fortune. <laughs> S- senor, you know what I receive for a Sunday afternoon in any Latin American country? Ten thousand dollars. Sometimes more. Your question is answered, senor? Well, not quite. Why does a fellow take bullfight lessons? Like I said, the evening was pleasant, but it was still a job. Watching Doris Cole now, awkwardly dancing with Billy Alder, I kept thinking of her argument with Mrs. Alder, her furtiveness. I felt sure she'd been the one who'd searched my room, and there would never be a better chance to return the compliment. So I developed a sudden killing headache, and over the protest of the others, said goodnight and grabbed a cab for the Alder house in Aguiara. In Miss Cole's room, I did a hurried but thorough search, and came up with two things that proved real interesting. A passport with Doris Cole's picture, but made out to one Dora Jansen. And an unsigned letter, postmarked New York. In a quick scrawl, it said simply that the Caribbean star would arrive in La Guerra on the 17th. I'm sorry about your headache, Mr. Dollar, but there is no aspirin in my room. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, motives for murder are like peanuts. Once you start, you can't stop. One difference, though. A peanut won't kill you. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, Dollar? There's Alder here. There must be something the matter with the house phone. I thought I rang a different room. Doris Cole's room, Mr. Alder? Well, yes. That's what you got. Now, see here, Dollar, you're not questioning that woman, badgering her. We were simply discussing two headaches and the value of aspirin. Want to speak to her? I just wanted to be sure everything was all right. Both of you running out of the nightclub with headaches like that. Oh, everything's fine. I'd like to speak to you, though. Sorry, it's late. I have a long day tomorrow. I'm afraid it's important. Good night, Dollar. Are you thinking of arresting me, Mr. Dollar? I'm not a policeman, Miss Cole. You act like one, answering my phone, sneaking into my room while I'm gone. That evens the score, then. You had a quick look through mine earlier in the day. Mr. Dollar. Just what were you looking for, Miss Cole? <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, 
Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Caracas, Venezuela, to the Home Office Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Alder Matter. Expense account continued. Back in my own room, after saying goodnight to a sullen Doris Cole, I didn't feel the slightest qualms about having invaded her room and lying about the reason for it. Why should I? The people in the older house didn't seem too concerned with the truth. In fact, the whole case seemed to be a question of lie or say nothing. Consider, Billy Alder had been shot at, indicating he had a good reason to change beneficiaries five times in a month. And still, he was the original say-nothing fella. Keep me alive was all I could get out of him. His wife had lied, his daughter had lied, and Doris Cole, an old friend of the family, had just proved to be a walking lie. The passport I'd found in her room had her photograph, all right, but it said she was Dora Jansen. An unsigned letter in the same drawer had stated simply that the Caribbean star would dock tomorrow. I got into bed, and an odd thought hit me. If the Caribbean star didn't dock, would the steamship company have joined the Liars Club, too? Expense account item seven, ten cents. One newspaper bought on the La Guiara docks early next morning. My Spanish is pretty nothing, but I could read the important thing, that the Caribbean star was due at noon. With time to kill, I drove into Billy Alder's office in Caracas. He hit the ceiling when I told him about Doris Cole's passport. I was suddenly glad I'd mentioned nothing about the letter. Dollar, how dare you search the room of a guest in my house? How dare you? Just returning a courtesy. What? Mine was searched thoroughly. Well, that still isn't any reason for your behavior. Oh, one-way ethics, Mr. Alder? I've told you repeatedly, Dollar. There's only one reason I want you here. I know. Keep you alive. But how? With handcuffs on? Now, suppose I told you to find some oil, then refuse to let you dig any holes in the ground. You'd begin to smell a rat, wouldn't you? What are you talking about? Just about everything in this cell. Look, I have a very busy... Day. Who is Dora Jansen, Mr. Alder? And why does she call herself Doris Cole? You're making too much of nothing, Dollar. It isn't a crime to use another name. That depends on the reason, doesn't it? Yeah, she's an old friend. Oh, who isn't? Dollar, I... Aren't you tired of that tune? For a man who's afraid for his life, you've got more old friends than anyone I ever knew. Also, I haven't noticed anything particularly friendly between you. Yeah, she's, she's not a well woman, Dollar. I don't want you bothering You don't want me bothering anyone. Exactly. Not even the one who fired that shot at you. So I can't help getting an impression that you have a pretty good idea of who it might have been. I told you I was busy, Dollar. Yeah, but it's what you haven't told me I keep thinking about. Um, Dollar. What? Did, uh, did you find anything else in that room beside the passport? Why, Mr. Alder, what's happened to your sense of ethics? There was still plenty of time before the Caribbean Star would be docking, and Billy Alder's reaction had dictated my next move. The cable office in Laguiara suddenly seemed like a very important place to visit. There were too many silent mouths in Caracas, and I needed one that had something to say. Ah, okay, miss. You can take this now. Si, sí, senor. How do you like this to go? Don't spare the horses. Okay. Uh, cable, rush. Ah, si. Sí. Victor Kelly, world... Yeah, no, my lousy handwriting here. To Victor Kelly, Worldwide Mutual, Hartford, Connecticut, USA. See? Si? Want all possible information, Dora Jansen, a.k.a. Doris Cole, U.S. Passport, 19B67943-11, signed dollar. And your address for the answer? Uh, I'll pick it up here. As you wish. And lady, please... I know, senor. Don't spare the horses. It was still early when I reached the waterfront where the Caribbean Star would soon be docking. There wasn't much point in watching the incoming passengers. I didn't even know who I was looking for. So I found a spot at the pier entrance where I could concentrate on those meeting the passengers. Here I made a grudging concession to all movie detectives. Item seven, another ten cents, another newspaper. To hide behind. And you know something? It works fine. Doris Cole, or according to that passport, Dora Jansen, was nervous, excited. And it was no trouble to stay close behind her as she met a passenger. A short, nondescript man in his late fifties. When they jumped into a cab and hurried away from the pier, they were closely followed by a man clutching an unread newspaper. Me. The 
trip was a short one, about six or seven blocks away. The cab in front pulled up at a cheap hotel on the waterfront. I circled about once, got rid of my cab, and wandered into the dismal lobby. The fat, sleepy clerk made a concession. He opened one eye. See, si, you look for something. Yeah, that uh, gentleman who just came in, I, uh, I had an appointment with him. Oh, darn it, I, I must have left the slip of paper with his name on it in my hotel. I can't find it. It's too bad. You know, the gentleman who just went up to room, uh, room, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want me to say the number now, huh? <laughs> Don't you think I ever been to a movie? Oh, no, really, you can save me a lot of embarrassment. You've got it right there on the register. See? Si. Mind if I have a look? I mind. Look, friend... When was the last time you got anything for free, friend? Oh, why didn't you say so? I was trying not to offend you. Here. Here, let me see. You play blackjack, senor, how you call it, uh, uh, 21? Yeah, why? Like they say, hit me again. Oh, you're rubbing it in. See, you want to do business or no? Item nine, ten bucks, market schmear, schmooze, or just plain graft. He pointed an oversized forefinger at a name on the ledger, lost interest in me, went back to sleep. Arthur Singer, it said, room eight. I went up the stairway. A few seconds later, I moved as quietly as I could down the grimy second-floor hallway, stopped at the door of number eight. At first, I heard nothing. Then, after a long minute, the voices began, angrily, as though resuming an old know. argument. I don't know. Then Sorry. let me handle it. No, no. But what about him? Suppose he What does he does? You want it all to go for nothing? Now, you listen to me. I know what I'm doing. Five minutes later, I was back in the cable office getting a second message off to Vic Kelly in Hartford. It was a request for anything he could possibly dig up on Arthur Singer. I didn't hope for too much because it would probably turn out to be an uh, alias, but it was an angle I couldn't afford to overlook. You're not back for answers so soon, senor. Oh, no, I just want you to get this one off. Same fellow. And same way, no spare the horses? That's it. And thanks. It's nada. Oh, senor, I want to ask you something. Shoot. Your business partner, did I do something to displease him? He seemed so angry. My who seemed so what? Well, he was so nice at first, but after he read the message... Wait a hold everything. First of all, I have no business partner. Oh, then I make terrible mistakes. Oh, just tell me what happened. Well, this man, he come in less than a minute after you leave, was very nice. Yeah. Said he was your business partner, that he'd just leave you. You were worried because you forgot whether you say something in the message you just sent. Then you ask him to check it for you. Mm -hmm. He seemed to know what he was talking. So you showed it to him. Then? That is when he got so angry. He just put it down and leave. What did he look like? A little less tall than you, and he have gray hair. Eyeglasses? See, si, eyeglasses. Gray suit? See, si, senor. Gray suit. You know him? I'm beginning to wonder if anyone really does. I am so sorry for my mistake, senor. Oh, forget it. It wasn't your fault. Uh, just send that second message. Si, senor. About the answers. Send them to me at William Alder's house as soon as you get them. Maybe we'll read them together. Sure. Billy Alder was my new business partner. Alder, the original close-mouthed fellow. But it looked like there was nothing wrong with his brain or his eyesight. Then suddenly I didn't mind that he'd read my message to Vic Kelly... Because a frightened man usually reacts at the extreme ends of the scale. He'd been at the let's-do-nothing end. Maybe he'd now go the other way. There was one more step I could make on the waterfront, so I made it. My credentials presented at the steamship offices got me a look at the passenger list of the Caribbean Star. The name Arthur Singer wasn't on it. I started down the small waterfront street to where my car was parked. My mind was full of Billy Alder and the pieces of this crazy puzzle, tugging one way, pulling another. <laughs> Trying to make sense out of it somehow, I used some sort of slide rule where logic could be a solid base. And no matter how I twisted it, I knew one thing. It just wouldn't work. I didn't have enough yet to make it work. I was just reaching for the door handle when I saw his reflection in the car window. The man who'd sneaked up behind me, blackjack raised high in the air. The blackjack was just insurance. He was tough enough without it. I finally worked him to the side of the car. Managed to half Nelson and let the car door workers my blackjack... Five seconds later, an officer came rushing up, and five minutes later, I sat in the office of Jefe Velasquez, chief of police. You feeling all right now, amigo? Yeah, yeah, sure. What did you get out of that blackjack artist? Just what I expected. Still won't say who hired him, huh? You have to understand this kind of fellow, amigo. I do, huh? What I mean, he's uh, 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 assassino pequeño, you, you know? Sheephood, monster. Uh, see, si, see. Si. 
For extra two bolivar, maybe three, he would blackjack his mother. He claims he does not know who hired him that he is to get his money in a letter. <laughs> that one I was spats. Okay. I say he's lying. Of course, but he will stick to the story because he knows he will get the same sentence whether he tells or he does not. A cheap hood won't usually cover for somebody else. This guy does, amigo. Otherwise, he would never be hired again. I'd, uh... I'd give a lot for a few minutes alone with him, Jefe. Sorry, Juanito, but I like my job. Yeah, just wishful thinking. <laughs> Not hard to understand. Well, you are leaving? Not getting anywhere sitting here. Uh, you sure you haven't got business somewhere else? Uh, I got an awfully big end to talk to that thug. You know, I got a hunch. Forget it, amigo. It's like I say. If you ask him on a Monday what is the day, he must tell you Tuesday. You could beat him to death, he will still say Tuesday. Is the way they think. A fair favor. If I can. Suppose I don't prefer charges. Would you put a tail on him when he leaves? Johnny. Look, look, I know it's a million to one against the hood doing a rough up without the money in hand, but if he hasn't collected you. Come, amigo, like you say, a million to one. I know I'm grabbing at straws, but just in case, if I come on, huh? Okay. Good, thanks. Hey, where do you go? Right to the cable office. Oh? Yeah. And if a man in Hartford has nothing to say, I've got a permanent seat behind the eight ball. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a puzzle never fits itself together. You've got to snoop, pry, and juggle the pieces. And sometimes people get killed that way. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Tony Barrett. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Good morning, Senor Dollar. Is La Guiara Cable Office calling? We have an answer to cables you sent to Hartford, Connecticut. Good. Would you like me to read the message, Senor? No, I'm on a telephone with extensions. Oh, I see. Perhaps you prefer I have it delivered then? No, no, I don't. Then you will come in for it yourself? Yeah, just as fast as I can get there. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Caracas, Venezuela to the Home Office Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Alder Matter. Expense account continued. At the cable office, I ran into another dead end. Vic Kelly, back in Hartford, had come up with absolutely nothing on either Dora Jansen, who called herself Doris Cole, or Arthur Singer, the little man she'd hurried off an incoming liner yesterday. Complete strikeout. I headed outside, caught a glimpse of Mrs. Billy Alder watching me from across the street. Social life changing, Mrs. Alder? 
Does being my hostess include tailing me? Does being on Laguerre Street constitute tailing you? <laughs> Preserve me from amateur detectives. Good morning, Mr. Dollar. Now, oh, come on. You rushed out of the house so fast you couldn't possibly have eaten. I'll buy you breakfast. I knew it was curiosity that made her take me up. She just couldn't resist the thought that maybe I'd give something away, let something slip. She ate warily, tentatively. We must have looked like two boxers in a close fight sitting on the edge of their stools, waiting for the last round. The one that would decide the winner. You're staring. Thinking. You love your husband, Mrs. Alder? It better be a reason for a question like that. Let's stop sparring, huh? You know why I'm down here. Do I? You told me you did the other day. So I did. Now, don't be aloof, lady. You're not that much in the clear. You've been the beneficiary several times and dropped. My daughter is the present one, I believe. And what exactly is your point? There's been no crime committed. No crime? Somebody's bullet misses your husband by inches and you call it no crime? Thank you for breakfast. Don't forget, I saw you out on the grounds of the house searching the place that shot came from. I told you before. You knew an automatic pistol was used, admitted looking for a shell. You talk too much, Mr. Dollar. And you talk too little. Look, why have you been tailing me? It's certainly not to see that I'm protecting your husband's life. So it's obviously to make sure that I don't find out something. Now, what is it, Mrs. Alder? And why is it so terribly important I don't find out about it? If you won't leave, Mr. Dollar, I will. There's this about getting someone angry enough, fearful enough. It makes them forget about caution. Mrs. Alder never once looked back, simply headed straight for the cheap little waterfront hotel where Arthur Singer was staying. She stayed for over half an hour, and when she left, she still looked frightened. Whatever the game was, it looked like everyone was a player but me. But Mrs. Alder's move helped, started an idea gnawing at me. So I headed for Caracas in the office of a smart cop, Jefe Velasquez. I needed someone to talk to, and the Jefe was a good listener. Come, amigo, sit down. Tell me where it feels wrong, huh? Billy Alder. He does all that changing in his policy, so I assume he's scared of being knocked off. Probably by one of the people who has been named a beneficiary of the policy. So? So now I'll take the other people concerned. Alder's wife is as much a clam as her husband is. Also, she knows what kind of a gun was used to take that shot at him. Dora Jansen, a woman who uses an alias and is obviously afraid of me. Arthur Singer, a little man Dora has hidden in a waterfront hotel. And now I find Alder's wife knows about the little man, too. Conclusion, amigo? That the three of them are in on something together. But not to kill Alder for that policy. His daughter gets it all. Yet Alder is afraid. And I think he's scared of something the others know. Now, suppose that shot wasn't meant to kill him, just frighten him. A sign that somebody meant business. That is a nice piece of logic. Yeah. Now all I gotta do is make it work. Look, Hefe, whatever this deal is, nobody's gonna make a move till I'm out of here. So? So, good, bad, or indifferent, I'm going to do a little acting. I stayed with Velasquez another half hour, setting things up as best I could. Then I drove to the airport and paid item 11, $309.80 for a plane ticket marked Hartford, Connecticut. Sure, it was an expensive prop, but this was one act I had to be convincing in. I drove back to Caracas, pasted a real angry look on my face, marched into Billy Alder's sumptuous office and threw the airline ticket on his desk. He studied it for a long minute. What does this mean, Dollar? That I've had all of you I can take, Alder. You and your keep me alive. You are going back to the States? You can read. The ticket says Hartford, Connecticut. It also says the six o'clock plane, because there's nothing earlier. But, but Why? Why, Dollar? So I can get back and make my recommendations to the insurance company. You know what I'm going to recommend, Alder. Now, please, wait. That they cancel your policy because of your refusal to cooperate. Sorry, Alder. Now, Dollar, please. Now, don't do it. I beg There's you. There's a clause in that policy. I don't care about that policy. Now, don't you understand? I understand what? Listen to me. All that changing of beneficiaries. I only did that to make them send someone down here. I need protection. Against what? I... I'm in a jam. All I want is protection until... until it's peacefully settled. Do you understand? No, plainer. I know someone wants to kill me over a business deal. I'm asking you to see that I stay alive until I have time to... to reason with this man. Who is he? I, I can't tell you. Then let me tell you something. He's just arrived in town. How did you... 
Uh, don't you see, Mr. Dollar? You must stay. Sorry. Goodbye, Mr. Alder. I went back to the Alder house, packed my bag, and said my goodbyes. Neither Mrs. Alder nor Dora Jansen wept. I drove to the airport, checked my luggage in. Then I slipped away, drove back to Caracas the long way. A half hour later, I checked into a little side street hotel where Jefe Velasquez had reserved a room for me. Then came the hardest part, the waiting. That six o'clock plane must have been way out over the Caribbean when the call finally came. Uh, yeah? Velasquez here. You tired of waiting? Oh, brother, you know it. Look, Jefe, your men check in. Maybe I should have taken part of the work. Be patient, amigo. Your whole idea depends on the thinking you took that plane. You must stay right where you are. But uh, what about your men? Have I they... I get a call every couple minutes, amigo. Alder, his wife, the Dora Johnson, uh, Art the Singer. I can tell you every move they make in the last three hours. But they haven't made the one I'm waiting for, huh? You will know it three minutes after they make it. If they make it. Thanks, Efe. Five minutes later, Velasquez called again. He took only enough time to tell me he was on his way and to be down in the street in two minutes. I was. I only beat him by seconds. Come on, amigo. Well? It looked like your plan worked, Juanito, this uh, Dora Johnson. Yeah? As soon as she learned your plane left, the one you did not take, she rushed to the waterfront hotel, pick up the art the singer. Then the two of them rushed to the Alder house. And? Alder must have seen him coming because he jumped in his car and raced out in the direction of his oil village, Caranero. They see him and follow him. That's where we headed for. Then we better get things going, get there before Singer kills Alder. I don't know whether or not he deserves killing, but I know one thing. It'll cost my company a quarter of a million bucks. Velasquez's men were plenty good. Halfway to Caranero, one of them flagged us down, told us both cars had definitely passed his way. And when we reached the oil field, another one waited at the gate. He told us Billy Alder, Dora Jansen, and Arthur Singer were in a little work shack across the field. We left the car and moved as quietly as we could toward the shack. There was a weird feeling. In every direction, you could see the great oil rigs working, pumping, ignoring us. We reached the shack, peered cautiously through the window. An even weirder scene was taking place. An almost hysterical Dora Jansen pointed a luger at a sweating Billy Alder. A terrified Arthur Singer pleaded with her. Their words pushed easily through the thin wooden slag. Dora, don't, please don't do it. You'll only make things worse. Your brother's right, Dora. Dora, listen to me. Like he listened to you four years ago. What did it get him, Mr. Fancy Promoter? Tell me that. I'll make it right with him. A quiet gentleman. A bookkeeper who never did anything wrong in his life. Until you sold him a bill of goods. Now listen to me, both of you. So he rigged your books for you. Made false entries. Made it look like he was responsible for the bankruptcy. And he did the three years in prison that you should have done. For a hundred thousand dollars... That was the deal. And believe me, I'm not trying to cheat him. The money is tied up in my business. I need time, but I'll pay him. Pay him? It's been a year since he came out of jail. You'll never pay. You'll try to cheat him out of the money one way or another. I swear to you, Dora. It's a lot easier to kill him than pay him, isn't it? Oh, you're crazy. Is that why you kept the Luger in the house? Were you worried when it disappeared? When I shot at you to let you know I meant business? Think what you're doing. Dollar knows all about this. Oh, oh, yes. Your bodyguard must have gotten frightened after I had him beat up the other day. He's on his way to the States in a plane. Dora! No! I'm going to kill you. No! Come on. <laughs> Put it down, Dora. You pull that trigger and he'll still come out the winner. No! Senorita, do not make me fire, please. I don't care. As long as he gets what he deserves. Stand back! Senorita! For a split second, she wavered. Then the hate took over. Alder sank to the floor, disbelief on his face. Panic, she raced out into the night, and I went after her. Dora! No! Dora, hold it! No! There's no place to go! Dora! Stay away from me! Don't go in it! Ah! What happened to her, Johnny? She panicked, turned to scream at me, and ran right into one of the protection fences around the derrick. She just passed out. She'll come around. How's Alder? Conscious, but I do not know. We better get him to the hospital. Yeah, come on. She didn't mean to shoot him, mister. My sister wouldn't hurt anyone. Sure, sure. Go take care of her. She was only doing it for me. For me, mister. Walter. Uh, I... I would have paid. I wasn't going to cheat him. Hmm? Oh, Dollar. You know? Yeah, we heard it all. I'm glad it's over. 
worrying. Want to tell me one thing, Alder? Your wife, where does she fit? She had nothing to do with it. Just knew about it. I wasn't too nice to her for a long time. Other women, her running around, just a way of punishing me, paying me back. She knew I couldn't afford to complain. Yeah, wish you'd have told me a long time ago, Alder. I couldn't. Case could always be reopened. I, I, I couldn't face that. Would have hurt too much. Oh, yeah. But it wouldn't have hurt as much as that bullet. Expense account total, $833.14. Details. Billy Alder was rushed to the Caracas Hospital, underwent some excellent surgery, and, uh, relax, claims department. He's going to make it. As for his shady business tactics, well, that's out of my bailiwick. That's for the law boys. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a quiet cabin by a quiet lake, a place ideal for romance and ideal for murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gil Stratton, Harry Bartell, Barbara Fuller, John Daner, Virginia Gregg, Don Diamond, Vivi Janis, and Tony Barrett. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Tom Wilkins of Amalgamated Life, Johnny. Oh, hi, Tom. What's up? Well, at the moment, 50000 bucks worth of life insurance. Oh? Yeah, we got a policy for that amount on the life of one Edward Russell. Russell? Never heard of him. That's just the trouble, Johnny. Right now, nobody else has either. Three days ago, his wife, Leona, over in Denver, filed a missing persons report. She the beneficiary? Right. So what do you want from me? <laughs> Find out what happened to him. Well, how do you know anything did? Maybe he just walked out on his wife. Now, from what I can gather, Russell was a hothead. Could be he had one argument too many. Eh, it still could be just a guy getting away for a while. Huh? And why would he abandon his car in his storage garage in Colorado Springs? Oh. Yeah. It turned up this morning with part of his luggage in it. Interested? I'm on my way. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account item one, $120.50, plane fare and incidentals to Denver. Tom Wilkins hadn't given me much to go on, so I figured the logical place to start was with the missing man's wife, Leona Russell. Their house was in a moderately prosperous suburb of Denver, a white ranch house with a shake roof. Everything looked neat and well kept. But somehow, a forlorn feeling came through to me about the place. Then the door opened. 
And right away, I was sure something pretty bad had happened to Edward Russell. You don't just walk out on a wife who looked like that. Yes. Mrs. Leona Russell? Yes. I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Wilkins sent a telegram about you. Won't you come in? Thanks. Hmm, cooler in here. I try to keep the house shut up during the day. It helps. Please sit down. Oh, thank you. I've already told the police what little there was to tell when I filed the... the missing persons report. Oh, sure. This is just a routine investigation, Mrs. Russell. You probably don't feel too much like talking about it, but if you wouldn't mind going over what information there is again. Well, it was just a week ago that Ed, Mr. Russell, left. You were here when he left? Yes. He told me he was driving up to Boulder on business, that he'd only be gone overnight. Oh, what sort of business is he in? He's in real estate. Boulder, huh? But his car was found in Colorado Springs. I know. I can't explain that. When he didn't come home on time, I got worried. I'd call the hotel in Boulder. He never checked in there. Yes, I see. Did he know anyone in Colorado Springs? Just business contacts, as far as I know. He might have decided to go there instead of Boulder, but he would have called me. But he didn't? No. I... I haven't heard a thing from him since he drove away from here a week ago. Mrs. Russell, do you happen to know if your husband had any... well, enemies... No. Ed was pretty impulsive. You might even say hot-headed. But I just can't believe that anyone would hate him enough to... to do anything to him. Well, we don't know that anyone has. I know. <laughs> it's funny, the things that run through your mind at a time like this. Uh-huh. What sort of things? <laughs> it sounds funny, but... I've almost been wishing it was in an accident or something like that. In a hospital where he might not have a chance to call me, but... At least was safe and alive. You've checked the hospitals? All of them. I did that before I filed the missing persons report. Tell me, had your husband been unusually depressed before he left? If you're suggesting that Ed did away with himself, that's just not possible, Mr. Dollar. That's one thing he'd never do. He, he just wasn't built that way. Mm -hmm. Everything was uh, fine between you two. Yes. <laughs> Of course, we've had disagreements, arguments in the six years we've been married. Who hasn't? Uh, but nothing serious. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm not being very helpful to you, Mr. Dollar. Well, I'm sure that's not your fault. You've no idea at all where he could be then or what could have happened. No, none at all. Except... Except what? Well, I don't know if it means anything or not, but I, uh, I found this under some of Bill's papers on his desk just this morning travel folder. Crystal Lake. Where's that? It's a resort up in the mountains. As I say, I, I don't know whether it means anything or not. Has he ever been there before? Well, not that I know of. I mention it to you? No, I don't. I'm sure he hasn't. Well, I'll check it out. Thanks, Mrs. Russell. Oh, just one more thing. Yes? You're the beneficiary of his life insurance policy? Yes. I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar. I'm not thinking anything. I'm just asking questions. It's my job. I know. But let me ask you a question, Mr. Dollar. Do you think $50,000 or any amount of money could possibly make up for... for Ed? One thing about my job, you have to ask such nice questions sometimes. After Leona Russell's answer, there didn't seem to be much left to say, so I told her I'd let her know if I found out anything, and I left. I looked at the travel folder again. Crystal Lake. Pretty slim lead. But when you have nothing to go on, anything at all looks promising. Expense account item two, $45.20. I rented a car and drove to Crystal Lake. It was a beautiful spot. 7,000 feet high, clean, thin air fragrant pines and the clearest water this side of the Jackson Hole country. I parked a moment and looked out over the lake. Oh, great place to drop a hook. But I had a strong hunch that the fishing I'd be doing was of a little different variety. One thing was obvious. There was a lot of money up here. Most of the cabins would be in cellar to be called cabins and had their own boat landings. The village was nestled at one end of the lake, a colorful collection of Swiss chalets. I headed for the office of the local law, a deputy sheriff named Ansel Garrett, 
tall, thin, raw-boned lad in his early 30s who looked like he'd spent all but the first few hours of his life in the open. Clear, keen eyes that showed he had his wits about him. Have a seat, Dollar. Thanks. Uh, Edward Russell, you said. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Disappeared about a week ago. Left home in Denver. Hasn't been heard from since. So? So he could have come here. His wife found a travel folder about Crystal Lake in his papers. It's supposed to prove something? No, it doesn't prove anything, Ants, but it's my only lead. Here, take a look at this picture. Hmm. You recognize him? Yeah, looks sort of familiar. You've seen him up here at Crystal Lake? Yeah, I think so. Four or five days ago. Well, what do you know? Looks like my luck's changing. I hit the jackpot on my first nickel. Well, it depends on what jackpot you're talking about, Johnny. What do you mean? Well, for one thing, I could be wrong about the identification. <laughs> I guess you haven't been wrong about many of them in your time. I uh, suppose he was the guy, so what? Why are you looking for him, anyway? Mainly to find out if he's still alive. <laughs> what makes you think he's not? Nothing definite, but a hunch that's getting stronger by the minute. Oh? Insurance investigators are operating on hunches these days, huh? Once in a while. Just like deputy sheriff's hands. Yeah, all right. So hunches sometimes do pan out. But you could be way out in the pasture, Johnny. Maybe the guy just had an argument with his wife and he walked out on Oh, sure, yeah, I thought of that. But then I saw his wife. Nobody in his right mind would walk out on her. Mm, like that, huh? Like that. Look, Ants, can you give me any dope on this guy? No, not much. He came to see me about five days ago. Why? Mainly to ask me a silly question. Silly? Yeah. He asked me if there was a guy named Bill around Crystal Lake somewhere. Oh, I take it there's more than one. Yeah, fistful, Johnny. Bill Cullen, who tends bar at the hotel. Bill Jensen, who runs the boathouse. Bill Pickens, who clerks at the hardware. Yeah, okay, Bill... okay, I get the idea. I take it Russell didn't know which Bill he wanted, huh? Nope. Well, at least I know he was here at Crystal Lake now. You, uh, you haven't seen him since, huh? You know, just once. Oh? That same night. He was in the bar at the hotel talking to Betty Norton. Who's she? Heiress to the Norton estate. Mining. She's got a big place on the other side of the lake near Lookout Point. Know anything about her? Phew, all I want to. Oh. She travels at a pretty good clip. Oh, I see. Well, thanks for the information, Ace. You know, what are you going to do now? Try to find Edward Russell. Alive or otherwise. Is that a hunch of yours still operating? It hasn't gotten any weaker. Oh, uh, just one thing, Johnny. Mm. This is a pretty high-grade resort here. Things are nice and peaceful. I, uh, I like to keep it that way. Sure. So, so don't go off half-cocked, huh? For instance? For instance, don't start accusing anybody of murder unless or until you find a body. <laughs> and if I do find a body? Oh, then looks like we'll have to start doing a little accusing. I left Ansel Garrett's office and walked around the village. All I knew so far was that Edward Russell, or somebody who looked like him, had been in Crystal Lake several days ago, inquiring about a man named Bill, and that he'd been at the bar with a dough-heavy girl named Betty Norton. There were a flock of Bills in town, but there was only one Betty Norton, so I decided to start with her. I drove around the lake to her home, an elaborate lodge-type place that sprawled along the shore. Betty was down on her boat dock in a bathing suit, and she was a pretty elaborate-looking job herself. I was just going for a swim. Come on, join me. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Norton. I'm not equipped at the moment. Oh, there's some trunks in the dressing room. Yeah, well, look, I'd like to talk to you about something, But so... I don't feel like talking right now. I feel like swimming. But this is important. It's about... So is swimming. If you want to talk to me, you've got to go swimming first. <sighs> okay, we'll play it your way. That's the only way I ever play it, Mr. Dollar. So we went swimming. And I swam hard but mainly to keep from freezing to death. The water should have been accused by the feel of it, but Betty seemed to think it was normal. After a while, we climbed back onto the land. Wonderful, huh? Oh. Here's a towel. Oh, it's great, sure. Only about 20 degrees. Too cold. <laughs> Makes the sun feel better. Yeah. Hot and cold, Johnny. Contrast. Mm. That's what puts the charge in life. Is it? I wouldn't know. Hey, look, do you mind now if I ask you a couple of questions? Go ahead. You know a man named Edward Russell? I don't think so. I think you do. You had a drink with him at the hotel several nights ago. So this I do once in a while. Am I supposed to remember all of them? This one might have mentioned he was looking for a guy named Bill. Well, I remember now. He thought the bartender might be the one he was looking for, Bill Collins. So what happened? How should I know? I left. You haven't seen Russell since? Nope. Haven't missed him either. Oh, great. 
And for this kind of information, I practically freeze to death in that ice trough you laughingly call a lake. <laughs> Maybe your trip wasn't a waste of time after all, Johnny. No. We met. Well, uh... What do you do with your spare time? <laughs> well, A, I don't expect to have much, and B, isn't that sort of a leading question? Mm, I'm pretty good at leading. You must have trouble finding guys to dance with, huh? Why don't you try it sometime? Huh? I left on that, feeling like a fly who spotted the web at the last moment. And right now, I was feeling just about as useless as a fly, too. I wasn't getting even close to locating Edward Russell. I went back to my room and the phone was ringing. Johnny Dollar. Yeah, it's Garrett, Johnny. Sheriff's office. Oh, hi. Well, you can quit looking for Russell. We found him. Well, that's good news. Is it? He's dead. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a cabin with a lovely view of a beautiful lake. A nice, comfortable, quiet spot for murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Wythe, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hey, it's Garrett, Johnny, Sheriff's Office. You can quit looking for Edward Russell. We found him. Well, that's good news. Is it? He's dead. What? Yeah, been dead for three or four days. Where'd you find him? In a cabin on the other side of the lake. Your hunch was good. And expensive. What do you mean? It'll cost the company I represent a cool $50,000. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Amalgamated Life Associates, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Crystal Lake Matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item three, $2.55. Telegram to Tom Wilkins of Amalgamated Life Associates, notifying him of Edward Russell's murder. I was reasonably sure the telegram wouldn't make Tom sleep any easier. I headed for the office of Ansel Garrett, deputy sheriff in charge of the Crystal Lake substation. Sit down. Not good, huh, Johnny? No, not good. Not good at all. Who found the body, Ants? A fellow named Bixby's waiting next door. I figured you'd want to talk to him. Thanks, I do. First, though, I'd, uh, I'd like you to run over what you know about this deal again for me. I want to know just where we stand in it. People at this resort pay a lot of money for peace and quiet. I don't want to disturb it any more than I can help. Good luck. The meaning? Meaning if you know where you stand in this deal, you're a lot better off than I am, and I've got a strong hunch a lot of peace and quiet's going to get disturbed before it's wound up. I don't like your hunches, Johnny. you got a way of proving out. <laughs> like the one about Russell being dead. I suppose you give me the rundown. Okay, okay. And I can make it short because there's not much to tell. The company I represent holds a $50,000 policy on Russell. 
About a week ago, he disappeared. And his wife filed a missing persons report? Yeah, Leona Russell over in Denver. Mm. She said her husband had told her he was going on an overnight business trip to Boulder. He never came back. His car was found in a garage in Colorado Springs. And his wife couldn't account for it? No. She said she was completely in the dark. I take it she's his beneficiary. Oh, yeah, sure. I thought of that, too. I asked her about it. What kind of an answer did you get? Tears, mostly. And a pretty withering look. Either she's completely clean or she's one of the best actresses I've ever seen. The rest of the story you told me. How Russell came into your offices several days ago looking for a guy named Bill. Last name and description unknown. You know, like I said, there's a flock of Bills in this neck of the woods. Yeah, no. The bartender, the man who runs the boathouse, a clerk in the hardware store, a few assorted others. Hmm. I uh, told you I saw Russell having a drink with Betty Norton the same night he came to see me. You check her out? Yeah, yeah. I had to go swimming with her in that sub-zero lake before she'd answer any questions, though. And then what I got from her was nothing. She said she'd met Russell at the hotel, had a drink with him, then left. That's all you've got, huh? That's it. Well, that's precious little to go on. I'll let you talk to Mr. Bixby. Oh, uh, Mr. Bixby, would you step in here, please? This is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator, Mr. Clarence Bixby. Hi. How are you? Not too good at the moment. <laughs> you got troubles. It was my cabin the body was in. Oh. The padlock had been changed, Johnny. Here it is. No fingerprints other than Bixby's. I monkeyed with it for a while until I realized my key wouldn't fit, and then I pried it open with a big screwdriver. Mr. Bixby, would you mind showing me your cabin and just what happened? I guess not. Doesn't matter much now, anyway. What do you mean? Well, I was going to show the cabin to a guy when we found the body. He wanted to buy the place. But who'd want to buy it now? Bixby and I drove halfway around the lake. His cabin was a couple of hundred feet from the edge and had a good view of the water. Well, a nice spot here, Bixby. It was. You use the cabin much? Yeah, I haven't been able to regularly for the last couple of years. I got to figure, and you know, I keep on paying for taxes and upkeep on it. So I decided to sell it. Did you advertise it in the papers? I did. And first crack out of the box, I got a hot prospect. He's the one you brought up here to show the cabin to. Huh? That's right. His name's Putnam. Putnam. I'd like to talk to him. Yeah, he's staying at the hotel. Probably looking for another cabin to buy. Yeah, here we are. Yeah. Well, let's see. This is where the padlock was, huh? That was the first thing I noticed, that the padlock had been changed. The one I had on there was better. Whoever did it probably pried the first one off. Yeah, right here is where I, I pried off the lock this morning. Mm -hmm. Then what? And I opened the door. The body was on the floor right over here. Bullet hole in the forehead. I see. Putnam turned green, and I... Well, that's not a very pretty sight to find in your own cabin. No. Well, let's go sit outside. The dead man, Edward Russell. Did you happen to know him, Bixby? No. Never set eyes on him before. Why did they have to pick my cabin? <laughs> That's a good question. Hey, that cabin about a hundred yards away, who lives there? Oh, that one? Owned by the Butler family. They spend their summers up here. Oh, maybe they saw or heard something. No, Deputy Sheriff questioned them. They arrived here three days ago. He figured that was the morning after the killing. I see. Have a cigar? No, no thanks. What does it add up to, Dollar? Well, at the moment, Mr. Bixby, not much. I sat there and watched Bixby tie his cellophane cigar wrapper into a neat little knot. And I realized that was exactly my situation at the moment. The whole deal was a knot, and I didn't know how to untie it. I went back to the hotel... Item four, an expense account, $1.75. Telephone call to the dead man's wife, Leona Russell, over in Denver. It was very considerate of you to telephone, Mr. Dollar. The authorities notified me of what happened. They want me to come up there and confirm the identification. I see. You don't think it could be somebody else? Mm, I'm sorry, Mrs. Russell. I'm afraid not. I guess I'd really given up hoping... All the time I was trying to tell myself he was alive, but... Um, yes, yes. Um, look, Mrs. Russell, have you ever heard of a man named Clarence Bixby? Bixby? No. Your husband was found in Bixby's cabin. Did you ever hear him mention the name? No. Okay. 
Thanks anyway. I'll keep in touch. I hung up and sat there a moment, thinking her over. She stood to benefit to the tune of $50,000 by her husband's death. She seemed on the up and up, and yet... Expense account item five, another call to Denver, to the police department. I wanted them to check, check on her, but I found out that they and Ansel Garrett working together were a couple of jumps ahead of me. They'd already checked on Leona and established the fact that at the time of her husband's murder here at Crystal Lake, she'd been in Denver. I decided to look up Putnam, the man who'd wanted to buy Russell's cabin. I found him in the bar at the hotel. Yes, I tell you, it was quite a shock, Mr. Dollar. When Bixby opened his cabin door, a body sprawled there in front of us. It... <sighs> yes, sir, quite a shock. Yeah. How come you decided to buy Bixby's cabin, Mr. Putnam? Well, my wife and I had been on the lookout for a cabin for some time. When I saw Bixby's ad in the paper, it sounded like just the sort of place I was looking for. I see. So I answered the ad, made the arrangements with Bixby to come up here and have him show me the place. Mm Mm-hmm. Are you still interested in buying a cabin up here? Uh, Possibly. I've always wanted a place where I can come for rest now and then, but after what's happened, I don't think I'd be too happy in Bixby's place. Mr. Putnam, the dead man's name was Edward Russell. Did, uh, did you happen to know him? Of course not. Why? Ever hear of him before? See here, Mr. Dollar, what is your reason for asking questions like that? Surely you don't think I'm involved in any of this? No, routine, Mr. Putnam. Well, I don't care for the routine, Mr. Dollar. Well, look, I would... Skip it. See you later, Putnam. What pulled me into action was a glimpse I caught of the bartender. I started remembering a few things. Number one, Edward Russell had been looking for a guy named Bill. Number two, the bartender was one of several guys by that name here at Crystal Lake. Number three, something I saw on the bartender's face made me think he could be the bill that Russell had been looking for. I left Putnam's table and slid onto a stool at the bar. Hi. Hi. What'll it be? Is, uh, is that I.W. Harper there? Yeah. And soda, please. Have it up. Sort of quiet this evening, huh? Yeah, yeah. Been a little slack this season so far. I imagine it'll pick up later on this summer. Yeah, there you are. Thanks. Must have been quite a fight. Come again? You're wearing what looks like the tail end of a black eye. Oh, yeah, that. No, I, I've been down to pick up a bottle of mix the other day, and I bumped my face on the coin of the bar. You're uh, sure that's the way it happened, huh? Where are you getting at, pal? Better take a look at my car now. Insurance investigator. Yeah. A guy named Edward Russell was in here a few nights ago with Betty Norton. He was looking for someone named Bill. By some strange coincidence, your name is Bill. And by an even stranger coincidence, you've got a black eye. Okay, Donna. So Russell did give me the black eye. I traded him a split lip for it. What happened? I still haven't figured it out. He was in here drinking. He started talking to Miss Norton. She called me by my first name and... Suddenly, this Russell heats up. He comes up to me and starts asking me a bunch of questions. What kind of questions? Well, mainly had I ever lived in Denver. I told him no, but he didn't seem to believe me. Got pretty insulting, and we ended up outside. He pasted me first, and I let him have one. Then I spotted the hotel manager and broke it off. They left right after that. Well, why the cover-up about hitting your face on the bar? Are you kidding? Look, how long do you think a bartender would last in a hotel like this if the management knew he got in a fight with a customer? Particularly if the customer winds up dead, huh? Yeah, I heard about the killing this afternoon. Tough, but I must say that guy was asking for trouble. I don't know what was eating him, but something sure was. You didn't see him after that night? No. Check on me if you want. Oh, don't worry, I will. I... Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? You said something a minute ago that just rang a bell. You said they left together after the fight. Who's they? Russell and Miss Norton. You sure about that? You sure she was with him when he left? Sure, I'm sure. You don't miss any tricks about a guy like that. Hey, look. If he told you different, I don't want to get nobody in trouble. That's where you and I differ, Bill. There's one person I want to get in trouble real bad. Who? The person who killed Russ. And right now, Betty Norton looked like an interesting possibility. I went outside and started walking along the lakeshore in the moonlight, thinking about it. She told me she'd left alone after one drink with Russell. But according to the bartender, she'd lied. She and Russell had left together. The motive stumped me, though. As far as I could figure, Leona Russell was the only one who could profit by her husband's death. Yet she didn't kill him. But Betty Norton, the girl who always had to play everything her way... I decided to have another talk with her and turned to go back to the hotel, and I stopped. Out of the corner of my eye, I'd seen a movement near a tree on the slope above me. 
A shadow where there shouldn't have been a shadow. I scrambled up the slope. There was nobody in sight. So somebody was keeping an eye on me. Somebody who knew this area pretty well. A nasty thought started pecking away at me. To wit, in getting closer to Russell's killer, I might be getting closer to something else, too. A bullet. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a girl who lied and a padlock that didn't. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. This is Betty Norton. I've been trying to call you. I know I was out. I'm sorry. You keep pretty late hours. It's after midnight. Did I wake you up? No. Good. Why don't you come over? The moon's real nice tonight. The lake is luscious. I'll come over, Betty. But not to talk about the moon or the water. Oh. Got something else on your mind, maybe? Yeah. A little thing called murder. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account continued. Item six, two dollars. Tip to the Crystal Lake Hotel garage attendant for rousting him out of bed to get my car. I wanted very much to have another talk with Betty Norton, the wealthy, glamorous girl on the other side of the lake. She had told me she hadn't been with Edward Russell when he left the hotel bar the night he was murdered. But the bartender at the hotel swore that she and Russell had left together. If she'd lied about that, maybe she'd lied about a few other things. When I got to her Lakeshore mansion, she had a few well-spaced dim lights burning, a dreamy-type record playing, and some drinks mixed. The whole bit. Here you are, Johnny. Bourbon, isn't it? Yeah. Ah, you've got a good memory, Betty. Sure. I always remember what's important. Or what you want to remember. Same thing. Isn't it? How about the things you don't want to remember? Meaning? A couple of questions I want to ask you. Oh, now don't start making with those dull questions again. Look, let's just have a drink. <laughs> Last time I had to go swimming with you before you'd answer. This time it's got to be a drink, huh? Well, I thought we might dance, too. With you leading, I suppose. Sorry, Betty. I know you probably own quite a few things in this world, but the list stops short of me. I want some answers from you, and I want them now. Okay, so be a party pooper. So ask questions. You told me you met Edward Russell in the hotel bar the night he was murdered. You had one drink with him and left. That's right. You lied, Betty. Who says so? The bartender at the hotel. 
My, and I've always tipped him so well, too. Look, baby, suppose we cut the comic routines, huh? All right. So I left the bar with Russell. Why did you lie about it to me this afternoon? It's very simple, Johnny. Part of the Norton training, I guess. What does that mean? My father told me long ago I could do whatever I liked, but to keep it out of the newspapers. That's the way I've played it ever since. Well, go on. On that night you're talking about, Russell and the bartender got into a fight. I know. And that's why I lied to you. Believe me. I just didn't want to be mixed up in anything that could land in the papers. I see. What happened then? He and I went to a coffee shop to sober him up a little. You can check that. I will. Then what? He kept mumbling about somebody named Bill he was looking for. Did you say much about him? No, it wasn't making very much sense. And then Hiram came into the coffee shop. Who? Hiram, the old fellow who drives what passes for a taxi here at the lake. He told Russell somebody wanted to see him. Russell left with Hiram. And you didn't see Russell after that? No, I didn't. You don't look convinced, Johnny. I'm not. You lied once before, you could be lying again. Sorry. I told you I lied before, but this time it's the truth. Mm-hmm. Where can I get in touch with Hiram? His number's on the cover of the local directory. Local directory. This one over here? Yes. Okay. Johnny, at this time of night? Yes, at this time of night. He doesn't usually take calls after midnight. Mm. Uh, sleep around somewhere, I guess. Well, I'll check him in the morning. What is it? Shh, quiet. Johnny, what is it? What's the matter? I thought I heard something outside here. Could it have been one of your servants? Well, I only have a housekeeper with me here, and she went to bed hours ago. Hmm. There are a lot of deer around here. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, maybe. Johnny, you call Hiram in the morning. He'll back my story up. It's crazy thinking I had anything to do with Russell's murder. What possible reason could I have? A pretty weird one, maybe, but it might fit. You told me this afternoon you had to play everything your way. You've probably been doing it most of your life and getting away with it. Maybe Russell wouldn't cooperate. Are you kidding? Look, men like Russell are a dime a dozen. So I had a drink with him and got mixed up in a barroom brawl. I should have known better. But as far as getting interested in him, I wasn't. Believe me, I can always find others who like to... Play it my way, as you put it. Hmm. What's the matter? Oh, you kill me. That gold-plated front you put on. I wonder if behind it you aren't just a hollow, lonely kid. Thanks a lot for reminding me, Mr. Freud. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I guess that was a little out of line. I guess I was asking for it. But you're wrong about me not being able to stand anyone who doesn't play it my way. You see, I found someone who won't. And I kind of like it. Kind of like you, that is. Um, <clears throat> yeah, look, uh, oh, I guess Oh, don't better... worry. I'm not going to try to appropriate you or, or to buy you. But about the loneliness? Don't leave just yet, Johnny. Stay just a f few minutes more. Okay. Just a few minutes. I guess I felt a little sorry for her and her loneliness. Or maybe it was... Well, anyway, I stayed a few minutes more. I think it was just a few minutes. My watch had stopped. First thing in the morning, I tried to get Hiram the cab driver on the phone again, but still no answer. I headed for Deputy Sheriff Ansel Garrett's office. Clarence Bixby, who owned the cabin where Russell's body was found, was with him. Good morning, Johnny. Hans, Mr. Bixby. Good oh, morning, Dolly. Anything new? Not much. Well, I won't take up any more of your time, Sheriff. Uh, however, I would like to ask a favor of you, though. What is it? So far, the Denver papers haven't mentioned which cabin up here the body was found in. Now, I'd appreciate it if it could be kept that way. Otherwise, if it got out, I'm afraid my chances of selling the place would be pretty dim. Yeah, and anybody who'd want to buy it for that reason would probably be the kind of person not very welcome here at the lake. Okay, Bixby. Sounds reasonable enough. I'll see what I can do. Much obliged, Sheriff. Cigar? No, thanks. Dollar? No, no thanks. Well, see you later, fellas. I'll be around a day or two more if you want me for 
Okay. Well, how do things look this morning, Johnny? Just like Bixby's cigar wrapper. Hmm? I wish he'd quit tying those things in knots. Every time he does it, it reminds me that we're right in the middle of a knot we can't untie. Yeah. It's a bear, all right. Oh, brother, it's worse than that. A guy named Edward Russell takes off from his home in Denver and disappears. He turns up here looking for a guy named Bill, of which there are too many in this town. Then Bixby brings a prospect up here to show his cabin, too. He finds the padlock's been switched. Russell's body inside. Yeah. Ants, the only person who stood to profit financially on Russell's death is his wife, Leona, beneficiary on his $50,000 insurance policy. Mm. But she couldn't have killed him. The Denver police established her in Denver at the time. Oh, incidentally, she's up here at the lake now, Johnny. Oh, yeah, she told me over the phone you wanted her to confirm the identification. How'd she bear up? Uh, Not too well. It was kind of rough. You got any information out of Betty Norton? Well, her story is she had coffee with Russell after his fracas with a bartender... Hiram, the cab driver, came in and told Russell somebody was looking for him. Russell went away with Hiram. You checked with Hiram? I've been trying to get in touch with him on the phone. No answer. Yeah, he's on the go a lot. He keeps his cab behind the hotel garage. We can check there and leave a message for him. Yeah, okay. Yes. What about Bixby as a possibility? I thought of that too, Johnny. It had taken an awful lot of nerve to kill a guy and then arrange to discover the body in your own cabin, but... It sure would be quite a cover. Yeah. Yeah, But like you say, it'd take more nerve than most men have got. Besides, we run a check on Bixby, and we've turned up absolutely nothing to tie him into the deal at all. Now, there's no evidence he'd ever known Russell. I know. Leona Russell can't remember her husband ever mentioning Bixby's name. I, uh... Hey, wait a minute. How about Putnam? The guy who wanted to buy Bixby's cabin? Yeah. The same thing could apply to him. He knew the cabin was empty... He could have planted Russell's body there and then arranged for Bixby to open the cabin. It could be, except how does he tie in? I don't know. He said he and his wife wanted to buy the cabin. Might be interesting to check with his wife and see what she says. Not a bad idea, Johnny. I'll put in a long-distance call to her. Don't count on much, though. At this point, Ansel, I'm counting on nothing. And I wasn't. I was getting nowhere trying to match a logical motive with any of the suspects. I decided I might as well continue checking guys named Bill around town and see if I could find the one Russell had been looking for. I went down to Bill's boathouse at the landing. Bill Jensen ran. It was a stocky, heavyset man in his late 20s. His face looked friendly enough. That is, if you weren't paying much attention to his eyes. They were about the coldest shade of blue I'd ever seen. What can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? Boat, maybe? A little information, maybe. What about? A man named Edward Russell. The guy who was murdered? What about him? Did he come around here to your boathouse? Not that I know of. Well, he was looking for a man named Bill, and I thought you might be the one. No. No, Aunt Garrett was telling me about him, but I'm not the one he was looking for. Sorry. Did you have to see him around town anywhere? Russell? No. First time I saw him was his picture in the paper after the killing. I see. Hey, you got quite a lot of boats here, Jensen. Yeah, pretty big investment in them. You keep the ones here in the boathouse padlocked, I see. No, I have to. Used to get one stolen now and then. Say, you want to take one out in the lake now, Mr. Dollar? Uh, not right now, Jensen. Maybe later. See you around. All of a sudden, I was real interested in Bill Jensen and his boathouse. Because some of the padlocks on the boats looked very much like the one that had been placed on Bixby's cabin door. The one he pried off when he discovered Russell's body. I wanted a closer look at those padlocks, but now wasn't the time. I went on back to the hotel to look for Hiram, but his taxi still wasn't there. So I left him a message to contact me as soon as possible. Then, after dark, I went back to the boathouse. There was nobody around. I slipped in the back and took a close look at the boat padlocks. Yeah, no doubt about it. They were the same kind as the one on Bixby's door. And one of them was missing. Yeah, Bill Jensen could be my boy. I hit the deck fast behind one of the boats and looked around me. It was a bad spot to be in. I was pinned against a wall. I edged toward the rear, then dove for the door of the tiny office. Then I realized my mistake. I'd figured that the office would have an outside door, but it didn't. I was trapped. Yeah, it looked like I'd just solved the murder. The hard way. Now, 
here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a shot in the dark that missed, and another that hit the bullseye. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ansel Garrett, Johnny. I was out when you phoned a minute ago. Ants, get over here fast. What's the matter? I'm trapped in the office of Jensen's Boathouse. Trapped? Look, I've got no time to explain. There's a man outside with a gun, and I can't hold him off much longer. Who is it? I don't know, but I've got a strong hunch it's the one who murdered Russell. And he's trying to do likewise to me. Tonight... And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account continued. Item seven, two cents. Just about what I figured my life was worth at the moment. The tiny office I was in had no windows and no outside door. A real trap. And outside in the darkened boathouse, somebody with a gun was stalking me. Probably the killer I'd been looking for. But now he was looking for me. I stacked what furniture there was against the door. He started throwing his weight against it. And it couldn't last very long. There was nothing I could do but wait. Right then, the sound of Ants Garrett's voice outside was just about the sweetest music this side of heaven. Drop the gun! Drop it! You okay, Johnny? Yeah, yeah, just a minute. I'll get this stuff away from the door. Okay. Light switch here somewhere. There. Well... Bill Jensen. So you're my boy, Jensen. What are you talking about? What are you doing here anyway, Dollar? Getting shot at by you, mostly. Look, this is my boathouse, remember? You got no business to come prowling around here. Now simmer down, Bill. Simmer down. I thought he was a prowler, Ants. Oh, yeah, sure. You knew I was getting close to you, Jensen. You decided to put me out of the ball game, and you came pretty close, believe me. I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. I figured it was somebody after my boat again. expect me to buy a hold story now, like that? Just hold it a second, both of you. If I can get a word in edgewise around here, maybe we can straighten things out. They're pretty straight right now, as far as I can see. Maybe. Bill, you claim you figured Johnny was a prowler trying to steal something, huh? How would you figure it, Ants? I see somebody sneaking into the boathouse and catch a glimpse of somebody else hanging around outside. Wait a outside. minute, wait a minute. Somebody else who? Man or woman? I couldn't tell. Whoever it was got out of sight mighty fast. Oh, sure. Pretty convenient story, Jensen. Somebody around here has been keeping an eye on me right from the start. But right now, it figures to be you. Look, Dollar, I'm... Hold it, Bill! A couple of Jensen's boats have turned up missing lately, Johnny. It's natural he might think that yeah, you... Yeah, and something else has turned up missing here, too, Ants. What do you mean? That's why I came here to the boathouse tonight in the first place. 
When I was here this afternoon, I noticed that the padlocks on his boats were missing. One of them was missing. They looked an awful lot like the one that Russell's killer put on the cabin door when he planted the body there. A lock's a lock, Johnny. Yeah, but one of Jensen's is missing. Don't forget that. Oh? Here, come here. Take a look. Right there. Yeah. Yeah, So it is. How about it, Jensen? I didn't even know it was gone. How do I know what happened to it? Somebody stole it. Probably the same guy who stole those boats last month. Look, look, if you're trying to involve me in Russell's murder, you're wasting your time. I didn't even know the guy, and you got nothing to tie me into it. No? Then you better listen to a few facts, Jensen. Edward Russell took off from his home in Denver and came up here to Crystal Lake looking for a guy named Bill, which just happens to be your name. Half a dozen other Bills in town, too, Dollar. Now, what does that prove? Russell's body was found in Bixby's vacant cabin when Bixby brought a prospect up to show him the place. Bixby's lock had been taken off the door and a new one put on. Your padlock, Jensen. I already told you somebody must have stolen it from Then I come around to your boathouse here to check on the locks and you start throwing shots at me. You figure it out. You haven't got a case against me and you know it, Dollar. Just the same, Jensen. You better come down to my office with us. I got a few more questions I want to ask you. And I'd like to check your gun against the slug that killed Russell. Go ahead. Check it. Sure, I'll come down with you, Ants. I want to get this straightened out, too. But let me tell you something, Dollar. Next time you come around my boathouse without a search warrant, I won't miss. We questioned Jensen for an hour, but he didn't change his story. He kept denying any connection with the murdered man, Edward Russell, or his wife, Leona. Afterward, Anson and I went into his office. I don't think we got enough to hold him on, Johnny. Yeah. Well, for one thing, his gun's a different caliber than the one that killed Russell. Oh, sure, he could have used a different gun, but we'd have to find it to prove anything. Well, what about the padlock? Mm-hmm. That's a point, all right, but it's our only point. Somebody could have stolen it, like Jensen said. A frame? Could be. <laughs> Jensen sure sticks to his story. <sighs> yeah. I threw everything I could think of at him, but he didn't crack an inch. Well, after all, Johnny, you were out of line going into his boathouse like that. So I should have had a search warrant. It wasn't time. You know, you got quite a knack for stirring up trouble. If you're wrong about Jensen and the other suspects, you're going to owe a few apologies. Apologies I don't mind handing out. But Russell's killer I want. You think I don't? Deputy Sheriff Garrett speaking. What? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, put it through. It's Mrs. Putnam in Denver, Johnny, wife of the man who wanted to buy Bixby's cabin. Yeah. I put a call into her earlier, hope... You... Hello? Oh, yeah, Mrs. Putnam. This is Deputy Sheriff Garrett up at Crystal Lake. Yeah, the reason I'm calling, your husband tells us you and he had been interested in buying a cabin up here for some time. I thought I'd check with you. What's that? You sure about that? I see. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Mrs. Putnam. Well, I guess your hunches are still clicking, Johnny. She didn't know anything about it, huh? Not a thing. Didn't even know her husband was up here. Look, gentlemen, I've already told you all about it. I saw Bixby's ad in the paper about his cabin here being for sale. It it sounded like just a thing that... That That you and your wife had in mind, Mr. Putnam? Yes, yes, exactly. So I... You can hold it right there, Putnam. You lied to us. I most certainly did not. Your wife doesn't seem to know anything about it. Oh, my wife? Good Lord. Is she up here? No. No, I talked to her on the phone. You, you, You didn't tell her about my wanting to buy the cabin. Yeah, Putnam, I did. You lied, Putnam. And there could be a pretty good reason for it. Look, I... You knew Bixby's cabin was empty. You could have planted Russell's body there and then pretended to want to buy the place so Bixby would open it up and the body would be discovered. It would make a pretty good cover for you. Oh, gentlemen, please. I'm in enough trouble as it is right now without you piling more on. I had nothing to do with Russell's murder. I didn't even know the man. What do you mean about being in trouble, then? Oh, with my wife. Look, it's probably hard for the two of you to understand... You don't know my wife. Don't know your wife? What about? I did lie about her wanting the cabin. She didn't know anything about it. We know that. I just wanted a place to... 
well to get away from her once in a while. Ants looked at me, and I looked at Ants. And I guess we both had the same idea. The idea that we'd run another in a long series of blanks. We heard Putnam out a long and familiar tale of woe. We could establish no connection between him and the dead man, so we finally left. We left him in the middle of a long sentence about what his wife said to him every time he got home from the office late. Ants and I went outside. The lake was silver in the moonlight, and a million stars were crowding the sky. A good night to be young, but at the moment I was feeling 90 years old. Getting you down, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah, right now I feel like an old beat-up merry-go-round. <laughs> I've been going round and round, and my bearings are getting creaky. Yeah, the trouble is we've checked out just about everybody who could possibly be involved. It's motive that beats me, Ants. The only one we know of to gain by Russell's death is his wife, Leona, beneficiary of his $50,000 insurance policy. Yeah, but the Denver police established her in Denver at the time Russell was killed up here. Yeah, she couldn't have done it. We've got only one more lead as far as I can figure. The guy who drives the local taxi here at the lake. Huh? Yeah. He keeps his car right over there in that shed. I know. That's why I was heading this way. Shed's empty, though. Benny Norton told me when she was with Russell the night he got killed, his Hiram came up and told Russell somebody was looking for him. Drove him away. Well, Hiram could have a line on the killer. But I can't seem to get a line on Hiram. I've tried to call him half a dozen times. I've left a message for him to contact me, but I haven't had a word from him. I don't like it. Our boys are looking for him. No sign yet. Well, we're not getting anywhere right now. Hey, look, if you're off duty, Ants, I'll buy you a drink in the hotel room. I am, and you got a deal. Of course, there's one possibility been in the back of my mind all along, Johnny. Yeah, probably in yours, too. You mean the killer could be somebody we don't even know about, a stranger? Yeah. Yeah, those are the toughest ones to crack. I know. Hmm. Lobby's kind of crowded tonight. We're getting into the busy season. Mr. Dollar. Hey, it's Leona Russell. Excuse me a minute, Ants. Meet you in the bar. You're right. Good evening, Mrs. Russell. I didn't know you were still here. I'm leaving in the morning. The sheriff asked me to come up here and make an identification of the body. I know. Afterward, I just couldn't seem to get myself organized. I took one of the hotel cottages for a day or two. Such a peaceful spot up here. It's hard to believe. Yes, I understand. Uh, Mrs. Russell, your husband came up here apparently looking for a man named Bill. I've questioned two Bills so far, Cullen the bartender and Jensen the boatkeeper. Those names mean anything to you? Not that I recall. <laughs> That's what's so terrible about this whole thing, Mr. Dollar. There just doesn't seem to have been any connection between anybody up here and my husband. Why would anyone have done it? That's a good question, Mrs. Russell. And right now, we don't seem to have an answer for it. I went into the bar, but Aunt Garrett was nowhere in sight. The bartender told me he'd been called away. Expense account item eight, 75 cents, one drink. I waited. Still no Garrett. After a while, I went on the back of the hotel to check on Hiram's taxi cab. Nothing. The message I'd left him was still there. I went back into the bar, but Ants didn't show up. Finally, I went up to my room. Johnny Dollar. Hey, it's Garrett, Johnny. Oh, hi. I tried to call you in the bar just now. They told me you'd gone to your room. I got tired waiting for you. Sorry. I got hauled away on official business. I'm calling from a gas station up near the three-mile grade. Hey, trouble? Plenty. Johnny, seems like when you go looking for people, it always turns out to be bad luck for them. What do you mean? You came up here looking for Russell. He turned up dead. Now you've been looking for Hiram, the taxi driver. Don't tell me. Afraid so. We just fished his body out of a ravine. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up, the payoff. A payoff with illegal tender. Hot lead. Join us, won't you? Yours truly... Johnny Dollar.
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ansel Garrett, Johnny. I'm calling from a gas station up near the Three Mile Grade, ten miles north of the lake. Trouble? Plenty. Johnny, seems like when you go looking for people, it always turns out to be bad luck for them. What do you mean? You came up here to Crystal Lake looking for Edward Russell. He turned up dead. Now you've been looking for Hiram the taxi driver. Don't tell me. Afraid so. We just fished his body out of a ravine. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is a final accounting of expenses and report of my investigation of the Crystal Lake matter. <laughs> Item 9, one dollar. Tip to the garage man to get my car out in a hurry. I drove up to the three-mile grade. Deputy Sheriff Ansel Garrett was waiting for me beside the highway and led the way down the ravine. It, watch the foot, Johnny. It's pretty tricky. Yeah. Who discovered Hiram's body? One of my boys patrolling the highway. He spotted a glint of metal down here in the moonlight. Yeah, here we are. Yeah. Oh, brother. Taxi cab and all, huh? What a wreck. Yeah. He crashed the guardrail and came down the slope. I doubt if it was an accident, Ants. When a guy's got a bullet hole in his forehead, it's no accident, Johnny. Looks like the same person who killed Russell killed Hiram to shut his mouth. Uh, I guess that's about the size of it. Hiram's murder opens up another keg of nails, Ants. How so? Well, Betty's story is that the last she saw of Russell the night he was murdered was when he drove away in Hiram's taxi. But that story depended on Hiram for confirmation. You'll never be able to confirm it now. Well, earlier tonight you were beat because you were fresh out of suspects, Johnny. Now you got a real live one again. Maybe. But trying to find a motive to fit Betty Norton as a blind alley. The only one who could benefit financially from Russell's death is his wife, Leona. And she was in Denver at the time. I still think Russell's murder ties in with the fact that he came up here looking for somebody named Bill. And apparently had it in for him. It could be. Trouble is, Johnny, we got too many guys by that name at Crystal Lake. Bill Cullen, the hotel bartender. Bill Jensen at the boathouse. Both of them are still possibilities, Ants. The bartender had a fight with Russell on the night of the murder. And it was one of Bill Jensen's padlocks on the cabin where the body was found. Yeah... It's true enough. Whoever killed Russell and hid his body in Bixby's vacant cabin didn't know that Bixby was planning on selling the place and would bring somebody up to show it and discover the body. Sounds real convincing, Johnny. Now, all you have to do is figure out somebody's name for the whoever and a good motive, and you're all set. Oh, yeah, sure. Real simple. You know, one thing that's been bothering me from the start, though. Why did the killer plant Russell's body in a cabin? With all the wide open spaces around here, why a cabin? Yeah, you could have figured dogs or animals would uncover the body if it was outside somewhere. How about the lake? The bodies have a way of coming to the surface. Yeah, I guess you're right. If we could only have gotten to Hiram before this. 
You happen to know where he lived? No, a little rooming house not far from the hotel. You through here? No, not yet, Johnny. I got a couple of my boys beating the bush around here. Okay, I'll head back to town and see if I can turn up anything of interest at Hiram's rooming house. On the way back to the village, I stopped at Betty Norton's Lakeshore Mansion, but she wasn't at home. Her housekeeper told me she'd gone to Denver for a couple of days. On hearing that, my interest in her as a suspect shot up again. Expense account item 10, $1.45, long-distance call to the Denver police, requesting them to try to locate Betty Norton for further questioning. Then I went to the rooming house where Hiram had lived. I couldn't find anything in his room that would give me a lead on his killer. But as I was coming out, I found someone in the hall who might. Huh? Well, Bill the bartender. Oh, hello, darling. What are you doing here? It's real simple. I live here. Oh, same rooming house as Hiram, huh? That's right. Now, look, don't go trying to tie me into his murder. We was friends. I didn't know the news of his killing was out. How did you know he was dead, Bill? Well, I, I just talked to one of Vance Garrett's boys at the hotel. He told me. Oh, I see. No, you don't see, Dolly. You still fight. Look, Dolly. whoever killed Hiram is the same one who killed Russell. You had a fight with Russell on the night of his death. Yeah, well, I explained that to you before. He was looking for somebody named Bill. He thought I was the one, got tough about it. But that's all there was to it. I didn't kill him. I didn't kill Hiram. You'll never prove it I did. Yeah, going round and round on the merry-go-round. Somewhere along the line, I must have missed something. But I didn't know what. I decided to go back and start from the beginning. In this case, Bixby's cabin, where Russell's body was discovered. I found Bixby in the hotel bar. Hi, Dollar. Care for a drink? No, no thanks, Bixby. Well, I got a little good news earlier this evening. Sheriff Garrett told me he was through checking over my cabin so I can get it cleaned up and repainted now. You gonna advertise it again? Yeah, yeah, I'm not too optimistic about my chances of selling it, though. Even though the location of it's been kept out of the papers, everybody at Crystal Lake here knows about it. Uh, <clears throat> you never found out who put that new padlock on the door, huh? Oh, the lock came from Jensen's boathouse. But we haven't been able to tie in Bill Jensen with any of the rest of it. Look, Bixby, you mind if I take another look around your cabin? Not at all, Dolly. You want me to go with you? No, that won't be necessary. Okay. Here's the key. Help yourself. It was my last chance. Maybe there was something in the cabin that neither Ansel Garrett nor I had noticed before. Something, anything that would give me a lead. I spent an hour going through it inch by inch, and I drew a great big blank. Everything was in place. Nothing had been touched. Even my cigarette butt on the front porch and Bixby's cigar wrapper twisted in a knot where we'd sat and talked after he'd reenacted the discovery of Russell's body. Inside, only marks on the floor where Ansel Garrett's boys had measured the distance of the body from the door, stuff like that. But as far as anything that would give me a fresh lead, there was nothing. Nothing at all. I was licked and I knew it. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Good evening, Mrs. Russell. I just dropped in to say goodbye. Well, that, that was very thoughtful of you. Please come in. Thanks. When are you leaving? I'm checking out in the morning. What are your plans? I'm not sure, Mr. Dollar. I'll probably get rid of the house in Denver and take an apartment for a while. After that, I, I don't know. Have you filed your claim yet on your husband's insurance policy? No, not yet. My lawyer will take care of it for me. I'd rather not have any more to do with things like that personally than I can help. Mr. Dollar, have you gotten anywhere with your investigation? Have you found anyone at all who could have had a reason to kill my husband? To tell you the truth, Mrs. Russell, up to now I've got no... Then I saw it. Something in Leona Russell's room. Just a little thing. But all of a sudden, the whole deal slid neatly into place. But I had to be sure. Somehow, I had to start the ball rolling and see what happened. You were saying, Mr. Dollar? Oh, yeah. I, I was saying that up to now, I haven't been able to get any... Uh, what time is it? Well, um, well a quarter to ten. Oh, i got to make a phone call. Mind if I use your phone? Well, uh, no, not at all. I was supposed to call Deputy Sheriff Garrett to check on a new lead. 
And uh, if it's panned out, looks like we're in. Deputy Sheriff Garrett. Johnny Dollar, Ants. Uh, how's that new lead look? Huh? What new lead? Yeah, good. Hey, what are you... Oh, maybe putting on an act for somebody, Johnny? That's right. Well, looks like we're on the right track at last. Uh, you can't beat a lab test. Thanks, Ants. Something new has developed, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Looks like we're finally closing in on the right man, Mrs. Russell. I gotta run now. Got a date with the sheriff. But I'll keep you posted. I went outside her hotel cottage and waited. I could hear her on the phone. In a moment, she came out. Started along the trail near the lakeshore. I followed. I was sure I was finally getting close to Russell's killer. But then a gun barrel on my back told me I'd gotten a little too close. Hold it, Della. Well, Mr. Bixby. Surprised? As a matter of fact, no. Bill? Is that you, Bill? Dollar. Hello, Leona. Leona, you stupid little... Falling for a gag like Dollar just pulled on you. But I had to talk to you, to warn you. Looks like you're a little stupid, too, Bixby. Huh? I just spotted one of them in Leona's cottage. I told you I should never have come to your cottage, Leona. You insisted. I had to see... That's what threw me about you, Bixby. Clarence Bixby, but a middle name of William, huh? Wilfred. If it'll do you any good now. It was you and Leona right from the start. Her husband found out about it, but all he had to go on was the name Bill. Somehow he got a lead that brought him up here to Crystal Lake. Of course I arranged for him to get the lead. Yeah. You wanted to be easy to find. You had Hiram, the taxi driver, decoy Russell to you, then killed Hiram to shut his mouth. Bill, get rid of him. Then you killed Russell in your own cabin and left his body. I had to. The people of the next cabin moved in that night. I was afraid they'd see me if I moved the body. So you played it smart. You stole a padlock from Bill Jensen to throw suspicion on him. Then you advertised your cabin and discovered the body when a prospect wanted to see the place. A pretty neat cover, Bixby. You had a lot of... I still have, Dolly. Enough to do what has to be done now. And sweet little Leona Russell, the poor grieving wife. In it with you, right from the start. Hurry up and do it, Bill. Then you and I can... Oh, no, that's where you're wrong, Leona. It's not going to be you and I anymore. Bill, you can't say that. You engineered the whole deal right from the start, and I'm sick of it. I'm getting out. You can't get out, Bill. You hear me? You can't. You're in this as deep as I am, and you... Oh, yes. I can get out all right, Leona. I know one good way. Oh, yes, I've used it before, and it works. Here's for you, baby. Bill, no! Bill! He swung the gun toward her. I drove at him, but too late. Oh, Bill! I hit him twice in the face and went down. I bent over Leona, but she was gone. She must have been dead when she hit the ground. Eleventh and final item on expense account, $145.20. Transportation and incidentals from Crystal Lake home. Total expenses, $423 even. Remarks about Bixby. In jail, awaiting trial on three counts of murder. Edward Russell, Hiram, Leona Russell. About Leona, who'd engineered the whole deal for a payoff. Well, she got paid off, all right. End of remarks, end of report. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, beginning on Friday night, because I'm sure you'll want to listen to the Republican convention Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week, a simple string of beads, and each bead on it, a motive for murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Dick Crenna, Charlotte Lawrence, Gene Tatum, Howard McNear, Forrest Lewis, and Herb Ellis. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Remember, next week's story will start on Friday night because of the Republican convention on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So join us Friday, a week from tonight, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Bob Lauder, Johnny. Trite State Guarantee. Hiya, Bob. Been a long time. Uh, I wish it were a longer time. Uh, nothing personal in that, is there? No, no, just bad temper. I'm on the prod, Johnny. We had a pearl necklace swipe, and it's got me irritated. Does the same thing to an oyster the way I hear. Yeah, but in reverse. If an oyster gets irritated, he makes a pearl. I lose a pearl, I get irritated. <laughs> right now I'm irritated 38 pearls worth. Say it money. 20,000 clams. Ever hear of Smiley Prowl? Smiley Prowl. Oh, sure. Small-time jewel thief. Couple of raps. Haven't heard of him lately, though. Well, you're here now. He phoned us from Ohio an hour ago. Says he's got the necklace and wants to talk a deal. Who's your client? girl named Melba Crane, a real snooty tooty the way I get it. Owns a town or something. Anyhow, it's named after her family, Cranesburg, Ohio. Well, if I can find it on the map, I'll see about a plane reservation. Don't bother, Johnny. You already got one. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Tri-State Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Cranesburg matter. Item one, $105.35, incidentals in Hartford and transportation to Cranesburg, Ohio. I checked into the hotel, the Crane Hotel, incidentally, and per instructions, waited for contact by one Smiley Prell jewel thief. That Crane name was beginning to run out of my ears, so for the moment at least, I postponed calling on the family itself. As it happened, though, the family came to me, or at any rate, one of them did. Come in. My name is Phineas Crane, Mr. Dollar. Uh, may I... Oh, sure, sure. Come on in, Mr. Crane. Thank you, sir. You're related to Miss Melba Crane? Melba is my niece. And the necklace belonged to her? That is correct. It was her own personal property, not a part of any family holding. Oh, I see. Well, sit down, won't you, Mr. Crane? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Just who <laughs> constitutes the uh, family you mentioned? Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Dollar, only Melba and myself now. We're the last remaining survivors. Uh, oh, now I see you're unpacking, sir. You just go right ahead and forgive my intrusion. Well, yeah, you did catch me a little by surprise. I just got in town a few minutes ago, and I wasn't expecting visitors. Uh, Mr. Lauder of the insurance company wired that you were coming, and I was waiting here at the hotel. Oh. I understand the thief has approached you. Well, no, not me personally, no. He phoned the main office in Hartford and talked to Lauder. I see. I'll probably hear from him sometime this afternoon. Uh -huh. Now, you say he, Mr. Dollar. Are you certain the call was from a man? Lauder was certain. Do you have some reason to doubt it? Oh, no, oh, no, no, not at all. I, I just wondered... The name he gave is a known jewel thief. Several previous convictions. Smiley Prell. Yes, oh, is that, oh. And the call was made from here in Cranesburg. Yeah, that's right. Is that, well, that's very remarkable. Why so? Well, this is quite a small town, as you've no doubt noticed. Now, a stranger would draw attention. It'd be somewhat uh, conspicuous. Oh, not necessarily. Smiley may have come here some time ago to establish himself. You may even have met him, Mr. Crane. Oh, no, oh, no. Oh, no. well, I'm quite sure that I was well, utterly impossible. Did Lauder wire you a description? Uh, no, no, of course not. Then how can you be so sure? Uh, well, I uh, I just haven't met any strangers in the last few months. Not a one. Oh, I see. Well, I am now at home. Can I uh, can I order you up something from the bar, Mr. Crane? Uh, the, oh, no, 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 thank you. No, I really have to run on. I only stopped in for a minute. Did you have anything special in mind? Oh, no, 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 nothing at all. I, um... I don't believe you, Mr. Crane. Uh, I beg your pardon, sir? Well, I just don't believe you. You care for a cigarette? A cig oh, no, 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 thank you. I, I never smoke. Uh, and I, uh, I must say, I fail to understand your implication. You understand I... it, all right. Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid... Now, what is it, Mr. Crane? I... Is there something phony about the loss of that necklace? Certainly not. Then what's up? I merely came here to offer my help... And Melba's, too, of course. 
I wanted you to know that we'll be glad to cooperate fully in any action you may choose to take. That's very generous of you. And your niece. My niece? Well, uh, she's a very remarkable girl, Melby. Oh? Yes, she's a trifle headstrong at times, of course. Uh, Not always inclined to use the best judgment. Uh Uh-huh. How has she shown this lack of judgment, Mr. Crane? Oh, there's nothing specific at all, but I I did want you... uh, I did want to see you before you talk to her. You understand? And let you know kind of what to expect, as you might say. Well, naturally, she's very upset over the loss of her necklace. I imagine. Uh, You don't have any hope, I suppose, of recovering it? Well, as a matter of fact, I have a lot of hope of recovering it. Possibly within 24 hours. Oh, I see. Oh, well, no. Certainly Mel would be very happy to hear that. It was an engagement gift, you understand, uh, from her fiancé, Dean Sellers, his name. Oh, yeah, she was quite broken up when it was stolen. Well, a $20,000 necklace is a pretty fair loss. Now, Mr. Crane... Oh, it's you... not the intrinsic value at all, Mr. Dowd. No, I suppose not, since that part of it is covered by the insurance. Well, yeah, oh, yes, quite so. But I was referring to the sentimental attachments, you understand. Oh, naturally. And, of course, to the sheer beauty... Oh. Oh, it was lovely, Mr. Wright. You've seen the necklace, I suppose. No, but I've got photographs of it. Oh, yes, of course, yes, from the insurance company. Yeah, it's quite an unusual ornament, with each pearl set individually in a platinum mounting. The whole thing is... Oh, pardon me. Johnny Dollar. This is you know who, Mr. Dollar. Is all right to talk? Yeah, go ahead, shoot. All right. You know where the Green Line Bar is? I'll find it. Well, meet me there, then, in an um, hour and a half. Check. And I won't have it on me, Dollar, so don't go smarty pants on me or you'll be holding the sack. You, you, I just want you and me, you understand? No cops, huh? I've been in this game a long time, Chuck. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I'm counting on, so I'll see you later. That was the thief, I presume? <sighs> so he says. Well, I've got to be running along now. If there's anything I can do... Well, Mr. you can Dollar, finish but... what you were saying about your niece, if you will. Oh, no, no. It was nothing, really. Not at all. I see. Uh, it's just that Melba is a bit too, uh, impulsive at times. Oh. <laughs> Headstrong, you know. She's young and she's foolish, but she never means any actual harm by it. I, um, no, not really, she doesn't. Now, I, I'm sure you understand that, Mr. Dollar. So, a uh, good day, sir. <laughs> Item two, $26 even. Deposit and first day's rental on a hired car. I checked on the location of the Green Lion, 15 minutes from the center of town. So there was plenty of time to follow up another angle before I went to meet Smiley Prell. I parked the car in front of the Cranesburg Bank, went inside and presented my credentials and a letter of introduction to Milton Borkley, president. Uh, step inside the office, Mr. Dollar. We'll have a little privacy at least. Thanks, Mr. Borkley. Uh, have a seat. All right, thanks. Any any recommendation to Bob Lauders is good enough for me. He've handled a lot of investments for Tri-State. He's a fine company. Nice company to work for. Now, what can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? Oh, it's uh, just the usual routine check in cases of this kind. The general financial status of the Crane Bunch. You mean the Crane Chemical Company or the Crane Family? Well, I assume the two went together. No, no, not for several years now. Melba's father sold the last of the family stock a while before his death. Neither Phineas nor Melba have one cent of ownership in the company. I see. Now, the company, of course, is in excellent financial condition. It's the uh, family we're concerned with. Well, there, the picture is a little different. The fact is that although they're the social leaders of the town and everybody figures they're rolling in it, the cranes are broke, flat broke, have been for a couple of years now. But as I understand it, they live at quite a fancy estate out on the edge of town. Sure, and it's mortgaged to the hilt. Hmm. That's very interesting. Of course, uh, lately, old Phineas seems to be going around with a pocket full of money. I don't know where he got it. It is a funny thing. How lately? Since the necklace was stolen? Or before? Oh, long before. Two or three months. Uh, the robbery was only last week. Supposedly, at least. No, I see what you mean, but it's not the answer. Melba wore those pearls to the country club dance just a few days before they were taken. Well, it was an idea. I'll give you a piece of advice, Mr. Dollar. Have more than just an idea before you get too rough with Melba Crane or her uncle. Oh? Yeah, money or no money, they're still top society here. The local aristocrats. And the town kind of takes care of its own. Well, as I said, this is only routine. I don't have the slightest bit of evidence that the Cranes are trying to pull an insurance swindle. 
But I get paid to be suspicious, that's all. Mm-hmm. Well, I wondered myself where Phineas was getting the money. Any ideas about it? No, not unless he's been borrowing from his prospective son-in-law. Dean Sellers? The lad who gave Miss Crane the pearls? Yes. How is he fixed financially? A man who can afford a $20,000 engagement gift? Yeah, we can assume he's eating regularly, I suppose. Well, actually, I don't know too much about him. He's an out-of-towner, came here about eight months ago. Doesn't bank with me. I see. But I will tell you one thing. If he doesn't have money now, he certainly will have before long. <laughs> he's a go-getter, that boy. Yeah, he must be. Here eight months and engaged to the town bell. Oh, he's a whirlwind. Keeps six or eight projects going all at once. For instance, real estate, business promotion, one thing and another. So busy, he even had to postpone the wedding. They were supposed to get hits three weeks ago. Of course, I hear that that may be due to, uh, well... Due to what? Mr. Dollar, this whole thing is odd enough just on the basis of facts. The rumors, I think we'll skip. I'm uh, sure you understand. <laughs> That was the second time I was supposed to, quote, understand, unquote. Phineas Crane was sure I could understand about his niece. And banker Milton Borkley was equally certain about the rumors. As a matter of fact, I understood less about the whole thing than I did when I first got in town. I wasn't getting anywhere. I was losing ground. Item three, a dollar forty, two dry martinis in the Green Lion Bar while I waited for Smiley Prell. He was 20 minutes late, but he finally showed up, slipped into the back booth across from me. Are you, uh, your dollar? Right. Have a drink? No, no, some other time. I only got about one minute. All right. What's your price? No price, not now. Oh, look, Smiley, a minute is not long enough to do much bargaining. Well, I didn't come here to bargain. Well, I did. And we assume from the way you talked on the phone to Hartford, you felt the same way. Uh, just uh, keep your shirt on, chum. We'll, we'll make a deal, all right, but uh, later. Not, not right now. Why not? Because something's come up. i got to get it straightened out first. What? Never mind. Hey, look. You remember this address. 1412 North Oak Street, room 6. Huh? The boarding house. Now, you, you meet me there at 9 o'clock tonight. Oh, wait a minute. What's this all about? I haven't got time, chum. Don't worry. You'll get your beads back one way or another. What do you mean? I mean that somebody's trying to hand old Smiley a real quick shuffle. First class double cross. And I'm going to see to it that somebody gets it right in the neck. Who? Who's the somebody? Never mind. You just sit tight and meet me at 9 o'clock. And I think I'll be in a position to give you a lot more than just the necklace. You understand? Frankly, no. Well, you will. Uh, you're going to understand real good before you're through. So stick around, Dollar. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, when somebody kisses the wrong somebody and somebody gets burnt up over it, and then a gun is found in the ashes, man, it's murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I guess we were cut off, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, apparently. Now, who did you say My you... name's Bartlett, J.D. Bartlett. 
You mean you work for Mr. Bartlett? I mean, I am Mr. Bartlett. I mean, Miss Bartlett. Oh, now you've got me all confused. You're confused? Look, Mr. Dollar, the only J.D. Bartlett in town is me. I'm him. Uh, her, I mean. Now, you see what you've done. I'll never forgive myself. Well, anyway, I'm the tri-state guarantee agent here in Cranesburg, and it seems the least you could have done was to look me up. Well, give me time. I just got in town. You had time to rush out there to that south side bar and start lushing it up. I came out here to this joint to talk to a jewel thief. You what? Jewel thief? It's the guy who phoned Hartford and offered to make a deal on the crane necklace. He claims he's the one who stole it. That for a slight consideration, I can get it back. And what do you think? I think I've walked in on the nuttiest case in the month of Sundays. Hey, look, he's waiting for me at the bar. Suppose I drop by later and... Are you sure J.D. Bartlett is a woman? You're the first man who ever doubted it. I'll see you later, Mr. Dollar. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Tri-State Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Cranesburg matter. Expense account continued. When I told her the case was nutty, I meant it. The start of it had been fairly ordinary. A pearl necklace insured for $20,000 had been stolen from a wall safe in the home of its owner, local socialite Melba Crane. Smiley Prell, a known small-time jewel thief, had phoned us, claiming to have the necklace, and Smiley offered to talk a deal. But before I'd been in town ten minutes, things began to crumble and change shape. Melba's feather-headed Uncle Phineas had called at my hotel to warn me that his niece was headstrong and impulsive. Or at least he said that was why he called. When I tagged the rumor that the aristocratic cranes were flat broke until recently. And now, at the Green Lion Inn, Smiley Prell, a burglar by admission, was turning skittish and climbing up. Look, Dollar, I got no time to talk now. Oh, relax, will you, Smiley? A man in your profession can't afford to develop a case of nerves. Oh, very funny, but I got to blow this joint. Now, I told you before you went to get that phone call, I got things to do. Yeah, I know what you told me. All right, then. Now, you meet me later at that place in time I told you Sit about down. it. Sit down. You try pushing me, you're never going to get them beads back. You ever think of that? I don't know where I am anyway. I told sure, you I... and an hour before on the phone, you told me to meet you here and we talk a deal. All right, and so we will. We'll talk later. Then. Hey, what's the matter with you? Well, how many times I got to tell you? Something's come up, and I, I got to get it straightened out. Like what, for instance? Like what? Well, never mind. It's none of your business. It's it's like personal. So, uh, later, huh? You said you were being handed a double cross. Now, what kind of a double That's cross? That's exactly what I'm trying to figure out. Who did it? Who crossed you? Never mind who crossed me. It's none of your business. Did you have a partner on this job? Oh, look, now, don't try to kid me. You checked my M.O. before you ever left Hartford. If you did, then you will, you know I always work alone. Well, it can be a first time for anything. Look, I got no time to talk. Did you have talk. somebody on the inside, Smiley? Hmm? Somebody in the crane house who tipped you off, briefed you? Hmm. You, know, you want to know too much. Is that where the double cross came from? No, I, I got nothing more to say. More? You haven't said anything yet. Well, you meet me tonight where I said two dollar at nine o'clock. You know something, and... Smiley? I don't think you've got it. Huh? What are you talking about? The necklace. I don't think you had anything to do with the robbery. I don't believe you've got it. Or that you've ever even seen it. You don't, huh? No. No, I think you're trying to pull a con of some kind. But it's not going to work. Um, a dollar... You know what the things look like? Yeah, I got photographs of them. All right, then check me out. There are 38 pearls, hmm? Yeah? And they're pink, match color, match size. And they're not pierced like they usually are. Each one's set in a, um, in a fitted platinum mount, and the mounts are fastened together with those, um, you know, those, those little links. What kind of a stone in the clasp? In the clasp? There ain't any stone in the clasp. Hey, what are you trying to do? Okay, okay, all right, you've got it. Or at least you've seen it. So, how much do you want? Meet me tonight at 9 o'clock, and I'll tell you, 1412 North Oak Street, room 6, oh. and no cop. 
Not if you want them beads back, you understand? Not any more than I did when I walked in here. Well, you will, so just keep your shirt on. Smiley, if you can talk tonight, you can talk now. There's no reason oh, to talk around. Oh, knock it down. Now, look, I got things to do and not much time to do them in, so go find yourself a cool pad somewhere and simmer down, huh? So long, Doc. <laughs> Item 4, 275. I was stuck with the check, naturally. So I paid it and strolled toward the door. I stopped just outside in the entranceway to the roadhouse and watched Smiley cross the parking lot toward a tree-shaded taxi stand where a couple of waiting hacks had parked out of the sun. A few yards away from me stood another cab, this one occupied. I stepped out of the entrance and walked over to the taxi because I'd recognized the passenger in the back seat. Afternoon, Mr. Crane. Hey, what? Oh, what? I'm sorry if I startled you. Oh, no, not at all. No, I, I just didn't hear you walk up. Yeah, I, uh, I noticed you seemed pretty concerned with something across the lot. There. Across the lot, but I'm afraid I don't. It understand. wouldn't be that fellow getting into the taxi, would it? But what, what fellow? I don't know what you mean, Mister Dollar. Oh, I could be wrong. I hadn't even noticed the man, as a matter of fact. Oh well, then of course you won't mind if we just stand here and watch him drive off. Yeah, I, I really should get back into town. Good. I'm going that way myself. I've got a car here. Be glad to take it. But I've already engaged this driver. Well, pull him off. We'll get going. Give us a chance to talk on the way in. You might as well, Mr. Crane. The other taxi is already out of sight. And I hadn't noticed. Very well. Here you are, driver. Keep the chin. Oh, oh, thank you, sir. My car is over this way. I'm afraid there may be... A misunderstanding of some sort, Mr. Dollar. Oh. You seem to be under the misapprehension that I was interested for some reason in, in that stranger who left. I said I could be wrong. Yeah, and I can assure you that you are. <laughs> uh, here's the car. Right yeah. Yeah. Now, to, to the best of my knowledge, I have never seen the man before in my life. Well, there'll be days like that sometimes. Yeah. What's that? A colloquialism of the common man, Mr. Crane. What, uh, what were you doing out at the Green Lion, by the way, Mr. Crane? Well, I was uh, just, uh, killing time, uh, were you? Well, as a matter of fact, sir, I was waiting to talk with you. Well, you don't say. Yes, I was afraid I may have left a wrong impression when I talked with you at your hotel earlier today. In what way, Mr. Crane? But I mean... About my niece, Melba. Well, you said she was headstrong, impulsive. Oh, yes, but not a bit more so than any other normal, average girl, Mr. Dollar. Oh, I see. I don't really know why I considered it so important at the time. I, I must have been a little upset. Yeah, well, that's understandable. You don't have a jewel robbery in the family every day. In the family? I mean, to, stolen from the family. Well, <laughs> Apparently, we're both giving wrong impressions. Well, yes, I did say we are. Centuries, I'm glad that everything is cleared up now. I wish it were. Yeah. What's that? Nothing has been cleared up yet, as far as I can see. The necklace is still missing. Well, of course, that isn't what I meant. It's what I mean. It's the only reason I'm here in Cranesburg, to recover that necklace one way or another. Well, then, what do you mean by one way or another? Either by tagging the thief and getting it back through police action, or, if necessary, by making a deal. I just talked to the man who claims to be in possession of the pearls, as you know, of course, but he wasn't. I beg your pardon, sir, but I do not know, of course. Well, then let's say, may have guessed. You were in my hotel room when he phoned. You heard me arrange to meet him here. I didn't really pay much attention to that phone call. All right. Anyway, when I flew in here from Hartford, I expected this to be a cut-and-dried matter of routine. I'd meet Prell, make a quick deal to get the pearls back, and catch the next plane out. Only it's apparently not going to be that way. Yeah, but it isn't. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean I've stumbled onto a whole nest full of question marks. And nothing seems to add up quite right. Prell, for one thing. I think he's got himself into a spot of some kind. His attitude doesn't make sense. And what else, Mr. Dollar? Little things. Rumors I've picked up around town. Hints. And, of course, the biggest question mark seems to be right close to home. Which one is that? You, Mr. Crane. When I dropped him off at the center of town, he was still fumbling with vague phrases, trying to clear up the misapprehensions, as he put it, but actually saying nothing. He was sure, however, that I would understand. 
He was wrong. I didn't. Even my mistake about J.D. Bart, the Tri-State's local agent, seemed to fit in with the rest of the mixed-up case. I'd assume from the name that Bartley was a man. But when I walked into the office a few minutes later, I was suddenly happy that I was wrong. Your dollar, I presume? That's right. Miss Bartlett. Just make it J.D. I've spent a lot of time and effort getting those initials pounded into the skulls of the local inhabitants. Why? It's good for business. Makes me one of the boys, you might say. I kind of doubt it somehow. As you mentioned on the phone, you're, uh, unmistakable. <laughs> but that, I'm going to drop the dollar and call you Johnny. Pull up a chair. Yeah. Thanks, J.D. Did you get anywhere with that character who snatched the Queen's rocks? No. Nope. How come? Oh, he stalled. Postponed the whole deal until 9 o'clock tonight. Why? Ah, uh, he was nervous, I guess. Huh? Well, that's about the only reason I can figure. And between him and old Phineas Crane, I'm getting a little nervous myself. How did Phineas get into the act? Good question. Wish I had a good answer. Hey, what about these cranes, J.D.? What makes them tick? Beats me. Well, you sold them the insurance policy. You must know something about them. I didn't sell the policy. I just permitted it to be bought from me. How so? Melba Crane came snooting into the office one day, dropped the pearls under my plebeian nose, and wanted them insured. Uh oh. Why do you dislike her? She's a good looking dame, and I'm pretty well favored myself. That answer your question. Mm, roughly, yes. So what happened? So I got Jim Markley, local jeweler in here, to appraise him, issued the policy, and that was that. I understand that the necklace was an engagement gift from some newcomer in town. Yeah, Dean Sellers. She had him hooked for he even got his bags unpacked. That skirt has the ethics of a boa constrictor and about as much personality as a face painted on an egg. <laughs> Somehow I don't feel I'm getting an unbiased opinion. You won't at this address. Why can't she climb down off her pedestal and play ball with the rest of us? The crane name, the crane tradition, the crane social position. The only thing they're not so high and mighty about is the crane bank account, because there isn't one. Yeah, except lately. As I understand it, old Phineas has been flashing money around pretty freely the last few months. Yeah, so I've heard. Don't ask me to explain it. I can't even explain Phineas. What do you mean? He's a rare one, that old boy. Old school tie, mouthful of mush, that sort of thing. But you know, if it was a matter of protecting the family name, I actually think he'd commit murder. Now, here's our star to tell you about Monday's intriguing episode of this continuing story. Monday, a thief stalls for time, an old man lies desperately, and a strange girl whispers the dread word, murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us Monday night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Melba Crane, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, Miss Crane. I phoned a little while ago, and your maid said you were out. She told me. Was there something you... You've had a $20,000 pearl necklace stolen. I thought you might want to talk about it. I have talked about it. The local police were quite thorough, Mr. Dollar. Well, let's say there have been some new developments. Like what? That's what I want to see you about. I suppose you want to come out here. Oh, talk. thank you. Will a half hour from now be convenient? C couldn't we talk about this over the phone? If 45 minutes will be better for you, I'll be glad to cooperate. 
You seem to be a very persistent man. I usually get what I go after. Know something, Mr. Dollar? What? So do I. Oh, then this might turn out to be interesting. See you in a half hour. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cranesburg, Ohio, to the Home Office Tri-State Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cranesburg matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item, $20,000. The face value of the policy on a pearl necklace stolen one week ago from Miss Melba Crane. Young socialite, one of the last two surviving members of the town's most aristocratic family. And, according to her own statement, a girl who always got what she went after. Well, I'd almost got what I'd gone after. I'd at least made contact with Smiley Prell, a jewel thief who'd phoned Hartford and offered a deal. But that was all. Smiley had clammed up, started to stall, and implied the whole thing was blowing up at his face. And now the victim herself was trying to stall. And on top of everything else, a storm was coming up. I left my hired car near the coach house and walked down a long arbor toward the entrance to the Crane Mansion. It had been quite an estate once, still was. But the buildings needed a touch of paint here and there. And the gardens needed a gardener. Just a hint of wear and tear. It fit with what I'd learned at the bank. Though still tops in local society, Melba Crane and her Uncle Phineas were flat broke. I was reaching to ring the doorbell when I saw the couple in the sunroom. A man in a business suit and a girl in a maid's uniform. So busy with each other, they didn't even notice me at first. It was an intensely romantic scene, and I started to feel like a peeping Tom. The girl was still a little red-faced when she answered the door a few seconds later. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Johnny Dollar. I'd like to see Miss... Dollar, you're the investigator about the robbery. Lauder must have wired everybody in town. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I, I didn't mean to blurt it out that Oh, way. I found it interesting. You know we're going to get a little wet if that rain starts? Oh, uh, won't you come in, Mr. Dollar? Thanks. You'll uh, want to see Miss Crane, I imagine. Yes, I think she's expecting me. If you'll wait here, please. Oh, by the way, I, uh, I didn't interrupt you, I hope. Interrupt? I... I'll tell her you're here, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. Bye, See you later. Oh, hello. You must be the insurance fellow. Did you get a wire, too? A wire? Oh, no. Melba told me you were coming out. I'm a friend of the family, Mr. Dollar, Dean Sellers. How are you, Mr. Sellers? Melba and I are engaged, you know. Congratulations. Well, it's not recent. Yeah, I know. So you're a little hard to figure out. I'm a complete enigma, Mr. Sellers. I believe you're the chap who gave Miss Crane the necklace, right? Yes, it was an engagement present. Do you uh, have any lead on it yet? Nothing definite. I understood you'd been contacted by the thief who stole it. That's right. Well, then you... Well, I haven't have... actually seen the necklace yet, and until I do, I can't be positive this man ever, well, even has it. It wouldn't be the first time a professional jewel thief has tried to pull a swindle. I see. Uh, tell me something, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Suppose you do get hold of the pearls. What happens to them then? Well, that depends. If Miss Crane's claim hasn't been paid at the time, they go to her. If it has been paid and she refuses to reopen negotiations, then we sell the necklace to recover our losses. And up till now, as I understand it, the claim hasn't been paid. That's right. I see. Well, I hope you get it back quick, then. The insurance won't cover the sentimental value. Sentimental value to whom, Mr. Sellers? <laughs> to both of us. Oh, I know. I uh, I saw you outside the sunroom there. Strictly unintentional. Uh, what I mean is his appearances can be deceiving sometimes. I I wouldn't want you to misunderstand. Oh, I think I understand perfectly, Mr. Sellers. Good. Whether Miss Crane would or not may be something else again. Though. Oh, Melba is very understanding. She must be. Well, I've got to run on. She'll be down in a minute. Uh, my office is in the Ridley building. Drop in if there's any way I can help. Thanks. I may just do that. Hello? Uh -huh. 
I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Dollar. Oh, that's all right. It it gave me a chance to meet your fiancé. Oh, were you talking with Dean? We exchanged a few pleasantries. Isn't he a darling? Well... Of course, he's a little headstrong sometimes, and impulsive. But he, but he never, never means any harm by it. How did you know? Oh, personal observation. And also, by an odd coincidence, that's exactly the way you were described to me. Oh? Instead of beautiful, glamorous, seductive? I imagine it was assumed that I could see those qualities for myself. Mm. I wonder if I should buy that as it is or analyze it first. I warn you, I'm dangerously subtle. I think you may be at that. Would you like a drink, or are you one of those always-stick-to-business types? I'm even worse. I combine the two. I'll have scotch on the rocks. Well, that's my drink. Well, now we found something in common. We already had something. The robbery. Yeah, you want to talk about it? Why not? I want that necklace recovered as much as you do. Yes, I understand it has a high sentimental value. Who told you that? Your fiancé. Oh. Here's your drink. Thanks. To pearls, the frozen tears from the eyes of Allah. A poetic cop. <laughs> More cynical than poetic. The man I heard call them that had just knifed a British colonial administrator and blown up a sampan with six Chinese fishermen aboard. Why? Nine pearls. He wanted them. There were 38 in that necklace of yours. This man, did he get away with it? Uh, not exactly. He was shot to death on the Hong Kong waterfront. This is good scotch. It is? Another thing, Miss Crane, I am not a cop, poetic or otherwise. It amounts to the same thing, doesn't it? Well, in some ways. I'm not professionally concerned with identifying and capturing criminals and bringing them to justice. My obligations on that score are no more nor less than those of any other private citizen. So? So I'm hired by the insurance company to protect their interests. Usually that involves trying to recover stolen property or looking for evidence of insurance fraud. I'm afraid I don't quite... Sometimes I make deals, Miss Crane. Meaning exactly what? Meaning that if somebody should start something and get in over their head, I I might listen to reason, try to work something out. A cop wouldn't. He's not permitted to. Well, that would all be very interesting, I'm sure, to the person who stole the necklace. Yeah, you'd think so, wouldn't you? What about that person, Mr. Dollar, the jewel thief who phoned the insurance company? Smiley Prowl. I talked to him a couple of hours ago, briefly. Does he have the pearls? I don't know. Uh, do you mind if I have another drink? Go ahead. Thanks. What do you mean you don't know? That's why you came here, wasn't it? To meet him and get them back? He may not have them. He may just be trying to swindle the insurance company. That's not too uncommon a game, you know. No, I wouldn't know. Oh, yeah. It's tried every now and then. The nicest people sometimes. Just looking at you. you know, it seems to me you're taking this whole thing pretty calmly. <sighs> Well, that's merely a front. Inside, I'm a seething volcano. Now, look... Hey, tell me something. Why did you postpone your wedding? I didn't. Dean was the one who... Now, what difference does it make? What's that got to do with it? Do you think he's changed his mind about marrying you? Suppose we leave Mr. Sellers out of it. Can't. He's already in it. He's the one who gave you the necklace in the first place, an engagement gift. Has he called off the engagement, Miss Crane? He hasn't, and he won't, regardless of any rumors you may hear to the contrary. Now, does that answer your question? Mm, more or less. Then suppose we leave my personal life alone and talk about the robbery. That is, if you're at all interested in it. Where is the safe, Miss Crane? Safe? Oh, that the necklace was in. It's there behind that painting. Do you want to see it? If you don't mind. All right. You and your uncle live here alone, as I understand it. My maid, of course, Betty. Well, there's the safe. I doubt if you'll find any fingerprints or anything. The police spent hours on it. Mm -hmm. That's a real old-fashioned one. Our family's been around quite a while, Mr. Dollar. Wouldn't be much of a job for a professional safecracker. You mean even without the combination? Even without. How did the thief get into the house? Force a window somewhere, a door? No, with a key, I guess. You see, it happened in the afternoon. I'd gone out, and Uncle Phineas was out somewhere, as usual. The house was empty at the time. What about your maid? Betty? Well, after I left, she decided to go into town to do some shopping or something. Oh, they 
couldn't possibly have picked a better time. Apparently not. Would you like to look around the house? No, no thanks. I've got a pretty complete story from the police reports. Mostly I came out here to take a look at you. And what's your verdict? Maybe I'll do better with Smiley Prowl. I'm meeting him later. Oh? And is he going to produce the necklace? I don't know. He talked about a double cross. Said he might give me more than I was bargaining for. He was pretty upset. Why? I don't know. Oh, incidentally, Mr. Dollar, there's someone else you'll no doubt be talking to, and I want to warn you about him. Who's that? Uncle Phineas. Of course he means all right, Is but he he... strong and impulsive, too? He makes up things sometimes, and he's, well, just a little bit vague. Balmy, you mean? Mr. Dollar, with people of our class, it's referred to as eccentric. I'm sure you understand. I left the house filled with understanding and with some brand new questions about the cranes that needed still more understanding. The lowering storm clouds had brought an early dusk, and it was nearly dark when I reached to open the door of my car. Then suddenly I caught a flash of white at the corner of the coach house. Somebody had seen me and tried to duck out of sight. I walked quickly across the driveway and moved quietly up to the corner of the building. How are you, Betty? Mr. Dollar. Can I help you with that? Uh, no. I mean, I, I, I was just going to burn some trash. Well, let me put it in the incinerator for you. Here. No, please. Sure you sorted these papers? There seems to be something heavy here. Betty? Uh, let me have it, please. You won't understand. Why, Miss Crane thought I was very understanding. Betty! Uh, you'd better run on. She sounds impatient. I'll, I'll take care of this. Please. No, please. You'll only... Oh! I watched her disappear into the shadows, running toward the house. Then I unwrapped the package she'd been trying to hide in the incinerator. It was a 32 caliber revolver, and one chamber had been fired. Recently. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a strange disappearance, a grim cry in the night. And a quarry is run to earth in room 313. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Betty, Mr. Dollar. Betty? Miss Crane's maid. I'm the one who... Well... Oh, yeah. What can I do for you, Betty? Have you told anyone about it? The gun? No, not yet. Oh, thank heaven. Do you still have it? Well, what do you think I'd do? Bury it somewhere? Look, Mr. Dollar... No, you look. Somebody's used this gun, used it recently. Who was it? You? No, I never saw it before. Then why were you trying to hide it in the incinerator? I was scared. I didn't know what I was doing. Is it your gun? I found it. Where? Please. Is it tied in with the theft of Miss Crane's necklace? I don't know anything about it, about about anything. I I just know I'm in trouble. You've got to help me, Mr. Dollar. Please. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cranesburg, Ohio. To the Home Office Tri-State Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the crane matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item seven, $3.10 for a bad steak and worse coffee in the hotel dining room. But it didn't matter much. I had to rush it anyway with one eye on my watch. I was meeting jewel thief Swanny Prell at his rooming house at 9 o'clock. And Melba Crane's maid, Betty, was coming here to the hotel at 10, providing she could slip away from the house. The schedule was tightening up on me, but I still hadn't seen hide nor hair of the stolen necklace. That is, if hide nor hair can apply to a string of matched pearls insured for $20,000. 14-12 North Oak Street was in a lost and forgotten corner of town, dark and nearly deserted at this hour of the evening. The rooming house, a ramshackle frame built flush to the sidewalk, seemed to wait for me, brooding in silence. There were no names on the letterboxes and no sign of an office. I tried the front door. It was open. Room six was the number Smiley had given me. I walked down the long hall, studying the numbers on the doors with a dim light from a single bulb at the far end. Four, five, six. I heard the barest hint of movement behind the door, then silence. I reached down quietly and turned the knob. The door was unlocked. I took a deep breath and then went in fast. Get out! What the devil? Take it easy, Mac. All right, hold it now until I find the light switch. Uh, well? Well, I'll be. Mr. <laughs> Aren't you a little out of your territory, Mr. Crane? Uh, I don't know what you mean. Sit down before you shake your teeth loose. I beg your pardon, sir. Don't mention it. If I may remind you who you're talking you to... You don't have to remind me. You're Phineas P. Crane, uncle of Miss Melba Crane, who had a pearl necklace stolen from her. You're one of the last two surviving members of the Crane family who founded Cranesburg. Mr. Dollar, I... And I have just caught you prowling the room of a known professional jewel thief. Now sit down. Uh... I can explain this, sir. Yeah, I hope so. I suppose our host isn't home. There's no one else here. Was the door unlocked? Or were you equipped with a set of keys? I beg your pardon. Again? You're the most polite burglar I've ever tagged. This is not the way it seems, I assure you. All right, now you've assured me. Convince me. Uh... I came to ask some questions of the gentleman who lives here. Do you know him? Certainly not. It's hardly likely that I'd be acquainted with a person of his type. Oh, I don't know. He's a jewel thief. Your niece had a necklace stolen ten days ago. It kind of adds up in a way. Oh, it... Well, now, are you accusing me of complicity? I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just trying to find out what you were doing hiding here in Smiley Prell's room. I... I came here to talk to him. What about? <clears throat> But the reasons are personal, Mr. Dollar. Then you did know him. No, I... I... I knew he lived here. Because I, I followed him one day. I I didn't know his name. I didn't know he was a jewel thief. Until you said so just a moment ago. Come on, I know. I know. This seems rather odd. Yeah, well, that's one way of putting it. Now, you'd understand if I were in a position to explain. Well, it might be a good idea if you got in that position, in view of the circumstances. I simply cannot... And I do not believe your capacity is such that you can force me to. You're quite right. But the police might handle it somewhat differently. Oh, I doubt it very much. My grandfather founded this town. <laughs> yes, they remember that here. A matter of pulling rank. Huh? Oh, I think they had leaned toward believing any reasonable story that I might give them. A story like that is reasonable only as long as there's no actual evidence to disprove it. Oh, is that so? And you have such evidence? Not yet. But I think I will be for long. Oh, <laughs> well, then I'll have to deal with that eventuality when and if it happens. Who are you trying to protect, Mr. Crane? I... I don't know what you mean. Why did you follow Smiley? Because I saw him under rather unusual circumstances. Before or after the robbery? Both. Well, a uh, after. Yes, when I followed him. When was that, tonight? Uh, no, that was several days. But, but did I... Did you expect him to be here tonight? Or were you counting on his room being empty? I did not come here to commit burglary. <laughs> May I remind you, sir? Oh, yeah, I know. You're Phineas P. Crane, and you and your niece are the tip-top aristocrats on the local totem pole. Also, I happen to know your flat I beg I your imagine $20,000 worth of insurance would look pretty good to you. I am not a thief, 
People have an odd moral sense sometimes. A lot of them seem to think insurance fraud is not quite the same as actual Did theft. I do not happen to be one of those persons, Mr. Dodd. What about your niece? Uh, well, that necklace was given to her as an engagement gift by the man she's going to marry. And I'm sure its value to her is much more than the amount of the insurance. Maybe, and maybe not. You did tell me this afternoon that she's headstrong, impulsive. Oh, yes, but I, I did not mean to imply so. All right, be... Mr. Crane. I imagine you'll be around when I want you. You're not the kind of man who runs away. So for the moment, play it your way. Cover up and hide behind the family name. But sooner or later, you're going to have to talk it out with somebody. Either with me or someone else. Am I free to go now? <laughs> sure. Sure, as far as I'm concerned. Unless you want to stick around and wait for Smiley. Well, I doubt whether there's much point in that now. Under the circumstances. <clears throat> Good night, sir. Keep cool, Mr. Crane. I shall make every effort to... As soon as Crane left, I made a quick search of the room and found nothing. Smiley evidently traveled light and lived light. There was hardly any sign he was even living in the place. I gave it up as a bad job, finally, closed the door behind me and drove back to my hotel. I was starting to see a faint gleam of daylight in the case, but I couldn't quite figure how Phineas Crane fit into it. And unfortunately, I was in no position to push him very hard, since technically I had no more right in that room than he did. But all of my theories fell apart when I walked through the door of my hotel room. Come right in, son. Have a seat. Thanks. One of us could be in the wrong room, of course. Not if your name's Dollar. Oh, I wasn't questioning my presence, Mr. Uh... You know a fellow named Smiley Prell? Well, I know who he is. Got business with him, have you? Maybe. Do I uh, have any with you? Well, my name's Durham, Mr. Dollar. Ed Durham. Oh, well, it's a little late, Mr. Durham, so if you don't mind. I'm chief of police here in Cranesburg. Oh. Well, maybe it's not as late as I thought. Found your name where this fellow Prell had wrote it down, along with your room number here at the hotel. Eh, careless of him. Kind of helpful, though. He a friend of yours? Uh, no, no, I'd hardly call him that. Oh, I don't see any point in holding out on you, Chief Durham. Here are my credentials. I'm an insurance investigator working on that crane robbery. You don't say. Smiley Prell is a jewel thief. Two previous convictions. He phoned the insurance company in Hartford and wanted to talk a deal. I flew in here this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Well, these seem to be in order, all right. Thanks. I had an appointment to meet Prell this evening in his rooming house at 9 o'clock, but he didn't show. Reckon he wasn't in much shape to, Mr. Dollar. Oh, what do you mean? Prell got himself shot four or five hours ago. Shot? Yeah. Real shot. Matter of fact, he's dead. Murdered? Kind of looks that way. Found him in a back alley behind the city park. Must have happened sometime this afternoon. You wouldn't know anything about it, would you, Mr. Dollar? I don't know. I might. Do you know what kind of a gun was used to kill him? Thirty-two revolver, according to the boys in ballistics. Well, hold on to your hat. I may have it right here. Uh, don't bother looking under the mattress, Mr. Dollar. What? I already found it. Yep, got it right here. You're pretty cagey, aren't you? Wasn't sure how to figure you. Reckon you're all right, though, or you'd have kept your mouth shut. Oh, thanks. How'd you come by it? I took it away from Melba Crane's housemate, a girl named Betty. Yeah, I know who she is. It was some time between 6.30 and 7 this evening. I caught her trying to hide it in the incinerator. You don't say. It's been fired, as you undoubtedly noticed. You might have it checked through, but I don't imagine it's registered. It's registered, all right. Oh? We don't have many guns around here. I recognize this one right off. Belongs to Phineas Crane. What? Add up to anything, Mr. Dollar? Not the way I've been adding. It's got me stumped, too. I, uh... I don't suppose you found that necklace on Smiley Prell's body. No, not a sign of it. You figure then this murder is tied up some way with that robbery? What else is it to figure? What about these cranes, Chief? Just who are they? What are they? Well, they're an old line family. Just two of them left now, Phineas and Melba. Not as wealthy as they used to be, maybe. Milton Barkley at the bank told me the same thing. Funny thing about that, though. 
Lately, at least, old Phineas seems to have plenty of cash to jingle together. How lately? Now, not just since the robbery, if that's what you mean. It's longer than that. Last four or five months. Well, that checks, too, with what Bortley said. You got some idea they planned that robbery, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I don't know. I've got no evidence of it, if that's what you're asking. How do Phineas and Melba get along together? Well, they're kind of like royalty here, you know. They're pretty much to themselves. And if they do have any trouble, it's never heard outside the house. Uh Uh-huh. What do you know about Melba's fiancé, this Dean Sellers? Well, he's been here about eight months. Seems to be a pretty nice fellow. Civic leader and all that. Everybody in town thought it was just fine when they got engaged. Figured they was meant for each other. Well, he certainly goes in for lavish gifts. A necklace with 38 match pearls is quite a... Expecting somebody? Yeah, quiet, sir. Who is it? Betty, let me in, Mr. Dollar. Oh, just a minute. She phoned earlier, wants the gun back. Maybe you'd better listen in from the the bathroom there. Good idea. Let me get set. Okay, right. Come in, Betty. Thank you. I've got to have it back, Mr. Dollar. Have what back? The gun you were trying to hide in the incinerator this evening? Yes, of course. You mean this one? Oh, yes. Please, Mr. Dollar. Somebody's trying to get me into trouble. Who? I don't know. I found that gun. That's the truth. Found it where? Hidden in a drawer in my room out at the cranes. Who put it there? I don't know. I don't know. When I saw it, I got scared. I was trying to get rid of it when you stopped me. And now, tonight on the radio, it says a man's been shot. Did you know him? No. Do you know whose gun this is? I don't know anything about it. Oh, give it to me, please. I'd like to, Betty. But I'm afraid things aren't that simple. What do you mean? All right, Chief. It's all yours. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a castle crumbles. Cupid goes to jail. And a lovely iceberg thaws a bit. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Dean Sellers, Mr. Dollar. You may recall meeting me this afternoon at... Yes, you're Miss Crane's fiancé. What's on your mind, Mr. Sellers? Uh, I'm downstairs in the hotel lobby. I'd like to come up and talk to you, if I could. Well, I was just on the point of leaving for the police station. Oh, and you know about Betty? Yes. As a matter of fact, Chief Durham arrested her here in my room. What? I said she was arrested... I know, but... What was she doing there? I had the gun that was used to murder Smiley Prell. She wanted it back. What do you mean, wanted it back? Why all the interest in this girl, Mr. Sellers? Well, I... Is it just because you happen to be engaged to the woman she works for? Well, yes, you might say that. No, that's not it at all. I've got to talk to you. All right. I'll meet you in the hotel bar in five minutes. And every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cranesburg, Ohio... To the Home Office Tri-State Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cranesburg matter. Expense account continued. (laughs) 
Item 10, $2.75 for three brandies straight. One for me and two for Dean Sellers. Newcomer to Cranesburg, man about town and fiancé of local socialite Melba Crane. The man who'd given her the pearl necklace that had been stolen from the safe in her home. It had supposedly been an engagement gift. Yet now Sellers was flipping his lid because Melba's maid was in a jam. I remembered the scene in the Crane's sunroom earlier in the afternoon. And Dean Sellers remembered it, too. When you walked up on the porch at the Crane estate and saw Betty and me in each other's arms, you, uh... Well, uh... I thought the obvious, naturally. Yeah, I figured as much. That's why I tried to cover up when I talked to you afterward. You didn't have to, Mr. Sellers. I kind of wrote it off as just another bachelor having a fling before he settled down. Yeah, that's the way I looked at it, uh, at first. Mm-hmm. So? So, it didn't work out that way. How did it work out? I finally realized I was in love with Betty. I see. I know it may sound corny, but it happens to be true. Does Melba Crane know about it? No, or at least I don't think she does. Well, what did she think when you broke off your engagement? Oh, I haven't actually broken it off. I, I just uh, postponed it. I told her I was loaded with work and we'd have to wait a while. And she accepted that? Well, she seemed to. Can't be sure about Melba, though. She's a cool one. Plays her cards close. Yeah, well, most women are pretty cool when they suspect somebody is poaching on their own private preserve. Well, she may have suspected, but I don't think she could have known anything for sure. Betty and I haven't always been as careless as we were this afternoon. Well, what about the pearls? Were you intending to ask Melba to give them back? I didn't really know what to do, Mr. Dollar. $20,000 is a lot of money. On the other hand, I gave them to her as an engagement gift. It seemed kind of rough to ask for them back after breaking the engagement on her. Do you think she'd have returned them if you had asked her? Well, I suppose so. Of course, it didn't go that far. Before I could make up my mind what to do, the necklace was stolen. And this afternoon, the man who claimed he stole it was murdered. Betty had nothing to do with that. You could be prejudiced, Mr. Sellers. I know her, I tell you. How well? Well, enough that I'm planning to marry her. That's what I mean. All right. But that doesn't mean I'm completely blind about her. Somebody's trying to frame that girl. Who, for instance? I don't know. And for what reason? I don't know that either. But I do know one thing. When she says she knows nothing about it, she's telling the truth. I admire loyalty myself, Mr. Sellers, but there are a lot of facts against her. What facts? As you probably know, when I caught her with that gun out at the crane place and took it away from her, she was trying to hide it in the incinerator. All right. What's that prove? She would found it hidden in her room and she was trying to get rid of it. Well, a lot of people, if they were innocent, might have gone to the police with it. Uh, she got scared, that's all. She, she lost her head. Uh, maybe. But that's not all that's against her. There are other things, a kind of pattern. What things? That safe at the crane house was opened during the one hour of the day that everybody was out somewhere. Including Betty, if you remember. So she claims. And she probably was. I'm not saying she actually committed the theft. She couldn't have. No one except Melba and her uncle Phineas knows the combination to that safe. No, no. I think Smiley Prell actually did the job. An old-fashioned safe like that would be a cinch for a pro of his talents. Then how do you figure Betty is being involved? Smiley had to know when to do it. And he had to get into the house. There were no locks forced. So he must have had a key. So, of course, uh, the maid must have helped him. Not necessarily. But it sure does add up. And then Smiley Prell was murdered, shot. Are you claiming she did that too? She was in possession of the gun that killed him. She was caught trying to get rid of it. But why? Why would she kill him if they were in on it together? Well, as you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, $20,000 is a lot of money. Maybe she wanted a whole necklace, not a half of one. You don't know her, that's all. No, no, you're right. But I do know what the facts seem to point to. Circumstantial evidence, nothing else. True. And not only that, but it leaves you hanging right up in the air. What do you mean? That pearl necklace. Now, there's a fact for you to swallow. As I understand it, the police haven't found it. That's right. It wasn't on Prell's body. And they didn't find it on Betty. If she killed him to get it, where is it? I don't know. Well, if she's arraigned for this, the prosecuting attorney had better know. Because without it, he won't even have a case. I'm quite aware of that, Mr. Sellers. I left him standing there, belligerent and despondent, and drove across town to the police station. It was late by then, and Cranesburg had pretty well folded up for the night. Well, that was fine with me. The fewer people I saw at the moment, the better. I felt about as low as Sellers did. 
because I was starting to get a hunch that this one might turn out messy, that no matter how it might end, some average decent people were bound to get hurt. It's like that sometimes when there's been a murder. Chief of Police Durham looked like he was expecting me. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thanks, Chief. You, uh, planning to spend the night here? Nope, I'm about to give up. Going home in a few minutes. I've been trying to get a statement from that girl. Any luck? It depends on how you mean it. She's willing to talk, all right. Answers anything we ask her. But not the way you want her to answer, is that it? She won't budge an inch away from that same story. Says she found the gun hidden in her room, was scared because of the robbery last week, and tried to get rid of it. What about Smiley Prell? Claims the first she heard of him was that bulletin on the radio telling about his murder. That's when she got panicky and came to the hotel to get the gun back. And that's all she knows about it, huh? So she claims. We couldn't budge her on it. Uh Uh-huh. You still haven't found any trace of the necklace, huh? Nope. And without it, I doubt if the DA will even issue a complaint. Yeah. The same possibility was raised by someone else a few minutes ago. Mm, Who was that? Dean Sellers, the fellow who gave the pearls to Miss Crane in the first place. How come he's getting into it? Well, it appears that love has reared its head. He's frowning in the mouth over this girl's arrest. Claims she's being framed. He could be right, Mr. Dollar. I know. Uh, It beats me. Man just don't know where to start with a mess like this one on his hands. I think I'm beginning to get some idea of where to start. How do you mean? Look, I've got a photograph here from the insurance files. Take a look. It's a photo of that necklace. I see. I was wondering, Chief Durham... Do you know of any jeweler here in Cranesburg who could make a duplicate of that? A skillful imitation? No. No, I'm afraid you'll have to go into Cincinnati for that. Be the closest place, at least. No, no, I don't want a duplicate made. I want to know whether somebody did go into Cincinnati for that purpose some four or five months ago. Well, it might take a while to find out. How much of a while? Well, not too long, with a little luck. I could get Jim Markley in here. Markley? He's a local jeweler. He could take this photograph and... Give them a technical description over the phone. Done things like that for us before. Good. Yeah, might have something back for you by tomorrow afternoon. The sooner the better. Yeah. Now call Jim and ask him to come down. One other thing, Chief. Yeah? I've already phoned Hartford and started them to work on this, but we may get faster results if you move in on it from this end. All right. What is it you want? I want a tracer put on Dean Sellers. I see. A complete rundown. He's been here for eight months. What did he do before that? Where did he come from? Where did he get the necklace? Who are his friends? What's his financial status? Anything you can get. I, uh, I don't quite see what you're aiming at, Mr. Dollar. I'm not quite sure I do. It was after midnight, and there was nothing more I could do until the next day except drive back to my hotel and sack in for the night. It was a good, sensible, conservative intention, and I managed to carry it to the point of taking off my tie and unbuttoning my shirt. The night manager had been pretty upset earlier when Betty Jackson came to my room and then left under arrest. I don't know what he thought when I had my second female visitor. Well, good evening, Miss Crane. Could I have a word with you, Mr. Dollar? Sure, why not? Come on in. Thank you. I guess it's a little indiscreet of me to come here like this. Oh? Why so? Well, after all, this is Cranesburg, and when one has to maintain a sort of position in town, well, I'm sure you understand. Oh, perfectly. How about a drink? What? Drink. T-R-I-N-K. I even happen to have two clean glasses. I'm afraid you have the wrong impression, Mr. Dollar. Why so? It's good cognac. The best, in fact. Won't do a bit of harm to your uh, position. Make it a double, if you will. Check. May I ask you what has happened to cause you to throw discretion to the winds in this mad fashion, Miss Crane? I felt there was something I ought to make clear to you concerning Dean, my fiancé. I see. Here you go. Thank you. I believe you talked to him this evening, didn't you? Briefly, yes. Then you know, of course, that he's taking up for this girl, trying to defend what she did. He did seem to have something like that in mind. I also think you may have observed a little tableau in the sunroom when you came to the house this afternoon. Oh, now, look, Miss Please. Crane. I'm quite aware of the situation. I've observed a few of those scenes myself. I'm not a complete fool, you know. Why are you telling me all this? The reason should be obvious. I'm dense. I can only understand what I actually hear. 
What I mean is, it should be rather apparent that any alibi Dean might supply in a noble attempt to save this poor, innocent girl should not be given too much credence. Because he might be prejudiced in her favor? Is there any doubt of it? Your glass is empty. Like another one? Oh, I don't believe I should. Thanks. Aren't you a little prejudiced, Miss Crane, against the girl? Very likely, under the circumstances. Am I to take it, then, that you're on her side, too? (laughs) I am on the side of the Tri-State Guarantee Company. And if you remember, they're out $20,000 on a necklace that was stolen. I'm here to get it back, that's all. I think I'd better go. I shouldn't have come here at all. Whatever you think. Oh, by the way, has Uncle Phineas talked to you yet? We passed the time of day. That's all? We didn't have much time. The circumstances were a little unusual. Then you've probably been spared some of his wilder imaginings. I wouldn't count on that. What do you mean? Sit down, Miss Crane. Finish your drink. We haven't even started to talk. Here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a bomb drops, the timid run for cover, and all is not as it seems. Not even murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Good afternoon, sir. This is Phineas Crane. How are you, Mr. Crane? Highly perturbed, sir. Now, what's bothering you? My generation used to call it conscience. I want to talk to you, Mr. Dollar. Well, that's quite a change, isn't it, from your attitude last night? There have been a number of changes since last night. I can't bear the thought of that girl being imprisoned. She doesn't like it too much herself. All right, what's on your mind? Uh, I'd prefer not to discuss it over the telephone. Then you'll have to hold your horses. I'm waiting here for a call from Hartford and some information from the police. It might be the same information I'm ready to give you, sir. I don't think so. You should have talked last night, Mr. Crane. I might have been willing then to make a deal of some kind. And now? No deal. I can guess what happened to the necklace. And as far as the rest of it's concerned, I never make deals on murder. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cranesburg, Ohio... To the Home Office, Tri-State Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cranesburg matter. Expense account, final page. (music) Item 13, $28.65. Phone calls to Cincinnati and Cleveland and two prepaid calls to Hartford. The wheels were spinning now, and I spent most of the day just sitting back and waiting. Toward late afternoon, Police Chief Ed Durham phoned. Then Hartford, and then Durham again. And finally, the three black bars dropped into place, and the payoff was jackpot. 
Item 14, $10.50, second day's rental on hired car. I left the hotel just before dark and drove out through the north edge of town to the Crane Estate. When I'd gone out there the day before, I'd been mostly guessing, playing hunches. But this time, I knew pretty much what I wanted and just how to go about getting it. I thought the place deserted as I walked up the long arbor from the carriage house. But as I stepped out onto the terrace, I realized I was wrong. Mr. Dollar, over here. In here, please. Hurry. Why all the secrecy, Mr. Crane? I wanted to talk to you alone. I rather doubted whether I would be able to, if it were known that you were here. Able to or permitted to? Well, that's what I meant, sir. Permitted. Who would stop you, Mr. Crane? Well, that, you might say, is part of the story. The story I didn't tell you last night. Why not? Why didn't you tell me? I still thought then I might be able to save things. And you don't think so now? I'm afraid not. It's too late. You know too much about it now. What were you doing in Smiley Pearl's room when I found you last night? Looking for the necklace. I told you that. Did you know then he'd been murdered? Oh, no, no, no. I wouldn't have had the nerve to go there if I had. And there wouldn't be of any use of going. That's when I realized it was all over when I heard Mr. Prell had been killed. Dishonesty is one thing, but murder is something else again. You're so right. Of course, it wasn't dishonest at first. It was all quite legal in the beginning. But not later. No, no, not later. I was against that. Not that I'm claiming any virtue for it. Probably it was just cowardice. Mr. Dollar, be as easy on her as you can. I'm afraid it won't be in my hands. I suppose not. These things are always done so impersonally by institutions created for that purpose. Rightfully, no doubt. But one occasionally wonders. There's something I wonder about sometimes, Mr. Crane. You refer to... Human greed. That's true. There's no real excuse for us, my niece and me. Reasons, yes. An inherited social position and way of life. And declining wealth to support them. We're soft people, Mr. Dollar. And when life gets hard, we we look for a soft way out. And that usually turns out to be the hard way. She'll find it so, I imagine. For me, it doesn't really matter anymore. How did you get into... On to Smiley Prell. How did you know he was the one who robbed your son? I was just guessing until you told me yesterday that he was a professional jewel thief and that he'd phoned the insurance company and claimed to have the necklace. But before that, when you were guessing, how did you know about him? What reason did you have to guess? I'd seen him hanging around the estate here twice, the week before the robbery and when I saw him again afterward, talking to his uh, uh, contact, uh, I guess you'd call it. His employer fits the facts better. I suppose so. Anyway, I put two and two together, and I followed Prowl. I found out where he lived. Did the employer know you'd done this? Oh, no, hardly. Or I doubt that I'd be sitting here talking to you. Oh, not that it matters, since you probably know more of the details than I do. All right, Uncle Phineas. That's quite enough. Melba. That was a very quiet entrance, Miss Crane. It wasn't intentional. I didn't know you were here until I heard voices. Uncle Phineas, would you mind leaving us alone? It's too late, my dear. I think time is about to run out on all of us. Aided a great deal, I presume, by some of your more senile imaginings. Mr. Dollar didn't really need any help. Please. Very well, my dear. I leave the two of you then to what I anticipate may be rather stormy. What were you doing? Pumping him? Trying to make him say things you could twist later and use against him? No, it was more a matter of humoring him, I'd say. What's the matter, Melba? A hangover from last night? I suppose you told him that, too, that I came to your hotel to see you. No, it didn't seem relevant somehow. I see. Where's your fiancé? Dean? Sure, how many have you got? Mr. Sellers is in the billiard room. Why? What do you want with him? Oh, I need just a few more facts to fill out the picture. I think he can supply them, that's all. 
What facts? Why have you come here? Uncle Phineas invited me. What for? He said something about wanting to clear his conscience. His mind wanders. You know that. You can't rely on anything he says. I'm not. What about the girl they arrested? Your maid, Betty? Yes, Betty. If the police are satisfied she's guilty, why aren't you? Because I was hired to find a pearl necklace that was stolen from your safe. It was insured for $20,000, remember? And I haven't found it yet. Suppose I were to withdraw the insurance claim. It's a little too late. The police would want to know why. Why? Simply because I choose to. Because I don't want any more fuss about it. It's not a loss, actually. The necklace was a gift. Oh, yes, I know. An engagement present of great sentimental value from that wealthy young philanderer, Mr. Dean Sellers, who, incidentally, is broker than you are. What? Yeah. Got a complete rundown on him from Hartford late this afternoon. I don't believe it. (laughs) It's quite a shock, I imagine. You'd say anything just to help that girl get out of jail. Ah, you got me mixed up with Sellers, haven't you? He's the one who rallied to her defense. Cheap little flirt. I hope they convict her. Do you really believe she's the reason Sellers broke off your engagement? It wasn't broken off. It was only postponed. (sighs) Well, it's like I said, Melba. A lot of surprises. By the way, I'd like to search Betty's room, if you don't mind. That's actually why I came out here. What for? That necklace. I was hired to recover it, remember? But if you think she's innocent, then why do you bother... How do you know what I think? I haven't really said, have I? No. That's true. That's quite true. Lucky shot, Mr. Dollar. You got two on the break. Yeah. Result of a misspent youth. All right. Four ball in the corner pocket. Expert, huh? Oh, just lucky, like you said. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Sellers, you were right about Betty. She isn't guilty. She was being framed. I told you so. Yeah, she was just an innocent bystander, you might say. Even though I did find the necklace a few minutes ago, hidden in her room... Found it? Good. The cranes, though, aren't quite so innocent. The cranes? No. Nine ball, the far side pocket. What do you mean about the cranes? They were broke, and they needed money to keep up a front. When you came to town and showed an interest in Melba, they figured you were the answer. Why, you're making Melba sound pretty cold-blooded, you know. Oh, there was no love lost. You were playing the same game. Huh? Sure, Sellers. That's the way you've always operated. Your last wife was a wealthy widow in Miami, Florida. You stayed with her for a year and a half and took her for $150,000. And all that was left of it when you came here was the $20,000 you had invested in the pearl necklace. That was your stake, and that's the way you used it, to convince Melba Crane you weren't a fortune hunter. Twelve ball in the far corner. Dollar, where did you get all this information? Police records. Then about a month ago, you broke off your engagement with Melba Crane. Why? Because I was in love with Betty. You were playing Betty for a pigeon. You backed out because you'd finally discovered that the cranes were flat broke. I wasn't after Melba's money. Sure you were. But you wanted to get out without losing your investment, that necklace. So you brought in Smiley Prell to steal it for you. I never saw Prell in my life. Uncle Finney saw the two of you together a couple of days after the robbery. Well, he's lying. So Prell pulled the robbery. And then he told you the pearls he'd stolen were phony. You accused him of double-crossing you. He thought you were double-crossing him. Net result, he got sore and tried for a deal with the insurance company. That's why you killed him. Are you accusing me of murder? That's right, Sellers. Eight ball in the end pocket. Who else, Sellers? Betty wasn't in it, except that you tried to frame her. And both the cranes knew the pearls were imitation. You were the only one who didn't. They weren't imitations. I paid $20,000 for that necklace. Not for this one. Melba sold the necklace a month after you gave it to her. They've been living on the money. She had this copy made in Cincinnati. Why, that cheap little crook. So the pearls you kill Smiley for and then planted upstairs in Betty's room are worth about 200 bucks at the most. Something to think about, isn't it? That's right, Dollar. And so is this. Uh Uh-oh. That's a losing game, too, Sellers. It will be for you if you try to make a move. Shoot it out with the police? Is that your answer? If it comes to that. At least I know how to use a gun. Smiley Prell could tell you. Did you steal this one from Uncle Phineas, too? No, no. This one's my own. Now put down that pool cue and get your hands up. Slow and easy. When I go out of here... I'd... Dean, what are you doing with that? Thanks, Melba. What have you done, Mr. Dollar? 
Nothing that's going to make him feel very happy for the next day or so. A pool cue makes a pretty handy weapon. Why? What, what was he doing with that gun? Surprise number one. Your fiancé is the lad who had your necklace stolen and then later killed his partner. Dean! Oh, that's probably the chief of police. He was coming out to meet me. You want to let him in? Murderer. And I was going to marry him. Yeah, I guess murder is a lot worse than fraud. What do you mean? You filed an insurance claim on a necklace you'd already sold. I imagine the company will want to prosecute. I... I didn't know what I was doing. You sure didn't. Anywhere along the line. You were marrying Dean Sellers for the money he didn't have. And at the same time, he was trying to marry you for the money you didn't have. <laughs> Too bad it didn't work out. You two were made for each other. The police are getting impatient, Miss Crane. Expense account item 15, $186.25. Incidentals in Cranesburg and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $409.10. End of account, end of report. Under separate cover, I am forwarding one necklace consisting of 38 pearls, all imitation. Approximate value, $200. Along with my sincere condolences. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the curse of an ancient king and how it affected the lives and deaths of two people. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Howard McNear, Forrest Lewis, Paul Richards, Mary Jane Croft, Virginia Gregg, James McCallion, Shirley Mitchell, and Russ Thorson. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jimmy Sayer, at Inner Allied Life, Johnny. Oh, hi, Jim. How are you? The way I feel now, the way I'm going to feel depends on you. Okay, let's have it. Remember a guy named King Tut? Egyptian mummy they dug out of a tomb full of treasure a few years ago. That's right. Well, don't tell me you held a policy on him now, Jim. <laughs> oh, seriously, now. You'll also remember there was supposed to be a curse on anybody who molested his tomb. Yeah, supposed to be. But, of course, anybody knows that stuff's a lot of malarkey. Is it? Isn't it? Better reserve judgment, Johnny, until you hear about the curse of Kamashek. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Interallied Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account item one, one dollar even. Taxi to the office of Interallied Life to talk with Jim Sayer. The conference was brief and not very enlightening. I'd much rather have you see Mr. Turnbull and get the story from him yourself. As I said in the beginning, he's a very important client. What's more to the point, 
He can tell you about it much better than I can. Jim, to coin a cliche, you're being just as clear as mud. Also, by the way, he specifically asked for you. Oh, how come? Well, it seems he liked the way you handled the Parkinson case a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, Emily Parkinson, the widow who died. Yeah, and... yeah, that's the one. She was his sister. And, well, go down and see him, Johnny. I, I honestly can't tell you anything more than I already have about the thing. James, you have told me nothing. But he can, and you can pick up a nice fee on it. As a favor to me? No, for that nice fee. Jim promised to phone Eric Turnbull that I was on my way, and I ran of items two and three, four dollars and twenty cents, for a quick lunch and train fare to Stamford. There I was met by a chauffeured car and driven to Turnbull's house. Far out of the town on Birchbrook Road, it was set on one of the biggest, most beautifully landscaped pieces of property I'd ever seen. The fine old home looked as though it had stood there in all its straight-laced dignity for a hundred years, and stolid against the changing world would stand for another hundred. In sharp contrast, a lithe, clean Studebaker Golden Hawk was parked in the sweeping driveway at the front. Haskins, the chauffeur, had explained on the way that he doubled his butler, so I wasn't particularly surprised when he opened the door for me. Since you received a call about your coming, sir, you are to go right in while I take the motor car to the garage. Unless... He glanced at the Golden Hawk quickly back of me, then, having left the word unless hanging in midair, climbed back behind the wheel and drove off. Well, he said go right in. Inside, the house was a classic. From the tile-floored reception room with its walls of oak and the broad staircase leading to the second floor, I could look into the huge living room, finished in polished mahogany with a leaded glass window at one side and thick oriental rugs on the floor. A fireplace that seemed to take in a whole wall and fine mahogany furniture that glowed with a beautiful patina. Beyond that, I could see the library, golden and walnut. And sitting at a broad desk was a man, his face red with anger, shaking his fist at a very attractive girl of 22 or 3 who stood before him, obviously distressed by what was going on. Don't call me Uncle Eric. I'm not your uncle now, and by heaven, if I had my way, I never will be. You're not married to him yet, my girl, and if I have anything to say about it, you... Oh. Oh. Mr. Dollar, isn't it? Yes, sir. Mr. Turnbull? That's right. Come in, come in. And Dorothy, Mr. Dollar, and I wish to be alone. The girl stood there for a brief moment, looking at the man with an expression of utter futility in her face. Then, without so much as a glance at me, he turned and left by the door that I had just entered. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in, please. Thank you. I'm sorry about this. Somewhat embarrassing to you, I'm sure. But it's... Well, it's something I'll have to tell you about later. Sit down, please. Thanks. May I pour you a drink? I must confess, I feel I could use one at the moment. No, no thanks, Mr. Turnbull. I uh, think I'll pass. I suppose it is a little early, but, well, good luck. Now. Jim Sayer, an inner ally, tells me you have an insurance problem. Actually, not yet. I'll be perfectly frank with you, Mr. Dollar. Please do. I'm asking you to help me not as an insurance investigator, but as a man I feel I can trust. (laughs) But you don't really know me, Mr. Turnbull. Oh, on the contrary, I do very well. As a result of your handling of the case of my widowed sister, Emily, when she died a few years ago. As a matter of fact, you and I met very briefly at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, Emily Parkinson. The case involved a lot of phony relatives who filed claims on her estate. Yes, that's right. And your clever trapping of those false claimants and their cheap attempts to gain part of Emily's fortune was... <laughs> I understand that several of them are still serving sentences. Yeah, I believe so. Which is quite what they deserve. If there's anything I detest in this world, it's dishonesty. Well, I I guess most of us feel that way about it. Of course we do, if we have any shred of human dignity. Yeah. But now, uh, what is your problem? It uh, concerns Donald, uh, Emily's son, my nephew. I had expected him to arrive here before you, but suppose I go ahead anyway. Go ahead. Well... When her husband died, Emily was left with a considerable estate and their only child, Donald. The uh, estate's worth nearly a million now. Mm -hmm. With not too many years ahead of us, she wasn't well. She had lavished everything on the boy. The best of private schools, travel to Europe, all the things that befit one of our social and financial status. Before she died, she carefully put all of the money into a trust for Donald. A rather unique arrangement, which I control until he reaches the age of 30. What would happen if he didn't survive you? Would it all pass to you? Uh, uh, yes, yes. But of course, I have no particular need of it. When I sold Turnbull Enterprises some years ago, I 
I think you can see that I'm pretty well fixed investments, you know. Yeah. At uh, any rate, since his mother died, Donald has been living here with me in accordance with her request that I care for him. And I've been glad to do it, for I love the boy very dearly. How old is he, by the way? Uh, 25. He'll be 26 in October. And what's he doing for a living? Uh, that's the whole point. There's no need for him to work for a living, as you put it. But in college, against my better judgment, he majored in archaeology and Egyptology. Mm. What did you want him to study? <laughs> Business and finance, of course. Forgive me for being so blunt, Dollar, but I see no sense whatsoever in his taking the fortune that his father spent so many years building up and squandering it on a lot of... of... Oh, oh, Donald, come in, come in. I received word at the club you wish to see me, Uncle Larry. What is it this... Oh. Mr. Dollar, this is my nephew, Donald Cronin. How do you do, Mr. Hi, Donald? We've been talking about you, Donald. Oh? As a result of a newspaper item I just read, to the effect that you're preparing for another expedition. That's right, sir. I'm going to the ancient city of Thebes in Egypt. Egypt? Since my trip last fall, I've done a lot of reading and research in New York and London. I'm convinced I've located the ancient tomb of the pharaoh Kamashek. An advance party's already begun excavation. I'll join them there. Do you realize the cost of this, this thing? Uncle Eric, it promises to be one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. You mean it might be if I let you go? If you let me go? Uncle Eric, perhaps Mr. Dollar... Mr. Dollar can hear anything I have to say to you. You see, Dollar, we're finally getting to the point. Uh, yeah... Donald, I'll make no bones about it. I'm quite fed up with your wasting your time on these stupid, pointless expeditions. That's not the way the museum feels about them, sir. Well, that's the way I feel about oh, them. Wait, sir, please. Uh, Donald, isn't that your collection for Yucatan that the museum recently acquired? Why, yes, sir. My party and I were able to... I'm sure we don't care about your party and you. You're not only wasting your time, but your money. The money your father struggled an entire lifetime to gain. That money was left for me to spend in any way I see fit. Provided your handling of it meets my approval. When you're 30 and the estate passes completely into your hands, you can do anything you like with it. Buy the Brooklyn Bridge if you want. You probably will. But until then, I am legally in control of it. And now, finally, I have every intention of exercising that control. At least to the extent of seeing you don't squander any more of it on these foolhardy expeditions. I take it you've made several, Donald. Yes, sir, and he's opposed me in all of them. Because sooner or later, you've got to learn that as the wealthy son of a family, it's up to you to carry on the tradition that's been set for you. To increase the fortune that's part of your family name. Build even greater financial power. Not to throw it away. Do you call my contributions to science and history a waste of money? Oh, now look, my boy. There's nothing selfish about my attitude in this matter. I'm thinking only of you and your future. The family name that you alone are left to uphold. Well... Now, why don't you give up this asinine idea of going to Egypt? No, sir. What do you mean, no? Let me finish. There's no point in your saying any more, Uncle. I'm going to explore the tomb of Kamashek. Now, listen here, you I've young made Drake. all the arrangements, obtained the sponsorship of the museum, notified the universities that are interested in my work. I say you're not going. And I say I am, sir. You young fool. Don't you realize that I'm in a position to cut you off and out a penny? If you think I care, Uncle Eric, you're crazy. Then by heaven, I will. So help me, Donald. I've tried to avoid this kind of situation, but you and your idiotic bullheadedness, your utter disregard for the responsibility and importance of your family, social status have made it inevitable. Now it's come in spite of all I've tried to do, and by heaven, I'll cut you off without a... Wait a minute. Donald, where are you going? Egypt. In the moment or two before Eric Turnbull recovered his poise enough to speak to me, my mind raced. This whole situation offered a big flock of wild possibilities. Obviously, the two were at sword points, had been for some time. Apparently, and I began to wonder about this, Turnbull had no need of Donald's money. Yet he seemed determined to keep him from spending it. And on what looked to me like a very worthy expedition. If Donald died, Turnbull had said, the estate would pass to him. Oh, and something else I wanted to find out about. The girl who had been there when I arrived. But why? Why? Why did I want to know or need any answers? What could this whole affair possibly have meant to me? I'm no family counselor. I'm an... In... I guess I spoke that thought out loud. I'm an insurance investigator. Yes, Dollar. Which is another reason why I need your help in this affair. But I, uh, I just don't see it, Mr. I'm Turnbull. I'm afraid I must apologize for that little scene a moment ago. Well, there's no need to. It was interesting, to say the least. Well, we didn't touch on the one thing that I wanted you to know about. That girl, Dorothy Harkness, his so-called fiancé. <laughs> oh. Thanks to a generous allowance, plus fees from the museum and some of the universities, Donald's insured his life for $100,000. 50000 for the museum. And a like amount for the girl. Through Inter-Allied? Yes. I'll put it to you bluntly. 
She has prodded him to go on these expeditions. And I believe she somehow hopes to engineer his death during this Kamashek project in order to collect on that policy. Do I make myself clear? If anything was clear about this situation, I certainly couldn't see it. More things that come flying at me from out of left field during the past half hour than I could cope with. And I wanted time to organize some kind of thinking. So I used a corny old device, glanced at my watch, said something about being late for an appointment back in Hartford. I apologized, promised to talk with him again tomorrow when there'd be more time. Haskins drove me back to the station and courteously waited until the train pulled in, then left. And it was then I noticed the little Studebaker Golden Hawk that I'd seen at the house pull up beside the platform, and the girl, Dorothy Harkness, jumped out and ran over to me. Mr. Dollar, I had to wait for Haskins to leave so he wouldn't see me. Oh? I must talk to you. Please call me. Here's the number. Is this about Donald? Yes. Because of the danger he's in. From Mr. Turnbull? No. And you must believe me. From the curse of Kamashek. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a little order starts to come out of the Department of Utter Confusion and a promise of murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have your call to Stanford, sir. Oh, thank you, operator. Hello? Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm so glad you've called. Well, you seem pretty anxious to talk about something, Miss Harkness. I am, about Donald and his uncle, and Donald's plan for the expedition to Egypt. To dig up the remains of the old pharaoh Kamashek? Yes. Can you come over here to see me, please? Oh, when I talked to you on the station platform a while ago, you said something about the curse of Kamashek. Yes. Isn't that nothing more nor less than superstition? No. Huh? I'm afraid that in this case, Mr. Dollar, it can mean nothing more nor less than murder. I'll take the first train. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, The Curse of Kamashek Matter. Expense account continued. (laughs) Item 4, 320, cab to the station, train fare from Hartford to Stamford, and cab to the modest but attractive apartment of Dorothy Harkness. The short trip gave me time to think. Eric Turnbull, wealthy retired businessman, called me in on this case. Turnbull, uncle of young Donald Cronin, entirely in control of a large trust fund for the boy. Turnbull, who was determined to prevent him from making an expedition to the tomb of Kamashek, on the excuse that he suspected a plot against the boy's life, engineered by Dorothy Harkness, who was not only Donald's fiancée, but a beneficiary of his $100,000 life policy. 
So a talk with Dorothy Harkness seemed very much in order. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. I'm so glad you were willing to come and talk with me. How are you, Miss Harkness? You make me sound so old. It's Dorothy. Won't you sit down? All right. Thank you. But before we go any further, Dorothy, I think you ought to understand that I'm an insurance investigator, and so oh, far... Oh, I know that. Donald told me his uncle was going to send for you. But there's been no claim file, no reason for one. I know. Mr. Turnbull does, well, kind of unusual things now and then, and I guess this is one of them. Unless he's trying to prevent whatever might cause a claim to be filed. Mr. Dollar, I don't know what Mr. Turnbull has told you about me, but I'm sure it wasn't good. I'm afraid we don't get along very well. Well, it's uh, pretty obvious he doesn't like your interest in his nephew, Donald. I've known Donald since school, Mr. Dollar, and we... We hope to get married. At least Donald does. Oh? And what about you? Uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I got the impression from Mr. Turnbull you were doing a pretty good job of getting Donald into your clutches. But that isn't the way it is at all. We've been seeing a great deal of each other, and Donald has asked me to marry him. And I'm fond of him, Mr. Dollar, terribly fond of him. But so far as marriage is concerned, I... I'm not sure. What do you mean? I can't help wondering all the time if he isn't hoping to marry me just as a... well, as an escape from his uncle. Uh-huh. Would you marry him? If I were sure of, of him. You'd be sure of an awful lot of money, Dorothy. What? The minute he reached 30, that is. Mr. Turnbull has poisoned your mind, Mr. Dollar. What money Donald has or may have has nothing to do with it. That sort of thinking is filthy. I, um... I guess you mean that, don't you, Dorothy? Yes. I think I've loved Donald ever since my father brought him into the museum. Your father? Yes, he's curator of archaeology. Well, how does he feel about Donald and you? His only interest in Donald is in the money, the financial support he gives the museum. Oh. Since that's... mother died, he's become a grasping, self-centered old man whose only interest is in the museum. I see. That's why I don't live with him anymore. Well, then I take it he opposes any thought of your marrying Donald. He wants me to string him along for his money and scientific contributions. But Donald is making something of himself. Instead of wasting his life in idle luxury as Mr. Turnbull would have it. Or would he rather have Don increase the family fortune? No. No, just not spend it. That's all he cares about. So if anything should happen to Donald, there would be more left for Mr. Eric Turnbull. And that's why I called you. Because I'm afraid that if Donald does go on this expedition to Egypt, something will happen to him. Oh, now, wait a minute. Turnbull has objected strenuously to this latest expedition. You don't know them yet. Either of them. They're of the same stock, and they're both stubborn, determined, and willful, and his uncle is clever. Clever enough to play on this stubbornness. Capitalize on it. What's that supposed to mean? He knows that the surest way to keep Donald from doing something is to insist that he do it. It's always been that way. Are you sure you haven't been reading too much psychology? It's true. And in spite of Donald's academic maturity, he's almost like a child in some things. Emotional sometimes. That... That's another reason why I wonder if Donald really wants to marry me. If he loves me enough. Or if he's simply rebelling against his uncle. You feel, then, that Mr. Turnbull is opposing the expedition to be sure that Donald will make it? Yes. Because he doesn't quietly reason with Donald, talk things out. He shouts, he storms, he threatens. And that gets Don's back hair up, huh? It makes him more determined to go than ever. Wouldn't it do the same to you? <laughs> Maybe so. And I'm afraid that if he does go... He'll never come back. You honestly don't want him to go? No. Just what do you think might happen to him? This curse of Kamashek you mentioned? I think that would be the excuse for his uncle to have something happen to him. Well, what is this curse? Do you remember King Tutankhamun? Well, I remember hearing and reading something about him, old Egyptian pharaoh. His tomb had a curse on it, too. But because they believed it would yield important historical data and some of the treasure of those ancient dynasties... An expedition went to the Valley of the Kings and excavated it anyhow. You're really hip on this stuff, aren't you? Because of Donald's interest in it, I guess. But listen to me. One after another, people who were involved in that expedition died under very mysterious circumstances. Yeah, I remember. Even Lord Carnivan himself. They said that he died from the results of a mosquito bite and pneumonia. But the other deaths were not so easily explained away. Not even by able scientists and doctors. You believe in the curse of King Tut, then? And now the curse of Kamashek? No. 
Oh, I don't. But from what you just told me... There have been too many other tombs, all bearing warnings, where the people who dug into them touched the treasures in them, even touched the remains of the kings, had no harm at all come to them. Well, then I'm afraid I don't see what you're driving at. This, Johnny. Any mysterious death of someone who's explored one of these ancient tombs will be accepted as a result of the curse, don't you see? It's an open door to murder. You know something, to me it all sounds a little far-fetched. No. Because of Eric Turnbull... Because I'm sure he wants Donald out of the way. For his money. This terrible friction between them, this antagonism that's been building up for years. And it's reached a point where either one of them would be glad to see the other out of the way. But Eric Turnbull is the only one who's evil enough to do something about it. Well, I gotta admit, the sparks kind of flew between them when I saw them together. And don't forget it would be to his uncle's advantage if Donald were to die. He needs the money? Well, no, I guess he doesn't. What about you? I'm doing all right at the museum. I'm earning enough to live on, and I'm happy in my work. Just the same as I understand it, you'd collect half of Donald's life policy. I hate you for even thinking about such a thing. I'd hoped you would help me save Donald's life. Funny, though, isn't it? Funny. Harry Turnbull is my employer in this case, if there really is a case. Because he's smart. He's clever. He's clever enough to know that calling you in would help cover up anything he might do. All right, look... Suppose Eric Turnbull did want, did plan to get rid of Donald. How? I don't know. But this I do know. And it's the thing that has scared me. On his last expedition, and he didn't realize it until afterwards, one of the men in his party, a man he'd selected himself, turned out to have been paid separately by Mr. Turnbull. Why not? He probably wanted somebody there to look after Donald without his knowing. Listen to me. This man caused a couple of accidents. At least they called them accidents that could have cost Donald his life. Oh, now, Dorothy, look. No, no. No, I can see that you don't believe anything I've told you. Dorothy, I think you're just building up something in your imagination. You don't believe me. But at least do this. Remember, no matter what happens, remember what I've told you. Somebody was lying. That was a cinch. But who? And why? Unless one of them really was plotting against the life of Donald Cronin. I couldn't get it out of my head that at least Eric Turnbull didn't need whatever money would come from Donald's death. Dorothy Harkness, on the other hand, would gain what to her would be plenty. Sure, nearly a million would go to Turnbull. But that would mean much less to him than the 50,000 insurance would to her. Well, there seemed to be nothing more to say to her at the moment, so I left her, took a cab back to the station, that's item 5, 65 cents, and telephoned to the house on Birchbrook Road in the hope that Donald would be home and I'd have a chance to talk to him. Hello? Oh, Mr. Turnbull, uh, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, splendid. Where are you? Well, I'm at the station, but I was calling to try and... Splendid. Haskins will drive the car down to meet you immediately. Well, uh, now... I knew that if you thought it over, you'd be willing to take on this case. Uh, yeah, sure. You just wait right there. Haskins will be along in a few minutes. Goodbye. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Well, thank you, but before we, uh, before we talk about this... Sit down, thing... won't you? Now, from what I've been able to learn, Donald is planning to leave for Egypt immediately. I, uh, checked with a friend at the Explorers Club in New York where the boy's been staying these past few days. Oh, I thought he always stayed right here with you. Well, he does, except when he's preparing for an expedition. Then you are going to let him go. Well, how can I stop him without making him look foolish in the eyes of his colleagues, the museum, the universities who are so interested in his work? Yes, I have to let him go. But with you beside him there... Oh, wait a minute. Of course, I'll expect you to be with him during the entire expedition. Well, now, look, I... Remember this, no expense is to be spared in the protection of my nephew's life. I uh, had to go down to New York to see David Wilt. He's my stockbroker, Harris Dillman Company. While I was there, I stopped at my bank and arranged to have some 5,000 in American Express Chavers checks ready for you. All you have to do is go down there and sign them and pick them up. If you need more, cable me. You don't waste any time, do you? I know Donald. He's very stubborn, determined, and willful. (laughs) In his present frame of mind, he might pack up and take off at a moment's notice. I want to be sure you're at his side. Okay, you're the boss. But, Mr. Turnbull... Yes? You still haven't told me why you think his life is in any more danger on this expedition than on any of the others he's undertaken. Because that girl, Dorothy Harkness, is smart, is clever... And because of something that happened on Donald's last expedition in Yucatan. Oh? He didn't realize it until afterwards. But one of the men in his party, a man he'd selected himself, 
turned out to be a friend of this Dorothy Harkness. Not 20 minutes ago, I heard exactly... Now listen to me. This man caused a couple of accidents. At least they called them accidents. That could have cost Donald his life. And Mr. Dollar, though lacking any proof, I am convinced he was put up to them by the beneficiary of his insurance policy. Dorothy Harkness. Did I say somebody was lying? Somebody had to be lying. And by now, that old feeling was beginning to come back to me. That hunch, whatever it is, that told me somebody was planning to kill Donald. Eric Turnbull? Dorothy Harkness? Who? Something told me I'd better get to Donald Cronin. But fast. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, suddenly the reason for a carefully planned murder becomes crystal clear. And a race against death becomes a race for my own life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the operator at the Explorers Club. Oh, good. Have you been able to... Sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I haven't been able to reach Mr. Donald Cronin for you. Well, hasn't he been there at all? He was in and out all morning, but he refused to answer any calls then. Since you first telephoned, he hasn't been back. Well, do you know when he will be back? No, I don't, sir. All right, then leave a message. I'll meet him there at the club. Is it very important that you see him, Mr. Dollar? It's important that I keep him from being murdered. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item six, $9.80, train to New York, quick lunch and taxi to the Traders Bank and Trust Company. There I picked up the American Express traveler's checks that Eric Turnbull had left in my name, had left for expense money to take me to Egypt, to make sure his nephew Donald Cronin lived safely through an expedition to open the grave of the ancient pharaoh Kamashek. The bank teller's brief remark gave me something to think about. Hmm. I'll, uh, I'll sign, Mr. Dollar? Mm, yep. Yes, now, let me check the amount for you just once more. All right. One thousand, two thousand, three thousand, thirty-five hundred, four, forty-five, forty-seven, forty-eight... At five thousand dollars each. Mm-hmm. Yes, here you are. Good, thanks. And as I'm sure Mr. Turnbull knows, this will close out this particular account completely. I thought about that remark a little later when it began to tie in with some other things I learned. Right now, item seven eighty cents cab fare to the Explorers Club. 
Donald had not yet returned, so I left another message for him, asking him to sit tight until he heard from me. And I meant sit tight. Because apparently, after the latest argument with his Uncle Eric, he was quite likely to hop off to Egypt on short notice. This I didn't want. As a matter of fact, at this point, I wasn't sure I approved of his expedition at all. Both his uncle and his girlfriend, Dorothy Harkness, had told me they thought his life was in danger. And each accused the other of plotting his murder. I was about to leave the Explorers Club when I was buttonholed by a short, kind of cute-looking old character in gray striped suit, tatters all vest, spats, believe it or not, and all but a monocle. Uh, I say there, old man. Uh, yes? If you'll pardon me, I believe I overheard you inquiring at the desk for Donald Cronin, didn't I? Oh, yes. Do you know him? Oh, I most certainly do. Uh, but excuse me, I'm Percival Thronghurst Scatterday. Mr. Scatterday, I'm Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Donald told me that he'd met you at his home. Uh, tell me, do you plan to accompany him on the ex expedition to Thebes? Well, uh, yes. Excellent, excellent. It should result, you know, in one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. Think of it. The tomb of Kamashek. Yes. Do you know where Donald is now? Treasures, artifacts, and that should put to shame the ones that were excavated from the tomb of Tutankhamun. Yes, I'm sure it will, but now... If I'm... history has told us the truth about Kamashek, uh, 18th dynasty, I believe... Now that I wouldn't know, but now, uh, Mr. Scandaday, it's important that I reach Donald Cronin just uh, as no, soon no, as... No, 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 now that I think of it, Kamashek... Kamashek was 12th dynasty. Oh, Mr. Scandaday, uh, if... But, but he couldn't be, because that was the era... Oh, yes, yes, I remember now. It was the 18th, the same period in which the great temple of Queen Hatshepsut was erected at Daya el-Bahari, at Thebes, of course. Uh, you've seen that, of course. No, I haven't. Oh, magnificent, enthralling. Now, look here, sir. Uh, but now, Mr. Dollar... I've got to reach Donald Cronin, so if you'll excuse me... Uh, Mr. Dollar, please, you say you are going with Donald. You do know about the curse of Kamashek. Or do you? Yes, yes, I've heard of it. Oh, then you'll certainly arrange not to be present at the opening of the sarcophagus. Why? Well, as I'm certain you know, all the preliminary work has been accomplished by the advance party, of course. So I understand. The antechamber of the tomb was opened over a month ago. So? Well, it simply means that as soon as Donald arrives, they will penetrate to the sepulchral chamber and the sarcophagus itself. Well? Uh, Mr. Dollar. It was engraved on the stone slab, barring the way to the last chamber, Mantak Ko Fore El, and so on. Oh, what's that supposed to be? Uh, the warning, my boy, the warning. That whosoever violate the tomb and desecrate the body of the noble pharaoh by contact therewith shall quickly die. <laughs> you don't believe in those things, do you? Mr. Dollar. As I always understood it, those warnings were just put there to discourage thieves from robbing those old tombs. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I only ask that you remember what happened to those who violated the tomb of Tutankhamun. Oh, well, couldn't the deaths of the people who entered that tomb be due simply to coincidence? Or rather, things, uh, circumstances quite apart from their having done so? Of course, of course, they could, but were they? Mr. Dollar, I assure you that if it were not for the warning of the curse of Kamashek, I would be the first to want to enter that tomb. Instead, I have refused to go on the expedition at all. Uh, take care of Donald. Well, that's what I'm being hired to do. And of yourself, sir. Yeah, sure. Now, sorry, but I'm anxious to reach Donald, and you say you've seen him here at the club? Yes, only last evening. He was here making some of his final preparations. Well, do you know where he is now? Yes. Well, where? At his uncle's place in Stamford, Connecticut. You're sure? Uh, as sure as I am that you've not heeded my warning about the curse of Kamashek. But I beg you, Mr. Dollar, for the welfare of Donald Cronin and yourself. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. If this were a mystery story instead of an accounting of expenditures on a case, I'd tag Percy Scatterday as a prime suspect for whatever might happen later. Like the man who tries to throw you off his own trail by suggesting that somebody else is gunning for you. But I decided he was just an old fogey who'd been turned down on the Kamashek expedition, was trying to justify his own shortcomings with the tales about the curse. But you know something? I was wrong. I should have listened to him a little more understandingly. <laughs> Item 8, 75 cents, taxi to the office of Harrison and Dillman and Company to see David Wilt, the man Eric Turnbull had named as his stockbroker. The reason? The remark the bank teller had made about closing out an account... As it turned out, my timing was perfect. Uh, sit down, sir, sit down. I'll be with you just as soon as I finish this phone call. Oh, sure, thanks. Hello. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, but someone just stepped into my office. If you'd rather be left alone, I'll... No, it's all right. Now, as I started to say, if you dispose of the gold metal mining stock, your holdings will be reduced to practically nothing. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Well, but, Mr... 
Yes, but Mr. Tur... Look, you sure you wouldn't rather I come back another time? Very well, very well. It's just that I hate to see what was once a very strong investment program. Very well, Mr. Turnbull, if you insist. Turnbull? Yes, yes. Goodbye. Now, now, sir. Eric Turnbull, Mr. Wilt? Oh, yes, but... Now, just a minute, sir. It was very remiss of me to mention a client's name in front of you, at least under the circumstances. Whatever I may have said on the phone just now was quite confidential. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I can only ask that you discreetly forget anything you may have heard. Not by a long shot. What's this? Who are you, sir? Dollar, I believe, the receptionist said. That's right, Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. And that conversation told me just what I came here to try to charm you into telling me. Mr. Dollar, please remember this. That was entirely confidential. None of your business. Here, my credentials. Yeah? Well? Now, you remember something. So far as Eric Turnbull is concerned, my coming here is entirely confidential. None of his business. Goodbye, Mr. Wilt. So the wealthy Eric Turnbull wasn't so wealthy after all. Big investments in the stock market, he'd said. But they didn't look so big anymore. And the closing out of bank accounts. Item 930 cents, phone call to Dorothy Harkness. Yes, Mr. Dollar? I just called to tell you, Dorothy, that if it'll be any satisfaction to you, I'm going to make the trip to Egypt. Oh, thank heaven. Then Donald will have some protection against the machinations of his uncle. Oh, gal, that sounds like a line out of an old melodrama. I know you don't believe me, Mr. Dollar, but I'm so sure that Eric Turnbull is plotting against Donald's life. You know something? I'm beginning to feel a little that way, too. Then you did believe me. In spite of the way you poo-pooed everything I said, are you... Are you and Donald leaving together? I can't seem to find him. Do you know where he is? Have you tried the Explorers? No, not there. Well, he'll surely call me before he leaves. Well, if he does, have him get in touch with me. Where, Mr. Dollar? Right now, I'm going out to Eric Turnbull's house. After that, I'll be back in Hartford. Item 10, $7 even, train fare back to Stamford and taxi to the Turnbull residence in the hope that there I would find Donald Cronin, the real principal in this case, and the one person I hadn't yet talked to. But it was Eric Turnbull who met me at the door. Mr. Dollar, I'm glad to see you. Come in, come in. Have you seen my nephew Donald? Well, no. Isn't he here? No, nor is he at the Explorers Club. I've called him several times. I'm worried about him in his present frame of mind. I'm worried about him too, Mr. Turnbull, but not for the same because reason. Because of that girl, Dorothy Harkness. Yes, it no, that isn't what I meant. In his present frame of mind, he's likely to jump off on his flight to Egypt without... Look here. I wonder if he's with her. No, that much I do know. Oh, I wish to heaven he would call. If anything happens if to If anything that... happens to him, you'd love it, wouldn't you? What? What did you say? I've done a little checking up on you, Mr. Turnbull, since I last talked to you. What do you mean? In a case as involved as this, it's necessary to check all the angles. Everything, everyone, even the man who hires you. Has that girl been poisoning your mind against me, too? Your banker, from whom I picked up the American Express checks, let it slip that your account is in pretty bad shape. Non-existent now, as a matter of fact. Go on, Mr. Dollar. And your stockbroker, quite inadvertently, made it all too plain that the big investments you told me about aren't so big after all. Mr. Dollar... All right, tie that in with the fact that if anything does happen to Donald, you'll come into his estate. You've said enough. But it's true, isn't it? You laid so much stress on Dorothy and the museum getting his 100,000 life insurance, but you're the one who would really benefit by his death. Dollar, you have talked with one banker, with one stockbroker. Why, in your snooping around, didn't you talk with the others who hold my accounts? Like who? Like, that's none of your business. But if what you are implying were true, why in heaven's name would I ever ask you to come in and protect my nephew? As a cover-up? I should knock you down with my bare fists, and believe me, my boy, I could do it. Now listen to me. I am listening. If I didn't have any money, how could I afford to give you the 5000 in expense money, pay whatever other costs may be involved in your employment? And why do you suppose, in spite of this high-handed attitude of yours, I'm still begging you to stay on this case? See, Donald, Mr. Dollar, talk with him. You'll find that in spite of the angry scene between us, I'm concerned only with his welfare. That I want to protect him. That I want you to protect him. Wait, wait, that's Donald. Now, let me take it. Well, now, just a minute. Johnny Dollar. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, I was calling Mr. Turnbull. Mr. Scannady? Uh, yes, at the Explorers Club. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I've just talked to a couple of fellow members who saw him off. Saw him? Donald Cronin? Yes, last night. His plane has probably reached Cairo by now. Uh, fooled all of us, didn't he? Yeah. Thanks. Well, thought you'd want to... Well? Donald left for Egypt last night. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Then please, 
Please, I beg of you, go. In heaven's name, go to him. Stay with him. Protect him. For a long moment, Eric Turnbull simply stood there, sobbing, pleading with his tear-filled eyes. And suddenly, I don't know why, I found that I believed him. I wish now that he'd been lying. Two lives might have been saved. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a flight into darkness, and when day has come, there's blood on the desert sands. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Have you found Donald yet, Mr. Dollar? Have you been... Oh, this is Dorothy Hargman. Yeah, I know. And no, I haven't found Donald Cronin. He wasn't at his uncle's place? Johnny, you must find him. Talk to him. Talk him out of making the trip to Egypt. Dorothy. If he does, he'll die. His uncle will see to it that he dies. Look, Dorothy. find him and stop him. I'm afraid it's a little late for that. What? He took off on a direct flight to Egypt early yesterday. Oh, no. Has at least a 36-hour start, at least. Johnny, you must go after him. On the first plane, I can get to Cairo. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 10. Taxi, train to New York, and cab to the airport. $9.45. Item 11. Round trip plane fare to Cairo, Egypt. $1,305. I was tired, and the steady drone of the four powerful engines lulled me to sleep in no time. I think I might have slept most of the way to Paris, which was to be our first stop, except for hunger pangs and the appropriate ministrations of a very attractive stewardess. Usually on such a long flight, I try to make friends with everybody aboard, just to shorten the trip. And I did this time, except for one man who sat four or five seats behind me. He was a rather hefty individual, dark-complexioned, about 30, I'd guess, who didn't budge from his seat during the entire flight. And every time I approached him to pass the time of day, he immediately made like he was asleep. So he wanted to be alone. But when I settled down into my seat, next to a lovely petite brunette named Carolyn, who was... Now, that's beside the point, except for purely personal reasons that I'll pursue further when I get back to the States. Uh, yeah. The point is that in primping a bit and replenishing her lipstick, she held up a small mirror compact... 
And reflected in it, I could see that the dark complexion man was not only quite wide awake, but watching me every second of the ride. In a rather strange way, too. Concentrated. Like you'd watch a fly you're planning to swat. Then every time I'd turn around, he'd promptly shut his eyes and feign sleep again. Finally, it was early evening, we sat down at Le Bourget, the airport on the outskirts of Paris. Since this was Carolyn's destination, during the short layover, I helped her get her baggage and extracted the promise of a date in New York when she returned in the fall. Yeah. Yeah, I guess Paris does it to you. Well, anyhow, after she'd piled into a taxi, I wandered around for a bit thinking and decided to reboard the plane, look up the dark, silent passenger and have it out with him. But apparently I'd waited too long. As I passed a narrow sort of alley beside a baggage shed, he decided to have it out with me. In here, darling, quick. Huh? What? In here, where we won't be sane. Oh, now, just a minute, fella. Who are you? What do you want? Just this. What are you? What are you? What are you? you don't. All right, now. Now, what was the big idea, mister? You gonna talk or do you want some more of this? All right. All right, I'll talk. Well, who put you up to this? Come on, no, come on. No, I can't tell you that. You want to bet? <clears throat> All right, now start talking. I say... All right. All right, I'll talk, I'll talk. It was Turnblow. It was Turnblow. What? Turnbull? Here. Yeah, that's right. Frederick Turnbull. Why? Oh, should I know? I, I do a lot of strong arm for him. Go on, go on. So he pays me good to get you out of the way, so I should ask questions? Well, maybe he'll have a few to ask you if you ever get back to the States. Now, roll over. Huh? No. No. Hey. All right. Yeah, hey, wait. What are you doing? That's right. That's my passport. That's right, mister. That's exactly what it was. When you get back on your feet, you can try to figure out how to go on from here without it. Listen, you dirty... Sorry, m- buddy. I gotta catch a flight. <laughs> I suppose I should have turned the unfriendly thug over to the French police, but figured he'd have trouble enough lacking a passport to keep him out of my way for a while. The only charges I could make against him would be for assault. Time was of the essence, too. Since Donald Cronin actually was two days ahead of me, and it was important that I join him at the tomb of Kamashek as soon as possible. At least so I thought. Until I entered the main building of the airport again and heard my name being called on the PA system. The information desk showed me where to take a transatlantic phone call. Johnny Dollar. Dollar. This is Eric Turnbull. Well, well. Thank goodness I was able to reach you during your power stopover. I'm glad you did, Mr. Turnbull, because there are a couple of things I want to talk to you about. When you uh, return, Mr. Dollar. What's the matter with right now? And may I suggest that you take the first plane back here that you can get? First, I want a little explanation for a beating I just took from... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you say? Come back here and we'll settle our accounts. The, the, the case is closed. The... What? Donald is dead. Where? How? I just received word from one of the members of the expedition. In Egypt? Yes, the... the curse of Kavashek has been fulfilled. Or was he murdered? I'm afraid it was the same mysterious death that's overtaken so many who violated those old tombs. Well, I don't believe it. Any more than you believe in that so-called curse the last time I talked to you. I know! I was wrong. Heaven forgive me for letting the boy go. Look, Mr. Turnbull, things just don't make sense at all. Come back, Mr. Dollar, and we'll talk about it here. Listen to me. Yes? Before I decide what I'm going to do, I want to know why you hired a thug to try to put me out of the picture. What? I I, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you don't. Well, he made it plenty plain that he's handled strong-arm jobs for you before. That's impossible. Gave me your name as the man who's hired him many times. Frederick Turn... Whoa. Hold it. Hold it a minute. Dollar, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I haven't the least... Maybe I... I will go back to New York at that. Mr. Dollar! It suddenly dawned on me that I must have been slightly befuddled by the partial beating I'd taken earlier. You know, when the thug made his little confession a few minutes before. I'll talk, I'll talk. It was Turnblow hired me. Frederick Turnblow. Frederick Turnblow, he'd said, instead of Eric Turnbull. Sure, they sound alike. But a guy who's done a lot of strong-arm jobs, knows the guy, the right name of the guy that hired him, that can mean only one thing. Someone had instructed that thug to say he'd been hired by Turnbull. But who? 
I canceled out the rest of my flight to Cairo, made reservations back to New York, and then while waiting for that plane, ran up item 13, $82 American. On phone calls to whomever I could dig up among the Egyptian government authorities who had been overseeing the excavation of Kamashek's tomb. What little I learned was pretty much summed up by the British doctor who'd been a member of the expedition. Very mysterious, Mr. Dollar. You see, because of the superstition about violating the tomb, only two of our people even touched any of the bones we found within it. Yeah? And incidentally, that is all we found. The tomb had been thoroughly ransacked by thieves, well, probably centuries ago. Yeah, but you were saying, Doctor. Oh, yes, yes. Only two touched any of the remains. One was a native carrier, as soon as the bones had been properly sprayed with a preservative. Uh-huh. And the other was Donald Cronin, who, for some reason or other, wrapped up the bones and sent them by air to his uncle, a uh, Mr. Eric Turnbull in the United States. Oh. Well, go on, go on. Well, that's really all, Mr. Dollar. Except, of course, that both of them have died of some strange malady that the authorities have not been able to determine. And that's why the tomb has been officially closed again. Hey, listen, tell me something. Could the bones have been accessible to anyone before those two touched them? Yes, to anyone in the party. Well, now, don't tell me that you suspect... Oh, listen, mister, I don't know what I suspect. But I don't believe it was any curse of a long-dead pharaoh that killed those two men. Even in view of what happened to those who entered the tomb of Tutankhamen for some years ago, and then the tomb of... King... Look, tell me this, will you? Have any of the expedition returned to America? Well, of course, the authorities have here no reason for holding them. You haven't answered my question. No. Well, only the two young men that Donald brought along with him... Who were they? Uh, Carl Fortina. Oh, who's he? From New York. Like Donald himself, he's an archaeologist. And the other? One of his colleagues at the museum in, uh... Hmm, I believe it's in Stamford. What's his name? Oh, he's a young osteological expert, son of a curator at the museum, as I recall. What? And his name is Walter Harkness. Well, I'll be. But surely you don't think... Doctor, it's... you go right ahead and hang those two deaths on good old King Kamashek. Me? I'm going after a couple of live suspects. <laughs> There was plenty of time before the New York plane for a quick look for my heavy-handed pal in the alley where I'd left him. But he'd either crawled away or been picked up by the gendarmes, and I didn't have time for a session with them. Item 14150 for some food. Then aboard the plane, and we took off. Ah, it was a rough case to figure. Actually, of course, the insurance angle was done and over with. It ended with Donald Cronin's death. And two people would benefit by his death, both of them number one suspects. One, his uncle, Eric Turnbull, who would now take over the million-dollar estate. The other, Dorothy Harkness, who would gain a big chunk of life insurance money, along with the museum, of course, that her father... Who hold everything? Her father, Adam Harkness, who opposed her marriage to Donald, who looked on him simply as a source of income for the museum, who... Hold everything is right. There was the son, too, Walter Harkness, who ducked back to the States the minute Donald died. How did he fit into this? Believe me, in spite of all the talk in it, the belief in it, the one thing I was sure had nothing to do with the whole matter was the curse of Kamashek. Nevertheless, call it hunch or whatever you like, the more I thought about it, the more certain I became that I'd find all the answers in a package that Donald had mailed back to the States. A package containing the bones of Pharaoh Kamashek. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Haskins. Mr. Turnbull, then? Yes, and I'm sure he wishes to see you. It's a frightful thing about Master Donald, isn't it, sir? And how does Mr. Turnbull feel about it? Terribly broken up, sir. I'll bet. Oh, but, but please come in. He's in the library. Thanks. He just received a package the poor boy sent to him before he... Wait, Haskins. Has he opened it yet? He was examining the contents when the doorbell... Good heavens. Mr. Turnbull... He's fallen from his chair, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar, he's... Oh, no. Yeah, Haskins. He's dead. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Before I do, 
Please let me thank you for the letters you keep sending us about the program. So many come in every day that it's become quite a chore to answer them, but you know something? I love it. As a matter of fact, your letters are appreciated by all of us who are involved in the production and presentation of the show. Our director, the writers, the various members of our cast, and our excellent technical crew. So please don't stop. Tomorrow, the wind-up. And a sorry example of what the lust for money can sometimes do to nice people. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. St. Clair returning your call, Stinky. Oh, hi, Leonard. Where have you been, Johnny? It's been years. Yeah, I know. Listen, can you give me a hand? Who got poison this time? Two of them. I hope it's poison. And that you can prove it for me. We'll try. What do I do? Meet me here at the home of Eric Turnbull in Stamford, Connecticut. Okay, but Johnny... Give you the address in a minute. But Johnny, what do you mean you hope somebody got poison? Because if they didn't, I'm going to go off my rocker. What? Because the only other possible cause of death could be a curse. The curse of Kamashek. Who? An Egyptian king who died a couple of dozen centuries ago. What? Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continued. I called Dr. Leonard St. Clair, an old school chum, because I knew him to be one of the foremost toxicologists in the country. And I was telling the truth. I hoped it could be shown that some kind of poison killed Donald Cronin and subsequently his uncle Eric Turnbull. Both, apparently, had believed in the curse of the old Egyptian pharaoh. A curse that was to befall anyone who violated his ancient tomb on the banks of the Nile. Donald had done this in excavating the tomb. But his uncle here in Stamford had only touched the bones that Donald had airmailed to him. He was opening the package that Master Donald... God rest his soul. That Master Donald had sent him just before he died, there at the tomb in Egypt. I brought them in here to the library for him, sir. Go on, Haskins. Well, then you rang the doorbell. I, I left him with it, and uh, when you and I came in here... Yeah, dead. From the curse of Kamashek, Mr. Dollar... Oh, no, Haskins, I don't believe it. A friend of mine, Dr. St. Clair, will be here shortly, and he'll be but able to... But shouldn't we notify the police? No, sir? no, no, later. But, but leave my poor employee's body just lying there? For the time being, yes. Until Dr. St. Clair examines it. Hey, as you wish, sir. That's what I wish. Haskins. One person in this confusing mess I hadn't given a second thought to. As it turned out, there wasn't time, for Len St. Clair arrived a few minutes later in a car equipped like a miniature laboratory. 
No doubt as a result of the police work he was frequently called on to do. First, of course, in his capacity as an M.D., he made a thorough examination of Eric Turnbull's body for purposes of death certificate data. It was poison, all right, Johnny. I'm sure of it. At least as sure as I can be, short of making an autopsy. But what kind of poison, Len? And how administered? Well, at the risk of making it sound like a dime novel, I'd say it was an extremely rare, uh, well... Well, what? Come on. Well, it's something I haven't heard of in years. Related to the old Indian arrow poison. It's very difficult to detect. Can you make sure? Yes, if you'll help me drag some of my equipment in from the car, including a cage of white mice. Wh- what? Yeah, on which to experiment with samples of the stuff. Samples from those old bones out of the tomb? Mm, that's right. Now, from what you've told me, only two people have touched the bones since the minute they were discovered in the tomb. Three. A native carrier, Donald Cronin, and now the late Eric Turnbull. And they've all died. But, Johnny... Yeah? The poison I'm thinking of would hardly have been put on those bones in the time of the pharaohs. Oh, and by the way, I hope no one's touched them here. No, I've left them just as they are in that mailing wrapper. Good. Because it could be fatal. I'll carefully scrape them when we get the equipment in here. We brought in what Len needed for his work, including the white mice. Then I closed him in the library and left him to his experiments. To a bit of research, too, for he'd brought in a couple of thick books on toxicology. As a matter of routine, I phoned the local coroner and then tried to reach Dorothy Harkness. Her number didn't answer. I was about to drive over to her little apartment when Len came out of the library. I was right, Johnny. Curaba arsenium. That the name of the stuff? Uh-huh. In its powder form, absorbed into the pores of the skin, it could be fatal almost immediately. And listen to me. Yeah? Somehow, between the time the bones of that old king were discovered and the time that Donald Cronin touched them, somebody put that poison on them. How? Without endangering himself. By keeping it in aqueous solution until the bones were sprayed with it. Sprayed with it? Wait a minute. Yeah? Sprayed with it, huh? A doctor, an Englishman who was on the expedition, told me that the bones had been sprayed with some kind of preservative, even before the native carrier touched them. You thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah, right. Instead of preservative, it was the poison. Well, who sprayed them? I've got a wild idea, Len. But if it's right, it'll sew up this whole case. I wonder who that is. Well, while you're finding out, I'm going back and recheck these tests. But only as a matter of routine, because I'm sure I'm right. I beg your pardon, sir. Yeah, Haskins? Miss Dorothy Harkness is here, sir. Huh? And her young brother, Walter. Shall I ask them in, sir? By all means. It's a terrible thing that has happened. Is that really the way you feel about it, Dorothy? What? Yes, yes. What do you mean by that, Mr. Dollar? I'm Walter Harkness. Well, come right in, Walter. Because I have a sneaking suspicion you're the boy I've been looking for. What? Your conscience finally began to hurt you? Would you like to sit down and write your confession now? What are you talking about? Or did you and Dorothy just come here to put on a front? You know, as a (laughs) cover-up? I don't know what you're talking about. Johnny, what are you saying? Sit down, both of you, because I'm going to be saying plenty. Look here, Mr. Dollar. Sit down, I said. Now sit down. All right, Dorothy, we'll begin with you. Johnny, I don't understand. Now listen to me. From what you told me, and I've no other reason for believing it except that you told me, Donald Cronin was in love with you. It was true. And I At any I... rate, he made you part beneficiary of his $100,000 life insurance policy. Half of it, I believe. A cool $50,000. Johnny, how can you say you're oh, even Oh, be think... quiet. Mr. Dollar... I'm coming I... to you right now, Walter. You're working for the museum where your father is curator of archaeology. The museum that has depended quite a lot not only on Donald Cronin's scientific contributions... But his monetary help as well. Well, that may be true, but now look here. The museum. The other beneficiary of Donald's insurance. Also $50,000. Mr. Dollar, if you're implying that I had anything to do with Donald's debt... You can shut up, too, and let me talk. This is the first chance I've had to begin to tie this case up. The first time any of the crazy elements in it made sense. No, wait, tell me this. Eric Turnbull was opposed to Donald's interest in the museum, wasn't he? Well, yes, Sure. And I'll bet my bottom dollar that if something happened to both Donald and his uncle, the estate worth nearly a million was willed by Donald to the museum. That's true, Johnny, but there's no... No wonder Eric Turnbull was afraid for Donald's life. Because he knew who would ultimately benefit most by his death. No wonder he hated you, Dorothy. Johnny! Oh, Johnny, you can't mean you think that I would... No, 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 no. I think you were only being used as a tool, Dorothy. You told me yourself how your father opposed your marrying him. How his only interest was in getting money for the museum... Is that true, Walter? Yes, Mr. Dollar, that is true. 
But if you mean to imply that I or any of us was involved in Donald's Walter, death... Walter, the more I think about it, the more I'm sure you are directly involved. But now, sit down. It's a lie. I swear to it, Mr. Dolly. You're wrong. It's a lie. We'll see about that. Because there's one thing you may have overlooked. I know what killed Donald Crump. You... you do? Oh, yes, Walter. Just as well as you do. But I don't. I... I haven't the least... The curse of Kamashek. The curse Johnny. of Kamashek. Not by a long shot. Was it, Walter? I told you, I haven't the slightest... All right, then I... tell me this. Immediately the pile of bones was found in Kamashek's tomb before anyone touched them. I refused to touch them. Be... Will you listen to me? Before anybody touched them, somebody sprayed those bones with a so-called preservative. And I mean so-called. Well, I don't know why you should. Oh, well, that's common practice these days, in case you don't know it, but I fail to see what... What was supposed to be a preservative was, in reality, a deadly poison. What? Oh, come on now, Walter. But you're wrong. You must be wrong. That's impossible. You know, you're very convincing, I must admit. Well, it's true. I applied that preservative, Mr. Dollar. Oh, you did? Yes. Aqueous solution, wasn't it? Of course. And I'll bet you washed your hands very carefully immediately afterward, didn't you? Yes, of course I did, because I was told to. By whom? By... Oh, no. No. Walter? What is it? Holy... Tell me, Walter. Walter! Yes? Do you know anything about a man who tried to intercept me on my way to Egypt? To make sure I didn't get there until the bones of the pharaoh were sent to Eric Turnbull and that Donald Cronin died? No. No, I don't, believe me. Then answer me this one. Did you make up the, we'll call it, preservative that you used over there? No. Then who did? And who told you to be sure to wash your hands immediately after using it? Well? Walter! Oh, no! I, I'm afraid so, Dorothy. Oh, no! Better tell me, Walter. I beg your pardon, Mr. Dollar, but Mr. Harkness Sr. is here, too. Mr. Dollar, I'm Adam Harkness, curator of archaeology at the museum. Well, well, Mr. Harkness, I'm really glad to see you. Dorothy, Walter, Mr. Dollar... I've come to pick up the bones from the grave of Kamashek that I understand Donald Cronin sent to his uncle instead of to me through some misunderstanding. Oh, yeah, sure. I had a notion you'd want to pick up those bones, Dr. Harkness. And I'll give them to you on one condition. Oh? What is that? That you take them out of the package in which they arrived here with your bare hands. That you carry them out of this house also in your bare hands. Well, that's a strange... Will you? Of course not. Why? Why, because such priceless relics are too fragile, too... Too full of a deadly poison that you had them sprayed with? Kuraba arsenium, I believe it's called. I don't know what you're... Walter, what have you been telling us? It's true, isn't it, Father? Well, Dr. Harkness... <laughs> I don't know how you found out, Della, but I'll tell you this... You won't ever live. Wait a minute, put that thing down. Father! Wait a minute! Daddy! Johnny? <sighs> you stopped him all right, Len. But I think he'll live. Good. I knew all the police work I've been doing would come in handy sometime. Thanks for barging in at the psychological moment. Oh, I was only coming in to confirm the results of my tests. But I guess Dr. Harkness had already done it. Yeah. So, I guess the museum will profit mightily from half the insurance and all of the estate of Donald Cronin. The museum, that is, without Dr. Adam Harkness. Expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford, $985. Remarks? Well, doesn't mean a thing, I know, but... Uh... I kind of wonder what I might have found if I'd been assigned to investigate the deaths of the people who excavated some of those other old Egyptian tombs. Tombs that had a curse on them. <laughs> Interesting thought, isn't it? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a search for $80,000 that was never there. And a body that was never there. Yet both of them had to be found. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in this week's cast were Paul Dubow, Alan Reed Sr., Dick Crenna, Virginia Gregg, Ben Wright, Forrest Lewis, Eric Snowden, Barney Phillips, James McCallion, and Les Tremaine. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mort Parkinson, Johnny, Eternity Mutual. Oh, how are you, Mort? I couldn't feel much worse. It's the olives that do it, not the martinis. I wish it were that simple. Can you come over to my office right away, Johnny? Well, I guess so, if... I uh... don't often pull that confidential business, but I really would hesitate to go into this one on the phone. Pretty rough, huh? I'm afraid you're going to find it even worse than that. It's, uh... It's about Ed Morgan, Johnny. Ed Morgan. I'm sorry. I know he was a good friend of yours. He was one of the best I ever had. Ed was a great guy. It's too bad he had to die that way. Johnny, it's too bad he didn't die a year sooner. What? You'd better come on over at the office. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Eternity Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the confidential matter. <laughs> Item one, $2.85. Taxi from my apartment to the Eternity Building in the seventh floor office of Mort Parkinson, vice president and general manager. It was a room I well remembered, with its blank walnut paneling and deep leather chairs. I'd worked on a lot of cases with Mort, and with the late Ed Morgan, too. And it sounded now as though Ed, my good friend from a long time back, was about to become a case himself. Come in, Johnny. Pull up a chair. Thanks, Mort. Well, that was quite a phone call. It's quite a situation. Yeah, I gathered that. No, I just can't talk sitting down. Old habit, I guess. Remember when we used to be over in the old Johnstone building before we built this new one? We had those old-fashioned stand-up desks... It was when old man Clement was still alive. And before I was. Hmm? Oh, yes. I guess I keep forgetting about you newcomers. Meaning everybody who's come into the game within the last 40 years. I suppose I am one of the original settlers. And set in my ways, too. Yeah, well, what about I you? I sure hated to see those desks go. You could stand in front of them, lean an elbow on them, make out a report or a speech. Mark, or do... you're trying too hard to avoid it. Avoid what? You didn't call me over here just to reminisce about the old days. In a way, maybe I did. You know, it's funny. I always thought you liked Ed Morgan. But I did. And why did you say it's too bad he didn't die a year sooner? Because I liked him. Except like is too weak a word, actually. I thought as much of Ed as I would have of my own son if I'd had one. Why, well, I'm the one who hired him in the first place. Remember, Johnny? Yeah, I remember. And I took a personal interest in his career. Watched him work his way up. Till finally he was appointed chief adjuster for the West Coast, head of our San Francisco claims office. That was darn good for a man as young as he was. And I was proud of him, Johnny. Yeah, I know. I know you were. He was a hard worker, honest, dependable. 
And he had a good, sound future ahead of him. And then, just like that. Accidents are usually just like that. A foggy night, sharp curve, and he drove his car off a cliff into the Pacific Ocean. And that was that. Tragedy. Feeney, the end. Only it apparently wasn't the end. Or you wouldn't have called me over here. No, it wasn't, Johnny. I wish it had been. Meaning? You'd better brace yourself. Within two weeks after Ed Morgan's death, we started getting complaints from some of our clients. Out what do you mean, complaints? Old oh, demands for adjustment on claims Ed had reported paid weeks before. Requests for past due settlements and so on. Mort, I don't get it. Neither did I. So I sent a company accountant out to San Francisco on the QT and put him to work on the claims files. And we found out, Johnny. You found out what? That Ed's accounts had been doctored for some time. What? Johnny, in the months before he was killed, he'd embezzled nearly $80,000. Ed Morgan? Ed Morgan. I don't believe it. He did it. You might as well accept the fact. Anybody else, yes, anybody else. But not Ed. For one thing, money didn't mean that much to him. I know. We were always joshing him about living like an old hermit instead of a young bachelor. Well, th then why would he do it, steal $80,000 after all these years of being honest? What would he want that would cost that much money? That's exactly what I wish you'd find out. Now, wait a second, Mort. Wait a second. This is one I don't want any part of. Neither do I. But I'm afraid I'm stuck with it. And you are too, in a way. Why? Because Ed was your friend. Here's a flight ticket and reservation to San Francisco. Plane leaves in two hours. No, no, no. I'd rather pass it, Mort. Well, so would I. But we can't. Neither of us. There are too many questions left. And they've got to be answered. Not by me. $80,000 of the company's money is missing. I can't just write it off and forget it. It has to be accounted for. There are other investigators, Mort. And another thing that's just as important, to me at least, is to find out why he did it. It's a failure in human dynamics. A man like Ed, a man everybody respected and trusted, and he goes wrong. Why? Get somebody else to find out. I'd be pretty grateful if you'd do it, Johnny. Mort, I just don't want any part of I it. I know how you feel. It's quite a shock to find out he was a crook. It's like somebody pulling the rug out from under you. So now you want to forget all about him. Leave him safely dead and buried. Dead, Mort, but not buried. If you remember, they recovered the car, but not his body. It's still somewhere beneath the Pacific. All right, then. Look at it from an efficiency standpoint, if nothing else. To any other investigator, Ed Morgan would be just a name. An unknown quantity. But you knew him. I thought I did. Regardless of what he did, Johnny, I just hate to think of a stranger pouring into his past. Maybe I still think back to the old times in the old country when the family buried their own dead. I know, I know. And sometimes, Johnny, a friend has to go all the way. Even when the other person is uh, uh, goofed. Isn't that what the younger generation calls it? I'm not the younger generation, Mort. Right now, I'm older than Confucius. I sure appreciate it, Johnny. And after all, somebody's got to do it. Yeah, somebody's got to do it. And like you said, Ed was my friend. All right, Mort, let's have the ticket. Item two, $14.35, tips, taxi, and incidentals in Hartford and same in San Francisco. Plain trip between points paid from expense account of company manager and not included herewith. I went straight from the airport to Ed's last address when he was still alive, an apartment house in the Knob Hill section called the Drakeley Arms. And there's where I got my first surprise. Ed had always been the two-room bachelor walk-up type. But the Drakeley Arms consisted of equal parts of glitter, glass, swank, and price, including a uniform doorman, a small private bar off the lobby, and an assistant manager with a gardenia on his lapel. Oh, he was a rare one, that manager. And it was a real gardenia. I am, of course, most desirous of assisting you in every way possible, Mr... Uh, uh, what did you say your name was? Dollar. D-O-L-L. -L. I can spell dollar. I'll bet you can. I beg your pardon. Oh, it's quite all right. I didn't mean... You didn't mean to be offensive, I understand. Now, about the former occupant of Suite 14... Mr. Dollar, I'm terribly afraid... Oh, please don't be. I mean, there is simply very little I can tell you about the late Mr. Morgan. A matter of discretion? Is that it? Discretion? A policy of the house... Something of that sort? Well, we do, of course, try to protect the privacy of our residents. I'm sure you understand. 
Even to the extent of turning down $20? Uh, well... A curse one, isn't it? Uh, under the circumstances... Nice likeness of Andrew Jackson, isn't it? Uh, thank you, sir. Gratuities of this nature are always so helpful in smoothing the rough pathway of human relations. Don't you think so, Mr. Dollar? Definitely. It's already helping you remember my name. Uh, well, money is a mental stimulant, isn't it? Don't call it money. Just think of it as item three. I beg your pardon. Item... Oh, that's quite all right. I meant... Yeah, I know. It's a kind of a habit I seem to be picking up. Now, has your memory been stimulated any in regard to Ed Morgan? Oh, yes, the late Mr. Morgan. <laughs> pardon me, Mr. Dollar. Yes. Oh, yes, Countess Margie. Yes, I'll be delighted to send the boy up for two quarts of suds. Suds? Uh, would a nice dry Bavarian ale be... Yes, Countess, just plain beer. Yes, Countess, right away. Uh, frightful old lady. He mixes it with creme de menthe, you know. <laughs> now, where were we, Mr. Dollar? We weren't, not yet. Oh, yes, the late Mr. Morgan. Well, he'd been our guest, you understand, for about six months at the time of his... Uh, Tragic accident. What was he paying for his suite of rooms? Oh, well, ordinarily, we don't release information of Forget that. Forget it. This is not ordinary. How much? Uh, Twelve hundred dollars a month. I see. Oh, he was a true gentleman, if I may say so. A bon vivant. And uh, on the crassly materialistic side, if you'll forgive me, sir, a very free spender. Sorry, twenty's the limit. Mr. Dollar, I was not trying to coerce your generosity by, uh, well... Putting on another bite? Precisely. All right. So Ed was bedded down in a mink line stall and was throwing money around like water. What else? Who came to see him? What sort of visitors did he have? Well, none at all that I can recall. None at all? He leased that overpriced cubicle and then just sat in it? Well... What about friends here in the building? Oh, well, most of our guests might be termed individually exclusive. <laughs> Even eccentric in some cases. Except, of course, Mrs. Barrett. Mrs. Barrett? Yes. One of the loveliest guests we've ever had the pleasure of... Excuse me, Mr. Dollar. Yes? Yes, Countess Margie, the boy is on his way. I know, but he has to go clear down to the corner. Yes. Yeah. Well, please tell little Pim Pam that I'm so sorry. A dog drinks that stuff, too. Now, where were we? About this Mrs. Barrett you mentioned. Oh, yes. Well, of course, she and Mr. Morgan were inseparable, you understand. They were together constantly. And Mr. Barrett? Oh, there wasn't any. Well, not recently, I mean. Uh, deceased. You know, dead? Yeah, when? Early this year, as I recall. I didn't know him, of course. Mrs. Barrett moved in here shortly after his death. Not until then. And Ed Morgan, when did he move in? About uh, six weeks later. Oh, he met her here then? Oh, no. No, they were already acquainted. <laughs> well acquainted. I see. In fact, I believe that Mr. Morgan and the young and very lovely widow met at the time of her husband's death. A matter of uh, settling the estate or something of that sort. It would figure all right. Uh, I but don't you remember said... exactly why I thought so, but I do recall having an impression at the time that he moved in here only because of her. And as I say, they were together constantly right from the first. That's all very interesting. I wonder if I could have a talk with this, Mrs. Barry. Mm, that would be utterly impossible, I'm afraid. Now, look, if you think you can I pry... simply mean she isn't here. Isn't here? She's been gone for ten days now. Where'd she go? I really haven't the slightest idea, Mr. Dollar. Well, if she moved out, she must have left a forwarding address of some kind. Oh, she didn't move out. She still has her apartment here. She'll be back eventually, I imagine. But at the moment, I she's... haven't heard a word from her since she left. Oh, poor dear. You know, one can understand why she'd want to get away for a while. Such a tragic coincidence, having two deaths of exactly the same... Oh, confound that woman. Wait a minute. What do you mean by tragic coincidence? Hmm? Oh... Well, as I understand it, Mrs. Barrett's husband also died in some sort of accident. Yes, Countess. Now, here is our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... The trail back into a man's past is a faint and twisting one. And at times it runs through quicksand. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. 
Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Hugh Brundage speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, Mac Woodson, Mr. Dollar. The girl from the claims office called and uh, gave me this number. Oh, yes, Mr. Woodson. It seems we're working on the same case for the same company. Well, I've been working on Mr. Ed Morgan's files and records here for the past week now. I've turned up some... How much is missing? Well, about $80,000 so far. All of it was taken during the four months immediately preceding his death. I'll, I'll say one thing. In 20 years as an accountant, I've never seen a looting more cleverly carried out. Oh, Ed was a very bright lad. A man who'd go far, they all said. Did uh, you know him, Mr. Dollar? I thought I did. He was one of my best friends. But it turns out I'm only beginning to know him. Could you meet me in his office around 10 o'clock, Mr. Woodson? Yes, yes, that's where I am now. I've been working on these books day and night. Better be careful. That's what got Ed into trouble. Uh, How's that? Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Eternity Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the confidential matter. Location, San Francisco. Expense account continued. Item four, one dollar, one martini. Item five, one dollar, one tip to the bartender who stirred the martini. All in the house that Jack built. I don't know who built it, actually, but it took Jack to live in it. Twelve hundred bucks a month, to be exact. That was the take-home bite for an apartment at the Drakeley Arms on Knob Hill. And, of course, that didn't include drinks in the intimate little private bar just off the lobby. And this is where Ed Morgan had lived during the last five months of his life, until he missed a curve one night and drove his car off a cliff into the Pacific. Ed Morgan, whose idea of a big night had always been his pipe, slippers, and a mystery novel. But things were different when I'd known him and been his friend... For one thing, he hadn't stolen $80,000. Or I don't think he had. Do you find the martini adequate to your expectations, sir? Oh, yeah. Yeah, indeed. It's a heck of a belt for a buck. Thank you, sir. Quite a nice little place you got here. Oh, I find it a most agreeable sanctuary from the stress and strife and the hurly-burly of the city. Been here long? I have tended by here in the Drakeley Arms Rendezvous for some two years now. Oh, well, then you may have known a friend of mine who had an apartment here uh, up until a month ago. A uh, Mr. Edward Morgan? Oh, yes. Mr. Morgan was a regular customer here. An eager supplicant for my humble and healing wares. A beer drinker, mostly, as I recall. Uh, the rendezvous does not serve beer, sir. Oh, forgive me. I didn't know. Quite all right, sir. Yes, I was here before Mr. Morgan moved in. and Here I am still, now that he is no longer with us. Such is the chance and mystery of life. One just never knows. Precisely. Oh, could I send you... Not yet, thanks. Get to know Ed pretty well, did you? Mm, The policy of the Drakeley Arms, sir, is to maintain a certain degree of formality in relations between guests and personnel. (laughs) Sort of like a zoo, you might say, with bars to separate the people from the animals. (laughs) The comparison is quite apt. 
Somehow, I can't see Ed Morgan sacking in in a marble squirrel cage like this, John. I confess, I, he hardly seemed the type to me, sir. He was much too unrestrained for the Drakeley. He came in here a lot, did he? Almost nightly. For a few minutes, at least, on his way to some gala night spot. Gala night spot, Ed Morgan? Oh, yes. In all the years I knew Ed, I was only able to drag him into a gala night spot once. He stayed 20 minutes, then left because his tie was choking. Are you quite certain that your friend was the same, Ed Morgan? I wish I weren't. Who were his friends? Did he always come in alone? Oh, no. No, never alone, sir. He and Nicky were inseparable. Nicky? Oh, I should say, of course, Mrs. Barrett. Oh, a young widow, as I remember. Lives here in the building. A lovely girl. Fascinating. And also unrestrained? Definitely. And Ed, then, was one of her friends. Oh, they were together every night, sir. An hour here in our little establishment, a few champagne cocktails, then out to dinner, dancing, the opera, ballet. Ed Morgan? Oh, quite. Life was just a mad whirl for those two. I gather your friend was something of a wealthy playboy. He was a claims adjuster for an insurance company. Hmm. Then uh, how could he possibly live in the fashion he did? If I told you, it'd flip. I beg your pardon? Tell me something. Was Ed in here on the night he was killed? Oh, yes, yes. He left here about uh, nine, as I recall. And a few hours later, he was dead. How did this Nikki take it? Pretty broken up, was she? Uh, she is a woman of very strong character. Huh. In other words, she didn't ban an eye. Uh, well, I Look, wouldn't... that night Ed was killed. Did he leave here alone? No, sir. He was alone when he went off the cliff. Not when he left here, though. Nikki was with him. Item six, two dollars and forty cents, taxi to the Telegraph Hill apartment of Lisa Duval. Lisa had been Ed Morgan's secretary for about four years. But it seemed Miss Mousy business at the office was Miss North Beach Bohemia at home. Italian slacks and halter, cushions on the floor, and naturally a view of the Bay Bridge from a corner window. We sat on the floor, naturally, and drank Chianti from a half-gallon jug while a record player moaned agonizedly under the gouging of its needle. Bartok, I gathered, was now last year's kick. This was progressive jazz. Maybe it seems a little affected to you, Mr. Dollar. The way I dress and live in private life, as you might say. Why so? Everybody's got a right to salt his own dish of porridge the way he likes it. Well, I've done this deliberately, I guess, as a sort of antidote for the insurance business. Oh, has it been that bad? Not bad. Boring. Oh, not your end of it, of course. Investigation work must be exciting. Yes, yeah, scream a minute, day and night. But just keeping records, filing papers week after week. I used to stare out of the office window at the ships in the harbor and think about stowing away on one. But, of course, I didn't have the nerve. Mm, too bad. The cruise would have been delirious. I thought of quitting several times. I guess I stayed because of Ed, Mr. Morgan. Oh? He was always so wonderful to work for, so lenient and understanding, up until the last few months, at least. What about those last few months, Lisa? What came over him? I don't know. He was different, that's all. As though he were tense and nervous, under pressure. Any idea where the pressures came from? He didn't confide in me, Mr. Dollar. What, uh, what were your personal relations between the two of you during the years you worked for him? What do you mean? Well, I mean, were you friendly, formal, strictly business? Friendly, I think, would cover it best. Did you see each other outside of office hours? Occasionally. I notice one of his pipes there in the bookcase. He... Come here sometimes in the evening, and we'd listen to music and talk. Up until the... Until the last few months? It wasn't that we stopped being friends, Mr. Dollar. He was... he was just different, that's all. Tense, under pressure. That's about the only way I can describe it. But you don't know why he was that way. Well, looking back, I suppose it was because of the money. If he really did take it. I just... I just can't believe it. Ed wasn't that kind of a man. He was gentle and honest, at least until... Until the last few months. Yes. Or were you going to say, until she came along? How did you... Lisa. Yes. 
How long have you been in love with Ed? Ever since I started to work for him. But he never knew it. He couldn't even see me. I'm sorry, Lisa. I'm sorry for you too, Mr. Dollar. I know how close you and Ed were. And I know how you must feel being called in and having... Forget it. It's a job, that's all. Sure, just a job. So is major surgery. This woman he was going around with, Nikki Barrett. Did you ever meet her? I met her. What did you think? What's the difference? I was prejudiced. I'll allow for that. In the old days, they used to believe in witches, vampires. Some of them were very beautiful, and they'd lure a man on and on, and then destroy him. And you think she did something like that to Ed? Oh, you weren't out this way during the time he knew her. You weren't around him to see how he changed. No, no. Oddly enough, the one time I was through here about three months ago, Ed was unexpectedly called away on business. He wasn't called away. He was avoiding you. He knew he was getting in too deep. How did he meet her? She came to the office with a life insurance claim. Fifty thousand dollars. Her husband had just died. I knew her type from the minute she walked in. The grieving widow, all in black, and looking like a powers model. And he just melted down and laid his head under her foot. That was the start of it. Well, why'd she come to him? Unless she had a disputed claim. It was a double indemnity clause. Her husband had been killed in an accident. Her husband, too, huh? What do you mean? Ed Morgan died in an accident. Remember? <laughs> Item seven, a dollar and fifteen cents taxi from Lisa's apartment to the Declan building on Montgomery Street. It was after ten and the financial district was nearly deserted. The canyons between the tall buildings were hollow and empty. A cold wind was blowing off the bay. Or maybe it was blowing out of the past. An old, old past, dead and far away. The pattern was beginning to look familiar. Too familiar. Lord, the woman gave me the forbidden apple to eat. Ed, too, it seemed. The same old wine, the same old dodge. And yet there was something not quite right about that pattern. The count runs into some funny ones, Mr. Dollar. This Morgan case here is one of them. How do you mean, Mr. Woodson? Well, the way he was going about it, for one thing. Running hog wild, as you might say. Of course, as I said on the phone, his general scheme was pretty clever. He certainly knew standard procedures. Well, he'd been with the company a long time. Well, now, these uh, payoff checks on claims, of course, they were sent out from Hartford in care of this office. So what Morgan did was open a disbursement account in the bank here, then sign and deposit the checks and draw out the money in cash chargeable to direct disbursement funds under his own name. Mr. Woodson... Now, of course, the canceled checks would return to Hartford, but... Since they were countersigned to disbursement, they wouldn't even be processed. Instead, they'd be returned to Morgan. So, you see, there'd be no evidence Look, in Hartford. Mr. To... Woodson, I'll accept the fact that Ed was clever. But what did you mean there was something funny in the way he was going about it? Well, he must have known it couldn't last. It was a good scheme for a short time, but it carried the seeds of its own destruction. In what way? Complaints. Some of these claims are four months old and legitimate claims. Morgan couldn't stall these people off forever. Oh, I see. Only other embezzlement case I've worked on that was similar was a man who worked a quick swindle for a blackmail payoff. He knew he'd probably get caught, but he just had to take the chance. Yeah, you may have stumbled onto something, Mr. Woodson. Oh, is that so? Uh, you mean it ties in with that file folder you've been studying there? Oh, I don't know. It's an investigation report on an accidental death. Happened about a year ago. Ed Morgan handled the insurance claim and got to know the widow. He'd been running around with her for several months just before his death. I don't quite see the... Con oh, oh, of course. Mr. Morgan also died in an accident. Unless he was murdered. Now, here is our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, $80,000 and a beautiful girl, both missing. Then one of the two is found and a bombshell explodes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. 
Hugh Brandeis speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Hector, Mr. Dollar. Hector? Hector Nerkley, at the Drakeley Arms Apartments. You were here night before last, inquiring about the late Mr. Morgan. Oh, yes, I remember. What can I do for you, Mr. Nerkley? Oh, it's really quite the other way around. All right, what can you do for me? Well, I can give you some very interesting information, if you care to come over here. Why can't you give it to me on the phone? I'll tell you exactly why, Mr. Dollar. When you come over. Oh, for the love of Pete. Temper, temper. And why not? A month ago, the best friend I had in the world drove his car off a cliff into the Pacific. And his body's still out there in the ocean somewhere. It's never been recovered. Mr. Dollar. Then it turns out he was $80,000 short in his accounts. I can't find the money, you know, the woman he was running around with before his death. I can't find out anything. And now if I want some... All right, I'll be there in 30 minutes. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location San Francisco. To the home office, Eternity Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the confidential matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item nine, a dollar and seventy cents taxi from my hotel to the Drakeley Arms Apartments. A snooty high-priced joint where Ed Morgan had lived during the last four months of his life. Ed Morgan, a pipe and slippers bachelor who'd suddenly and strangely turned to champagne cocktails and high living who, as head of an insurance claims office, had found a way of swindling his employer out of $80,000 in four months, and who died a month ago as mysteriously as he'd lived. This was the man who at the moment was my assignment, whose past I was supposed to uncover. And he was also the man who'd been my lifelong friend. Good evening, Mr. Dollar. My, you did make excellent time. Now, look, if this turns out to be a runaround, so help me out. Temper? All right. All right, you said you had some very important information that couldn't be discussed over the phone. Well, it could have been discussed, of course. But, well, this information has to do with one of our guests, Mr. Dollar. A certain lovely young widow whom you seemed most concerned about the last time. Nikki Barrett. Quite. Has she come back? Is she here? I'm afraid not. Then what is it? First, I must ask you what your intentions are toward Mrs. Barrett. Well, I'm not going to marry her. Please. I hardly thought you were. All right, then what's the point? Simply this. I happen to be in a position to put you in touch with Mrs. Barrett. You know where she's hiding out? Hiding out? All right, I'll drop the implication. You know where she is. I do. Well, then let's have it. Why do you wish to find her? Because she's the only lead I've got on the Morgan case. She and Ed were thicker than thieves during the four months before his death. And she was with him the night he was killed. Earlier in the evening, at least. Are you going to have her arrested? No, no. I just want to ask her some questions. I've got no case against her. Not yet, at least. Mr. Dollar... Can I depend upon you in one very important respect? What's that? Under no circumstances must you let Mrs. Barrett know that I told you where she is. What's the matter? Afraid the board of directors would bust you to bellhop and strip off your gardenia? That is not amusing. Nor too improbable, as a matter of fact. After all, the watchword of the Drakely Arms is discretion. Yeah, well, all right. It's a deal. I won't tell her. Of course, there is one more little detail. Oh, now what? Well, the last time you requested information from me, Mr. Dollar, you were kind enough and uh, generous enough. Uh, Well, really, this is a bit awkward. What is it, Hector? 
Is the gardenia fund getting low? Well, you did say, as I recall, that it was merely an item in an expense account. All right. Here's another 20 bucks. Oh, thank you, sir. Now, what about Nikki Barrett? Well, we just received a letter from Mrs. Barrett. She asks that her mail be forwarded to her in care of American Express. Panama City, Panama. Item 10, $20, gratuity. Item 11, $388.45, hotels, some telegrams, incidentals in San Francisco, and plane fare to Panama. I'd sent wires ahead before I left the States. It wasn't until after I'd cleared customs and was heading for the American Express office that I was certain the messages had produced any results. Uh, Dispense me, por favor. Yeah? You are uh, Senor Johnny Dollar from the Estados, no? That's right. Capitan Garcia Ramulio of the Panama Federal Police. As you saw me, senor. Oh, glad to know you, Captain. I am honored, senor. We have received your telegram, and I have been instructed to cooperate with you very intensive. Well, it may take just that. Now, about the woman I described in the telegram. The Senora Barrett. Oh, Santa Madre, what a beautiful woman. So I've heard. You have not uh, had the pleasure of acquainting her? Not yet. The best of your life is before you in that case. Then I'll speed up and get to it. So you've already located her, huh? Oh, but of course, Senor. She has not um, changed her name, as you think, perhaps. So it was most simple. Good. Glad I didn't cause you too much trouble. Trouble? Senor, merely to gaze upon such a one is worth a lifetime of trouble. Which is exactly what it cost a couple of guys, I know. Uh, such eyes, such hair, such lips, yeah. such... Yeah, uh, well, uh, what do you say uh, we... Forgive uh, me, senor. I am carried away with it. Well, where is this living little doll staked out at the moment? She is registered at the Hotel Primeso, uh, room 17. Uh, Hotel Primeso? This is not the most unusual, I'm thinking. What do you mean? The Primeso is one hotel very small, which is uh, located on the waterfront. It's most for sailors, fishermen. I see. The beautiful tourista one would think to find in a hotel of well, more elegance. She may be deliberately staying away from the tourist belt. Yes, sabe, senor. Who can tell the reasons of a woman? Yeah. Is she living there alone? So I have been informed. You expect someone with her? I don't know what to expect. I don't even know why she came here. I'm moving in blind. Uh, see, life is most difficult at times. Uh. You didn't talk to her, did you? Let her know you were checking on her? Please, senor. Oh, I'm sorry, Captain. I had to be sure. She is most entirely without suspicion. Good, good. Well, I suppose I'd better check into a hotel first. Uh, then what are your plans, senor? I don't know exactly. I'll talk to her, try to get some answers. And from there on, I'll just have to call it as I go. I hope uh, this lovely lady has not involved in some uh, serious crime. I hope not, too. But I wouldn't bet much on it. Item 12, $8, taxi, flat rate for the rest of the day. And by the time I checked into a hotel and showered and changed, the rest of the day didn't have long to go. The hotel Promesa was on the waterfront, as Captain Garcia had said, and some distance from town. But although it wasn't a tourist trap, neither was it quite the sailor's flop house I'd been led to expect. It was built native style with bamboo shutters and wide verandas, half buried in a thicket of mango and banana. Five bucks bought me the desk clerk's undying affection, and two minutes later I stood unannounced at the door of room 17. Just a minute. It's about time. I ordered that ice at least a... Uh, I thought you were the bellboy. No. The name is Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Mind if I come in, Mrs. Barrett? What for? Well, it would be more comfortable than trying to talk out here in the veranda. What is it you want to talk about? A friend of mine. Name of Ed Morgan. All right. Come on in. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. I'd offer you a drink, but there's no ice. And it isn't this kind of heat. I don't care for a drink, thanks. You'd think it would cool off after the sun goes down, but it doesn't. At least not very much. Sometimes a breeze comes up from the... From... What are you staring at, Mr. Dollar? You? Why? I'd had such glowing reports about you that I was sure they were exaggerated. They weren't. Thanks. 
And did you come all the way down here just to check those glowing reports? How do you know I came all the way down here? What do you mean? Maybe I live here. No. I've heard of you before. Ed, Mr. Morgan used to talk about you. Was it Ed or Mr. Morgan? You don't miss much, do you? I try not to. It was Ed, as you undoubtedly knew. Yes, I knew. But I wasn't sure why. Why? Why he lost his head. Now that I've seen you, I can understand. Who wouldn't? Oh, please. I'd rather not talk about it, Mr. Dollar. Ever since that terrible accident, there's been only one thing I've wanted. To forget. Well, I'm sorry to have to bring up unpleasant memories, Mrs. Barrett, but I've got to ask you some questions. There's nothing... The night of his death, what time did he leave you? What do you mean? You were together earlier in the evening. You left the bar at the Drigley Arms together at 9 o'clock, but shortly after midnight, when Ed ran his car off a cliff into the Pacific, he was apparently alone. We went to dinner, then he brought me back to the apartment house. He was going to Half Moon Bay to see a client. That's why he happened to be on that road. I don't want to talk about it, Mr. Dollar. It's horrible to think of him dying that way. His body's still out there in the ocean somewhere. That's why I came down here. To get away and try to forget. Then you thought quite a lot of him, huh? We were going to be married. I see. Well, it's uh, it's too bad it didn't work out with all the wealth Ed had and the beauty you wealth. have. Why, well, I... I had the idea that he just worked for an insurance company. And lived the way he did? Oh, come now, Mrs. Barrett. Well, actually, I didn't really consider it. My husband had left me quite well off. How long were you married before he died? Only ten months. Oh, you do have bad luck, don't you? I don't think this attitude of yours... Relax. Here, have a cigarette. I don't smoke. Oh. Do you mind if I do? No, of course not. Thanks. Do you have a suite here, Mrs. Barrett, or just this one room? Just this room. Why? Oh, and then this door must lead to the bath. What do you think you're doing? Empty, huh? Of course it's empty. Uh-huh. Then the other possibility is that closet. Stay away from there. When I came in, there was cigarette smoke in the air, stubs in the ashtray. There's no one here. Stay away from there. Oh, look, Mrs. Barrett, turning out the lights may be romantic, but it's not the idea of... What? You... I was still conscious but groggy, and I couldn't seem to get off the floor. I heard someone moving, heard the door to the veranda open and close. I shook my head and tried to clear it. I finally staggered to my feet and found the light switch. Nicky Barrett was cowering back against the wall, staring at me, scared, but not saying anything. I stumbled toward the door. The veranda was empty. There was no sign of movement in the shadows. So there was somebody hiding in that closet. No. There wasn't anybody here. I'm the one who hit you. You'd have to have a fist three times your size. It's true. Forget it. I know the game now. I should have known it a lot sooner. You're wrong. There's only one person in this world who tears cigarettes apart and shreds the paper that way. No! The two of you, in on it together. They didn't find his body because there wasn't anybody to find. He's still alive. He was right here in this room. That was Ed Morgan. Now, here is our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a search for a dead man who intends to stay dead and who's willing to kill to do it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Hugh Brundage speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Capitan Garcia Ramulio of the Panama Federal Police. Good. Your sergeant said he could locate you in a matter of minutes. I am never lost from contact, senor. You have uh, talked with the beautiful tourista, no? I have talked with her, yes, and I ended up getting socked in the jaw. These Americano women are so very much athletics. No, she didn't hit me. It was a guy who was hiding out in a closet. Ah, see, si, I understand, senor. Somehow I doubt it. Look, Garcia, it was the man I came down here to question her about. I'm sure of it. But, senor, you have to tell me... Yeah, I know. Apparently his death was faked. I think he's here, hiding out somewhere in Panama City. Do you think you can find him? When my men make the search, senor, even a little dog could not escape. Then go to it. His name is Ed Morgan, but he may be using another one. The charge is embezzlement. You know his description, senor? I ought to. He's been one of my best friends for years. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Panama, to the Home Office, Eternity Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the confidential matter. Expense account continued. Item 14, $12.85, telegram to Hartford, advising them that the case had turned in a completely new direction. I'd taken the case with the idea of digging up a man's past, a man who had been one of my best friends. Of finding out why, after a life of complete honesty and loyalty to his company, he had suddenly gone wrong and embezzled $80,000. I'd found out that part of the why was probably a lovely young widow named Nikki Barrett. But I'd found out more. The man we thought dead, who'd supposedly drowned when his car went off a cliff into the Pacific Ocean, was still alive. So now it was a matter of filing charges, requesting extradition from Panama, and of course capturing the fugitive. That I left to Captain Garcia for the moment and went to bed. I came down to breakfast the next morning, I still hadn't heard back from Garcia. But I did get a return engagement from my little playmate of the night before. Good morning, Johnny. Hmm? Oh, well. Good morning, Mrs. Barrett. I came into town early especially to see you. Why? A deep concern as to whether I survived that sock in the jaw? No. No concern, really. I imagine you have a pretty tough jaw. Do you mind if I sit down? If you promise not to double up your fist. I can explain that, Johnny. With all night to think about it? Yeah, I bet you can. How about some breakfast? I don't really... They got a special this morning. Fried fish and papaya. Oof. Tastes even worse than it sounds. No, I'll just have some coffee. That we already have. Sugar, cream? Just black. Thank you. All right, you're on. Spin it out. Well... I'll admit it was silly to claim I was the one who hit you last night. Of course it was silly. I know who hit me. You don't. It was Ed Morgan. He was hiding in the closet in your hotel room. You're wrong, Johnny. It, you don't mind if I call you Johnny, do you? I mean, you and Ed were such close friends. I feel I almost know you. You could be wrong, Mrs. Barrett. I used to think I knew Ed until he met you and decided to tap the till for 80 grand. All right, call me, Johnny, if it gives you more confidence in your act. It's not an act. Okay, if you didn't hit me and Ed didn't, then who was it? Let's just say it was a friend. (laughs) He wasn't very friendly to me. He misunderstood you coming there. He shouldn't have been there himself. He's, well, he's married and not that I knew it, though, until last night. (laughs) That's not a bad attempt, Mrs. Barrett, at a snow job, but I still don't buy it. Better drink your coffee. Johnny... Ed was drowned in San Francisco when his car ran off into the ocean. He's dead. How can he be dead in San Francisco and still be tearing up cigarettes in Panama? I did that. You don't even smoke. But the man who was there last night does. And I tore the cigarettes in that peculiar way. I picked up the habit from Ed. I just did it absentmindedly, I guess. Now, this gets better as it goes along. I'm not lying. It's true. No, I mean this fish and papaya. I guess you just have to get used to the mixture. Please, Johnny. You're not even touching your coffee. If I drink it, will you please listen to me? I am listening to you. I just don't believe you. 
Look, we all make mistakes. Last night, you made a guess. You thought that was Ed, but you were wrong. So why be stubborn about it and cause a lot of unnecessary trouble? Let's forget it and be friends. Can't afford it, sweetie. I haven't got that kind of money. Do you think I sell my friendship? It cost Ed $80,000 of the company's money. No. How much of that did you get? Half of it? No. More than half of it? No, I don't know what you're talking about. How much does he have left Stop now? Stop it! Stop saying such things. All right. Can't you understand? Once and for all, Ed isn't here. Nor anywhere else. He's dead. No, he isn't. But I wish to have any were. What do you mean? Just that. But he was your friend. That's right. He was my friend. When I heard about his accident, heard he'd been killed, it hit hard. It hurt plenty. And I guess it hurt even more when I learned he'd been stealing from the company. Johnny. So I took the job of digging into the mess and trying to find some answers. I didn't want the job, didn't want any part of it, but I took it anyway. Somebody had to do it. And he had been my friend once. And then I find out he's still alive. No, so you Johnny. So it means now I've got to catch him and take him back to stand trial. And that's going to be even tougher than facing his death and the fact he was a crook. If Ed were alive, you'd take him back? Help send him to prison like any other common criminal? That's what he is, isn't he? But he was your friend. Oh, skip it. You wouldn't understand. I might, if you'd let me try. The only thing you're trying to do, Mrs. Barrett, is to con me into thinking I might possibly be wrong. Thinking maybe it was somebody else in your room last night. I told you. The idea is to throw me off balance just long enough so the two of you can make a run for it. Nice try, only it won't work, so knock it off. Ed and I were going to be married, Johnny. And the shock of his death... I said skip it. Ed used to talk about you. He told me you were this way. Hard and cold and ruthless. Then he has no excuse. He knew what to expect. But I didn't believe it. I didn't think anyone could be a... senor. Oh, good morning. I don't believe you've met my companion. I have not been so fortunate, senor. This is Captain Garcia of the Panama Police, Mrs. Barrett. Hello. Greatly honored, senora. Might be a good idea to take a careful look at her, Garcia. You will probably be arresting her in the next day or so as an accomplice to fraud. Let us hope such regrettable necessity is not happening. Thank you, Captain. I'm sure it won't. Mr. Dollar has a rather boorish sense of humor. I comprehend, senora. Uh, Mr. Dollar, it is possible, perhaps, that uh, I speak a little with you? Yeah, sure. I imagine Mrs. Barrett will be happy to excuse me at this point. Hasta la vista, senora. Remember, Johnny. He was your friend. I did not wish to mention this matter before the senora. Oh? I think it's better she's not here. Here what? Have you turned up something? Yes, si, senora. I have to tell you, not even the little dog can hide from Garcia. So? We have located this man, Ed Morgan. I got into the police car with Captain Garcia, and we drove out of town and followed the shoreline for about six miles. Then we pulled up near a cluster of rickety wharves built around the edge of a tiny inlet. There were numerous native fishing boats tied against the pilings, but no village, no shacks, nor any other sign of a habitation. Garcia cut the mortar and lit a cigarette. Pues aquí estamos. Here we are, senor. Here? He's hiding out here? Si, senor. He live on one of the little fishing boats which are tied to the wharf. The number three one there, which is blue painted, you see? Yeah, I see it. Well, a place like this would be safer than a hotel. You're pretty sure it's him. Pues, Miguel Ronesto, who is on the boat, said this man come out here one month ago. He paid Miguel much money just to live on the boat, tie up at shore. And he is like you described, senor. I think so is him. All right. I'll go on board and talk to him. And uh, I think I'd better go along, Garcia. Whatever you wish, senor, I wait for you here. Okay. Ed? Ed Morgan! Ed? I know you're here, so you might as well answer. The cabin's unlocked. Come on down. Been a long time, Ed. Yeah, it has. Sorry the place is so littered up. Temporary quarters, you understand. Sit down. Thanks. Johnny, why did it have to be you? 
It had to be somebody, Ed, sooner or later. You should have known that. But not you. How'd you get onto me? I traced Mrs. Barrett down here. I thought you were dead until last night. She wasn't supposed to show here for six months. Last week, here she was. Couldn't wait. Why did you do it, Ed? You wouldn't understand. You've always had dames crazy about you without lifting a hand. But not me. This face always stopped him. Sure, I used to laugh about it, but... Well, you just wouldn't understand. And this woman was different, is that it? Nikki fell as hard as I did. I didn't know women like her even existed. She's for me all the way. Is she worth the price tag? $80,000? Cut it, Johnny. It's not that way. It's just that Nikki had always lived well, and I had to live that way, too, in order to be around her. I got in further and further, and finally I was in too deep to pull out. Did she know you were stealing from the company? Not at first. The blame's all mine, Johnny, not hers. You picked your own apples, that it? Call it that. And I didn't spend all that money. We decided to get out of the country, start a new life together. I figured I'd need that much. And Nikki agreed to that plan? Sure. That's why she's here. She sold out and came on down. Only she didn't, Ed. She still has her apartment in San Francisco. You're wrong, Johnny. She sold her furniture, her clothes, everything. The stuff is all there, Ed. I saw it. You're lying, Johnny. She pulled stakes. She told me. Okay, she told you. I guess you know why I'm here. I know why you think you're here. Hold it, Johnny. Don't move. I've had this gun on you since you came on board. I know you have. But I wonder if you'd really use it. Don't try to find out. And don't tell me I'm in a spot. I know that. But I'm going on as far as I can. And if I have to kill to do it, then I'll kill. Maybe I could have stopped him. Maybe he wouldn't have fired. I don't know. And for one reason or another, I didn't feel much like finding out. I let him go. He backed out of the cabin hatch and bolted it on the outside. I heard him cross the deck and run along the wharf. And I waited for Garcia to call out to challenge him. The only sound was the car motor starting up and speeding away. Then I heard somebody come running down the wharf. Senor Dollar! Get the door open, Garcia. Where is he? What happened? He take the car, senor. He's me to blame. I, I am not alert. Before I know it, Never he's... mind. Where's the nearest telephone? Two miles, senor. Two miles? How do we get there? But how else, senor? We walk? Now, here is our star to tell you about tomorrow's final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, fate plays a devil's tune, collects a payment long overdue, and the music ends on a scream. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Hugh Brundig speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Capitan Garcia Ramulio, senor. Oh, Garcia. Of the Panama Federal Police. Tell me, have senor, you... Senor, the most intensive troubles are being extended in this matter. 
Which means you haven't found him yet. Every man of the police is active alert. I'm happy to hear it. You may rest assured, senor, that the capture of this dangerous Americano gangster is occur at any moment. Have you found any trace of him? Senor, I wish to advise you that the entire resource of my policia is at the reposal of our good neighbor of the north. Thank you very much. Do you know where he's headed? It is only by cooperation that our two great... Garcia. See, senor. Do you have any idea at all what's happened to Ed Morgan? No, senor. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Panama... To the home office, Eternity Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the confidential matter. Expense account, final page. <laughs> Item 15, a dollar and ten cents. Taxi from my hotel to Plaza Bolivar in the office of Captain Garcia, Commandante of Police. It had been over an hour and a half since I'd let Ed Morgan point a gun at me and escape from the tiny fishing boat where he'd been hiding out for the past month. I'd expected the police to capture him within 30 minutes. There were only two highways out, and they'd both been blockaded immediately. But somehow, Ed, driving a stolen police car, had escaped the net. In fact, he'd done more than merely escape, as I discovered when I walked into the massive stone police headquarters. Ah, Senor Dollar, pleased to sit you down. Thanks. The most surprised thing is, of course, Senor. What do you mean? You will remember you say it's a fine idea to keep watch at the hotel of the Senora Barrett. Yeah, I thought Ed might try to get in touch with her. Bueno, see. Si. So I do this thing. I send two men, and they watch for one hour. Que bobos, they are fools. Why so? They do not see the Senor Morgan. They do not see the Senor Barrett. But only after one hour do they think to talk with the manager. You know what he say? What? Senor Morgan come five minutes before they do, and he take the Senor away in the car. What the devil for? Can sabe, Senor. Driving a stolen car and just one job ahead of the police, and he risks his neck to go after her? Why? Pues a veces el amor le vuelve loco, un hombre. Meaning... This love is sometimes make a man crazy in the head. I'll buy that one. It's something I am not understand so good, senor. What's that? How is it you all know all about this criminal? He wasn't always a criminal, Garcia. He was one of my best friends for 12 years. Uh, then I am much sympathy with you, senor. It's too unfortunate that you are have the job for arresting. Well, I didn't know he was alive when I took the job. Get this. The company ran an audit on his books and found an 80 grand shortage. I went to San Francisco to find out what happened to the money. Ed was supposedly dead at the time. We all thought so. Then I do not understand why you have come here to Panama. I came to talk to this Nicky Barrett, the woman he'd been running around with. I stumbled onto him by luck or accident or whatever you want to call it. Que curioso es la vida. To live is like to fish, senor. One is never certain what he may pull up on the hook. Well, I've pulled up one here and I'd like to throw it back. But I guess you don't have much choice when you're... Dispense me, por favor. Bueno. Eh? ¿Qué dice? Sí, sí, yo sé. Cerca del mar. Santa madre, qué tan lejos. What is it, Garcia? Ay, que lástima. Sí, cuídelo bien. Venemos ahorita. Sí, adiós. What's wrong? What's happened? Señor Morgan and the señora, they have been found. Where? They have tried to escape by the old road on the cliff. It's abandoned, very dangerous. They are miss one bad curve and go into the ocean. Into the ocean? See, si, senor, the car is under ten meters of water. There is no sign of life. Expense account item 16, $75, charter fee and one power launch. This included the services of a diver and line tender. We were just plain lucky on this one. A salvage company happened to be working in the port and had a man and equipment free at the moment. We took off along the coastline and in less than an hour we dropped anchor over the wreck. The diver had been lowered beneath the surface. The sea was calm against the rocks, but the water wasn't clear enough to see more than just the outline of the car lying over 30 feet down on the bottom. While we waited for the diver to come back up, I glanced toward the high cliff towering above us. A month ago, there'd been another cliff like that in San Francisco. Like I say, senor, life is too strange sometimes. So is death. This man, this woman, they meet, they look one at each other, and what are they think? A lot of things, maybe... But not that they'd end up here, like this. How true it is, senor. 
Who can ever know if one day he will come Wait a to second. Certain... The diver's coming up. Let me see. It's too bad he doesn't have the system of telephone. In this case, we can talk on the water. He didn't have time to rig it up. Well, we'll soon know, I guess. I am most sorry for you, Senor Dollar, that your friend has to die like this. I faced the idea of his death a month ago and accepted it. Then I had to face some other things about him. Another shark now doesn't seem to have much meaning. It's just a matter of... Hey, there's the diver. He's up at the rail. Hey, let me give you a hand with that faceplate. I'll work on this side. It's very complicated, this diving business. Yeah. Well, this is kind of an old-fashioned rig. They got suits now with self-contained oxygen, independent control. Stuff the frogmen developed during and after the war. Fantastico. Yeah, it is. All right. There we go. All right, now, what'd you find? Oh, let me get a breath of raw air first. Oh, gotta get that compressor motor fixed. Throws down more CO than oxygen. Come on, come on, how to look. A dollar's a mess. That car must have rolled over a dozen times coming down that cliff. All cracked up. Yeah, but what about... One door's half off and flattened back. On the glass is slivered. Looks like it had been bombed instead of just wrecked. Senor, is the... Yeah, the body of the woman is inside, but... There's no chance of getting it out without dropping a grappler and seeing if we can roll the car over. And the man? Is he... Nope. Just the woman. That's the only one down there. Again, the same pattern. A car plunging off a cliff into the ocean and a body missing from it. But this time I was sure it wasn't faked. Ed wouldn't have done a thing like that to Nicky. Not to Nicky. And yet his body was not in the wreck. I looked again at the high wall of the cliff, steep but not vertical. A car would have rolled and bounced coming down, as the diver had said. And one door was torn half off. The glass was smashed out. It was a possibility, as far as I could see, the only possibility. I had the captain run the launch in close. Then I jumped onto the rocks and started to climb. The slope was gentler than it had looked from the water, and the surface was broken by ravines. Clumps and thickets of tropical plants clung to the shelves, and the going was rough. A long ways from impossible. I had made it halfway to the top when I found him, jammed in the trough of a gully. Broken, badly hurt, but still alive. Barely alive. That you, Johnny? Yeah. Easy now, Ed. Let me get a foothold here. We didn't make it, Johnny. You didn't have a chance, Ed. You should have realized. I know. Maybe I knew all along. Better not try to talk. It's kind of funny when you think about it. I mean, what happened here? Just like we did it in San Francisco. Only this time it's real. Lost control. Yeah, this time it's real. Now, you lie still there. There are police on the road up above. We'll get some ropes down have you out of here before you know it. Forget it, Johnny. It's no use. The mall smashed inside. I can't even move. All right. Maybe you got a broken bone or two, but that's no reason to... T- Don't lie to me, Johnny. I'm dying. We both know it. Am I right or not? Yeah, I'm, f- I'm afraid you're right. Doesn't matter anymore. Oh, Ed. Tell me, is is Nikki? She's dead. No. You're right about her, Johnny. Forget it. Will you forget it? I made her come with me in the car. Held a gun on her. She got mad, scared. She spilled the whole story. Yeah, that doesn't make any difference it's now. Funny. I thought she came down here before she was supposed to because she just couldn't wait to join me. But she only came to get the rest of the money. She wasn't planning to stay. Listen to me, Ed. This kind of talk... She didn't love me. Never did. She admitted it right before we went off the cliff. But I thought she did, Johnny, for a while. And nobody else ever let me even think it. Please, Ed, why don't you try to forget about it? You know something, Johnny? What? If I was to go back, I think I'd do the same thing again. Nikki, the way she could be when she wanted to, it gets you. 
got me anyway. It's crazy. Maybe there's just no answer for a guy like me. Except this. I don't know, Ed. I'm not a judge. Kind of figures, you know. Nikki dying, too. I bought her and paid for her. I at least ought to be able to take her with me. After all, I... Easy now. The money. What's left of it? It's inside my coat. Give it to Moore. Tell him I'm sorry. Make him understand. He will, Ed. You too, Johnny. I'm... I'm sorry. I guess I don't know what else to say. Forget it. But I still think I'd do it all over again. (laughs) Crazy, eh? There are times we all go a little crazy. I got no right to ask, but if you would, I'd sure appreciate it. I mean, if you just shake hands with me. Oh, sure, Ed. Here you go. Funny, I... I can't, can't find your hand. It, it's dark. I, I can't see where... Right here, Red. Right here. Oh. I shake you ugly old son of a gun. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks for not... For not... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So long, Ed. Item 17, $487.25, hotel and incidentals in Panama and transportation back to the States. Expense account total, $912.61. Am forwarding under separate cover by American Express, insured $62,112.30. End of account, end of report. Remarks? No, Mort, not on this one. Ed Morgan was my friend. The report stands. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the imperfect alibi matter. A real weirdie, where a big lie turns out to be the one real truth in the case. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jack Edwards, Russell Thorson, Furley Mitchell, Stacey Harris, Bob Miller, Harry Bartell, Victor Perrin, and Frank Gerstle. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Hugh Brundage speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Joe McNabb, Northeast Indemnity. Hi, Joe. Good to hear your voice. It's not mutual, Johnny. And I always thought you cared. Whenever I hear your voice, it's because I'm in trouble. Oh, what is it this time? Ever hear of Harvey Stone? Sure, the Stone Corporation. And Stone Enterprises and the Stone Foundation. Sounds like he's a foundation himself. Practically. Late 30s, bachelor over the management from his father, E.J., when the old boy got crippled up with arthritis last year. So? So the total amount of insurance we're carrying on him is over 100000 So? 
He lives in New York, Westchester County. Last night he was driving along a road in the country. A small object hit his windshield. Oh, look, Joe, don't tell me you want me to investigate a claim for a broken windshield. I sure do, Johnny. That small object was a bullet. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Northeast Indemnity Associates, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the imperfect alibi matter. Expense account item one, one dollar even, taxi to the office of Northeast Indemnity where Joe McNabb was waiting for me. It's kind of a complicated situation, Johnny. Yeah, well, it usually is when people get shot at, Joe. Now, mind, we're not sure the bullet was meant for Harvey Stone. He's inclined to brush the whole thing off, think somebody might have been doing a little target practice in the woods. Stray shot, huh? Well, could be. Yes, yes, but with the kind of insurance we're carrying on... Yeah, him, better give me a rundown on him. Harvey's father, E.J., built up the business, a widower. Two years ago, he remarried. Last year, he had to retire. He's in a wheelchair now. I see. Well, now Harvey is running things. Lives with his father and stepmother in a big place in Westchester County, but he also keeps a small apartment on East 57th in Manhattan. Uh-huh. Any trouble in the family? Anything like that? Harvey's been running around lately with a supper club singer named Helen Barrett. I gather he's thinking of marrying her. I also gather his family is bitterly opposed to the idea. How about Harvey's business affairs? Could he have made any enemies there? One, at least. Who? Oh. Dutch Krieger. Know him? Yeah, I sure do. A gambler with a lot of dough behind him and a couple of gunsels in front. That's the one. Now, how come he get mixed up with a character like Krieger? He didn't. He refused to. Come again. Krieger's put on a big act about going legitimate. Young Stone was negotiating a sizable real estate transaction recently. Found out that Krieger was one of the associates in the deal. He threatened to call it all off. Made the other associates kick Krieger out. Oh, uh-uh, Dutch wouldn't forget a thing like that. No, he wouldn't. Now, who's the beneficiary on Stone's insurance policies? Father and stepmother, jointly. Johnny, I smell trouble. I want you to go down there and nose around, see what you can turn up, and do me a slight favor. Sure. What is it? Keep Harvey Stone alive, will you? Expense account item two, $12.50, transportation and incidentals to the Stone Estate in Westchester County. It was one of those massive, dignified-looking places, nestling comfortably in about ten acres of grounds. The butler showed me into a room only about half as big as Grand Central Station, so I wandered around inspecting the paneling and the Italian works of art. Then I zeroed in on one of the paintings. It involved a luscious lady, a bunch of grapes, and a pool of water. Nice, isn't it? Hmm? Yeah. The painting, I mean. Quite nice, isn't it? Oh, yeah, if you like grapes. You must be... I'm uh... Mrs. Stone, Mr. Dollar. Daphne Stone. Mrs.? I didn't know the wedding had taken place. My, you are behind the times. It took place two years ago. Two... Well, I, uh... I'm Mrs. E.J. Stone. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, is your, uh, stepson here? Harvey, he should be back any minute. He had to run into the city. But let me give you a tip, Mr. Dollar. Don't call Harvey my stepson in front of him. Oh. You see, he and I are just about the same age, and he's... Yeah, oh, okay, I'll remember. Uh, how about Harvey's father? Is he here? Yes. My husband will be along in just a moment. He has to get around in a wheelchair now, but he's very stubborn. Won't let anyone push him. Well, uh, Mrs. Stone, I think you know why I'm here. Yes, of course. About that absurd thing that happened to Harvey last night. Absurd? Well, isn't it ridiculous to think that it was an attempt on his life? After all, he will go tearing around these roads at night in his sports car. Probably someone out hunting. Is that what you think, Mrs. Stone? What else could it be? Nobody has any reason to kill Harvey. Everything harmonious here at home, I suppose. Of course. How about Harvey's plans to marry Helen Barrett? Oh, yes, that. 
That. Mr. Dollar. Say, I'm getting a little weary of that name. It's Johnny, isn't it? Yeah. And Daphne. Johnny, let me give you another tip. <laughs> you seem to be full of them. Uh, what's this one, Daphne? I wouldn't mention Harvey's fiancé to his father. Oh? Mr. Stone is quite violently opposed to the match. How about you, Daphne? How do you feel about it? Why, anything Harvey wants. It... Oh, Edward, this is Mr. Dollar. Yes, yes, I know. Hello, Mr. Stone. That idiot McNabb from the insurance company phoned me about you, Dollar. Worries like an old woman. Seems to think that fool accident Harvey had last night is an attempted murder. Oh, he's just taking normal precautions, Mr. Stone. Precautions. Well, just as well, I suppose. Harvey could use a nursemaid. He always manages to get things fouled up somehow. Now, Edward, You want to see my orchids, Dollar? Orchids? Of course you do. This way, out in the solarium. Okay. Oh, here, let me push you. Never mind. I can manage. All my good advice. Sorry, Daphne. This way, Dollar. I'll have a drink for you when you're ready, Johnny. Thanks. Ah, here we are. Well, some orchids. Who cares about orchids? Just wanted to talk to you. Well? What do you make of this business, Dollar? About Harvey, I mean. That bullet in his windshield last night. You really figure somebody's trying to kill him? Well, I, I don't know, Mr. Stone. That's why I'm here to find out. Well, I don't know who it'd be. Harvey's not a bad sort, really. Terrible businessman. Oh? How so? Oh, I could run the Stone Corporation better than he does for my wheelchair. He uh, doesn't do things your way, huh? Nothing's like it used to be. Everything's done differently now. Maybe it has to be. Has to be. Business is business. Yeah. Well, how about his fiance? I suppose you disapprove of her, too. Helen Barrett? <laughs> no, by golly, I... Got to hand it to Harvey there. Don't quite know how he managed to land someone like her. Wait a minute. You mean you're not opposed to his marrying her? More power to him. Chip off the old block, I guess. What's that mean? Oh, I did the same thing. That's what. Picked himself a Broadway girl. You mean Mrs. Stone, Daphne? Right out of musical comedy. I see. Well, how does she feel about Helen Barrett? Yeah, I won't seem to warm up to her. Oh, well, how can you figure out a woman? Yeah, how can you? So it's Daphne that disapproves of Helen. Well, that's very interesting. Interesting? It's a nuisance. Here's your drink, Johnny. Oh, oh, thanks, Daphne. Uh, Mr. Stone, you're not having any? No, that fool doctor of mine says no. Edward, you look tired. Perhaps you'd better rest. Tired? Up. Who's tired? Well, then just one more question, Mr. Stone. What is it? Do you know of anyone who might want to kill Harvey? Once in a while, I sure would. Edward. I tell you, when I think of how he's running that business into the ground, I could... I could wring his neck. Edward, it's no time for jokes. Johnny, this whole thing is ridiculous. Harvey hasn't an enemy in the world. Well, have you gotten me nicely taken apart by now, people? Oh, Harvey, dear. Hello, Daphne. Father? Well, this is Dollar, Harvey. Jimmy, isn't it? Uh, Johnny. Yes, I heard Mr. Dollar was coming. And why? How are you? You look tired, Harvey. Let me fix you a drink. Thanks. Darling... Thanks, darling. Ha. You know, Dollar, sometimes I wonder which one of us is married to Daphne. That was a perfectly charming thing to say, Edward. Yes, Father, you seem to be in unusually good form tonight. This is for the benefit of our guests, no doubt. Uh, uh, look, if I could just talk to you for a moment, Harvey. Oh, don't mind these little exchanges, Johnny. If you're around this place very long, you'll get used to them. Ah, good night. Good night, Father. Mr. Stone. Like a drink now, Harvey? Oh, never mind, Daphne. I can manage. All right. I'll go on up then. I hope we'll be seeing you again, Johnny. Oh, you probably will. Good night. I, um, I'm sorry about that business with Father just now, Johnny. Most of the time he thinks it's fine that Daphne and I get on so well together, but sometimes he doesn't. I suppose now he's in the wheelchair, he feels the difference in their ages even more. Yeah. And ever since I've taken over the management of the corporation, well... Oh, I'm sure he must have made it very clear he doesn't approve of my policies. And he's probably right. Oh? Well, my heart's not in it, really. But somebody had to take over. Look, uh, Harvey, you said you knew why I was here. Oh, sure. About that silly business last evening. Well, what exactly happened? Well, I have a new sports car that I'm fond of. I went for a drive. You know, there are some pretty good country roads around here. Mm -hmm. And I slowed for a sharp turn. And I heard what I thought was a backfire. But my windshield shattered. It was a bullet. Well, what'd you do then? I stopped to warn whoever it was to keep away from the roads. It didn't occur to you that somebody might be trying to kill you? 
Oh, well, good Lord, no. Look, Johnny, I used to roam these woods when I was a kid, taking pot shots at fence posts. That's obviously what happened last night. You didn't see anyone when you stopped? No, it was probably some kid. He's probably still running. And you can't think of anyone who might want to kill you? Of course not. How about Dutch Krieger? Krieger, the gambler? I understand he was involved in a business deal you were thinking of making. You refused to go through with it until his associates dumped him. Of course. After all, the name Stone does have a pretty honorable history. I couldn't very well have it connected with somebody like Krieger. Well, Dutch wouldn't forget a thing like that. Uh, look, about your fiance, Helen Barrett. Uh, Johnny, I suggest you can find your questions to subjects not quite so personal. All right, so I sound nosy, but you're heavily insured, Harvey, and that bullet last night could have been meant for you. My job is to find out if there's anyone who could possibly have any reason to kill you. There isn't. Do you know of anyone who's opposed to your marriage? I told you I'd rather not talk about that. Anyway, there's a good chance there isn't going to be any marriage. No. What do you mean? Look, Johnny, I have a good idea. It's almost time for the last train into the city. I'll drive you to the station. A polite but firm message that the interview was over. Harvey got called to the phone and I went outside to wait for him. Daphne had lied when she told me Harvey's father opposed the marriage to nightclub singer Helen Barrett. It was Daphne who didn't like the idea. She and Harvey seemed pretty chummy and the old man didn't seem to like that. Harvey had crossed a rough boy named Dutch Krieger in a business deal, and it's a cinch Dutch didn't like that. And now Harvey just told me there might not be a marriage, which indicated some kind of trouble there. All in all, it looked like a cozy little powder keg. Then as I started for Harvey's car, the keg exploded right in my stomach in the form of a fist. I couldn't see who they were, but the two of them really knew their business, the way they worked me over. Hard enough to hurt, not hard enough to put me out. Finally, I guess they got bored. One of them did me a favor. He put me away. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... Well, look, you should never get in a card game with a professional gambler. He can deal you any card he wants, even the ace of spades. The death card. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Ristelli at Homicide, Johnny. I was out when you called. Anything new on the Harvey Stone killing, Joe? Not a thing, but maybe we've already got all we need. Meaning Helen Barrett? We're still holding her. Joe, I don't think she did it. No? Oh, I know it all adds up to her, but... Well, just call it a hunch. Hunches are fine, Johnny, but facts are better. You want to hear some facts? I'll be right over. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northeast Indemnity Associates, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the imperfect alibi matter. Location, New York City. Expense account continued. Item 8, $1.40. Cab fare to police headquarters from my hotel to talk to Lieutenant Joe Rostelli. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. Facts, you said. Facts. Number one. Harvey Stone was shot in the left side of the forehead at close range with a thirty-eight caliber Smith & Wesson. The gun was near the body. Any prints on it? No, it was clean. But Helen Barrett had gloves with him. Helen says she left Harvey's apartment and went to her own to pack up. They were going to elope. When she got back to his apartment, he was dead. So she told me, Johnny. I'd like to believe her, too. She seems like a pretty nice kid, but, uh... But what? Not enough facts in her favor. Who saw her leave Stone's apartment? We can't find anyone who did. What time did she leave? She can't remember. Did anyone see her return? What time? That's a lot of questions not to be able to answer, Johnny. Yeah, yeah, I know. What was the time of death? Medical examiner figures it's somewhere between 11.30 and midnight. Well, Helen told me she thought it was about 11 when she left Harvey's apartment and about midnight when she returned. Yeah, about. Even if she did leave, she only lives a few blocks away. It's a lot of time unaccounted for, Johnny. Yeah. Better fill me in on what you know. Well, as I get it, Harvey Stone took over the management of his father's corporation when old E.J. took to a wheelchair about a year ago. Yeah, yeah, I know. Two years ago, old E.J. married an ex-chorus girl named Daphne. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's about Harvey's age. The two of them were apparently pretty friendly, and the old man was bothered by it occasionally. Incidentally, he and Daphne are joint beneficiaries on Harvey's insurance policy. A hundred and fifty thousand worth. Sounds like you're trying to tie the old man into the killing. Be quite a stretch, Johnny, from his wheelchair up in Westchester County to Harvey's apartment on East 57. I know, but right now I'm more interested in Daphne. Oh? I told you last night I thought Dutch Krieger was mixed up in this. I went to his office afterward and spotted a picture of Daphne Stone on his wall. Inscription, All My Love, signed Daphne. You think Daphne got Dutch to do her and himself a favor, huh? That's a possibility, isn't it? Sure, sure, it's a possibility. Trouble is, there are all kinds of possibilities. Right now, I got to stick with a probability. Helen Barrett. Uh Uh-huh. How are you doing on motive for her? Not good, not bad. We know there was some question as to whether they were going to be married or not. Helen says the hesitation was on her part. But suppose it was the other way around. Harvey decided not to go through with the marriage? Yeah. Getting cut out of the stone money would hurt some girls plenty. Maybe this was her way of getting even with him for breach of promise. (laughs) You know, Joe, for a guy who loves facts, seems to me you're edging over into hunches, too. I admit it isn't a closed case by a long shot. So let's get back to facts. Harvey was shot in the forehead with a thirty-eight Smith & Wesson sometime between 11.30 and... Excuse me. Vestelli speaking. Who? What about? Oh, well, send him in. Somebody wants to see me about the killing. Oh. You Lieutenant Rostelli? That's right. Your hand on the stone killing? Trying to. I want to talk to you about it. Sit down. Thank you. What's your name? Gentry. Alvin Gentry. So what about the stone killing? I killed Harvey Stone. What? What? Let's have that again. I said, I killed Stone. I want to make a statement. Why did you kill him? Making a play for my girl. I didn't like it. Your girl? You mean Helen Barrett? Who? Helen Barrett, Harvey Stone's fiance. No, I don't know her. I mean my girl, Doris, a hat check girl at Barney's. Well, go on, go on. Well, Stone was on the make for her. Every time he came in Barney's, he'd make a play for her. I told him to lay off, and he wouldn't. He asked her to go away with him. I went to his apartment, and I killed him. How'd you kill him? I shot him. Where? I told you, in his apartment. I mean, where did the bullet hit him? Oh, in the chest. What kind of gun did you use? Forty-five cold. What'd you do with the gun? I threw it in the river. Okay, Gentry, get out. What? I said, get out. But I told you... Yeah, you told me all right. Now I'm telling you. Get out. Look, I don't understand. I'll tell you what you do. You just go on out of here and think it over. When you come back with a few facts straight... Facts? Yeah, like the caliber of the gun and where Stone was shot and the location of the gun. You get the facts straight and I'll be glad to listen to you. Now get out. Okay. Confessing Sam number one. Yeah, there's always a string of them. 
That's one reason we don't usually release the caliber of the gun to the papers, to help weed out these confessing Sam. wonder why they do it. A psychiatrist was explaining it to me once. Something to do with repressed feelings of guilt, I think he said. Next one will probably say he stabbed Harvey Stone with a letter opener. Yeah. Well, I'm going to run out and have a talk with Daphne. Stully speaking. All right. Now, look, Mike, you take the statement, huh? Thanks. Well, I was wrong about the letter opener, Johnny. Oh? We got a guy now who claims he used a razor on Harvey. Slit his throat from ear to ear. As I left, I spent about three minutes feeling sorry for Estelle and his crank confessions, but then I dropped that routine and started feeling sorry for my own problems. The case against Helen Barrett looked pretty bad, but I still kept thinking of Daphne Stone's picture in Dutch Krieger's office. Expense account item 9, 320, transportation to the Stone Estate in Westchester County. I was shown into the king-sized drawing room again to wait for Daphne. But then I saw a very interesting sight that wiped Daphne out of my mind for a moment. It was old E.J.'s wheelchair at the door to the solarium. And what was unusual about it was that it was empty. I edged toward the door. Then I got a glimpse of E.J. puttering around his orchids. He spotted me, though, and hobbled quickly to his wheelchair. With an abrupt wave, he wheeled into the hall and out of sight. A couple of minutes later, in came Daphne. Hello, Johnny. Daphne. Look, you said it was important that you talk to me, but I really don't feel much like talking after what's happened. I'm sure you understand. I think so. How's E.J. taking it? My husband is reacting as I suppose any father would who'd just lost his son. He's bewildered and hurt. You didn't tell me E.J. could navigate without his wheelchair. I saw him a minute ago inspecting his orchids. The wheelchair was parked near the door. I... I didn't think it was important, Johnny. It's true, he can be out of his chair for short periods, but it's rather uncomfortable for him. Out of his chair for how long? Not long enough to get into New York and back, if that's what you're wondering. Thanks. You told me it was E.J. who was opposed to Harvey's plans to marry Helen Barrett, but I found out that you were the one who was fighting it. I suppose it was foolish of me to pretend otherwise. I guess I just didn't want you to get any wrong ideas. About what? About the reason I opposed it. What's the right idea? The name of Stone means something, Johnny. Dignity. Tradition. Breeding. I doubt if someone like Helen Barrett, an entertainer, nice as she is, could keep that tradition alive. Are you kidding? I'm completely serious. Something like this happened once before with Harvey's secretary, Martha Winters. And you stopped it just like you were trying to stop him from marrying Helen. I don't like the way you put that. I merely persuaded him to think of the family name. <laughs> you know, you kill me, Daphne. What do you mean by that? This dose of blue blood you've picked up. Aren't you a Daphne come lady yourself? How dare you? Save it. E.J. told me he lifted you out of a chorus line when he married you. Now, how about it? Yes, it's true. So where do you get off I with this? I don't suppose you'd ever understand this, Johnny. But there are chorus girls and chorus girls. This I know. I had to support my mother somehow. But all the while, I knew that life wasn't for me. And when I got a chance at this life, I took it. And since I married Edward, I've lived the way anyone with the name of Stone should live. I've put my past behind me. Even Dutch Krieger? Dutch? Yeah. Yeah, I saw your picture on his office wall. He was part of the past. It doesn't exist anymore. Isn't it kind of a coincidence he tried to worm his way into one of Harvey's business deals? I had nothing to do with it. And Harvey acted correctly in refusing to have anything to do with Dutch. I see. Then you opposed Harvey's marriage to Helen to protect the family name, huh? Just as I opposed the previous attachment to his secretary. Sure it wasn't because you didn't like the idea of competition? That's a... That's a pretty low thing to say under the circumstances. Well, just what are the circumstances? It's... It's very simple. I've lost someone who was... very dear to me. 
Even though I was hardly stepmother, we were practically the same age. Sure. I know people talked about it, made crude jokes about it. But I didn't care. Because I found in Harvey something I'd never had in my life before. Oh, what was that? A friend, Johnny. A real friend. I went back into the city. If I could only find somebody to establish the time period Helen had been away from Harvey's place. I went over to her apartment house, figuring there's always one tenant who knows everybody else's business. Five doorbells later, I found the one. Sure, I had to come in late, but I don't remember just what time. I was watching a program on the TV. There was this old man and woman. Yeah, with that yes, yes. Really, I, uh, was, what? You're sure it was Helen Barrett who came in? Well, I ought to be sure. She lives right under me. Besides, he was waiting for them. They had a talk. I couldn't quite hear what they were saying. She kept telling him to quiet down. Well, I mean, I, well, I wasn't really paying any attention. It was... No, no, of course not. You said he was waiting for her. Who do you mean? Friend of hers, at least he used to be. She used to go with him. Happen to remember his name? Sure. Gentry. Alvin Gentry. Alvin Gentry. It was Alvin Gentry who'd made the fake confession in Rostelli's office. At the time, there'd been nothing to tie him into the case. But now, according to Mrs. Carson, he was a friend of Helen's. My hunch about her innocence took a nosedive. Yeah, that confession he tried to make could be his way of trying to protect her. And that would add up to just one thing. Helen was guilty after all. Now here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, up pops an eyewitness and drives the final nail into the wrong coffin. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Rostelli at Homicide, returning your call, Johnny. I've uncovered a couple of items on the Harvey Stone killing, Joe. Good, let's have them. Remember Alvin Gentry? The crank who made the fake confession in my office yesterday? Yeah, what about him? Looks like he's not a psycho after all. What do you mean? I just found out he's a friend of Helen Barrett's. Well, what do you know? Could be he was doing it to shield her. That sure doesn't look good for her, Johnny. Yeah, I got to admit, my hunch about her innocence just took a nosedive. I also learned that Harvey's secretary, Martha Winters, used to be his girlfriend. Yeah, I'm up to date on that one. Matter of fact, Martha's in my office right now. Oh? Says she wants to make a statement. You want to hear it? You bet I do. Tonight, 
And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northeast Indemnity Associates, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the imperfect alibi matter, location, New York City. Expense account continued. Item 10, a dollar forty cab from my hotel to police headquarters. Martha Winters, secretary to the murdered man, Harvey Stone, was in Lieutenant Joe Rostelli's office. She was a blonde. And again, I had to admire the dead man's taste. He could really pick them. Miss Winters, would you mind telling Mr. Dollar here what you've just told me? No, not at all, Lieutenant. You see, Mr. Dollar, I have a small apartment in the same building as Mr. Stone's apartment. On East 57th? Yes. Uh, Harvey, as Mr. Stone transacted most of the business at his apartment rather than the office when he was in town. That's mainly why he kept the apartment. And we felt it would be more convenient for me to be nearby. I see. Well, the night before last... The night of the murder... Yes. I'd been out to a show. I got home about 11.30. Go on. I saw Helen Barrett walking toward Mr. Stone's apartment. What? You sure about the time? Well, not right down to the second, of course, but I am positive it was within five minutes of 11.30. I see. Well, why did you wait until this morning to tell us this? Well, I... Come on, let's have it, Miss Winters. Well, naturally, no one likes to get mixed up in things like this, and... I didn't want to make trouble for anybody. Helen Barrett always seemed like a, a nice person. But Mr. Stone was my employer and my friend. And after thinking it over, I, I could see what my duty was. You say Harvey Stone was your friend. Was he anything more than that? I don't think I know what you mean, Mr. Dollar. I think you do. I understand that at one time you and Harvey were planning to be married. That's true. But that's all in the past. Oh? Yes, we decided mutually that it was a mistake. We've been friends ever since, but nothing more than that. I see. Well. Heard enough, Johnny? Yeah. Okay, Miss Winters, that'll be all. Thanks for coming in. We'll get in touch with you again if we need any further information. All right. Any time, Lieutenant. Well, Johnny... According to Martha Winter's statement, Helen Barrett was in Harvey's apartment at the approximate time of the murder. We know it was somewhere between 11.30 and midnight. Helen said she left Harvey's apartment around 11 to go home and pack. They were going to elope. When he didn't come for her, she got worried. She went back to his apartment around midnight, found him dead. But that story won't hold water if Martha's telling the truth. Yeah. If. You don't sound convinced. Are you, Joe? Uh, I don't know, Johnny. I don't know. It's a pretty nauseating shortage of facts in this case. Nauseating's the word for it, all right. No, I mean literally. When I get one like this, my stomach starts acting up. Joe, what have we got in the way of facts? Well, number one, Harvey Stone was shot in the forehead with a thirty-eight Smith & Wesson sometime between 11.30 and midnight. Yeah. And even that fact got twisted around yesterday by Alvin Gentry when he made what he called a confession... He said he shot Stone in the chest with a Colt forty-five and threw the gun in the river. Yeah. You told me you'd found out he was a friend of Helen's. His confession doesn't look good for her, believe me. I know. But I can't seem to lose my hunch that she's innocent. Look, Johnny, I, I don't blame you for trying. It's your job. What do you mean? Harvey Stone was insured for 150000 bucks by the company you represent. Yeah, that's right. Okay, his father E.J. Stone and his young stepmother Daphne are the joint beneficiaries. Now, if one of them should turn out to be the murderer, your company wouldn't have to pay off. Wait a minute, Joe, wait a minute. I think you know me well enough to figure I'd a lot rather see that company pay through the nose than convict an innocent person. Sure, but just about everything we've got points to Helen Barrett. Just about, but not quite. For instance... For instance, Harvey's father, E.J. Stone. He thought Harvey was running the business into the ground. He didn't like it. He also didn't like the fact that Harvey and his stepmother were pretty friendly. Yeah, a man in a wheelchair is liable to resent a lot of things. Yeah, well, that's just the point. E.J. can get out of his wheelchair when he wants to. I saw him out of it yesterday. Uh -huh. Sure. Then there's Daphne herself. 
She opposed the idea of Harvey marrying Helen. Said she wanted to protect the stone name. But that sounds pretty fishy coming from somebody who used to be a chorus girl herself. Did you ask her about that picture of her you spotted in Dutch Krieger's office? Yeah. She said that was all in the past. But I wonder. Dutch got kicked out of a business deal by Harvey. He wouldn't forget that, and he's a tough cookie. And there still could be a connection between him and Daphne. Here we go again. Could be. Okay, okay. So I guess what it all adds up to is just that I kind of got myself sold on Helen. Sure, I've been sold on people, too. Sometimes it's ended up costing me. So now I just hold back and don't make up my mind one way or another. All right. It's turned out to be a pretty good idea, too. Why don't you try it, Johnny? Expense account item 11, a double martini for me. When I thought over what Joe Rostelli had said, Sure, it was good advice not to get too sold on people, but it didn't help me much at the moment. I still couldn't believe Helen Barrett had killed Harvey Stone, but I had to admit that if she wasn't the killer, it left a lot of things unexplained. For one thing, Alvin Gentry's fake confession. It sure looked like he was trying to shield her. I checked and learned that he managed a supper club where Helen used to sing. I decided to have a talk with him. I found him at a corner table. Yeah? I'm Johnny Dollar, Gentry. We uh, we met in Lieutenant Rostelli's office. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you. What about? About the Harvey Stone killing. There's nothing to talk about. I don't agree. I think there is. I made my confession. You guys didn't believe me. Well, now, that's because you got a few of the things wrong, Gentry. What interests me now is not your confession, but the reason you made it. What do you mean? Well, you said Harvey Stone had been making a play for your girl, a hat check girl, wasn't it? You, you said that's why you killed him. So? So, you said you didn't know Helen Barrett. I don't. But you're lying. Look, Dolly. We found out you're a friend of Helen's. You used to go with her, and you were waiting in her apartment the night of the murder when she left Harvey's and came home to pack. Well, how about it, Gentry? Okay, so I do know Helen, but she didn't kill Stone. How do you know? She couldn't have. She's not that kind. Oh, sure. You were waiting at her apartment that night. Why? I wanted to see her. What about? She used to sing here. She drew good crowds. I wanted her back. What kind of a mood was she in when she got to her apartment? What do you mean? Well, did she talk about Harvey Stone any? Did did she seem mad or upset? I don't remember. Cut it out, Gentry. I want straight answers. Well, I guess they had a little argument. What about? I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Helen didn't kill Stone. She was... She was with me. You mean for a few minutes at her apartment? I mean longer than a few minutes. She was with me at the time of the killing. Now look, Gentry. I know you're trying to help Helen, but believe me, this isn't helping her. First you make a phony confession, and now all of a sudden you're giving her an alibi. Uh, Sure, it was stupid of me to make that confession. You can say that again. But I realized later it wasn't necessary. I realized that Helen had been with me at the time of the killing. You're going to stick to that story? Sure I am. Under oath? Under oath. Perjury's a pretty serious thing, Gentry. Perjury's pretty hard to prove, Dollar. One thing seemed pretty clear. Alvin Gentry was apparently convinced that Helen had killed Harvey Stone. He was doing everything he could think of, even perjuring himself to shield her. And the more he scrambled, the worse it began to look for her. Then, too, there was the statement of Martha Winters, Harvey's secretary, that she'd seen Helen returning to his apartment at 11.30. That would put Helen back there during the time of the murder. I still wasn't completely convinced that Martha Winters was telling the truth, so I spent the rest of the afternoon checking on her to see what I could find out. And a couple of things I found out were pretty interesting. So interesting that I decided to try to run a little bluff on her. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Martha. I'd like to talk to you. Well, I I was just on my way out. Well, this won't take long. All right. Please come in. Thanks. Well? It's about that statement you made to Lieutenant Rostelli this morning. Oh? Well, I really haven't anything more to add to it, Mr. Dollar. Look, I'm sorry, but I have an engagement. Yeah. You told us this morning that you and Harvey Stone used to go together. But you called it off and were just uh, friends after that. Yes, that's right. Now, look, Mr. Dollar, But that isn't the story I picked up at the office of the Stone Corporation a while ago, Martha. The office? 
Now, what right have you to go snooping around that Sorry, office? Sorry, Martha, but snooping's my business. And you know, you pick up a lot of interesting information that way. Well, if you're going to listen to office For instance, gossip... I found out it was Harvey who called off the deal with no. you. No. And you've been carrying a torch for him ever since. There have been a couple of nasty scenes about That's it. That's a lie. Matter of fact, once or twice he'd almost made up his mind to can you, but each time he decided lies, not to. Lies, lies, all of it. Okay. Okay. We'll let that go for a minute. Now, about your statement this morning. Mr. Dollar, I haven't time to stand here and repeat what I've already said. That's where you're wrong, Martha. You've got time to hear this. You'll take time. Now, what is it? You said you saw Helen heading for Harvey's apartment at 11.30. Yes, I did. Where were you at the time? Why, here. In your apartment here? But your apartment's around the corner of the hall from Harvey's. Well, How I, could you have seen her from here? Well, I, I didn't mean I was in my apartment. I, I was at the entrance, just coming in. The front entrance, huh? Yes. But Helen came in the side entrance. You couldn't have seen her from the front. But she's lying. Anyway, I hadn't reached the front entrance yet. I, I was outside. Sorry, Martha. The doorman and the cop on the beat both would have seen Helen. I did. You lied, you... didn't you? No. You didn't see her at all. I... Well, it had to be, Helen. She's the one who killed him. I know she did. You lied, didn't you, Martha? If it hadn't been for her... If it weren't for her, maybe you'd be Mrs. Harvey Stone, huh? I didn't mean that. I'm... I meant Harvey'd still be alive. I I just didn't want her to get away with you it. You lied, Martha. You didn't see Helen at all. <laughs> yes, I lied, Mr. Dollar. I lied. Yeah. My bluff about the doorman, the cop on the beat, and Helen coming in the side entrance had paid off. Looking at Martha, I didn't exactly feel like giving three cheers about it. But one thing was clear, though. The Harvey Stone murder case had just busted wide open again. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up. A gambler stakes his life on his hand and loses Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Rustelli at Homicide, Johnny. Glad you called, Joe. Got something new for you on the Harvey Stone murder case. Uh, well, let's have it. Yesterday, Harvey's secretary, Martha Winters, told us she'd seen Helen Barrett approaching his apartment at just about the time he was murdered. Yeah? She just admitted to me that she lied. Oh? She wasn't in position to have seen anyone approaching the apartment at the time. Well, that maybe opens things up a little again. Yeah. I've got an item along that line, too, Johnny. What is it? Harvey's young stepmother, Daphne, up in Westchester County. Oh? What about her? I just found out she was here in the city the night of Harvey's murder. What? Yeah. (laughs) 
tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northeast Indemnity Associates, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the imperfect alibi matter, location, New York City. Expense account concluded. Item 13, 320, transportation to the Stone Estate in Westchester County to question Harvey's young stepmother, Daphne Stone. As a suspect in Harvey's killing, Daphne was very much alive again. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. Nice out here. Mm-hmm. Drink? No, thanks. How's the investigation going? Well, that's what I came to talk about, Daphne. It uh, hasn't been going too well. Oh? I was under the impression that an arrest had been made. Helen Barrett's being held. Well, then... Helen Barrett could be the killer. A lot of things point in her direction. But there are a few that don't. What do you mean? Right from the start, you've been giving me incomplete answers or false answers. First, you told me it was Harvey's father, E.J., who opposed his plans to marry Helen. Then I found out you were the one who was fighting it. Look, I explained all that. It was because I didn't want you to get the wrong idea. Oh, about... yeah, yeah, so you said. You told me you opposed it because you didn't think the stone name should go to a supper club singer like Helen. Yes. But you yourself used to be a chorus girl. I explained that to you, too, Johnny. Okay. So you oppose the marriage for the dignity of the family and not just to keep Harvey at home with you. That's a vicious thing to say. I told you Harvey and I, being about the same age, were very good friends, true friends. Is that what your husband thought? You forget Harvey's father is confined to a wheelchair. Understandably, he might occasionally resent those who can be more active. That's another thing you didn't tell me, Daphne, that E.J. could get out of his wheelchair on occasion. I caught a glimpse of him out of it the last time I was here. Short periods only. And with considerable discomfort. So you and Harvey were friends. Like you and that gambler, Dutch Krieger, huh? Donnie, my patience is running out. I explained that Dutch was in the past. Completely in the past. Before my marriage. But Dutch got kicked out of a business deal by Harvey. And he wouldn't like a thing like that. Harvey acted perfectly properly. Really, Johnny. I right, just one more thing, Well, Daphne. what is it? One thing more you didn't tell me. That you were in the city the night Harvey was murdered there. Well? I should have told you that, Johnny. I went into the city that evening because I knew Harvey was to have a meeting with Helen later that night. I wanted to talk to Harvey first. What about? I knew he was planning some definite action about her. So you wanted to talk him out of marrying her? If you want to put it like that, yes. What time was that? I saw him in his apartment about nine. I left before ten. Can anybody verify those times? I don't know. I see. What was the outcome of your talk with Harvey? He assured me he'd break off with Helen. You sure about that? Completely sure. I decided to stay at a hotel that night instead of coming back home. I suppose that's how the police knew I was in the city. It's Helen's story that when she saw Harvey later, they decided to elope. If I believed that, but I don't. I think she's lying. And how about you, Daphne? Have you given me the whole truth now? Yes, Johnny. The whole truth. Everything I've done has been done solely to protect the family name. Everything. Right then, I'd have given a lot to know just what that everything involved. Whether or not it also included some weird idea of killing Harvey to somehow protect the family name. Expense account item 14, 320, transportation back to the city. I got permission from Joe Rostelli to talk to Helen Barron. When they brought her into the interrogation room, she looked pale and tired. Hello, Johnny. Helen, several things I want to ask you about. Sit down. Sure. What? Martha Winters, for one. Harvey's secretary? What about her? 
Well, she made a statement that she'd seen you heading for Harvey's apartment around 11.30. That had put you inside there during the time of the murder. No. No, I'm sure it was later than that. Almost 12 when I got back there. Martha later admitted that she lied. But the question is, why? Still carrying the torch for Harvey? Yes, I guess she was. Next item's about Alvin Jeffrey. Lieutenant Ristelli told me about that confession Alvin made. He got all the details wrong. Caliber of the gun. Poor Alvin. What do you mean? Well, he'd always made it clear how he felt about me. But I didn't think he'd go that far. Well, how do you feel about him? I've always liked him very much. Used to go with him some. But I stopped when I started seeing Harvey. Did you talk to Alvin Long at your apartment that night? No. Just a few minutes while I was packing. <sighs> you know, you just talked yourself out of an alibi. What do you mean? Well, after Gentry's confession didn't sell, he was willing to swear you were with him during the entire period the murder could have taken place. Johnny, why does an innocent person need an alibi? It helps in court. Believe me. Well, how'd you make out with Daphne and Helen, Johnny? Joe, remind me never to get involved with show people again. They make their living putting on an act, and I'm just country boy enough not to be able to tell a difference once in a while. They both gave you nice straight stories, huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Real sincere. Look me right in the eye, both of them. But one of them was lying, huh? Daphne said Harvey told her he'd break off with Helen. But Helen says the two of them were planning to elope. Of course, Harvey might have changed his mind after talking to Daphne. Yeah, but that's something we're not going to be able to confirm now. No. Johnny, it's a cinch Alvin Gentry's convinced that Helen's guilty. I think he's holding back something. Guy doesn't stick his neck out that far without a reason. I know, but I still don't dig her motive. Well, suppose Daphne's telling the truth that Harvey broke up with Helen. Maybe she couldn't stand getting the brush off. Yeah, could be, all right. People can do some strange things under the name of love, Johnny, particularly when it turns to hate. And that can happen awful fast. Expenses... Items 15 and 16, a dollar 40 cab to my hotel and a dollar even for a pot of coffee in my room. One hour, three cups of coffee and half a dozen cigarettes later, I was still nowhere. I was beat. And then a weird little idea began pecking away at me. A couple of things Ristelli had said suddenly started adding up to a pretty fantastic answer. Maybe it wouldn't stand the light of day, but it was night now, and it was the only idea I could come up with. I decided to try it on for size. I went to the club Alvin Gentry managed. Oh, hello, Dollar. I was sort of hoping you'd be around again. Oh? Yeah, I want to talk to you, but not now. It's almost closing time. Uh, stick around, will you? I waited at the bar while the customers left. Twenty minutes later, Gentry and I were alone. He slid onto a stool beside me. Drink? Uh, no, no thanks, What's on your mind, Gentry? Well, I've been thinking about what you said the last time we talked about uh, perjury. Oh? Huh? I decided you were right, Dollar. I make it pretty tough on you for perjury. Yeah, they do. I'm withdrawing my statement that Helen was with me at the time of the murder. Well, that's probably the smart thing to do, Gentry. Sure, what's the use? I'm getting tired of being a sucker in this deal of fall guy. Oh? Huh? That goofed-up confession I made was bad enough. Then I had to stick my neck out still further with that fake alibi for her. And for what? So you're withdrawing the statement, huh? Yeah. That's uh, probably what you came to see me about, huh? No. No, that isn't why I came to see you at all, Gentry. Hmm? And I wouldn't exactly call you a sucker. I think you're one of the smartest guys I've ever seen in a sort of weird and twisted kind of way. What are you talking about? You played this whole deal real cagey right from the start. Everything you did was supposed to look like a cover for Helen. But instead of that, you were really trying to put a noose around her neck. You're out of your mind, Dollar. And that confession you made, Gentry, that's why I came to see you. To tell you it wasn't goofed up at all. You did kill Harvey Stone. You know, you got a real weird sense of humor. Have I? A couple of things Lieutenant Rostelli said added up in my mind a few minutes ago. Love can turn to hate fast. And you'd have to have a good reason to do what you did. You wanted Helen bad. When she told you that night she was going to marry Harvey Stone, you couldn't stand the idea. If you couldn't have her, nobody could. You're talking crazy. You went to Harvey's apartment and killed him. Then you made that fake confession to look like you were shielding her. Actually, you were framing her. No. You knew we wouldn't believe you, and we wouldn't believe that alibi you offered for her. It all made her look more guilty by the moment. Dolly, you're forcing me to say something I didn't want to. Oh, what is it? 
Helen was mad at Harvey that night. I was worried. I followed her back to his apartment. When I got there, she was standing over the body with a gun in her hand. She said, why did I do it? She kept saying it over and over. That's why I made the fake confession to protect her. Sorry, Gentry. It's a little too late for that story now. I keep telling you that confession you made was legitimate. Are you crazy? I didn't even get the caliber of the gun right. Yes, you did. What are you talking about? We made a mistake. Harvey was killed with a forty-five Colt, just like you said. You're crazy. It was a thirty-eight Smith... Yeah. A thirty-eight Smith & Wesson. I know that. So do the police. So does the killer. But nobody else. It, it was in the papers. No, Gentry. It wasn't in the papers. You're dead wrong, Dollar. Dead wrong. He kicked a bar stool at me, and I dove behind the end of the bar. The lights went off. I had my gun out now, but I couldn't see anything in the dark. He couldn't get past me to the front door, but he could get out of the back. I had to locate him fast. Then my hand touched an ashtray at the end of the bar. I picked it up and tossed it toward the center of the room. I spotted the flash of his gun. Now I had him pegged. I found a lamp on one of the tables. Gentry was slumped in a corner. My shoulder. Help me. Don't worry, Gentry. You're not going to conk out. There's plenty left of you to stand trial. Final item on expense account, $12.80. Transportation and incidentals back home. Total expenses, $192.40. But still he arrived in response to my call and had Gentry carted away. Helen Barrett was released from custody. Remarks? Here I thought Dutch Krieger was the gambler in the case. But the little game of winner-take-all that Gentry had been playing was just about the weirdest I'd ever heard of. I thought about him up there in the death house at Sing Sing and realized that the big trouble with that kind of gamble that he was taking is that the loser's seat can get awfully hot. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... One of the biggest, toughest, loudest characters I've ever met. A real two-fisted terror. And her name is Meg McCarthy. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Tony Barrett, Shirley Mitchell, Will Wright, Chet Stratton, Ted Corsia, Barney Phillips, Lillian Baeff, and Harry Bartell. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, I was afraid you might be away for the weekend. Who's that? Byron Kane, Intercoastal Maritime and Life. Oh, hello, By. How are things in Boston? In Boston, fine. In Cod Harbor, terrible. Who says? Meg McCarthy, who runs an eating place there at the harbor. Murder, mayhem, arson, or what? Right now, it's or what. But if you don't do something, and fast, it may be all three... Can you come over and see me? Now, bye? I know it's Saturday afternoon, Johnny, but this needs fast action. Will you? Bye. Goodbye. No, bye. Listen, you... Dollar, you're a sucker. (laughs) 
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cod Harbor, Massachusetts. To the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company. Following is an accounting of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Meg's Palace matter. Expense account item one, $7.30. Cab from my apartment, train fare and incidentals to Boston. Byron Key was a good insurance broker, and I figured he wouldn't have called me over a weekend unless it was pretty important. Get right to the point, Johnny. Insurance on the palace is only for $15,000. Wait a minute, Bye. What is this palace? A fishing boat? No, it's what Meg McCarthy calls her restaurant, right down on the dock. Cod Harvey, you say? That's right. Well, what seems to be the trouble over there that couldn't wait till after the weekend? Well, like I told you, this character, Meg McCarthy, runs a so-called restaurant down on the docks, the palace. I sold her 15000 insurance on it. And, Johnny, it's uh, quite a place. What do you mean by that? Uh... We also carry 25,000 straight life insurance on Meg herself. Separate policy, of course. Which one are you worried about, Pi? Both, I think. Huh? Matter of fact, the more I think about it, the gladder I am that she didn't fall from my pitch when I tried to get her to increase the coverage on the cafe. If she had, our necks would really be out. Well, what's the matter? Isn't it worth 15,000 now? Oh, sure, at least. Even if it doesn't look it. You know, the stoves, equipment, and all that sort of stuff are in the coverage, too. Then I'm afraid I don't see what you The thing is this, Johnny. Meg has been threatened... By whom? How? Who knows? Anyhow, she's notified me that there have been a couple of attempts to set fire to her place. Since she lives upstairs in it, that means danger to her own life, too. Uh-huh. And the whole 40000 is at stake. Yes. Will you go up there right away and see what you can do? Today? Tomorrow? Sunday? Look, maybe you can get in some fishing. I understand you're quite a fisherman. Oh, now, the last three times I was promised fishing while working on a case, all I did was cut bait. Proposition. If you don't get in at least a full day's fishing trip while you're up there... I'll double whatever you line up on your expense account. Uh, sounds mighty tempting. How about it, Johnny? Okay, bye. You asked for it. <laughs> Item two, eleven ninety-five. Transportation back to Hartford, then on to Cod Harbor the next morning. Fine way to spend a nice warm Sunday. Nice place too, if you lost your sense of smell. There were two or three dozen fishing boats of all shapes and sizes tied up at the long dock and piers that comprise the important part of the village. For housing, there was a scattering of weather-beaten shacks, one store. Meg's Palace turned out to be the biggest, most disreputable-looking of the dockside eating places. And since there was a clothes sign on the front door, I went around to the back. And I tell you, get off the clean scrub floor in my lovely joint of water is facing below. I'm what? sick and tired of looking at that whole No, 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 look here, Meg. I, I just come back to apologize uh-huh. to the uh-huh. Well, I... the next time that mangy, curly crew of the Lillian comes in here and gets drunk and brawls and carries on and busts up me fine glassware in China to say nothing of a couple no, of wooden Meg, chairs and a fine listen table. to me, darling. Don't now. you, darling, me, your pig face, squint No, hard. Meg, put on the frying pan. No, Meg. sir, not until you get your filthy hide out of here. I'm running a respectable joint, and the likes of you and the ragtail crew of yours have got no place in it. What, uh, What's more, and furthermore, I won't have you around. But hey, I, I only so come get... to pay for the damage, my boy did last night. Now, look hey, here. Hey, that's a laugh. Pay for the loss of me dignity to say nothing of me Make trade. Make little buttercup, please. Now, get out of here, Willie. Get out. Well, okay. Hey, here's your, here's your money, Meg. Who wants your dirty, offensible money? Get out! Meg, put down the frying pan. I'll put it down, Willie boy, if you don't get out of here. I'll Meg, Meg, your head. Let go. Get now before I don't get out. Oh, Meg, let go. Get out of here. I, uh, excuse me, Miss McCarthy. Oh, ain't he a darling? Ain't he the sweetest man you ever did see? Huh? The man you just threw out of here? Not only comes in to apologize, but brings the money to pay for the damage his pranking boys done last night when they were celebrating the big catch they made. Lovely bunch of lads they are, too, every one of them. As loyal to Willie Boy. Now, who the devil are you? 
And what's the big idea of barging in here on a Sunday when anybody with eyes in his stupid head can see that the place is closed oh, up? Oh, no, and your eyes so blind in your head you couldn't see the sign out front? I saw And th- sneaking in here the back way this way. Who do you think you are? Well, I wasn't Now sneaking. get out and leave a lady alone of a Sunday. Go on! Don't get tough with me, Meg McCarthy. Huh? Just put down that pot and shut up for a minute while I tell you why I'm here. Put it down. Shades of me, dear, departed over barren husband. Yes, sir. After all, I should have noticed you're a gent standing by the way you done while me and Bill was at its helter and skelter. Oh, but he's a dear one, ain't he? Yeah, well, at this point, I wouldn't know. But from what I saw a minute ago... Oh, don't let that fool you, dearie. We're in love, me and Willie boy. Ain't he a living doll? Meg. A fine, fine husband is going to make me, too. That's why I made him the beneficiary of my life insurance policy. That's exactly what I want to talk to you about. Then go ahead and talk. What's stopping you standing there like a banty rooster that doesn't... Will you shut up? Oh, of course I will, dearie. And I'm begging your humble pardon. But if there's anything I hate, it's a lily-livered man that has... Meg! Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Then listen. Yes, sir. My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Insurance investigator, eh? Well, in spite and despite of your pretty clothes and pleasing manner, I don't want any of already got. No, no, you don't understand. I Maggie. got all I can have. I'm well, just... And from the looks of things, these past couple Will you of... shut up a minute? Of course, dearie. I'm sorry. You call the insurance company, Mr. Byron Kay, an intercoastal oh, maritime. Oh, yes, dear little pasty-faced Byron boy. Why, do you know if he'd had half the guts and get of a he-man, he would have sold me twice the insurance he did? Well, that's not quite the way he told it to me. Well, it's the way I'm telling it to you. Oh, what am I going to do, darling, if they wreck my place the way they're trying? Oh, this Willie boy, as you call him, who was just in here? That's effeminate. What? He's Captain Billy Morgan. Bill, to you and any man what calls him Oh, Willie. put it down, will you? And stop yapping your head off and answer my question. Yes, sir. Now, is Captain Bill Morgan one of the people you suspect of trying to wreck this ugly-looking hash house? Oh, I love you, boy. You talk like a real sweet, overbearing maid. Then answer my question. Oh, well, of course he ain't. Willie boy wouldn't hurt me any more than I'd touch a hair of his pretty head if he had a hair on top of it. All right, then who? Johnny boy, there's a dozen of them like to see Meg's palace burn to the ground. Blast their black thieving souls. Why? Because I give them the best and the most food in the harbor. That's what the man gets here. So what happens to the silver plate in Ernie's manor house and Irving's chop suey joint? Well, I'm putting them out of business, that's what. So you think they're trying to put you out of business? Think huh? it, I know it. That's why I telephoned that sniveling, lop-eared Byron K to send somebody down here and make them stop it. Before he had to pay off a lot of insurance on it and maybe even on me. Why else do you think? There have been some attempts to set the place on fire, I understand. Why else do you think a lady like myself would take to sleeping on the bar down here every night, getting a creek and my sacred lily up? But I'm getting sick and fed up with it. I don't know that I blame you. Now, look, this will you... trying to keep awake all night every night to keep them from burning it out from under me and me, whether it's making a fair shadow of me for myself out of me, I'm losing me strength. But not your I aim. Have... Look, while we talk, I'll help you clear up some of this. Well, mess. the devil you will. It's not the man's job, especially since she ain't romantically inclined towards me. But she would let Bill Morgan clean up for you, huh? Well, he was the cause of it, wasn't he? So if he and his boys don't show up before nightfall and take care of it, so help me, I'll keel haul them every one. Besides, if he's going to be me old man when the fishing season's done, he's got to know how to keep in line. Now. Now. You say there are people you suspect are trying to fire this building. Three. All right, three. Now, who are they? The owners of the other restaurants here on the dock? I. First, there's Clem Harris, what runs the silver plate. Oh, and a sly one he is. Yeah, what do you mean? He's too soft and polite and soft-spoke. Me, I never trust a man unless he talks up like a man. Well, I guess that's why I like you, dear. Uh-huh. Well, who are the others? Ernie Turner at the Manor House Cafe. Oh, yeah. Is that the big place down at the other end? What? The little hole in the wall next to the bait stand. And half the time the customers don't know whether they're getting bad food or thawed out bait. And the third one. Yeah? Huh? <laughs> That stubborn mule that runs Irving's chop suey joint. Irving who? What's his last name? Irving. His name's Tony. His name... Now, wait a minute, will you please? Sure. Tony Fortino, Italian. Then why is it called... 
Why a chop suey place? Anybody has eyes, he would have saw how the sign was changed. First the Chinese had it with chop suey. Yeah. Then came Irving with kosher, so he added his name to it, and now it's Tony. Well, then why? Only there wasn't any more room left on the sign, so stop complaining. <sighs> okay, Meg, you win. But have you any specific reason to suspect any one of them? One of them? I suspect them all, the dirty conniving. Why? Because they're a dirty conniving... I'll tell you why. Because they won't sell out to me. Because oh. they all three keep open competing with me, and that's three against one, so they're a dirty all right, conniving. All right, you but... said that. Well, aren't they? How would all you... All right. Be... Yes, sir. I, uh... I love it when you speak to me that way, Johnny. Boy. So you said. Now, I asked you if you have any specific reason for suspecting any one or all of them. But of course I have, on account of the threats they sent. How do you know they sent them? Because I suspect them, that's why. And what happens three times they try to set fire Meg, to my lock? Meg, you don't have one bit of actual evidence against any of them, do you? Well... Well, do you? No. But I suspect the dirty kid Hold I've it, been... please. Are you sure those fires weren't accidental? Accidental? Well, with all the dirt and grease you leave around this In shack. the middle of the night with a stove fire bank like I've been doing it for 20 years and with all the fires starting outside where they have no business. Look, Johnny boy, I'll show you where they started outside. Well, now, that's a good idea because so far I confess I can't get very much alarmed over what's no, happened. No, who... Don't the whole town know I'm closed on Sundays? Hello, and what kind of a blubber-headed income poop would be calling Meg's Palace on a Sunday when everybody knows... I Johnny Dollar. Huh? Oh, of course. The gentleman's right here. It's for you, Johnny boy. Oh? Hello, Johnny Dollar. We know why you're here, Dollar. Oh, yeah? Who's we? But you won't be here long, understand? Well, now, that's a matter of opinion, isn't it? Either you go quiet the way you came, or you go in a long wooden box. Get it? What is it, Johnny boy? Come on, Meg. Let's get to work. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, they say that darkness can cover a multitude of sins. It can also cover a strong man armed with a deadly weapon. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Byron Kay in Boston, Johnny. Hi. The operator had quite a time locating you. I don't see why. I'm in the only available room for rent here in Cod Harbor. Huh? Well, she said she was ringing Meg's Palace Restaurant. That's where I am. Room's right above the place. Well, tell me, have you found out whether it's true somebody's trying to burn up that joint and put Meg out of business? Not only that, Bly, but whoever's behind the attempts to get her out of the way has threatened to get me. Some help? Yeah, yeah, I want you to send me something by truck as soon as possible. Huh? And I want to be sure it arrives here quietly at night so that nobody in this little fishing village knows it arrives. Holy smoke, what? Listen carefully, by, and I'll tell you. I want you to send me six large. Large. 
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cod Harbor, Massachusetts, to the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston, assignment, the Meg's Palace Matter. Expense account continued. Expense account item, well, since you're paying for and sending that batch of fire extinguishers, Byron, I can hardly charge them to my expense account, can I? But I have a sneaking suspicion they might be mighty important. A cursory inspection of this tiny fishing community has revealed no sign of a firehouse. Nothing, in fact, but some hose connections for cleaning off the docks. And after the threats Meg McCarthy has received, plus a couple of attempts to fire up this disreputable-looking establishment of hers, well, I guess I still have some Boy Scout blood in my veins. In view of the threat to me, I figured it might be a good idea to consult the local authorities. I learned a long time ago that it's a good plan to enlist their cooperation when working in a strange small community. Inquiries from some of the fishermen mending their nets spread out in the long wharf led me to a small, shabby, unmarked frame shack that stood about a block away from the waterfront. Hey, come in, come in. Mr. Beasley? That's right. Well, what's your name? Johnny Dollar. Dollar, hmm? Okay, what do you want? Well, uh, you're the chief of police, I understand. Acting chief of police? Oh, Acting mayor, too, an acting judge, acting town clerk, acting just about anything else you could want. <laughs> I don't get it. Well, I don't know why not. Officially, I guess Cod Harbor is just a part of Barnesboro, a couple of miles inland. We're so small, and we're not incorporated like most towns, so we just have to be kind of self-sufficient under ourselves. You see what I mean? And you know something? It works out pretty good. Yeah, well, I guess it's as chief, uh, as acting chief of police that I've come to see you. Yeah, what about? The Meg's Palace Cafe. Ah, uh, you mean you take any stock in Meg's talk about somebody threatening to burn up that cockroach loaded dump she calls a restaurant? I'm representing the insurance company that holds $15,000 insurance on it. Never come to your mind, Mr. Dollar, that Meg, her own self, might have set the fires to collect that insurance? And call for help as a cover-up? Yeah, yeah, the thought has entered my mind. Just crazy enough to do a thing like that, too. Hasn't she been to you for help? She told me. Well, what sort of evidence, one way or another, have you turned up? Dollar, I haven't looked for any. Yeah, what? The less I meddle in their affairs, the less trouble I'll have with the folks here in Cod Harbor. Oh, hey, now, wait a minute. For a mayor and police chief and so on, you don't seem to be very concerned about these people of yours. So maybe I'm not. What's the difference? Well, look here, if you... Yeah, you know, unless something serious happened, like a murder or... Or, or a fire that destroyed Meg's palace and maybe half the docks? Don't you think that sort of thing is serious? Well, yeah, if it happens. Then I'd probably have to call in the regular appointed authorities over to Barnesboro. But there hasn't been any fire yet. Not any real one. So why get your dander up? Well, I'll be... Look, with so little concern about the place, how did you ever get all those jobs? <laughs> Easy. Lost my school right on the banks last fall. So for want of something better, I just took it. It took them all. Why not? The town feeds and bores me, and I like it. So... Real soft, lazy, good-for-nothing life, huh? Sure. Now, why don't you be a good boy, Dollar, and leave things be around here? Stop wasting my time. Well, just let me take enough of your valuable time to ask a couple of questions. Sure. Go ahead. No harm in asking. I want to know about some of the people here in Cod Harbor. Like who? Clem Harris, for one. Careful, boy. That's my cousin. Oh. Who else? Ernie Turner and Tony Fortino. Oh, uh -huh. A count of them's the three that run the other dirty bites along the dock, huh? Yeah. I'd like a rundown on all three of them. Easy. Yeah? Yeah. Go talk to them. Oh, now, wait a minute. The easiest you're... way I know of for you to find out all about them. Oh, you're a lot of help. Dollar, like I said, we're kind of self-sufficient under ourselves around here. We like it that way. And that's just another way of saying we don't like strangers coming here and messing around in our affairs. <laughs> Well, that was pretty definitely that. It was getting quite late, and I decided I'd better postpone any interviews with Meg's business rivals until the following morning. 
Besides, as I walked along the wharf, I noticed that they were closed. Then I remembered somebody else I wanted to talk to, the beneficiary of Meg McCarthy's life insurance policy, the master of the fishing boat, Lily Ann, Captain Billy Morgan. But the Lily Ann, tied up at her berth, was dark and empty. Well, if anyone knew where Captain Billy was, it'd be Meg herself. So I walked the boards back to Meg's palace. What greeted me as I opened the back door of the place was truly a sight to behold. Over there with that hole, just come on the land lovingly. Over there in the corner, can't you see? What's the matter with your blinking eyeball? Standing in the center of the floor, brandishing a moth-eaten feather duster as if it were a club, stood Captain Billy Morgan. Shouting orders to three men who were cleaning up the mess of pots and pans and broken crockery left over from Meg McCarthy's temper tantrum of a short while earlier when she belabored this same Captain Billy for a little celebration he and his crew had had in their place the night before. Belabored? It looked like she must have thrown one of everything in the joint at him. Bill! Hey, Captain Billy! Hey! Hey! Oh, it's you, huh? I uh, seen you here earlier today when Meg threw me out. Well, looks to me like you weren't all she threw. Yes, sir. Oh, she's a living doll. Hey, see, ain't you the insurance man? She telephoned to help her find out who's trying to burn her out of here. Her uh, name's uh, Johnny Dollar, ain't it? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and Captain, I'd like to ask you a favor. Charlie, you yellow-bellied, bug-eyed man, he wasted it. Don't throw that trash in the corner. What's the matter with you? Sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I guess the boys don't like working at night when they got to be up and aboard Lily Ann and headed out for the fishing banks by 3 a.m. in the morning. Don't blame him. We couldn't leave Meg's place in a mess like this, now could we? After all, uh, she's going to have to serve us coffee and sinkers before we go. Where is she? Upstairs. Has been for the last hour. In her room? Uh, in that room she's renting out to you. Figured like maybe you could stand some cleaning up and debugging, I guess. You know something? <laughs> she figured right. Avast there with the mop all ear. I'll ring it around your bloody neck. And swab off them tables while Strata can't you see the mess you left on them? Now, uh, what can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? Well, look, why don't you and I go into the kitchen, Captain, where we can hear ourselves think? Well, sure, why not? All right, now you keep at it, you sow belly lunkheads. And if the joint ain't clean and tidy when I come back, I'll flash you all over the lease coppers. <laughs> Real fine bunch of boys I got there, ain't they? I'll bite, are they? You bet your sweet living life they are. Finest crew on any boat in the harbor. Charlie Oley and Montgomery. Now, uh, what was it you wanted, Mr. Dollar? You found out anything about who's causing all the worries to my lover girl? Not very much, yet. Well, I hope you do. Do you? Huh? I don't get you. I'm going to be honest with you. Lay all the cards right on the table. Well, that's the only way, I always say. All right. I'm just as concerned about Meg herself as I am about this cafe. Sure you are. Me too. Now, whether you like it or not, I have to consider the fact that you are the beneficiary of Meg's $25,000 life insurance policy. If anything were to happen to her... Why, sure, I see what you mean. You bet your life I see what you mean. Why, you blasted land loving son of a dirty yellow sculpin. Take it easy, Captain. Take Take it easy. easy. You trying to say I hurt one single hair, Meg McCutt? Dollar, you may crash like that. I'll swab the decks with that ornery hide of yours and feed you. Put him up. Put him up, Dollar. You want to talk to me like I that? I said you put right him up. down, Captain. Let's talk sense a minute. Talk sense, yeah, but don't you go implicating that I... I didn't imply a thing yet. Well, I warn you, you Just don't. a minute there, Pat. Captain Billy Morgan. Oh, oh, Just Meg, a minute. I, uh, Who do you think you're talking to like that, the guest of me humble establishment? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Meg, darling, but he and was And why ain't like you in there helping those poor boys of yours with the cleaning up? Well, but they, they're almost finished up, Meg, me, darling. Besides, they, unless you are and get out of here and get your sleep, you'll not be worth your sleep. Salt on the boat tomorrow. Meg, I'd like to talk to Captain Billy. Tomorrow. Go out in the boat with him in the morning and you'll all have plenty of time to talk. Well, I want to talk Willie to him now. boy, no- get uh, out with them. Go on. Well, uh, yes, my dear. And, uh, I'll see you at the dock at three in the morning. Well, now, wait a minute. Get, I... get, yo! Also, Johnny boy, you go out with him. Did give me a chance to fix your room up real nice for you, like it should be for a gentleman like yourself. <laughs> okay, Meg. Come to think of it, I was promised a fishing trip on this case. Anyways, I'll not be worrying about any fires tonight with you staying here. So if you don't mind, I'll retire to my bed and see you at breakfast time. Okay. Maybe I can help Billy's crew finish cleaning up in there. Oh, don't you lift a finger. 
"'Twas a twilly boy I thawed them plates and things "'so him and his crew can clean it up. "'Good night, Johnny boy. "'There's food in the icebox and your bed's all made "'and you're ready to retire. "'I stood there for a moment, smiling after her. "'Then I decided I'd take her advice "'that instead of helping the men clean up the cafe, "'I'd get a breath of fresh air before hitting the sack. The moon was just a thin sliver in the eastern sky, and the stars twinkled merrily in the broad, clear expanse overhead. The cottages of the peaceful little fishing village were dark. Along the docks at the waterfront, the fishing boats playfully nudged each other as they slowly and quietly swung and rolled on the gently heaving water. Their mass and rigging formed an intricate, ever-changing pattern against the occasional beam from the lighthouse and the point as it lazily swept across the night. Somewhere, far out on the landward breeze... An occasional seabird call. It was all so peaceful and serene that I couldn't help wondering how trouble could ever come to a... Then I saw it. A slight movement at the front corner of the old building. A silhouette hunched over, tensely watching the front door, waiting. But waiting for whom? Slowly, as quietly as possible, I crept up on whoever it was, hoping in the dim light to recognize him or her before I was discovered. Softly, I passed the side door. I could still hear the members of the crew inside at their work. But in my concentration and the person out front, I was too slow in my reaction when that side door suddenly opened behind me. Huh? What? Who are you? Oh, no, you... Oh! And very suddenly, it got very dark. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a trip to sea on the Lily Ann that starts out like an ordinary fishing trip. But somewhere on board lurks a man with murder in his heart. And his next intended victim, me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Gemstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Mm. Mr. Dollar? Oh, Oh, listen, it's after midnight, and I don't feel so good. This is Tim Beasley. I I want to talk to you. Oh, the oh-so-very-uncooperative mayor, chief of police, and general do nothing in this town. Now, just a minute. Now, you just a minute. I asked you for help this afternoon in finding out who's threatening to put Meg McCarthy in a restaurant out of business. Dollar. What do I get? A snide warning from you that the people of Cod Harbor don't want outsiders messing in their affairs. Well, I don't believe it. If you'll only listen to me, I want to help you. Then why weren't you here a little while ago when somebody slugged me? I was. What? Who do you think picked you up in that alley and put you to bed at Meg's place? You? You want to come over here and talk to me now? I know it's late. Okay, Beasley. If my head stops spinning long enough, I'll be right over. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From 
Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Card Harbor, Massachusetts. To the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston. Assignment, the Meg's Palace Matter. Expense account continued. Expense account? Well, so far here in Card Harbor, there's been little need for it. Meg McCarthy had given me a small room above a restaurant and provided all the food I could eat. My own two feet were the only means of transportation. The only shops were along the waterfront. They were suppliers to the boats tied up at the various docks. And a motley lot of boats they were. Some were big schooners dating back to the last century and still carrying sail. There were power boats of all shapes and sorts and sizes, from 18-footers with one-lung gasoline engines to big 60- and 70-foot diesel jobs. Trouble of the sort I'd come to investigate seemed out of place in this otherwise peaceful little village. Come in, Mr. Dollar. So, you've suffered a change of heart, obviously, and you've decided to cooperate. Yeah, that's about the best way to put it, I guess. See, it's this way. Wait, wait, before we go any further. What was this bit about picking me up after I got socked on the head a while ago? Listen, Mr. Dollar, after you left here this afternoon, I got to thinking. Maybe I was wrong in giving you the back of my hand, and maybe you was right in walking out mad like you did. Well, how would you feel? The insurance company back in Hartford gets word from Meg McCarthy that somebody's threatening to burn up that joint on the waterfront she calls a restaurant. It's insured for $15,000, and she's insured for twenty five. I know, I know. Well, you see, it's this way... And when I get here, I learn that somebody has already tried a couple of times to set fire to the place. All right, all right. I learned a long time ago that in a case like this, it's smart to enlist the help of the local authorities. Here in Cod Harbor, those authorities all seem to boil down to you. Why, I will never know. Yeah, like I told you. But now listen... And what do I get from you? The cold shoulder, the back of your hand, as you put it. I, I, I got to explain to you, Mr. Dollar. Well, then go ahead and explain. And believe me, brother, it better be good. Well, there, there probably ain't another village like this in the whole country, see? Technically, oh, we're supposed to be part of Barnesboro, a few miles inland. But we've always left them alone, and they've always left us alone. Any trouble happens, we settle it amongst ourselves. And because we're such a small place, uh, it's get along with everybody or get out, see? So we just don't have no trouble. Um, not of any account, that is. Unless it's somebody comes in from outside and makes it for us. You understand, Mr. Dollar? Are you forgetting it was one of your own townspeople who asked me to come here and for her own protection? That's what I got to thinking about after you left. So I decided maybe I'd better talk to you. And, well, that's how I happened to go over to Meg's place tonight. Was that you I saw in the shadows out by the front door? Yes, sir. I, I was waiting for Captain Billy Morgan and his crew to finish cleaning up the place for Meg. And I was going to go in and talk to you. And that's the truth, Mr. Dollar. Come on. Well, I just got there when I heard a noise out at the side of the cafe like a fight. Of course, it was dark. There was no fight. Somebody came out the side door from behind me and knocked me on the head. Yeah. So I took you up and put you on your bed and gave you time to get your senses back and then telephoned to you. Uh-huh. You sure it was you out at the front of the cafe? Oh, no, Mr. Dollar. You trying to implicate maybe it was me that give you a belaying pin over the head? Was that what hit me, Beasley? A belaying pin? Well, well, well something hit you, and I just... Okay, well, okay, I'll take your word it wasn't you, for the time being. I swear, Mr. Dollar, by all... All the... right, then, listen. Yeah? I heard that side door open just before I started seeing stars. Huh? Yeah? That means whoever struck me must have come from inside the cafe. Say. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The only people inside were Captain Morgan and the crew of his fishing boat. You sure? I'm sure, because I was in there myself just a minute before. Just Billy Morgan and his three men. Where was May? She'd gone up to bed. I just stepped outside for a breath of air. Oli? Huh? Oli Jensen, first mate. Yeah, I heard Captain Billy call one of them Oli. Last well, name's Jensen, huh? And then there's Charlie. Charlie Button's a deckhand and Montgomery the engineer. Well? No, no, not one of them could have done it. Isn't that like saying I didn't get hit? One of them must have done it. No, sir, Mr. Dollar, it just couldn't make any sense. All right, tell me this. Are any of them related to the guys who run the other cafes along the wharf? No, no. But you are, aren't you, Beasley? Huh? To Clem Harris at the silver plate, or is it the greasy plate? Anyway, he's your cousin, isn't he? Oh, I told you that. But if you think he had anything... Uh, right now, I don't know what I think. Well, let me tell you this. If you have suffered this big change of heart, it's about time you started proving it. I, I'll do anything you say, Mr. Dollar. All right. 
Meg seems to think the threats and attempts to burn down her place came from her competitors. Well, I know she does, but she's... Now, in a couple of hours, I'm taking off at the fishing banks with Captain Morgan and his crew. Maybe I'll be able to spot which of his men laid me out in the alley. If it was one of them. Meantime, you see if you can dig up anything that would put a finger at the other cafe owners. That means Ernie at the manor house, Tony who runs Irving's chop suey joint, and your cousin, Clem Harris. Okay, Mr. Dollar. I'll do it. Hey, by the way... Did you ever check their handwriting against the letters Meg received? Well, no, I never quite got around to it. it... I don't think you ever got around to doing anything. <laughs> it's such an easy job. Well, do it. Get... get the letters from Meg and check them. Yes, sir. I'm going to try to get a couple of hours sleep before we take off on the Lily Ann. Yes, sir. The big lazy slob. The first time I met him, he'd actually boasted about his soft job. About how nicely he could live in the town without having to lift a finger. Oh, sure, the sudden change of heart may have been genuine, but I wouldn't have bet on it. And I still had no proof it wasn't he who slugged me. And one of Meg's rival eateries was run by his cousin. But then everything indicated that whoever struck me had come from inside her own cafe. So I decided it was more important than ever that I go on the next day's fishing trip. Back in my room on the second floor of Meg's palace, I fell asleep the minute my head hit the pillow. And I could have sworn it was only a second later that... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, who was it? What is it? Time to get up and out. What do you think it is? Huh? Uh, who else? Uh, You're going out with the boys. Just get them lazy bones of yours up out of that bed. Oh, uh, but it's still pitch dark. Are you decent? Well, whether you are or whether you ain't, time you was up. Here's the light for you. Oh, oh turn that thing off. Now, yeah. here's some coffee. Take a saucer or two. It'll choke you. It's that strong, but it'll wake... Johnny boy, what happened to you? Oh, just what it looks like. But your head... Somebody just got real friendly with a belaying pin right after you went to bed. They come up here and attacked it? No, no, it was outside, out by the side door. I'll kill whoever done that to you, Johnny boy, so help me, I'll find out who done that. I'll... Be sure you want to get up and go out to the banks. Maybe you... No, no, I'll be all right. And I think it's pretty important I go out with Captain Billy and his boys. Because I have a sneaking suspicion one of them may have done this. Why, them dirty, conniving... Oh, no, Johnny, you must be wrong. Oh? Why, don't you know, darling, that's the finest crew of men in all of Cod Harbor? I'm not so sure. But then you... You mean you think one of them could also be behind trying to burn me down? And maybe me with it? You can be mighty sure I'm going to try to find out. Oh. Oh, Johnny boy, I pray that you're thinking wrong. Anyhow, if you're going with them, well, up and out with you. By the time you're in your clothes, I'll have some grits on the table for you. Eggs and pork chops and donuts and jam. I met the crew of the Lily Ann at that breakfast. Breakfast? Considering the amount of food set before them and the way they piled into it, you'd think those four men hadn't eaten for a month. And I must confess, there was nothing about them that looked like cause for suspicion. First, it was Charlie, a tall, brown-eyed, husky young fellow, alert and pleasant with a sense of humor, and he was obviously liked by the others. I don't know, Mr. Dollar. I think you just got to dreaming about some nice, pretty gal, and when you reached out and tried to grab her, you fell out of bed, and that's the way you got banged up. (laughs) Montgomery, a bit older, the man who was responsible for the engines on the boat. Gray-haired, lean, wiry, with gnarled fingers that looked clumsy and somehow never made a clumsy move. Whose blue eyes looked straight at you when he spoke. Don't you believe it. And you can blow me down, Mr. Dollar, if that ain't the most dastardly thing I ever heard of here in Card Arbor. Now, you best stick close to us, that's your friends whilst you're here. I sir. Friends of Meg McCarthy, be friends of us. <laughs> then Ollie Jensen, first mate, the oldest member of the crew. Quiet, calm, and efficient. The soft-spoken one. It's not for me to inquire why you're here, what business you're about, Mr. Dollar, and I don't. But I'm certain it's for the good. And any help that we can give you, you're welcome, sir. And I say the devil with all this chitter and chatter when there's fish at sea for you to catch, you lazy lunkers. Get up from that table and get to work. By the time the sun's up, the fish will all be out of your reach. Within a few minutes, we cast off and the Lily Ann put to sea. Slowly, the lights of the little village disappeared aft. The moon had gone down and our only company out in the dark water was the twinkling stars and the occasional running lights from the other boats setting out for the fishing banks. Captain Billy Morgan stood at the wheel. 
Montgomery sat athwart the engine cover and occasionally made some slight adjustment or indicated a change of throttle to the captain. Young Charlie and Ole made ready the two small boats and trot lines. For today, we'd go for codfish in the deep that lay along the edge of Taylor Banks. I stood alone up in the bows, looking over the curling wash as it scattered the myriad microscopic beings and gave a soft phosphorescent glow to the water gliding past. And I wondered. I wondered why there had to be trouble in this world, where honest labor by honest men could do so much more. Honest men? No. Not even among this crew. One of them had to be the man who'd attacked me. Was probably the one who had threatened to burn Meg McCarthy out of business. So I'd better have at it. I'd better get back aft, talk with them, watch their every move, try somehow to trap one of them into saying something that would give them away. Or maybe, who knows, give all of them away. And above all, watch my step. There was a long way back to shore. And the darkness and the sound of the engines could all too easily cover up an untoward act by one of them. It did. Before I could lift my head, a powerful pair of arms had picked me up bodily and dropped me overside. In the brief moment that I remember, I felt the strong tug from the big propellers as the water closed over me, and a terrible blow against my side. Then nothing. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the motives for arson and murder begin to take definite shape in the form of a confession. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Lionel Champ in here, Mr. Dollar. Who? I'm surprised Meg McCarty didn't answer. I ordered her to keep you in bed there at her place until I could see you again. I am in bed. And I take it you're the doctor who bandaged me up this way, put on this splint. That's right. After I tangled with a propeller at Captain Morgan's fishing boat this morning. Yes, only it was yesterday. Huh? You were unconscious when the captain and his men brought you in. After treating you, I gave you sedation. Oh. Rest was the most important thing. How did you ever happen to fall off that boat? Fall? Doctor, I was pushed. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cod Harbor, Massachusetts. To the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston. Assignment, the Meg's Palace Matter. Report and expense account continued. As soon as I hung up on Dr. Champion, I again checked the splint on my right leg and confirmed the suspicion that I couldn't possibly walk on it. Then, a few minutes later, Meg McCarthy came into my room. She carried a tray filled with enough food to choke a horse. 
And while I piled into it, she brought me up to date. It's in Barnesboro the Dr. Champion has his office. And lucky it was for you he happened to be here in Cod Harbor on his weekly visit. Oh, you were a sorry-looking mess when the men brought you in. Yesterday, the doctor said. You've been out as cold as a codfish ever since. But I can tell by the looks that the rest has done a lot for you. How do you feel? No matter of fact, Meg, I feel pretty... Oh, well, pretty good. There, you see. You've got to take it easy, like the doctor said. Just lay there and rest and sleep and eat all the good food I bring you. Yeah, except and unless I get up and going on this case. You'll try that and I'll lash you to the bedpost. Doctor's orders is doctor's orders, so don't you try nothing different. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it's a miracle, praise be, that that propeller on the Lily Ann didn't cut you to ribbons. Captain Billy and his crew brought me back here, huh? Who else? Where are they now? Fishing out on the banks, of course. What did you expect? Don't you know they have to earn a living the same as me and you? And what about keeping up the payments on that seagoing bathtub? Precious little time they had for fishing yesterday after that fool trick you pulled falling off of her. Is that what they told you happened? Of course. What else? Meg, which of the men told you I'd fallen off the boat? Well, all of them. Only the first mate, young Charlie Montgomery, the engineer, and, of course, my willy by himself, Captain Morgan, to you. And they all told it the same way? What? Why not? Should they be after making up fairy tales? How did they tell it? You're sure that screw didn't hit you on the head, too? You lost your memory? How did they tell it, Meg? It's important. Well... Whilst they went about their chores, you were standing alone up in the bows. Then they heard you yell. Yeah. Despite of the darkness, they seen you splash in the phosphorescent wake. And there you were, being sucked under by the prop. That's all. And they all told it the same? Exactly the same. Even young Charlie Buttons kept saying it over and over. I saw it. I saw it all. Oh. Like, well, you know... Like he was still struck with the fear of what might have happened to you. I wonder. Well, stop wondering and get yourself some more sleep or the doctor will have me head. And if he does, I'll take it out on you. And believe me, Johnny boy, that will be a lot worse than the fool accident of yours ever was. Meg, listen to me. It was no accident. What? I was thrown overboard. Oh, Johnny boy, you're raving delirious out of your head. I was leaning over the rail, watching the water, and a powerful pair of arms belonging to somebody aboard that boat picked me up and tossed me over. Saints, who? Holy Jensen, young Charlie Buttons, Montgomery, or Captain Billy himself. You start raving, Johnny. You must have got hit on the head. And I'll bet my last buck that whoever did it is the same one who slugged me in the alley, the same one who's threatened to burn you out of this place. Oh, no, And the minute I get up out of this bed, I... Tell me something. Yes? Tim Beasley, your police chief and mayor and so on. Yes? Has he been up here to see you? That good for nothing, brother, sky to know. And what's more, if he shows his ugly face in my establishment, I'll toss him out on his beam ends. But why do you ask? Because I told him to get the threatening notes from you. Check them against the handwriting of several people here in Cod Harbor. Who? Like that sniveling cousin of his, Clem Harris, that runs the Silver Plate Cafe? Yeah, among others. Well, he ain't been here, and I won't have him here. I take it you and he don't get along. Of course we don't. Why? Because ever since his cousin Clem has been in business, Tim has threatened to close me up. For what reason? For breaking town ordinances on restaurants. The kind he enforces over to Barnesboro. Well, have you been breaking them? No more than no less than dear cousin Clem or Tony Fortin or Ernie Turner does after their harsh joints. But me, he always is picking on, and why? Because I get most of the business from the fishermen. So you want a suspect in this case, Johnny boy? You've named them for me, Meg. The other cafe owners. All right, so I'll give you one. Tim Beasley and Clem Harris working in cahoots. And if it wasn't one of them waylaid you in the alley... Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Neither of them could have been aboard the Lily Ann. Then you must have fell. Oh, Meg, when is the doctor coming to see me? Mm, he should be here by now. Well, if he doesn't come pretty soon, I'm getting up and going, orders or no orders. Johnny? Motives, suspects... Why, Meg McCarthy herself could have rigged this whole thing. Called me in as a cover-up while she burned up her place to collect 15000 insurance. Even her intended, Captain Billy Morgan, who'd collect her life insurance if she were to die in a fire. Tim Beasley, lazy slob of a general factotum in Cod Harbor, to put Meg's palace out of business on behalf of his cousin, Clem Harris. Or Clem himself. Or one of Captain Billy's crew, for some reason I hadn't yet fathomed. Half an hour later, Dr. Champion arrived, looked me over, and then went to work with a pair of bandage shears. So, now we'll take off that splint. Oh, but if something's broken, Doc... <laughs> Not a thing broken, Mr. Dollar. Just an old trick of mine. Huh? You needed absolute rest until I could see you again. And from what I've heard about you, 
You wouldn't have taken it unless I fooled you into it. And that was the sole reason for the splint. <laughs> Doc, you're a wonder. <laughs> there we are. And in view of your surprisingly good condition, I'd say you may be up and around as soon as you honestly feel able. Say, even tomorrow, perhaps. Item eight, ten dollars for medical services. All the Dr. Champion would accept. Needless to say, as soon as he left, I planned to get up and get to work. But as he walked out the door, Meg brought Captain Billy in to visit and sympathize. So, in hope of keeping him off guard, I played real sick. Then only a Montgomery came in, too. But I needed to get these men alone, and I must admit, be feeling better than I did. And then I realized that young Charlie hadn't come. I asked about him. Two pardons for old Johnny. He said as long as the doctor was keeping you in bed two or three days, he could see you when he gets back. But wait a minute. Uh, he went to pick up some supplies for Meg here like he always does. Uh, gives him a chance to drop in on his sister where he keeps his Sunday clothes and things. He wasn't out on the boat with you today? Nah, Meg spoils a lad that way. Always has him going in for supplies when I need him the uh, most. Look here now, Willie boy. You talk like I was the one picked today. Well, of for course him. you did. Of you course always do. I didn't. And don't you tell me. He said it was you. Yeah, you're off your course, Mr. Oh, McCarthy. I am. You know blasted well as you are. don't you shake your finger at me, you blue nose. Yeah, pipe down, down, woman. Do you want Mr. Down. Dollar to Good have a relapse? you. Oh, Johnny boy. I'm sorry. Shut up, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Maggie. And but tell me boy. That... I'm sorry if I seem to be raising my voice at you. Oh, bless you, Meg. It's that fiery spirit that keeps me loving you. Yeah, but now, uh... Why don't we leave the poor man alone to recover, huh? Come on, boys. Yes, come on, all of you. Out you go. After you, Meg. Oh, After my, you. how polite we are. Montgomery, wait. Oh, Mr. Donner, something I can do for you to ease your bed of pain. A little drink or something. Of a bottle aboard the Lily Ann. No, no, thanks. I want to talk to you about Charlie. A real fine lad he is. Now, I'm sure he'll be wanting to see you when he gets back from his visit in town. No, no, wait. Uh, Captain Morgan said he has a sister in Barnesboro. Do you know the address? Oh, that I do. <laughs> Many's a fine meal we've had from her on our time off. Well, I want to see her. You know, just a little personal thing. Oh, then, here, I'll write down the address for you. She lives in a pretty little house on the corner of Road. Mm -hmm. Maybe Montgomery was the wrong one to ask. I don't know. But I had to gamble somewhere along the line. And if my suspicions about Charlie Buttons was right, I hoped I wouldn't be too late. When Montgomery had left, I sneaked out the back door to avoid Meg and hurried over to Tim Beasley's office in the shack that functioned as Cod Harbor City Hall. He wasn't there. A woman who lived next door informed me he'd taken off in a hurry to Barnesboro. So Beasley had gone to town after Charlie. Or had he? For $25, that's item nine, I rented a creaky old truck and headed for Barnesboro. Charlie's sister's house was on a gravel road out on the edge of town. There was no other car there, so I stopped in front of the place. Got out and walked up to the front door. Sorry, mister, but my sister... Mr. Dollar. Hello, Charlie. Yeah, I... I meant to say, why did you come in, Sure glad to see you're all right, Mr. Dollar. I am. That sure was awful. You, you're falling off the boat that way. What's the matter, Charlie? Aren't you feeling good? Yeah, sure. Sure I am. You look a little pale. And say... Well, well. Packing up to leave, huh? Yeah, I... Well, I'm tired of the fishing business, Mr. Dollar. Gonna give it up. Go somewhere else during a living. Tired of it, yeah. Why did you do it, Charlie? Huh? I, I don't know what you mean. It took somebody who knew that boat pretty well to sneak up on me in the dark and push me overboard. It took a strong, young pair of arms to do it, too. Yours, weren't they? Well? I didn't want to do it, Mr. Dollar. So help me, I didn't want to. But he made me. Yeah? Who made you? He found out. He, he found out about me, about my record. What record? That... That I'd killed a man once, accidentally, when I was just a kid. And I'd run out and escape from the reformatory. 
But now I'm grown. If they ever catch me, they'll hang me or the electric chair up for life. And he knew that. Charlie. If I didn't do anything he said, like slugging you or trying to start the fires or anything, he'd give me away. So I had to, don't you see? I couldn't help myself. He made me do everything. Charlie, who, Charlie, who? It's all right. You don't need to rough me up, Dollar. I knew I'd get caught up with someday. I'll go quiet with you. And maybe, maybe you'll help to try and get things easy for me. Charlie, who made you try to kill me? Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you. It was so he could get you out of the way and burn up Meg's palace and her with it. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar, it was... Oh, no. Huh? There. At the window. Behind you. That old trick. Oh, no, you... Help! The boy fell against me, pinning me to the floor. And as I pushed him away, I saw the patch of red slowly spreading on the front of his shirt directly above the heart. By the time I got to the window, a car had taken off down the old gravel road and was completely obscured by a thick cloud of dust. And I wondered. I wondered for whom the shot that killed Charlie had really been intended. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a killer strikes again, but one of his victims rises from the grave to strike back. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Chief Walters, Barnesboro Police. You call me? Oh, yeah, Chief. I understand you're out at Sally Button's place on the edge of town. What can I do for you? Better get out of here, Chief, fast. Oh? Yeah, to pick up a body. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account... America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Card Harbor, Massachusetts, to the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston. Assignment, the Meg's Palace Matter. Report and expense account continued. Whoever shot young Charlie Buttons there at his sister's home in Barnesboro had disappeared down the gravel road in a cloud of dust. Hence the call to the police. Chief Walters was in his late 30s and definitely on the ball. He made a quick call to the coroner and then in his car we took off for Cod Harbor. We've pretty much left him alone over there in Cod Harbor, Mr. Dollar, and so far they've always managed to keep the peace. This time? Yeah. Now listen, Chief, and I'll give it to you fast. Yes, do that. Meg McCarthy got some threats to burn her place down, notified the insurance company they sent me out. Understandable. First night there, I spotted a prowler around the cafe. But before I could get to him, somebody slugged me from behind. You didn't know who? Not then, but the prowler turned out to be Tim Beasley, your, well, your deputy over there, I guess you'd call him. Uh, sort of, you know, self-appointed, lazy lot. But didn't he know who slugged you? He said not. 
was Meg herself there. She has a powerful right dollar. Yeah, I thought of that, too. But let me go on now. The next morning, I went out on the Lily Ann, got tossed overboard. And believe me, Chief, the propeller on one of those boats isn't much fun to tangle with. Yes, Dr. Champion told me he'd had to go over to fix you up. Yeah. Anyhow, I was sure that whoever was after me was a member of that crew. Had to be. I see. When I came to back at Meg's, I had visitors. The crew, loaded with sympathy. The crew, that is, except for Charlie Buttons. And that's why you traced him to his sister's house? Uh Uh-huh. And, Chief, he confessed. Then I don't understand. What? He said he was forced to do those things by somebody who knew of his criminal record and was holding it over his head. Criminal record? Charlie Buttons? Yeah, it seems he killed a man once when he was just a kid. The point is, this other person threatened to expose Charlie unless Charlie did his bidding. So Charlie, not being very bright, didn't think he had a chance. You find out who this other person is? No. That's when somebody shoved a gun through the window and back him. He shot him, then took off in the proverbial cloud of dust. Hmm. How are you doing on suspects? Oh, brother, too many. Meg, of course, named her rivals in the cafe business right from the beginning. Well, I wouldn't count them very good suspects. Uh, and there's Captain Billy Morgan, her intended husband. <laughs> what a pair. And if I know Captain Billy, he was just scrounging a lot of free meals. Say, incidentally, I saw him in Barnesburg just before you called. Yeah. Uh, well, Captain Billy is beneficiary of Meg's life policy. And he still owes a lot of dough on the Lily Ann, I understand. Hmm. Who else? Tim Beasley. What? Yeah. No. Good dollar. I know he's a good-for-nothing bum who's taken that job of acting mayor, acting police chief, acting everything else so he can live off the fat of the land over there. But... Did you also know that Clem Harris, who runs the other big cafe, is his cousin? His cousin, huh? Oh, and Beasley never kept his promise to dig up the threatening notes Meg received and compare them with the handwriting of the others. Doesn't look good, does it? What do you think, Chief? I'm beginning to wonder if Tim Beasley will be there when we get to Cod Harbor. As it turned out, Tim Beasley was very much in evidence. So was the whole population of Cod Harbor. For as the lights of the little fishing village slowly hove into view, I saw another light down by the waterfront, or rather a big reddish glow. And as we pulled in closer, we could see the long tongues of flame leaping upward that caused it. Yep, Meg's palace was on fire. Chief Walters stepped on it. We took the last few turns on two wheels. Hoses of all sorts and shapes and sizes connected to pumps aboard the nearby fishing boats were throwing powerful streams of water at Meg's palace. At the back, where the fire had apparently started. But the flames continued to spread, even licking along the ground behind the building. That means arson, Johnny. Oil and gasoline spreading around back there. No doubt of it, Chief. How'd it start, Captain Billy? Who knows? But grab a hose and get to work. Get some hose off one of them boats. Don't go real crazy. Captain Billy Morgan was running the show, and every one of my prize suspects was in there working his head off. All of them taking orders from Captain Billy. And then I realized that Mike McCarthy was nowhere around, and I noticed something else. All the firefighting was directed toward the back of the building. The front, thanks to the wind, was untouched. But that's where Mick McCarthy's room was. Chief! Chief Wallace! Hey, Johnny, where are you going? Come on, Chief, give me a hand. What? See that window up there? Well, I'm going to climb up on the front roof of the place. You'll burn to a crisp up there. Got to take that chance, because I think I can blow this whole case wide open. Now, clench your hands so I can step on them and hoist me up. But even right here, the heat is Come too on, much. man, quick, come on. Okay, Johnny, but I think you're crazy. Here you are. Now, up. Here you go. The heat was almost unbearable up in that roof. I knew I had to do it. I crawled low along the shingles, hoping the rotten old roof would hold. A withering blast that felt like fire itself hit me full in the face as I broke the window of Meg's room. And there she lay, stretched out, unconscious on her bed. There was an ugly livid mark across her forehead where somebody had struck her down and then left her there at the mercy of the fire. Johnny! Valerie, all right! The searing heat seemed to press in on me, engulf me. And the open window gave a draft to the flames that were already licking at the sides of the open door. Somehow I managed to wrap a blanket around Meg, covering her face and stagger to the window, blindly, groping for it. Johnny! This way, the window! Keep that hose on us here! All right, Johnny. You're all right now, I got you. It's all right, boy. All right. It's all right, Johnny boy. 
I tried of having your hair singed and there's no suit of clothes. You're all okay. Well, thank goodness you are, Maggie. But tell me... Ooh. Oh, now take it easy. You've got a bad burn on that left arm and you've got to lie still. Yeah, And would Maggie... you believe it, it was Clem Harris, the one I always thought was such an old good blather skite that gave us each a place to stay here at this house. I wondered where I was when I came to a few minutes ago. I guess I misjudged the man. But how about you, Maggie? Oh, bless you, darling. You saved me life, and I'll never forget it. May the good Lord strike me down. If it hadn't have been for you. Oh, think of it, Johnny. Boy, I'd be laying still in that pile of ashes out there that was once to me a nice cafe. I love you, Johnny, boy, and I'm humble and I'm grateful. Maggie, that mark on your head. Oh, that dirty, blathering spalpeen who snuck up in my room and knocked me down and left me there. I'll murderize him when I find him, that dirty cunner. You don't know who it was? How could I when he snuck up from behind me? Oh, Chief Ward, just come in, sir, come in. Well, I must say, you two look pretty good, considering. Ready for a visitor, Johnny? Yeah, hi, Chief. Bring him in. Oh, now, Johnny, are you sure you want visitors until you're feeling better? Bring him in, boys. Right in here. Come on. Uh, Come on, Gilly. Why, Billy, boy. What's the matter with you, Willie? That look on your face. Oh, and you, Chief Waters. What was the idea of locking up my Willie boy like some dirty scoundrel of a crook when he tried so hard to save my cafe from that awful fire? Who do you think you are? All right, Meg, simmer down. Don't you talk to me like that, you young whisker snap. Yes, darling. Well, I won't simmer down. What was the big idea arresting me that way? Who do you think you are around here? And I'm talking to you, Dollar. You went too far, Captain Billy. I went too far. You're off your course. What are you talking about? Yes, Johnny boy. If you was responsible... Quiet, Meg. Uh, Yes, sir. I'm talking about arson, Captain Billy. And murder. And the motives behind them. What? Motives. They were all over the place by half a dozen people. But yours was the strongest. By far. You're off your head. The 25,000 insurance on Meg's life. That was the Why, you... Let me out of... No, just a minute. You take oh, your hand off Take it easy, head. Meg, or I'll have to order you out. But listen to what he's saying. Is that Captain Billy was... Quiet, quiet. Yeah, let me finish this, will you, Meg? Played lover boy to her, didn't you, Captain Billy? To make sure you'd be her beneficiary. You're crazy. That's You're dirty. Enough. It looked like you right from the first, but I couldn't be sure until I compared the writing on the threatening letters with some of your handwriting I found. Oh, no. So that's the way you found out, you dirty underhanded. Yeah, Captain, that's right. Threatening letters. To make it look like somebody else was out to get her. Her competitors, for instance. And to leave the way clear for you. Willie Bo. No, no, I didn't. I, I mean, I didn't mean to. Oh, but... no, Willie. Tell me it ain't true. Don't touch me. Oh. Why, Billy? Why'd you do it? I had to. I had to have the money or I'd lose my... What? Pocket. You mean your boat was more to you Go than... Go on, Billy, and quiet, Meg. Fishing. Fishing was my whole life. I had to save my boat. I had to get the money for it. How else could you I ever... You rotten... No, 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 I don't know, Johnny boy. Maybe I'll move to someplace else and open up. I wouldn't have the heart to here. Cod Harbor, it'd be too. It was here that I met him and I believed him. And Well, I guess this old heart of mine wasn't as tough as I thought it was. Yeah. I'm sorry, Meg. I'll get over it. Sure I will. Meg McCarthy, Johnny Dollar. No blather and idiot of a man is going to keep Meg McCarthy down. That's the You story. hear me? No man on this whole earth is worth it. Then all of them just a bunch of no good too tight. Oh, no. No, Johnny boy, not you. If only there was more of the likes of you in the world. I love you, Johnny boy. And if I were a bit younger and maybe pretty... Johnny. Yeah? Now tell me, who did you ever get the threat letters you compared the writing of? I'd have swore that I destroyed them, every one. <laughs> know something, Meg? I didn't. Huh? I never saw them. Never saw a sample of Captain Billy Morgan's writing either. You mean you... Oh, no. Huh? Well, it worked, didn't it? Aye. And it serves that conniving murder and blather scorching... Ah, there, 
देना मैं ओ जॉनी आई एम अफ्रेड आई रियली डिड लव हिम Yeah, it had been a long shot, and thank goodness it had paid off. The courts will take care of Captain Billy. The insurance on her place, of course, will have to be paid to Bank McCarthy, but no life insurance, thank heaven. <laughs> oh, poor Meg! It'll be a long, long time before she'll fall for sweet talk again. Expense account totaled, including fare and incidentals, back to Hartford, two twenty-one sixty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, well, they say that diamonds are a girl's best friend, but I wonder when they're a motive for murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jack Crucian, Byron Kane, Forrest Lewis, Bert Holland, Stan Jones, Bob Bruce, Austin Green, and Harry Bartell. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fortina. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Johnny Dollar. Tom Wilkins at Global Casualty, Johnny. Oh, hi, Tom. How are you doing? Lousy. Right now, I've got one big headache, a hundred thousand dollar headache. Try an ice bag and go back to bed. A bag of ice would cure me, all right, but not the kind of ice you're thinking of. Hmm. A hundred thousand bucks worth of uncut diamonds, Johnny. They've been stolen, and we wrote the policy on them. Hundred thousand. That's a fat lot of rocks, Tom. And a fat fee if you can recover them for us. You interested? Oh, that's the understatement of the week. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Global Casualty, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the picture postcard matter. Expense account item one: a dollar and a quarter taxi to the office of Global Casualty, where Tom Wilkins was waiting for me. Well, looks like we're bucking a pretty well organized outfit in this deal, Johnny. The way they pulled the job shows they'd planned it out pretty well. How did it happen, Tom, and where? The diamonds were being taken by special courier from Zurich, Switzerland, to Amsterdam. They got lifted at the Zurich airport. How? The airport was crowded. The courier was carrying the diamonds in a leather briefcase strapped to his wrist. A fight broke out suddenly. In the confusion, the courier was slugged and the case cut loose from him. After which the fight suddenly stopped, huh? Yeah. It was obviously a rigged brawl. By the time the police arrived, the people involved had disappeared. With the uncut diamonds, mm-hmm. sounds like their timing was pretty good. Too good. How about the courier? You get a look at the guy who slugged him? No, it happened from behind. Anybody in the airport crowd able to describe the guys who'd rigged the brawl? Well, no clear description. Somebody mentioned that one of the men involved was stocky, sort of a bull neck. Oh, great. Probably only a couple of million people answering that description. True. Zurich police turn up anything? Not a thing. 
Well, look, Tom, I'm an insurance investigator, not a magician. You better get yourself another boy. Whoa, Johnny. We got one lead, and it could be enough if it's on the level. Oh, well, let's have it. The robbery was day before yesterday. This morning, I got an airmail special delivery letter from Zurich. Here, take a look. Uh Uh-huh. Regarding the recent diamond matter, I have information which may enable you to recover them. For a reward. So I see. And he wants to talk to somebody about it. Yeah. And I nominate you. It's signed Sebastian. Any idea who he is? None at all. As you see, I was to reply to general delivery in Zurich. I did. Told him you were the one. Uh Uh-huh. How do I find him? Well, read on. You're to register at the Polo Hotel in Zurich. He or she will contact you there. You think it's on the level? I don't know. Could be a phony, somebody trying to ace in and promote a fast buck. It's happened before. Sure, and this could be another one. But right now, it's the only lead we've got. We've got to take a chance and go along with it. I can't say I care for the postscript here. Extreme caution necessary. Leads me to think there's one thing you'd better be real sure about, Johnny. What's that? That you don't get contacted by the wrong guy. And so, with the sun sinking slowly in the west and my morale slowly following suit, I said goodbye to my cheerful friend and set sail for distant shores. Item two, $622, plane fare and incidentals to Zurich, Switzerland. It was a quiet, uneventful flight, and I had a lot of time to think. But I didn't much like what I was thinking. Whoever had lifted the uncut stones wouldn't exactly like the idea of an informant spilling the beans to me... And I had a slight hunch I'd be lucky if beans were the only thing that got spilled. My plane landed at Zurich in the late afternoon. I hired a cab, that's item three, one dollar, to take me to the Polo Hotel. The city looked bright, fresh, and clean. It gave me a lift. And the sight of a very pretty girl walking quickly to my cab as we were ready to pull away from the airport didn't hurt either. Oh, darling, I... Well, oh. hello. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I've made a mistake. Darn it. I thought you but were... I was somebody else. Yeah, that's the trouble with having an ordinary-looking face. Well, I wouldn't call it ordinary. But, but please... Well? Please, I, I wonder, could I share your cab into the city? Oh, by all means. I guess my friend was not on that plane after all. Oh, that's rough. Okay, driver. Oh, is very good of you. Well, I'm a real prince when you get to know me, Miss... Schaefer. Ilsa Schaefer. Johnny Dollar. And speaking of getting to know me... Driver, please, pull up. Well, hey, how come? Oh, I am so sorry, Mr. Dollar. I just remembered something I have to do. We were just beginning to get acquainted. I know. A pity, isn't it? Well, look, wait, don't... But perhaps this will make up for it. Well, offhand, I can't think of a better start. Now, if you'll only... Goodbye. Hey, Ilsa, wait. Hmm. Well, if this is the customary Swiss hospitality driver, sign me up. Then I realized that Ilsa had forgotten her purse. I had the driver cruise around a few minutes, but we didn't see her anywhere. So I dropped her purse off at the lost and found office of the taxi cab company, then went on to the Polo Hotel. It was in the newer quarter of Zurich, on the lower slopes of the Zurichburg. I went inside and started for the desk in the lobby, but I didn't quite make it. Turn here, please. Sorry, I'm heading for the desk. I said turn here, please. You know, I can't say I care for the way you keep nudging me in the ribs. That wouldn't be a gun, would it? Yes, it would. Now, if you will, please come with me. Okay, mister. Where to? To the side entrance. I'll say one thing. I sure didn't expect all the reception committees. The first one I like much better. Huh? Skip it, will you? Outside. That car over there. Hey, look, isn't it about time you tell me what this is all about? There's no use pretending you do not know. The diamonds. Oh. You think I've got them, maybe? I do not think. I'm sure of it. Well, this may come as a nasty surprise to you, mister, but I... I have no time to waste. She entered your cab with a purse. She? And... Ilsa? And left without it. And she was, uh, shall we say, very friendly to you. Oh, that I remember. And I have no complaints, believe me, but she didn't give me any diamonds. I warn you. They weren't in her purse, either. They checked the contents at Lost and Found. Get into the car. Hey, look, this routine won't get you anywhere. Into the car. Hey, take it easy, friend. You're trying to poke a hole in my ribs. Okay, okay. Well, I take it. Into the car. I jerked the door open suddenly and knocked him off balance. I swung at him, but he ducked and lunged at me. I went sprawling into the street in front of an oncoming car. The fenders hit me a glancing blow and I bounced against the curb. 
By the time I could get to my feet again, my friend with a gun had disappeared, and so had his car. I wasn't hurt, but it took several minutes to convince the very scared cab driver who'd accidentally hit me. He should be scared. Expense account item four, twelve dollars and seventy-five cents. Telephone call to Tom Wilkins at Global Casualty Bank in the States. I'm glad you called, Johnny. Uh, any luck so far? No luck, but sure a lot of action. Well, what do you mean? Well, first off, an attractive little doll shares my cab for a few blocks, plants a kiss on me, and scrambles out, leaving her purse behind. What? Then a strong arm collars me and tells me the girl must have passed the diamonds to me in the cab. Oh, but that doesn't make sense. Well, anyway, that's what happened so far. Plus, my almost getting run over in the process. Look, Johnny, I knew this wouldn't be an easy assignment, but... Uh... Yeah, I know. Yeah. Don't worry, Tom. I'm still all in one piece. But I'm beginning to realize what Sebastian meant in his letter about extreme caution being necessary. Has anyone contacted you yet? No, only the aforementioned pair. No sign of this Sebastian, whoever he or she is. Well, I still don't understand Neither why... Neither do I. Either the boys who stole the diamonds have lost them, or there's another outfit trying to get their hands on them. In which case, I'm right in the middle. Johnny, Sebastian's still our only lead. You've got to give him plenty of chance to contact you. Yeah, I know. we Will do. But be careful. Look, I'm with you, believe me. I went up to my room and stretched out on the bed to wait. Two hours went by. Nothing happened. Finally, I went down to the lobby. Expense account item five, thirty cents, two English language newspapers. I settled down in the most conspicuous chair I could find and waited some more. Still nothing. I worked my way through the newspaper slowly. Then, finally, somebody came over to the chair that was back to back with mine. I took a quick look. He was well dressed, dark wavy hair, medium height. But he paid no attention to me and started reading his newspaper. Looked like a wrong guess. Maybe I'd have to wait until tomorrow. So I started to get up. Mr. Dollar. Mm, what? Please, put your newspaper in front of your face and do not turn around. Okay. Who are you? Sebastian, who wrote the letter to your company in the United States. Oh? It must not appear we are talking to each other. Somebody watching us? I would not doubt it. So you want to talk about the robbery of those uncut diamonds? How do I know you have any real information? I will give you proof presently. But first, let us talk about the reward. What is the amount? Depends on how good the information is, Sebastian. I am talking about the diamonds. Oh? Suppose I were to tell you that I was in a position to guarantee their return. Go on. For $25,000 and no further investigation... I will arrange for the return of the diamonds. I'd have to have proof that you know what you're talking about. Of course. Let me see. My back is to you. Is it your right hand which is closest to the wall and shielded from the lobby? Yeah. Put it down beside your chair. Do not take the newspaper away from your face. Okay. Here. Picture postcard. Yes. Addressed to me, as you see. The writing's in German. What does it mean? It is the equivalent of your American expression, having wonderful time, wish you were here. Signed by F. Gruner. Who's he or she? A friend. Look at the picture on the other side. The Kleibach Inn? Yes. An inn in the town of Kleibach in the Alps, several hours from here. Hey, wait a minute. Are the diamonds at the Kleibach Inn? No. But this postcard is part of the key to their location. Part of the key? Oh, now, look, Sebastian, this just isn't good enough. Shh, I can't... Shh. Someone is coming. I cannot talk further with you here. It is not safe. Oh, look, Do not you. worry. I will furnish all the proof you need. When? Tonight. Now, listen carefully. I am going. I will leave my newspaper on the floor beside my chair. Wait a few minutes, then get up. Drop your paper, and when you pick it up, pick up mine also. Then what? On an inner page of my paper, I have written my address. Come there in two hours. If I am not there, wait for me. Now, just a minute. How can I... Please. There is no time for further questions. Two hours, Mr. Dollar. In my room. Two hours later, I went to the address he'd given me. A small apartment in another part of the city. answer. He hadn't arrived yet. I went inside and waited. 
Fifteen minutes went by. No sign of Sebastian. And then something started pecking away at my brain, a faint sound. I finally pegged it, a dripping faucet. It came from the bathroom. The bathtub was full. In it, floating face down, was Sebastian. Now here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a perfect stranger wants to get acquainted and a beautiful girl asks me to go skiing. Trouble is, either or both of them could be trying to kill me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Inspector Herniger of the Zurich Police, Herr Dollar. Oh, yeah, Inspector. I talked to one of your men last night. Yeah, when you report the murder of this man called Sebastian. Yeah, any line on this killer? Not as yet. We are somewhat at a loss as to motive. That I think I can supply. So? Sebastian apparently had information about the robbery of some uncut diamonds here in Zurich. So? Yeah, and he was willing to sell his information. But somebody called off the sale permanently. So find the man who lifted the stones and we'll have Sebastian's killer. Perhaps. You don't sound convinced. It appears quite possible, Herr Dollar, that Sebastian was killed by a woman. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Global Casualty, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the picture postcard matter. Location, Zurich, Switzerland. Expense account continued. Item six, one dollar even, cab fare from the Polo Hotel to police headquarters. Inspector Herniger was a big man who moved and talked slowly. But one look at his very cold, slate-gray eyes told you his brain was moving a lot faster. Herr Dollar, I believe you told my lieutenant last evening that you were an insurance investigator? That's right, Inspector. And that you are in Zurich to investigate loss of a hundred thousand American dollars in diamonds at the airport a few days ago. Right. Well, uh... Perhaps you had better supply me with such background as you may have. Gladly. The robbery itself, of course, you know about. A fight broke out at the airport. We know that it was, as you say, rigged to create confusion. Yeah, and in the confusion, the courier who was carrying the stones was slugged. His briefcase was cut away from his wrist. Whereupon the assailants quickly melted away into the crowd. The exactness of their timing suggests that they were well organized and had planned a robbery in some detail. The next day, the company I'm representing got a letter from this man, Sebastian. He claimed to have information on the robbery and would help us recover the stones for a price. And you were sent to contact this Sebastian? Yeah. Or rather, I was sent here so that Sebastian could contact me. And did he? He did. 
But as it turned out, he practically had to stand in line. I am afraid I do not follow you. Well, first off, a very attractive young lady popped into my cab as I was leaving the airport for the hotel. I asked to share the cab. Oh? Two blocks later, she had the driver stop, planted a kiss on me, and jumped out. Indeed. You Americans seem to work fast, Herr Dollar. Yeah, I'm afraid I can't chalk up the incident to my personal charm, Inspector. She left her purse in the cab, and I gather the idea was to make somebody else think she'd pass the diamonds to me. And who would this somebody else be? A guy who jumped me in the lobby of the Polar Hotel. He was pretty convinced I had the stones. Mm. And how would the dead man Sebastian fit in? Well, it's my hunch. Sebastian was a member of the outfit who stole them in the first place. He could have been trying to play both ends against the middle. How do you arrive at that conclusion? Well, look, we know there were several members of the group... Okay, so they're bound to take a big loss when they fence the diamonds. They'd be lucky to get half the value, which would be 50000 True. Split three or four ways, that would cut the shares down considerably. But if Sebastian could engineer the return of the stones and collect a $25,000 reward for it, he'd be way ahead of the game. And Sebastian was secretly negotiating with you. Yeah, behind a newspaper in the hotel lobby. He wanted me to meet him in his room later so he could talk. I went there. I found him in the bathtub dead. And he had given you no specific information as to the location of the diamonds. Only this, Inspector. A picture postcard? Uh Uh-huh. The Kleibach Inn. He told me Kleibach was a small resort village up in the Alps. I know the place. Uh, The card is addressed to Sebastian and signed by F. Gruner. He said Gruner was a friend of his. Perhaps the diamonds are at the Kleibach Inn. He said no, that this card was only part of the key to finding them. And he gave you no indication as to what the rest of the key to their location was? No, no, none at all. I gather that's what we were going to talk about in his room later. But somebody else apparently had different ideas. Yeah. Say, look, you you said over the phone that Sebastian's killer could have been a woman. Well, he was struck on the head from behind, but only hard enough to stun him. His death was due to drowning in the bathtub. Many times in our experience, women have chosen such a method. A woman, then, could be Ilsa. Yeah. Or perhaps one of Sebastian's gang who learned of his plans. Very annoying, Herr Dollar. Many possibilities. But nothing tangible. Well, I'm heading for that place on the postcard, Inspector. The Kleibach Inn? Yeah. At this point, part of a key is better than none. Expense account item seven, sixteen dollars and twenty cents American. Transportation and incidentals to the Kleibach Inn. The postcard didn't do justice to the place. The village nestled in a little meadow below some towering peaks. Oh, above it was the inn, a chalet type building that looked out over the valley. And it was a peaceful scene. A few cows in the meadow with jangling bells, a lot of snow on the peaks. A sky of startlingly clear blue and a few wisps of clouds nudging the peaks. Inside, the inn looked spacious and comfortable, with a friendly fire crackling in the huge fireplace, and a friendly-looking fellow behind the desk. Welcome to the Kleibach Inn. Well, thanks. Uh, please sign here. Okay. Thank you, Herr Dollar, is it? Yeah. You the manager? Yeah, I am Otto Friedrich, your host. Well, maybe you could help me, Otto. I am at your service. All right. Take a look at this postcard. Oh, what's the matter? That is not the good picture of the inn. I had some new ones made. You see, the lighting is wrong in this picture. The entire north wing is in the shadows. Now, in the good picture... Yeah, the... yeah, well, what I want to know is, uh, do you sell these cards here? Not those cards, no. I have the new cards. See, here is one. Now, see how much better... Well, how about in the village? Do they sell the old cards there? <sighs> yeah, I'm afraid so, in one or two shops. I have told them a hundred times I will give them the new ones if only yeah. they will. You see, it's... Yes, a... it's the lighting. You ever hear the name Sebastian around here? Sebastian. Sebastian, Sebastian. No need to memorize it. Just tell me if you've heard it, please. Is it a first name or a last name? There you've got me. Sebastian. No, I do not remember hearing that name. I'll be glad to check my register well, for how, uh, how about F. Gruner? He's the one who sent the car to Sebastian. Gruner. 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 Perhaps I heard the name in the village somewhere. Oh, I will see what I can find out. Okay, thanks. In the meantime, I hope you'll be comfortable here and enjoy your visit. Ski equipment is at your disposal. Thanks. But I'll enjoy my visit a lot more if I can find F. Gruner. Oh, 
Okay, okay, coming. Yeah? Oh, I say, I, I'm looking for a chap named Dollar who's supposed to be occupying this room. I'm Johnny Dollar. You? Are you certain? Reasonably, what? Oh, what a pity. Well, I'm sorry, old man, but there's not very much I can do about it. Oh, I, I didn't mean that. I, I, I say, you must forgive me. Must I? Well, I mean, well, you see, I used to know a chap in London named Dollar. Delightful fellow, really. Uh, incidentally, I'm Geoffrey Harris. Oh, we had ripping times together. How jolly for you. Yeah, and when I heard that a chap named Dollar had registered here at the inn, well, naturally, I thought it must be old Bunny. Bunny? Yes, old Bunny Dollar. Oh, Bunny was just a dick nickname, you see. Well, that's reassuring, Harris. You know, there is a bit of a resemblance... You wouldn't mind a chance to be his brother or cousin, would you? No, no. Well, after all, Dollar's a bit of an odd name, and I... No, I'm to... sorry. If you'll excuse me, I'm on my way downstairs. Oh, splendid. Well, so am I. Oh? <laughs> it's quite a coincidence, is it? Is it? Well, running to you in this way, I mean, uh, you're absolutely sure that you, you don't know Bunny Dollar? This, I can guarantee. Oh, what a pity. He's really worlds of fun. Oh, yes, I can imagine. Well, what do you know? Uh, what's that? Hmm? Oh, uh, nothing. I, I just spotted an old friend over at the bar. Uh, see you later, Harris. Oh, I see. So I can see your point, old man. Well, hello, Ilsa. Uh, oh. It is Ilsa Schaefer, isn't it? Why, you're the yeah, one. that's right. Johnny Dollar, the one you shared a cab with back in Surrey. Oh, yes, of course. What a coincidence. Isn't it? Incidentally, Johnny, I want to thank you for turning my purse in. It was foolish of me to leave it in your cab. Just an oversight, huh? Well, yes, of course. I mean, you didn't by any chance leave it in the cab on purpose, huh? Well, of course not. Why would I do a thing like that? Oh, maybe so somebody else would think you passed something along to me in that cab, besides a kiss. Oh, that kiss. I suppose I shouldn't have been so impulsive. Oh, I didn't object to that. But I did object to a muscle man jumping me and acting like you had given me something. Oh? What was I supposed to have given you? You don't have any idea? No. Honestly, I don't. Okay. We'll let that ride for the time being. Mind if I ask what you're doing here at the club again? Oh, this is a favorite spot of mine. I like to ski. Oh? You don't seem convinced. I really am quite a good skier, Johnny. Are you? As a matter of fact, I plan to go skiing in the morning. Would you like to come with me? Well, now, that might be pretty interesting. Uh, just a minute. I'll go check with Otto, see if I can borrow some skis. Be right back. All right, Johnny. Ah, Herr Dollar. And how are you enjoying your stay so far? Just fine, Otto, fine. Now, look, about that girl over at the bar. Fräulein Schiefer. A most attractive young lady, no? A most attractive young lady, yes. Um, this seems to be a favorite spot of hers. I'm very happy to hear that, Herr Dollar. I suppose she comes here often, huh? This is her first visit to the Kleibach Inn. You're sure about that? Of course. I would certainly remember a young lady like her. Yes, this is her first visit, but I hope it will not be her last. Don't count on it, Otto. So Elsa was lying about coming here often. That could mean she'd lied about a few other things, too, like leaving her purse in my cab accidentally. She might have been trying to make it look like she'd passed the stolen diamonds onto me and thus take the heat off herself and whoever she was working with. I remembered what Inspector Honiger had told me, that Sebastian's killer could be a woman. I went back to the bar. Did you arrange for the skis? Yeah, yeah, I guess I'm all set. Good. Tomorrow morning, then. All right, where? Well, I had in mind the North Slope, but uh, perhaps you would not like that. Why not? Some people consider it too dangerous. Oh, I don't think I should worry about the danger, do you? Mm -hmm. After all, Elsa, I'll be in the best of hands. Thank you. I'm sure you'll take good care of me. I will certainly try to, Johnny. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, skiing's a strenuous sport, so is hunting. Put them together, and it's liable to kill you. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours 
Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Arthur, the innkeeper. I have a telephone call for you from Police Inspector Honegger in Zurich. I will put him on. Go ahead. Hi, Inspector. Any line on Sebastian's killer? Uh, Not yet, Herr Dollar. That also means no line on the stolen diamonds, huh? I do not know. You recall the picture postcard Sebastian gave you before his death? The picture of the Kleibach Inn? Sure. He said it was part of a key to the location of the diamonds. That's why I came up here to the inn. But I haven't found any sign of them. We have been watching Sebastian's apartment. This morning, the second part of the key arrived in his mailbox. Another postcard? Yes. I am sending it on to you. See what you can make of it. Looks like we're in the middle of a game of some kind. Have you been able to locate the missing murder suspect, Ilse Schaefer? I've not only located her, in five minutes I'm going skiing with her. What? Herr Dollar, do you think that is wise for you? It's one way of finding out if she ties in. I just hope it doesn't turn out to be the hard way. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Global Casualty in Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the picture postcard matter. Location, Clybox, Switzerland. Expense account continued. <music> Item 7, $3 American, rental on ski equipment. Ilsa Schaefer told me she'd come to Clybox to go skiing, and I wanted to make sure that was her reason. There'd been too many coincidences about her to suit me, First, the way she'd popped into my cab in Zurich, then popped out two blocks later, leaving her purse behind. Right after that, I'd been jumped by a strong arm who was sure Ilsa had passed the stolen diamonds to me. And now she turns up suddenly at the Kleibach Inn. I spotted her waiting for me at the ski lift. Come on, Johnny, you're late. In her skiing outfit, she could have passed for Miss Switzerland. But one nasty little thought kept coming into my brain, kept marring the picture. She could also be Sebastian's killer. We rode the lift up to the top and took off along the ridges. She skied like she was born to it. Easy, smooth, and graceful. It had been four years since I'd last been on skis, and as I struggled to keep up with her, I must have looked like a rusty snowplow. We worked our way out on the crest of one of the ridges. Let's stop here a moment. Well, that suits me fine. You winded? This is not exactly sea level. You'll get used to it. You see, I really can ski, Johnny. Oh, that's an understatement. Do you have a cigarette? Yeah, sure. Here. Thanks. Isn't it beautiful up here, Johnny? Yeah. You see that little dot way down there? That is the inn. A long way down. That's what I like about skiing. Everything is so remote, so far below. When you're up here... All that down there, it it just doesn't exist anymore. 
It's always there when you get back, though. <laughs> you, you are too practical, Johnny. But, you know, it's fun being with you. Thanks. I still can't get over it. What? Well, the coincidence that I should share your cab in Zurich and then run into you again at the Kleibach Inn. But I am glad. Aren't you? Can't say that I... Johnny! Hey, must have come from that other ridge behind the rocks. <coughs> Closer. We're sitting ducks on this ridge. Quick! Down the left side of it. There is a shortcut. Let's go. Keep low, Elsa. Who could be shooting at us? We'll figure that out when we get out of range. Oh. He's still right with us. We'll be out of sight in a moment. Could be a moment too late. There. We are past the shoulder. Yeah. Slope's pretty steep here. This is the quickest way. The shoulder of the ridge will keep us out of sight. Maybe. What do you mean? We get going much faster and we're going to take off. Hey, ahead of us, a cliff. Johnny, stop! What do you think I'm trying to do? Johnny, Johnny, watch out! Can't Johnny! Can't... Oh, brother. Oh, Johnny. Four feet more and I... Oh, thank heaven. This was a real great route you picked, Ilsa. Oh, I... I can't tell you how sorry I Sorry am. I didn't go over the edge. Oh, of course not. I mean, I'm... I'm sorry that in the excitement... I forgot about the avalanche. Avalanche? Yes, several months ago. It took away part of the slope and left this sheer drop. Forgot about it, huh? Well, I... I just told you I did. I noticed you didn't have much trouble stopping in time. But I was behind you. Oh, yeah, that's just where you were, behind me. What are you trying to say, Johnny? Just that this is one coincidence too many, Ilsa. We just happened to stop on the top of the ridge right where I make a grade-A target... Then you just happen to forget there's a sheer drop on this shortcut you got me to take. But I explain Come on, we're that... going back to the inn. The fire feels good, doesn't it? Johnny. Johnny, what is it? What's the matter? All those things you said up on the ridge. I'm waiting, Elsa. Waiting for what? For you to open up and tell me what this is all about and how you fit into the deal. Deal? Oh, cut it out, will you? You didn't just happen to share my cab back in Zurich. The whole thing was rigged so it would look like you passed those stolen diamonds along to stolen? me. Stolen? Johnny, I don't know anything about stolen diamonds. I suppose you also don't know anything about a man named Sebastian. Oh, yes, I know Sebastian. What has he got to or do with... about his murder? Murder? Oh, no. Oh, yes. Why, I, I can't believe it. Sebastian did. Yeah, and you've already admitted you knew Sebastian. Now let's have the rest of the story, straight. Oh, well, Sebastian was a friend of mine. Friend? Nothing more. He, he had asked me to share your cab at the airport and to leave my purse in it. Why did he want you to do that? I don't know. He, well, he said he was in some kind of trouble and needed help. He said if I would do that, it would help him. Ilsa, you'll have to do better than that. But I am telling you the truth. No, you... Hey, wait a minute. You claim you didn't know what kind of trouble Sebastian was in? No, he didn't tell you me. You also claim you don't know anything about the diamonds? A hundred thousand dollars worth? What? I read about that in the newspapers, but... Oh, wait a moment. Are you saying that Sebastian was involved in it? Up to his ears. I'm sorry to hear that, Johnny. But you must believe me. I did not know anything about it. You're either telling the truth or you're a whale of an actress, Dilsa. I'm telling you the truth. Okay. But about that taxi cab in Zurich, I, I don't understand. Sebastian was trying to double-cross the rest of the outfit by negotiating with me for the return of the diamonds. But apparently there was another outfit after the diamonds. He wanted to make it look to them like he'd passed the diamonds along oh. to take the heat off. You said a man attacked you after I had left your cab. Yeah. He obviously thought you'd slip me the diamonds. Oh. So Sebastian was setting me up as a patsy on the one hand and negotiating with me on the other. Who could have killed him? Good question. Could be the outfit trying to grab the stones. Or Sebastian's own crowd found out he was trying to sell them out. And the person who shot at us up on the Same ridge? Same two possibilities. Which reminds me, you still haven't explained how you happened to come up here to the Kleibach Inn. Oh. Well, Sebastian told me he had unfinished business in Zurich, and he would meet me here in a few days, and we would go skiing. I see. 
Tell me, did you know any of Sebastian's friends? One or two, slightly. Was one of them big and powerful, thick features, almost bald? Mm, no. Why? Well, he's the one who jumped me in the hotel lobby after my cab ride with you. Oh, no, no. I am certain I would remember him the way you describe him. Oh, there was a man Sebastian spent a great deal of time with, but he was short and stocky with very thick neck. Well, that fits the description of one of the men in the robbery at the Zurich airport. Do you know his name? Why, um... Bruner, I think it was. Could it have been Gruner? Yes, yes. Gruner. The man who sent the postcard to Sebastian. Yeah, that ties in all right. Postcard? Oh, I'll skip that. Was one of Sebastian's friends an Englishman? Mm, not that I know of. Why? Well, a fellow named Jeffrey Harris here at the hotel has been trying to strike up an acquaintance with me. Claims he thought I was old Bunny Dollar, a friend of his from London. Oh, well. Johnny, if you'll excuse me, I, I'm very tired and upset about this news of Sebastian. I, I think I'll go to my room. Yeah, okay, Elsa. If there's anything more I can do... Don't worry. I'll let you know. All right. I, I'll see you later. Herr Dollar? Hmm. Oh, Otto. Did you enjoy your skiing? Well, let's say it was real interesting. Got a question for you, Otto. Huh? As a man of experience, how do you tell if a woman is lying? <laughs> okay, Herr Dollar. As an innkeeper, I learned long ago that one listens to a woman, agrees with her, smiles politely, keeps his eyes open, and believes what he wishes about her. Yeah, well, I guess that's as good advice as any. Uh, Herr Dollar, this letter arrived for you from Zurich by special messenger while you were... Oh, yeah, I was expecting it. Thanks, Otto. One more thing. Yeah? Did anybody else go skiing this morning? From the inn? No. I see. But the Englishman... Jeffrey Harris? What about him? He likes to climb the rocks. He went out for a while. Climbing rocks, huh? Thanks a lot. Yeah. Jeffrey Harris could be my boy, all right. But at the moment, I was more interested in the contents of the envelope Police Inspector Honiger had sent me from Zurich. I tore it open and examined the postcard inside. Expense item eight, two and a half, long distance call to Zurich and Honiger. You received the postcard, Herr Dollar? Yeah, from Gruner to Sebastian, a picture of a chalet on the side of a mountain. You say this card arrived in Sebastian's mailbox? This morning. Apparently, Gruner is unaware of Sebastian's death. Uh, what do you make of the card? Well, the chalet in the picture is sort of a small halfway house for skiers. Is it attended? No, empty most of the time. Herr Dollar, possibly the first postcard of the inn was simply for the purpose of guiding Sebastian to Kleibach. The second is perhaps a picture of the actual location of the diamonds. That's what I'm going up there to find out. The trail up the mountain started in back of the inn. I worked my way up the ridge slowly, keeping an eye on every clump of rock, just in case my friend with the rifle was still on the prowl. Near the crest, I stopped for breath. Suddenly, I spotted something moving far down the slope below me. Someone was descending from rock to rock, almost down to the inn. It was too far to tell for sure, but it looked like the Englishman, Jeffrey Harris. I started my climb again. Ten minutes later, I reached the halfway house, the place on the postcard. It was small, just a shelter, and there was no sign of life. Inside, the place was in a shambles, completely torn about. If this had been the hiding place of the stolen diamonds, somebody had sure beat me to it. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... A third part of the key turns up in the form of a corpse. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Inspector Hardiger of the Zurich Police, Herr Dollar. Hi, Inspector. Where are you? Downstairs, in the lobby of the inn. I came up from Zurich to see if that picture postcard I sent you was of help in locating the stolen diamonds. Afraid not, Inspector. I located the chalet on the postcard, all right. It's sort of a shelter for skiers up on a ridge. Well? Well, when I got there, the place had been turned upside down. If the diamonds were hidden there, somebody sure beat me to it. I see. So it looks like we're at a dead end. Perhaps not. What do you mean? You recall that in Zurich, a large man attacked you thinking that you had the diamonds? Recall it? I've still got the lumps to prove it. What about him? A man answering that description bought a railroad ticket here to Kleibach last night. Oh? We have reason to believe that he is somewhere here in the village now. That could mean that the diamonds that he and you are looking for are here after all. I'll be right down, Inspector. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the home office, Global Casualty in Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the picture postcard matter. Location, Clybox, Switzerland. Expense account continued. Mm-hmm. Item 9, 70 cents. One pot of coffee for Inspector Honiger and myself at the Clybox Inn. Ah, most perplexing case, Herr Dollar. A skillfully timed robbery of the uncut diamonds at the Zurich airport last week... And then these puzzling postcards supposedly giving the location of the dime. Yeah, they've got to be the key, Inspector. If we can only figure them out. Look, we know now that Sebastian was in on the robbery and was trying to negotiate secretly for the return of the stones. Yeah, and he told you before he was murdered that the postcard he gave you was a part of the key to the location of the dime. That's right. It was signed by a man named Gruner. And according to Ilsa Schaefer, Gruner was a friend of Sebastian's. Her description of Gruner matches one of the men in the robbery at the airport. And what of this young lady, Ilse Schaefer? What do you make of her? Well, that's a a good question, Inspector. I I wish I knew the answer. I hope she's in the clear. Hope? Oh, oh, I see. All right, so I'm normal. Yeah, she is a very attractive young lady. But there is also the chance that she is involved... That she killed Sebastian. I know. I know. She could be involved or she could be innocent. It's a 50-50 proposition, I guess. Pay your money and take your choice. More coffee, Inspector? Please. Thank you. Uh, what is her story? Well, I finally got her to admit she didn't share my cab in Zurich and leave her purse in it just by coincidence. It was Sebastian's idea to make it look like she'd passed something along to me. But why would Sebastian wish to make it appear that you had the diamonds if he was trying to negotiate with you for their return? That does not make sense. Actually, I think it does, Inspector. It could go together this way. After the robbery, the gang split up. Gruna was to hide the diamonds, then get word to Sebastian as to their location. Of this much, we are fairly certain. Okay, okay. But now, Sebastian gets the bright idea of double-crossing his buddies. He gets in touch with the insurance company I represent, and they send me to Zurich to negotiate with him. I still do not... In the meantime, though, another outfit has moved into the picture and is trying to grab the stones from Sebastian and his boys. Yeah. Yeah, that would explain many things. Sure, sure it would. That's why he rigged that deal with Ilsa in my taxi cab to make it look to the other outfit like I had the stones. That would take them off his neck for a while. Yeah, he was playing me for a patsy. But I've got to admit, it was a pretty fair scheme. Then later, Sebastian contacts you and gives you the first postcard. Mm -hmm. He tells you it is part of the key to the location of the diamonds. That's right. But Sebastian didn't move fast enough, so he wound up dead. But uh, his confederate Gruner sent him a second card. Oh, probably mail before Sebastian was killed. It is possible. Now... The first postcard is a picture of this Kleibach Inn. Yeah, and according to Watto, the innkeeper, it's not the best picture of the inn. I asked him about Gruner. He said he thought he'd heard the name somewhere, but that Gruner hadn't been a guest here. Perhaps he is down in the village. Well, I'm going to check that today. 
But if the diamonds are in the village, why the postcard of the inn? And why the second postcard of the ski hut on the ridge? Uh, I do not know. Is there anybody here at the inn that you suspect of being an accomplice of Gruner and Sebastian? Ilsa Schaefer, for one. She claims Sebastian told her he'd meet her here in a few days for some skiing. I see. Anyone else? An Englishman named Jeffrey Harris. He seems pretty interested in me. Claims he thought I was a friend of his from London. He might be telling the truth. Yeah, yeah, he might be. But I found out he likes to climb mountains. And he was up there somewhere this morning when Ilsa and I were skiing and got shot at. Do you think Fräulein Schaefer could have maneuvered you into that position? Well, if she did, she had a lot of confidence in the marksmanship of her buddy in the rocks. And you told me she suggested a route of escape which ended suddenly at a, a cliff. Which I almost went off of. Yeah, yeah, Inspector, I hate to say it, but she could be the one. And I've got to find out one way or the other. Which means I'm going to stick pretty close to her for the time being. I gather that prospect is not entirely unpleasant to you. But be careful here, Dollar. She could be dangerous. So could Jeffrey Harris. On my way to the ski hut this afternoon, I spotted him down the mountain from me. And the ski hut had been torn apart. Yeah. If the diamonds were there, they're gone now. And Harris could be the boy who beat me to them. If he or anybody attempts to leave Kleibach, one of my men at the railroad station will report it. Well, I must be getting back to Zurich, Herr Dollar. Who knows? Perhaps these postcards are just decoys. And the stones are still in Zurich? No. No, I'd bet my bottom dollar they're here in Kleibach somewhere. If I could only figure out the meaning of those postcards. Yeah. Otherwise, why would the man who attacked you in Zurich have come here? He must be hiding out in the village somewhere. Well, perhaps I can turn up something else of help in Zurich. Right now, Inspector, anything would be of help, believe me. After Inspector Honiger left, I studied the postcards again, but I got nowhere. One of the inn, the other the ski hut. What did they mean? I went out on the balcony outside my room and looked up at the mountains. But I couldn't see the ski hut from there. A ridge was in the way. I did see something else, though. Three rooms down the balcony, Jeffrey Harris's French doors were open. His room was empty. So I decided to have a look. I wasn't sure just what I was looking for. Something, anything that would indicate whether or not Harris was involved in the whole thing. I worked my way to the closet, turning up one big nothing. His clothes were hung neatly in place, and in one corner was stacked some climbing gear. I reached around behind it, and my hand touched metal. I pulled it into view. A rifle with a telescopic sight. I sniffed at the barrel. The gun had been fired recently. Ah, good evening, Herr Dollar. Hello, Otto. Look. Have you seen Jeffrey Harris lately? The Englishman? Not since late afternoon. All day long he was out climbing the mountain. Yeah, I know. He no sooner got back than he went out again. Before dinner. And it was a good dinner tonight, too. Any idea where he went? None. Could be in the village. Look, tell me something. When he arrived here at your inn, did he have a gun case in his luggage? He had a lot of climbing equipment, but I did not notice a gun case. Well, he could have taken it apart and packed it in his suitcase. Why do you ask, Herr Dollar? Hmm. Oh, skip it. I'll see you later, Otto. Johnny. Oh. Hello, Elsa. I've been looking for you. Yeah? Have you been able to find out who are shooting at us up on the ridge this morning? I'm not sure yet. You still do not trust me, do you? I don't know, Elsa. What can I do to prove to you that I am not involved? In what? Anything. The diamond robbery, the murder of Sebastian, the attempt on your life this morning. I I like you, Johnny. I don't want you thinking such things about me. Look, let's uh, let's talk about it later on. Why not now? I have to go into the village. Well, perhaps I could go with you, Johnny. Do you mind? No. Matter of fact, that might be a good idea. Nice in the village tonight, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Quiet, too. You seem to to be looking for something, Johnny. For someone, Elsa. Who? The Englishman, Jeffrey Harris. Oh? 
You told me you'd never seen him before you came here to Clybach. That is right. Then he wasn't a friend of Sebastian's. Well, not as far as I know. Well, an hour ago in Harris's room, I found a rifle with a telescopic sight. You mean that Harris is the one who shot at you this morning? Otto, the innkeeper, told me Harris went mountain climbing today. I saw him on his way down late this afternoon. But he isn't at the inn now. Do you think he's down here in the village? Maybe. That's why. What's the matter? Hold it, Elsa. Well, well. Looks like maybe the village isn't so quiet after all. What do you mean? I think somebody's following us. What? Come on, I'll start walking. Yeah. Where? Across the street and back away in the shadows. Oh, what are you going to do, John? Figure out a way. Wait a minute. That alley up ahead will turn into it. Oh, John. Don't turn your head, Elsa. Okay, into the alley now. Good. He can't see us here. Who do you think it is? I don't know. Bruner, Jeffrey Harris, even the guy who jumped me back in Zurich thinking I had the diamonds. Keep going. You think he'll come into this alley? That's what I'm hoping. All right, now here we are. The doorway here will do very nicely. Look, you'll see. You keep going down the alley. Cut across to the next street and go back to the inn. But... What are you going to do? Wait for him. Go on now, go on. No, Johnny. Look, you do as I... I want to stay with you. Don't be silly. It could get a little rough around here all of a sudden. Uh, There's nothing you can do here, Elsa. So do what I tell you. Now get moving. Now. She looked at me a moment, then went down the alley and out of sight. A couple of minutes went by. Nothing. Then I heard steps. He was approaching the alley, whoever he was. Now he was at the entrance. I pressed back into the doorway. A few more feet. And... Oh, wait a minute. He decided not to bite. I edged out of the doorway and back to the mouth of the alley. Then I stuck my head around the corner. Nobody. He must have ducked into a building or down the street. It sounded like Ilsa for the next street. I cut through the alley. Then I spotted a couple of people in front of a small hotel down the street. They were jabbering excitedly. There was a man crumpled up on the ground. Ilsa saw me and ran over. Johnny! Oh, Johnny! What's the matter, Ilsa? He fell out of the upstairs window, almost in front of me. Who is it? It's, it's Sebastian's friend, Gruner. Gruner. The guy who'd been writing postcards to Sebastian. Gruner. The only man in the world who knew where the diamonds were hidden. My one lead. Dead. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up. I find out some people will not hesitate to kill anyone who gets in their way. And that's not so good when the man in the way is me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... 
Johnny Dollar. This is Arthur, the innkeeper, Herr Dollar. Oh, good. I was away from the desk for a few minutes and just received the message that you called. Look, Otto, I'm at the little hotel down in the village. You're not planning to move out of the Clybark Inn, I hope. No, no, listen. I want you to do me a favor. Of course. Have you seen Jeffrey Harris? The English gentleman? No. Then keep a sharp eye out for him. Oh. Yeah, and the minute he gets back to the inn, call me. But don't let him know you're calling me. Whatever you say, Herr Dollar. But is something wrong? Plenty. This man named Gruner I've been looking for. You have found him? I've found him, all right. Dead. What? And it looks like his killer is here at this hotel. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Clybox, Switzerland. To the Home Office Global Casualty, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the picture postcard matter. Expense account continued. The murder of Gruner meant that I had lost the one solid lead I had on the whole case. Unless, of course, I could round up whoever put him away. Item 10, $1 to the desk clerk for watching the rear entrance of the hotel in case the killer should try to get out that way. Well, what are you going to do, Johnny? Go upstairs and take a look. I'm coming with you. No, no, stay here. I won't. I'm coming with you. All right, I don't have time to argue. Now, tell me again just what happened, Elsa. Uh, you realized we were being followed along the street. You decided to wait in that alley, and I was to cut through to this street and go back to the inn. Yeah, yeah, go on. Well, when I got to the street, I heard a man cry out. Then I saw Gruner fall from an upstairs window. He was dead. He fell from a corner room? Yes. Well, that'd be this door over here. Okay. Get back against the wall, Elsa. All right. Be careful, Johnny. Yeah, yeah. Empty. Maybe one of the other rooms, Johnny. Yeah. Hey, hey. Somebody just locked up. That was down the hall. Yeah, come on. That room at the end. Get back, Elsa. Gone. The window. Yeah. Oh, great. A fire escape. Uh-oh. You see someone, Just Johnny? a flash as he disappeared around the corner. Could you recognize there him? There wasn't much light, but it looked like the big boy who jumped me back in Zurich. Then it was he who killed Gruner. Could be. And Gruner was my last lead to those stolen diamonds. You think that man who got away now has them? I don't know. If he does and tries to leave town, Inspector Honiger's man will pick him up at the railroad station. Well, let's go back to the inn. Mm-hmm. We did, but only because it meant being someplace where I could quietly sit down and think, try to put together and make sense out of what meager information I had. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I was starving. More coffee, Johnny? Hmm? No, no thanks, no. What's the matter, Johnny? Oh, what's the matter is I'm beat. The stolen diamonds. The stolen diamonds. Unless I can figure out the meaning of those picture postcards Gruner sent to Sebastian, I'm licked. And so far, I've drawn nothing but big blanks on them. Postcard? You didn't say anything to me about postcards. I know, Elsa. Well, look, you may as well know it. Right now, you're about my last hope. Huh? You claim you weren't involved in any of this, that you want to help me. Oh, yes, Johnny, and I mean it. Okay, here's your chance to prove it. How? Take a look at these postcards. They're all addressed to your dead pal, Sebastian. Mm-hmm. Sent to him by Gruner. That's right. A picture of the Clyback in here... And a picture of the ski hut on the ridge. Do they mean anything to you? Well, you are staying here at the inn, and I have seen the ski hut on the ridge. Beyond that, nothing. You're sure? Yes. What is it all about, Johnny? The postcards, I mean. Sebastian and Gruner were together in the diamond robbery back in Zurich. Then they split up. Gruner hid the diamonds and sent these postcards to Sebastian. They're supposed to be the key to the location of the diamonds. And now both Sebastian and Gruner are dead. Which means that if I can't figure out this key, I'll probably never recover those stones. You told me this morning you thought there were others after the diamonds. Yeah, and they probably knocked off Sebastian and Gruner trying to get them. These postcards, the inn and the ski hut. Have you searched this inn? As well as I could. And the ski hut? When I got there, the place had been ransacked. Somebody beat me to it. 
I saw Jeffrey Harris in the vicinity on my way up to the hut. The Englishman? Yeah. He could be my boy. Maybe whoever knocked off Gruner in the village was working for him. Maybe Mr. Harris already has the diamonds then. I hope to find out if and when he comes back here to the inn. I somehow doubt that he's found them, though. They went after Gruner after the ski hut was ransacked. And that would indicate they are still looking for them. Yes. The inn and the ski hut. Wait, Johnny. Perhaps the diamonds are somewhere on a line between the two places. I thought of that, but it doesn't work. You can't see the ski hut from here at the inn. A ridge cuts it off. And where on a line between the two? They're about five miles apart. I wonder if... Hold it, Elsa. What is it? Jeffrey Harris, just coming in. See you later, Elsa. Well, 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 it's the dollar chap. Yeah, that's right, Harris. The dollar chap. Enjoying your stay at Clyback, old man? Well, let's say it's been interesting. Delightful place, really. I'm a bit of a mountain climber, you know. I yeah, think. I know. Oh, you do? Oh, I didn't think my reputation had spread that much. Oh, I'm really just an amateur, but it's great fun. You did some climbing today, I believe. Yes, matter of fact, I did. Splendid place of rock up there. It gave me quite a workout. And you were down in the village this evening? Oh, yes. I say, old chap, you, you seem to be rather an inquisitive sort. Why all the questions, huh? Well, this morning I got shot at up on the ridge. Did... What's that? This evening a man was murdered in the village. Both times you were in the vicinity. Oh, oh now, look here, Dollar. Let's not be absurd, right? I, I, I'm sorry that someone was potting away at you this morning, but I assure you I had nothing to do with it, and I didn't even know about the murder in the village. Plus the fact you've been pretty interested in me ever since I arrived here at the inn. Yes, but I've explained all that. I thought at first that you might be my old friend Bunny Dollar from London. Look, let's quit talking about old Bunny Dollar and start talking about that rifle of yours with a telescopic sight. <laughs> we don't be ridiculous, old boy. I don't have any rifle. Well, I just happened to have found one in your closet today. I say, you are a snooper, aren't you? But you must have gotten to the wrong closet. I tell you, I don't own a rifle. It was there, all right, and it was your closet. Well, then somebody left it there by mistake. Now, look here, Dollar. I haven't the slightest idea what you're driving at, but I assure you, I am in no way involved. And I must say, I don't care for your attitude or behavior. You'd think I had you confused with old Bunny. Well, you're not in the least like him. You're prowling in my closet. I guess I drew a blank there. Uh, Elsa... Where did she... Hey, Dollar. How Otto. Where did Elsa go? Why, I do not know. She was sitting there a few minutes ago. Perhaps she went up to her room. Yeah. Hey, Dollar, this man you were looking for, Gruner... I'm not looking for him anymore, Otto. Like I told you over the phone, he got himself killed in the village this evening. I know. And that is what made me think you might be interested in this. Oh, hey, another postcard. Where'd you get it? It arrived today. It was addressed to the man called Sebastian in care of my inn. That means Gruner didn't know Sebastian was dead. Hey, hey, this could be the missing part of the key. Key? A picture of the village square. Does that mean something to you, Herr Dollar? I'm sure it means something, all right. But I'm not sure what. I went to my room and put the three postcards side by side. The inn... The ski hut on the ridge in the village square. The trouble was, I couldn't be sure this was all there was to the key. Maybe Gruner had planned to send more cards, but he wouldn't be sending any now. Yeah. Yeah, from any point of view, I was getting nowhere. Then I stopped cold. Point of view. I looked at the cards again. You couldn't see the ski hut from the inn, and you couldn't see the inn from the village. But maybe, just maybe, there was some point from which you could see all three. I went downstairs and outside. It was a moonlight night. I started walking slowly toward the village, keeping the inn in sight behind me. Finally, I came to a point in the road where I could see both the inn and the village square in the distance. But I still couldn't see the ski hut. There was a ridge in the way. I started cutting across a field. It looked like a little deserted farm. A shed loomed up in front of me, a small, broken-down barn. And then... Just as I got to the barn, the ski hut on the ridge came into view. I stopped and checked. Yeah. Yeah, I could see the inn, the village square, and the ski hut. And this was the one point from which the scenes on all three postcards were visible. This had to be it. I went inside. The barn was empty except for some straw in one corner. I ran my hands through it. And I pulled out a leather case. The moonlight streaming through the broken roof told me I finally found the uncut diamonds. Somebody outside. I froze against the wall in the shadow. He came in. I let him get close. Then I dove at him. 
I gave him a couple oh, so the midsection is crumpled. I dragged him to his feet. No, let's, let's go off. Well, my old friend who jumped me back in Zurich. Who are you? Come on. No, no, don't. No, I, I am Anton. Your outfit was trying to get the diamonds away from Sebastian's boys, huh? Yes. When you jumped me in Zurich, you thought I had them. Then you followed me here to Kleibach. And you killed Gruner trying to make him talk. Okay, who are you working for? Spell it. No, nobody. I am working alone. Don't give me that. You haven't the brains to mastermind a deal like this. Now, who's the boss? I can't tell you. Open up, Anton. Oh, start talking. I'm busy now. Hell, dollar. What? Otto. Stand very still. Well, so the little innkeeper is Anton's boss. You stupid fool, Anton. Yeah, well, what could I do, Otto? I, I didn't know he had had me approaching. One blunder after another. But I... I think I get it now, Otto. It was you who shot at me up at the ridge this morning. Then you planted the rifle in the Englishman's room. I realized after I had missed that perhaps it was just as well, darling. Sure, sure. You realized I might be able to help you. You couldn't figure out the location of the stones, although you had one of the postcards. But you knew I had the other two and might be able to figure out the three of them. Why not? So you gave me the third card, hoping I'd lead you to the diamonds. Which you very obligingly did. Give me the diamonds, Dollar. I will take them. Stand back, Anton. What? Huh? But Otto... Sure. You don't think he's really going to split with you, do you, Anton? What do you mean? Otto... Stay where you are, Anton. You have served your purpose. After all I have done for you. What? You said that? Anton started for Otto, who took his eyes off for a second. That's what I was waiting for. I dove at him just as his gun went off. Anton crumpled, and after a fist in his face, Otto did likewise. I knelt down and picked up his gun. All right, Otto. Just hold it where you are. But my shoulder, I'm hurt. Don't worry, Anton. There's enough of you left to talk to the police. And you know, I got a hunch you're going to be a real cooperative witness. Expense account, 14th and final item. $678.50. Transportation and incidentals home. Total expenses, $1,723 even. Remarks? Otto and Anton were turned over to police inspector Honiger. The diamonds are in safekeeping. About Otto. Well, greed is one of the seven deadly sins. It sure turned out to be the deadliest one for Otto. How about Elsa? Well, uh, please consider me available for any future assignments in Switzerland. End of report. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, there's uranium, they say, in the Arizona hills. There's also a killer with three victims behind him. And he's looking for another. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Lucille Meredith, Victor Perrin, Forrest Lewis, Stan Jones, and Ben Wright. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>